That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program. And signal gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline, available wherever you see the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independent Signal dealers from Canada to Mexico. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the whistler's strange story. Cover up. As the cold gray dawn broke over the fog-shrouded coastal village of Benton Cove, death came to the big house on the hill. Moments after the chimes of the hall clock had echoed six times through the silent house, a door along the upstairs corridor closed quietly, and Joan Harper, white-faced, nervously twisting a handkerchief in her fingers, moved slowly down the great circular stairway. At the foot of the stairs, she stopped, looked back over her shoulder for an instant, and then hurried into the library. As she picked up the phone, placed her call with the operator, her thoughts raced back to a moment two years ago, to a bright, warm spring morning in the garden when David Blaine had come to her. Joan. Joan. Here I am, David. Over here. Uh, hard at work, I see. Well, these plants certainly do need a lot of care. I don't suppose you'd be interested in some spade work, Mr. Blaine? Well, I... Might be. Good. And after that, I'll have something else for you to do. The hedge along the... Joan. Yes, David? I... I suppose you couldn't help overhearing that row upstairs. Well, Adele's voice has a way it's of... It's no use, Joan. I've tried to make it work, but it just won't. I'll be leaving in a day or two, moving into an apartment in Los Angeles. I see. Of course, there'll be no divorce. If Adele was well and strong... That would be another matter, but she isn't, and... Well, I just... I know, David. I'll do all I can for Adele, of course. Adele has more than enough money to take care of everything. I just can't stay on here any longer. It wouldn't be good for Adele, either. You understand why I can't stay, don't you, Joan? Yes. I understand. David. Yes? I... Nothing... It's nothing. Yes. That was two years ago, wasn't it, Joan? Two long years. Yet you remember it well, don't you? You understood then quite clearly why it was impossible for him to stay here at the house. And at that moment, you wanted to tell David that you were in love with him, too. But you couldn't. And you told yourself it would all work out for the best this way. David would go away and there would be no divorce. Your sister Adele would always stand between you as long as she lived. 
Now, two years later, you're placing a call to David to tell him that Adele is dead. Hello? David, this is Joan. Joan? Well, this is a surprise. How are you? David, I've been trying to reach you for the past two hours. Oh? Well, I... uh, I was at the airport seeing someone off, you know. Just this minute got back to the apartment. Joan, is something wrong? It... It's Adele. She's dead. Dead? Yes, sometime during the night. She shot herself. David? Yes? She was expecting you last night. I... I know. Something came up at the last minute. I couldn't make it. I was planning to drive down this morning. I see. All right, David. You'll hurry? Yes. Yes, I'll leave right away. Your hand is trembling as you replace the receiver. There's a tight, hard knot in your throat. The mere sound of his voice can do that, can't it, Joan? But there's something else. David's manner. His excuse about not coming down. And that vague feeling that has persisted ever since you were awakened by the gunshot. In that confused, half-awake state, it, it sounded as if there was someone on the back stairs hurrying away. But you couldn't be sure. The thought keeps running through your mind now as you wait for David while you answer the many questions of Sheriff Quinn. And then it's all swept away as you meet David. And in the days that follow, you call yourself foolish for letting your imagination run wild. David helps with everything after he arrives. And you stand side by side at the funeral attended by a large gathering of friends, villagers. And when it's over, you walk from the family crypt down the tree-shaded path toward the road in the waiting car. David? Yes? Have you made any plans about going back to the city? No. Nothing definite. How about you, Joe? Oh, I suppose I'll stay on at the house with Mrs. Hastings. Joan. Yes? Who, who's that man walking up ahead to one of the trench coat? Oh, that's Mark Quinn. He's the sheriff here. Sheriff? I see. Rather young, isn't he? Yes. Very capable, they say. Why do you ask? Oh, I... Uh... I couldn't help noticing during the services back there. He seemed to take it all pretty badly. I've seen that look on a man's face before. Hard, drained of all color, a little angry. Yet you know he's crying inside. He was in love with Adele, wasn't he? Yes, ever since high school. They were engaged once. Then I came along. Is that it? That's it. You know, I had a hunch it was something like that. Suppose he blames me for what's happened. Oh, of course not, David. He didn't come around to offer his condolences. Well, perhaps he's going to do that now. What? He stopped at the gate. I think he's waiting for it. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I think he is. Oh, Joan. Hello, Mark. I, uh, I don't suppose I'm the first to say this, but, well, if there's anything I can do... Thank you, Mark. Oh, uh, you've never met David, have you? Hello, Ma. We met a long time ago, Mr. Blaine. I don't suppose you remember. I, uh, I was at the wedding. Oh, I see. Sorry, I... That's quite all right. Some people have a memory for faces. Others don't. I happen to have. Although sometimes it plays tricks on me. That's so? Take the other night, for instance. Tuesday night, the night that Mrs. Blaine died. I could have sworn I saw you getting off the train here at the depot. Oh, Caught only a glimpse of the face. I I was mistaken, of course. You couldn't have been on that train. No, I didn't arrive till the following morning. I drove down. Uh-huh. Well, I I know you're anxious to get back up the hill, Joan. I won't keep you. Remember, if I can be of any help. What? Oh, yes, thank you, Mark. The fear has swept over you once again, hasn't it, Joan? The fear that points a finger of suspicion to David. And you wonder if Mark really did see David at the depot Tuesday night. Wonder if Mark actually believes he was mistaken. 
As you drive back to the house, you wonder, too, about the footsteps you thought you heard on the back stairs the same night. You don't want to think about it. Try to force it from your mind, but you can't. And you're afraid that what you suspect is true. That David was in the house the night your sister died. When you return to the house, you leave David downstairs in the library. Hurry up to your room. Pick up the phone. And moments later, you're talking to the telephone operator at David's business office. I'm sorry, Mr. Blaine is out of town. Oh, oh, yes, I remember now. He said something about going down to Benton Cove. Uh, when did he leave? He left Tuesday, on the afternoon train. Tuesday afternoon? You're certain? Yes, I'm quite certain. I made the reservation myself. I see. Thank you. He was here that night. David was here. With the prologue of Cover Up, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But first, a word about the amazing growth of Signal Oil Company from a mere handful of stations in Southern California into a coastwide organization serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. That growth has in large measure been due to one policy, which Signal has followed consistently for 17 years, to make each product that bears the name Signal even better and better. That goes not only for Signal gasoline and Signal premium compounded motor oil, but also for Signal's line of fine quality automotive accessories. For instance, take Signal's new deluxe battery. Unlike ordinary batteries, which are guaranteed for only 12 or 18 months, Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. And their improved all-rubber separators, the finest type known to battery engineering, make Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power. So, whether it's long life or dependable trouble-free performance you're interested in, you'll be wise to see your Signal dealer before you buy any battery. Compare the low cost per month of a Signal Deluxe battery. Compare the generous trade-in Signal dealers are now offering for old batteries. Compare their convenient credit terms. You'll see why, from any angle, today's best battery buy is the Signal Deluxe battery, sold only at Signal service stations. And now back to the Whistler. There's little doubt in your mind now, is there, Joan? David was in the house the night Adele died. You suspect the terrible reason as you wonder why he lied to you. You're afraid to think about it, afraid of what it can mean. You pace up and down the room for hours, fighting the horrible thoughts that keep creeping into your mind. Finally, there's a knock on the door. Mrs. Hastings, the housekeeper, enters. Dinner will be ready in about an hour, Miss Jones. Dinner? Oh, I, I don't... Mr. David was wondering if you'd like to join him in the library for a cocktail before... No. No, I, I don't think I'll come down tonight, Mrs. Hastings. I'm not feeling well. You really should have something, Miss Jones. I'll be all right. Perhaps after I rest a while. Very well. A moment after Mrs. Hastings leaves, you slip quietly down the back stairs, out into the cool night air, and start down the road to the village. You can't bear to face David now, can you? Not until you've had more time to think. You keep telling yourself it's all a horrible mistake. You're confused. That it'll all work out somehow. Then as you cross the small wooden bridge a short distance from the house, you hear someone call. Joan. Oh, oh Joan. Who is it? Oh, hello. Out for a little stroll? Oh, Mark. What are you doing here? Thought I'd take in a little night air. Beautiful evening, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Going uh, down the village? Uh, yes. Mind if I go along? No, of course not. I'm, uh, I'm sort of glad I ran into you. Oh? 
Yes, I've been wanting to talk to you uh, about Adele. Of course, if you'd rather I didn't... No, no, it's quite all right, Mark. Uh, what, what? When you found her, you didn't touch anything. The gun, for instance. Gun? Why, no, no, I didn't even notice it until later, after Dr. Kempston had arrived. It, it had fallen from her hand. Why, why do you ask? Well, there's, there's something rather odd about the fingerprints on it. Adele's prints. What do you mean? The position of the prints is rather unusual. It would seem more like that gun had been placed in her hand than the hand had been closed tightly around the handle to make the print. Oh, I see. It doesn't seem natural to me the way the gun was held. Oh? But then, who knows? I guess it's entirely possible. Mark, I, I don't believe I'll go down to the village after all. I just oh? remembered something. Oh? I'll have to go back to the house. You go on. Something important? Yes. Yes, it's quite important. Suddenly, you've made up your mind, haven't you, Joan? Yes. You've got to see David right away. You've got to know for certain. You hurry back to the house, to the library. David isn't there. You go on up to his room. Knock on the door. No answer. David. David? You call his name softly, but sensing as you do that he's not in the room, and knowing, too, that you're glad you don't actually have to face him. Then your eyes move to the top of the bureau, to a letter addressed to David. Your hand moves to it slowly, mechanically, and even as you tell yourself that it's wrong, you take the letter from its envelope, stare at the first page, at the letterhead of doctors Ferguson and Dunby, physicians and surgeons. You know at once that old Dr. Ferguson, executor of Adele's father's estate, wrote that letter. That isn't important, is it, Joan? It's what he tells David in the first paragraph, a brief paragraph, but so very important. And so, David, I feel it my duty to advise you that in the event of Adele's death prior to yours, and while a state of marriage still exists, all of the monies and property involved in your late father-in-law's estate are bequeathed to you. Oh, no. Oh, David. Oh. Miss Jones, I didn't know you were in oh, here. Oh, I, I thought David... Uh, have you seen him? I believe he's out in the garden, miss. Said something about taking a turn before dinner. I see. Thank you, Mrs. Hastings. You tremble as you go downstairs and out into the garden. It was wrong of you to be in David's room. Wrong to take his letter. But somehow you couldn't help it. And those words keep blurring in your mind as you walk quickly toward the rose arbor. David had a motive to kill her, didn't he, Joan? A strong one. And no matter how hard you try to fight down your fears, they persist. Suddenly, you're aware of David's voice. And you step back. Stand behind the protection of the rose arbor, listening as he questions old Ben, the gardener. What you mean to say is, Ben, you didn't do as you were told that night. Well, Mr. David, I didn't mean to go against Miss Adele's wishes. But I was tired. I, I saw no reason why I should go into town. But all the other servants did go into town. Yes, sir. Oh, if only we had known what poor Miss Adele was planning to do to herself. It might have been prevented, yes. But what I was wondering about then, from your cottage, didn't you hear the shot? Yes, but I, I thought it was only a car backfire. You didn't go out, look around in the yard? You mean there might have been someone here, Mr. David, that it might not have been suicide? I'm asking the questions, Ben. Did you see or hear anyone? No, sir. No, sir. I, that's, I didn't... That's but, all I want to know. But I guess there could have been someone, Mr. David. I had no idea anyone even suspected... No one does, Ben. Forget it. Forget we even discussed the matter. The tone of David's voice frightens you, doesn't it, Joan? You draw back into the shadows as the two men start away toward old Ben's cottage. Then you turn and hurry back to the house. Enter the library, the letter still clasped in your hand. 
You want to read that terrible, frightening paragraph again. But David suddenly calls your name. John! John! You whirl around, frantically wondering if he saw you. Knows that you were listening outside. John! Then, as you hear him coming toward the library, you remember the letter. Know that you must hide it. You turn hurriedly, slip the letter behind a heavy oil painting on the mantelpiece. Oh, there you are, John. I've been wanting to talk to you. I was in the garden. Oh? David, is there anything special you want to tell me? Why, yes. Joan, when everything is cleared up here, I'll be going away again. If I sent for you, say, in six months, would you come to me? I don't know, David. You don't know? No. No, I don't, David. It seems there are more important things we should be talking about. More important things? What could be more important than you and I? You know why I went away the first time. You must know now that I'd do anything for you. Yes, I... I believe you would do anything. What are you talking about, John? David. Where were you the night Adele died? I told you. I was in Los Angeles. John, where are you going? Leave me alone, David. I... I've got to think. Goodness, Miss Joan. You've scarcely touched your breakfast. I'm sorry. I don't want any more. My dear, you simply must calm yourself. I know you didn't sleep at all well last Mrs. night. Mrs. Hastings, I... I'm going to drive into town. If you have to reach me for any reason... I'll be at Dr. Ferguson's office. All right, Miss Joan. May I help you? I'm Joan Harper. I wanted to see Dr. Ferguson. Were you a patient of his? Uh, no, but you see, he looked after my sister and handled her affairs. Dr. Ferguson passed away last week. He's dead? Yes. Pneumonia. Oh, I see. Could Dr. Dunby help you? No. No, I'm afraid not. It it wasn't anything important anyway. Thank you. Is that you, Miss Joan? Yes, Mrs. Hastings. Oh, goodness, Miss Joan. I didn't know whether to call you or not. But Mr. David has decided to leave. He's upstairs packing. Packing? No. Yes, I... Didn't know if he discussed it with you or not. It all seemed so sudden. I'll go up. David. Oh, it's you, Joan. I thought you... David, why are you going away? I told you. But only last night. You said you were going to wait until everything was cleared up. Everything's as clear as, it, as it'll ever be, Joan. Look, I just can't say why, but... Yes, David? Well, I, I can't stand it around here. This... This house, the memories. Is that all that bothers you, David? Joan, I wish that... Miss Joan. In a minute, Mrs. Hastings. I'm sorry, but Sheriff Quinn is downstairs. There's a man with him. He insists on seeing Mr. David. Sheriff. Oh, David, David. I'll go talk to him. No. I want to go with you, David. We'll talk to him together. Going down the stairs, you take his hand, grasp it tightly, reassuringly. But all the time, the fears of the past few days pound in your brain, telling you exactly what's going to happen when you walk into the living room with David to confront Sheriff Mark Quinn. Oh, uh, morning, John. Sorry to disturb you. It's all right, Mark. I understand you want to talk to David. Yes. Um, Mr. Blaine, this is Joe Larkins. Oh, <laughs> he don't remember, I guess, Sheriff. The night your wife was killed, Mr. Blaine, Larkins here was on a freight train that passed through Benton Cove on its way to Los Angeles. It's him, all right. Can't be no mistake. He swung on the train, rode up to L.A., and hopped off. Oh, David. Blaine, I had a hunch all along. You were in town the night your wife was shot. Now I'd go a step further. And say you were in this house. David, oh, David, tell them it isn't true. Tell them you never saw this man before. I'm sorry, Joe. There's no use pretending any longer. He saw me all right. I was on that freight. And I was here that night with Adele. The 
Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since thorough scientific lubrication is even more important to your car during the rainy season, I'd like to tell you about some of the extras you get in a signal lube job. You see, signal dealers, being in business for themselves, do go out of their way to give you the kind of job they're proud to stand back of. That's why, for instance, they take no chances on memory when they lubricate your car. Instead, they check against Signal's factory-recommended lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point on your car. And they use nine specialized Signal oils and greases, so each part will have the exact type of protection it needs. But do they stop there? No, sir. Just to make doubly sure not a single part has been overlooked, they check each point again, which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. Now, that's the kind of lube service you want if your car is to give you the long, trouble-free service that was built into it. And that's the kind of lubrication you get from friendly, independent signal dealers. And now, back to the whistler. It's all over, isn't it, Joan? In David's own words, There's no use pretending any longer. And you look from him to the quiet, accusing face of Sheriff Mark Quinn. There's no doubt or question. David was in the house on the night Adele died. He had every reason to kill her. You know that from what you read in the letter you hid behind the painting on the mantelpiece. It can mean only one thing. David is guilty. And then you're suddenly aware of his voice, speaking quietly, futilely, Telling Sheriff Quinn another version of what happened the night he came here to see Adele. I suppose there's little use telling it. I knew how it would sound then. That's why I ran. Ran? You saw me all right that night at the station, Sheriff. I came down on the train. Adele had phoned that afternoon, asked me to come. Said she'd arranged for us to be alone so we could talk, get things straightened out once and for all. When I arrived at the house, in Adele's room, she was dead. Go on, Mr. Blaine. I don't know whether she asked me to come here to frame me or not. Anyway, the gun was lying on the floor beside her. I picked it up without thinking. Uh Uh-huh. Then I I realized how I was going to look. I wiped the gun off, pressed it back into Adele's hand. Oh, David. An interesting story, Blaine. It's true. And you knew about it, Quinn. It was all in that letter of Dr. Ferguson. Now, wait a minute. I don't know anything about any letter. You took it, Quinn. Knowing it would have saved me. Dr. Ferguson's letter. Yes. Oh, David, David, what are you saying? That letter makes everything worse. Your motive. Do you know anything about any letter, Joan? Yes, I... I hid it. Here, behind this picture. I'll get it. Joan, you did this for me? Oh, I, I knew it was wrong, David, but I couldn't help it. I just knew you didn't do it. I, I hid it to help you. Give me that letter. You didn't read it all, did you, Joan? I read enough. Read the second page, Sheriff. That last paragraph. I tell you these things, David, because of the situation existing between you and your wife, Adele, and because my most recent examination shows that she has less than a month to live. David. Well, I guess that does it, David. Nobody would kill someone who had only a month to live. Sorry I caused you so much trouble. Oh, David... And I almost burned that letter. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Lorette Philbrandt and Nett Lefevre. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Lewis Hampton and music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. 
Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly, dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Nightmare. In the bouncing glare of the headlights, the narrow shoreline road twisted and turned dangerously. Signposts, clumps of pine trees, driveways to darken the states whirled past Philip Adams as he raced through the night, and behind him the sirens grew louder and louder. As Philip Adams ran from the car into the brush, he patted his coat pocket. The bulging manila envelope was still there. Branches tore at his clothing. He stumbled on the lucky path, fell. Quickly, he staggered to his feet and plunged on into the thick undergrowth. And then he heard voices and stopped to listen. Come out, Mac. You and Charlie, cover the creek there. Okay. Oh, Eddie, keep that spot on the road, will you? All right, the rest of you, come on. Hey. Hey down there, any luck? No sign of him down here, Lieutenant. Bound to be around here somewhere. Are you sure this is the guy we're looking for, Lieutenant? Yeah, yeah, we checked the license number. It's Adams, all right. Mm. Think he might still have the dough on him? Yeah, it's hard to say. You know, he's no piker, this Adams. 200,000 bucks. Yeah, well, it was easy for him. He worked for the bank, knew his way around. If he hadn't got so anxious and barreled out so fast, trying to get away... Say, but... Lieutenant, huh? uh, I wonder if he had time to make it inside one of these estates along here. Hmm, Maybe. He'd have a tough time getting into this one, though. Oh, here, uh, throw your light up there along the wall, will you? Yeah. No, no, don't say a thing. All right. Now, come on. Let's take a look over this way. Keep your eyes open. You know, I got a hunch he headed back across the road. As the officers move away to continue their search, you breathe a little easier, don't you, Philip? Painfully, you crawl from the underbrush and carefully hobble across the street. The entrance gate to the estate is locked, but you've got to get over that wall. A last desperate, agonizing leap gives you one more chance at freedom. But it isn't much of a chance, is it, Philip? As you lie there in a cold sweat on top of the wall, clutching the rough stone with bleeding hands, you feel the sharp pain spread slowly up your leg. My leg. You know you've hurt your ankle badly. Luck has been against you from the start. The officer was right, wasn't he? If only you'd taken your time. If you hadn't been so anxious to get away with the money, this wouldn't have happened. The perfect crime isn't so perfect now. Is it, Philip? Moments later, as the moon creeps from behind a cloud, you see the house a short distance away. Its windows are dark, 
carefully, you drop to the ground. Move across the lawn. Your twisted ankle making each step an eternity of pain. The windows on the ground floor are locked. Then as you cross the porch, you kick the doormat and hear the clink of metal. A key. It's a door key. I wonder if... Let's see. Yeah. You open the door cautiously. Smell the musty odor of a closed house. See the furniture covers, the rolled up rugs. Heaving a sigh of relief, you close the door. Hobble across the living room. In the kitchen, you turn on the water faucet. Let the cold water run over your bleeding hand. And then... Well, <laughs> hello. Oh. Oh, hello. I, I was sound asleep. I thought when you came, the noise of the car would wake me. The car? Oh, you, you well, mean... I didn't really know if you'd take the train, taxi, drive, or what... That's why I sent you the wire about the key. Oh. Oh, you're the key. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I found it all right. Oh. Oh, your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice. Here, let no, me... No, no. No, it's nothing. Oh. oh, we'd better take care of this. I, uh... I tripped walking up the drive. Afraid I twisted my ankle, oh, too. Oh, I'd better call a doctor. Oh, no, no, please. No, that won't be necessary. No, I'll be all right in a few days. But he lives just down the road. No, I don't need a doctor. Now, really. Well, then I'll get some bandages. <laughs> After all, that's what I'm here for. To take care of you. Oh? Oh. Oh, I'm Miss Wyatt. Hilda Wyatt. Oh. Miss Wyatt. Oh, yes, of course. How do you do, Miss Wyatt? <laughs> In a few moments, she's back with bandages and iodine for your bleeding hand. And you watch her as she runs steaming hot water into a basin and wonder who young, attractive Miss Wyatt is. You wonder, too, who you're supposed to be. It's fantastic, isn't it? To sneak into a strange house and be greeted so cordially by a woman you've never seen before. There, now. If you'll put your foot in the water... Ah! Too hot? Uh, no. Uh, I'll get used to it. It should take the swelling down. Oh. I'm certainly glad you're here. Yeah. This is such a big house. Mm. I guess I was a little frightened. I've been here alone the past two days. You've been alone? Well, the employment agency didn't want to send any of the other servants down until they heard from Evans. Evans? The new butler, you know, you know. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, of course. I spoke to him on the phone last night. <laughs> Sounds rather nice. I think you'll like him. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure I will. Uh, where is uh, Evans now? Oh, he was in San Francisco. He said he'd be down in a day or so. You see, he was under the impression you wouldn't be here for several days. Something you said in one of your wires from Chicago. Oh, yes. Well, I changed my mind. Well, he's likely to arrive any time. Anyway, everything's practically ready for you. I made up your room myself. And if you don't mind my cooking for breakfast... Well, of course not. Well, you're very thoughtful, Miss Wyatt. <laughs> oh, that's just professional instinct. And now that you're here in your new home, I hope you like it. And your new secretary, too. Oh, I I hope so, too, Miss Wyatt. Uh, who told you I was just moving in? Uh, the employment agency. They told me quite a bit about you. And the gardener next door is very talkative. Mm. Says he even knows what you paid for the house. Oh, it, ow. Easy with that hand, Miss Wyatt. Oh, I'm sorry. Not much of a brownie, I'm afraid. But I am a good secretary. Yes, I'm sure you are. I appreciate your hiring me, Mr. Crane. Oh, you, you do? Is, is something wrong, Mr. Crane? Mr. Crane? Huh? Oh, wrong? No. No. no everything's fine, Miss Wyatt. Yes, just fine. With the prologue of Nightmare... The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now, news about ethyl gasoline. 
Signal Ethel is already back at many signal service stations and will soon be available at all signal stations. So tonight, on behalf of all the independent signal dealers throughout the West, I want to take this opportunity to thank you loyal signal customers for your patience during the period when unavoidable conditions made it impossible to supply this extra quality gasoline. Naturally, Signal Oil Company is doing everything in its power to get Signal Ethel into all signal stations as soon as possible, although it will take a little longer to supply stations located farthest from refineries. For your convenience, each signal dealer will post a sign at his station the moment his supply of Signal Ethel arrives. That sign will be your signal that you can again enjoy the faster starting, more flashing pickup and smoother knock-free power of Signal Ethel gasoline. So, for the very tops in performance from your car, watch for the sign at your signal station that says, We have Ethel. And now back to the whistler. bewildered by the curious turn of events, aren't you, Philip? Fleeing the police in the middle of the night, entering a strange house, being greeted as though you belonged, greeted by the perfect secretary, Miss Hilda Wyatt, who somehow thinks you're the owner of the estate, a man named Crane. And now as you stretch out on the long leather couch in the study, you can't sleep, can you? This strange refuge from the police is almost as nerve-wracking as last night's chase. Your swollen, twisted ankle makes walking almost impossible. And you know you're going to have to stay here in this house until your ankle gets better. But you think of what could happen. Perhaps the servants will arrive from San Francisco and expose you. Maybe the real Mr. Crane will show up. Something you'll say will arouse Miss Wyatt's suspicions. She'll call the police. As the first rays of the morning sun creep through the window, you try to ignore the pain in your ankle... As you slip through the hall to the front door, all you want is escape. Escape to Mexico with the $200,000 you stole from the local bank. And then as you open the door... Oh, oh. Huh. hello. Uh, just about to ring your bell here. Well, what is it you want? My name's Haskell, Lieutenant, Norville Police. And you're... Uh... Oh, my name, uh, my name's Crane. Oh, I see. You, uh, you own this place? Uh, that's right. I, uh, I bought it a little while back. He's Hudson Willard Crane. He owns the oil club near Reno. Miss Wyatt, good morning. Oh, you shouldn't be on that ankle, you know. I, uh, oh, uh, this is Miss Wyatt, my secretary officer. Oh, how do, do? how do you do, Miss Wyatt? Oh, so you're the Hudson Crane that owns the oil club, huh? Mm-hmm. I see. Oh, you said you were looking for someone, Lieutenant? Oh, yeah. A man named Adams. He ran off with a couple of hundred thousand from the local bank. He was in the neighborhood last night. Thought he might have climbed over the wall and gotten into the estate here. You, uh, you didn't see or hear anything during the night? Why, no. No, nothing at all. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Crane. Sorry I bothered you. Thank you, Miss. Oh, it's quite all right. Goodbye. Well, Miss Wyatt, you... Seem to know quite a bit about me. Oh, no, not really. Actually, I only know what they told me at the employment agency. They said you, uh, you were young and rather good-looking. A successful nightclub operator, but I'll learn more in time. Yes. Yeah. For a new secretary, Miss Wyatt seems to know quite a bit about her employer, Mr. Hudson Willard Crane. Doesn't she, Philip? But it's lucky for you that the employment agency told her as much as they did. You couldn't have told the officers anything, could you? Not even Crane's first name. And you have to convince everyone that you are Mr. Crane for a day or so. Yes, Miss Wyatt was a lucky break for you. She's efficient, too, in many ways, as you find out the next morning. More coffee, Mr. Crane? Oh, no, thank you. This is fine. I thought after you finished breakfast, we might get right to work. That is, if you feel up to it. There are some checks you should sign for the real estate people. Checks? 
Oh, well, yeah, I'll attend to that later. And the mail. Your correspondence is piling up. Well, later, Miss Wyatt. Well, all right, sir. Oh, oh, I suppose you'll want to talk to Evans, the butler. Evans, he's here? He arrived a short while ago. He came on the bus. Oh. I'll send him in. No, uh, no, wait, not just yet. But he'll be anxious to know how you want things done, Mr. Crane. After all, some of your friends may be dropping in. And... Oh, Miss Wyatt, please, I- I'll take care of everything later. Very well, Mr. Crane. You notice the strange, puzzled look on Miss Wyatt's face as she turns and walks away. And you wonder if she's beginning to think that something is wrong. You realize that your only chance to evade the police is to stay in the house for another 24 hours, at least until your ankle's better. Yes, that's all you need, isn't it? 24 hours. And the police will have left the neighborhood by then, and you'll be able to slip away unnoticed. But in the meantime, you've got to somehow keep one jump ahead of the efficient Miss Wyatt. And to do that, You've got to know more about this man, Crane. You hurry to the study. Oh, Mr. Mr. Crane, Uh, Looking for something, Miss Wyatt? Well, I I was just sorting things out. I thought I made it perfectly clear that you were not to bother with business. But these are the files you sent from Chicago. I was just going to straighten them out. Uh Uh-huh. I'll take care of Miss Wyatt. Mr. Crane, I don't want you to think I was deliberately prying into your personal affairs. I... Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, Chicago. Oh. Oh, yes, I'll take the call. Just a minute, Miss Wyatt. Let me have the phone. Well, uh, all right, Mr. Crane. Hello? Hello, this is Mr. Crane. Uh, One moment, please. Miss Wyatt, this is personal. Do you mind? Uh, Of course not. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Crane? Hey, what's going on there? Oh, uh, let me apologize for the confusion, sir. Uh, we were just opening the house, and I'm... Who is this, the new butler? Uh, yes, I'm the new butler. I'm Evans, sir. All right, now get this. I'm leaving Chicago in a few minutes, flying out to San Francisco. Uh, do you wish me to meet you, sir? Never mind, I'll pick up a car at the airport garage and drive in myself. Oh, very good, sir. My plane lands sometime tomorrow. Pardon, sir, would you mind telephoning uh, from San Francisco when you arrive? Why? Well, I want to have the house ready for you, sir. Oh, of course. You'll be bringing guests, sir? No, no, I, I'll i be alone. Yes, sir. One more thing. If anybody asks you, anybody, you don't know when I'm coming back, understand? Oh, yes, of course, sir. I don't want to see anybody when I get there. Just get away from everything and everybody. I quite understand, sir. Uh, is that all, sir? See you tomorrow, Evans. Your hand trembles as you replace the receiver. You haven't much time now, have you, Philip? And yet somehow, you sense in all this a real chance for escape. A few minutes later, you put things in motion in a conversation with Evans, the new butler. And you're no longer afraid because you know now that he's never met Crane face to face. Evans, I hate to have you just arrive and then send you off again, but uh, something urgent's come up. Very good, sir. Whatever you wish. I'm going to have to make a quick trip to Canada. I want you to run into San Francisco and make the arrangements for me. Oh, uh, here's some money. Buy anything you think I'll need. Well, this might all take some time, sir. When oh, it's you... all right. Uh, well, I'd like to leave day after tomorrow, and you stay on in the city until everything's taken care of. Very good, sir. I'll handle everything. <laughs> Yes, Philip. Evans will handle everything. He's very efficient. Too bad you have no intention of actually using his services. But it will look good to the police, won't it? When Crane finally arrives and they piece it all together. Discover that you planned a clever escape to Canada. It will throw them off. While you're actually continuing on your way to Mexico. later that night, with Evans gone, that you decide to speak to Miss Wyatt, plant some things in her mind that will add to your plan in evading the police. You go downstairs and wonder why it's so quiet in the house. Suddenly you feel panic. Miss Wyatt. Miss Wyatt. Miss Wyatt. You wonder if she's gone, Philip. If she learned the truth and slipped away from the house. And then you see a crack of light beneath the study door. Miss Wyatt. What are you doing? Isn't it fairly obvious? I'm going through your Chicago files again. No, your attitude's pretty hard to understand, Miss Wyatt. 
I think it's time we talk this over. Uh, sit down. No. I prefer that we stand for this. Oh, God. Stay where you are. I wasn't sure about you until just now, Crane, when I went through your files. If I had been, I'd have killed you the first night you were here. What? Do you think it was fun fixing your ankle, cooking your meals? Now, wait a minute. You You've c- heard of imposters, haven't you, Crane? All right, I'm an imposter, but... Look. Look, I can make things easy for you. I've you got can't 200- give me back Joe Baldwin, Crane. Joe Baldwin? My name isn't Wyatt Crane. It's Baldwin. Edna Baldwin. I wasn't only Joe Baldwin's girl, Crane. I was his wife. Joe Baldwin? Now tell me the name means nothing to you. Tell me that, Crane. You don't remember how you framed him, do you? Wait a minute. This is all a mistake. It's no mistake, Crane. I found out everything five minutes ago. I've never heard of Baldwin. you got to listen to me. You're all wrong. I'm not the man you, you are. You are Hudson Willard Crane, and you framed Joe Baldwin into the electric chair. Will you wait and a you minute? you double-crossed Joe and me, too, out of enough money to buy into gambling places in Chicago now and Nevada. Now listen to me. And now you live like a king. Well, that's all over for you now, Crane. The law couldn't get you. But I will. You don't understand. I'm not Crane at all. My name's don't Adam. Don't come any closer. Come on, give me that gun. No. Look, I'm not Crane, don't no. you see? You must believe me. Give me that no, gun. You would try anything, give wouldn't you? But you can't get away with it with me. Crane. Miss Wyatt. You watch as she falls to the floor. A small girl now, small and white. You don't have to feel her pulse to know that she's dead. Numbly, you sink down in the chair, sure that this is the end. A murdered girl in the house. You wanted by the police already. An ankle that won't allow you to walk two blocks. It's all over now, isn't it, Philip? The grand plans for escape into Mexico. Everything's done. You'll be caught and it'll be the gas chamber. As the phone's insistent ringing brings you back to your surroundings, you reach over and touch the cradle, hoping to stop the irritation of the sound. And then slowly it comes to you. Hello. A half-familiar voice on the other end of the air. Hello. Hello. Say, is everything all right there? Can you hear me? This is Crane. I'm in San Francisco. Mr. Crane. Oh, you're in San Francisco. Of course. You asked me to phone. All right, I'm here. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. You sure everything's all right there? Oh, everything's fine, sir. You didn't tell anybody I was coming in? No, I didn't, sir. Good. I'll have a bite of dinner and then I'll start... Oh, uh, uh, begging your pardon, sir, but, uh, could you hurry? I thought you said everything was all right. It's, uh, something I can't discuss on the telephone, not right now, sir. But uh, your new secretary, Miss Wyatt, I, uh, uh, caught her looking through your personal files. What? I'll pick up my car and be there in two hours. Very good, sir, and, uh, drive carefully, sir. Yes, you must get Crane to hurry, Philip, because the car he's driving up from San Francisco is your way out. It all came to you when you heard his voice on the telephone. And there'll be no murder charge against you. It'll be against Crane, the one man who had reason to kill this girl. Methodically, you hobble about the room, setting the murder trap. The first thing, wipe the gun free of your prints. Straighten the rug. Turn a single lamp on in the study. Her body's behind the desk. It'll take him a while to see it. But while he's inside, you'll be in his car driving southward, and you'll stop just once to make an anonymous phone call to the police. You smile to yourself as you step outside in the gathering dusk and take your station well hidden behind the porch, waiting for Crane. The two hours seem like years, but at last a black limousine pulls up in the driveway, and a tall, broad-shouldered man gets out. You watch him go up on the porch and push open the door. Hello. Hello, anybody home? And your heart's in your mouth as you see him stoop and pick up the gun that you left lying in the hall. Quietly, you creep toward the car, and then a thought strikes you. Maybe he didn't leave the keys. You've got to have those keys. You're shaking as you come to the car and look through the open window and run your hand quickly along the dashboard. And then... Ah, they're here. I'm in luck. The keys are here. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. 
Meantime, a tip for you drivers. Since cooler weather is here to stay, the kind of oil that you use in your motor is more important than ever. The reason? On short trips around town, your motor seldom gets warm enough to drive off the moisture that condenses in the crankcase. As a result, harmful gums may form, which can damage costly motor parts. That's why Signal brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an improved type lubricant which contains special scientific compounds. Inside your motor, these compounds go to work to do jobs which a regular oil alone cannot do. One compound, for instance, stands ready to dissolve any harmful gums that might form. Another compound washes out carbon. And still other compounds help in other ways to keep performance up and wear down. That's why Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil is your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. So next time you change oil, make it a change for the better at your nearest Signal service station. It'll take your Signal dealer only a few moments to drain out tired old oil and refill with the improved type Signal Oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. And now back to the whistler. It's been a nightmare, hasn't it, Philip? Your flight. The moments of panic before your escape over the wall to the protection of Crane's darkened house. The worry and constant fear of discovery. Of not being able to flee because of your swollen ankle. But it's all behind you now. Crane did exactly what you planned. He picked up the murder gun where you left it in the hallway. The gun you used to kill Hilda Wyatt. He's certain to be excused. And you'll see to it that with your phone call to the police... And the confusion of a murder will give you still more time to cross the border into Mexico with your $200,000. You smile to yourself as you open the door and start to slip behind the wheel. Borrowing this car, Mr. Uh, Crane? Oh. Where did you come from? Oh, I've been sitting in this back seat all the time. Look, it's a mistake. I'm not Crane. Oh, that's so? I saw you sneaking out of the house. I just came by to see Mr. Crane on business. And he wasn't home, huh? That's right. Uh, you looking for Mr. Crane? For grand larceny, embezzlement, and a dozen other things. Just had a wire from the Chicago police to pick him up. Police? Yeah. Oh, I'm Reynolds, uh, San Francisco headquarters. But Lieutenant Jeffrey's the head man. You know, he might want to talk to you. Oh, look, I, I don't want to get mixed up in anything. Oh, if you're on the level, you won't get mixed up. I'm in an awful hurry. I, I, I can't wait for your Lieutenant Jeffries to show up. Don't have to. He's inside now. He's... Sure, sure. That was Jeffries that went in the house just a minute ago. You mean that wasn't Crane? I thought you said you knew Crane. Oh, well... I... You know, I think we'll both go inside. Lieutenant Jeffries might want to ask you some questions. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Eve McVeigh. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed tonight by Sterling Tracy. With story by Robert Eisenbach and Jackson Gillis and music by Wilbur Hatch. And was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is 
your signal for the signal oil program, the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. The Lovely Look. began quietly, matter-of-factly. Charles Belden would have found it difficult to trace it back to the exact moment when he began to feel as he did toward the girl. Certainly it wasn't love at first sight. Somehow he could still tell himself that he was beyond that sort of thing. That as a respectable married man and the competent manager of the London importing firm, founded by his wife's father, he'd accomplished a certain reputation. But he did remember the first time they met, some of the words they spoke, the way she looked at him. It was a Sunday morning, cold, unpleasant, the familiar half-fog shrouding the house. He'd gone outside, he didn't know why, to sniff the damp sea air and speculate on the weather. Or perhaps because there was as much companionship in loneliness as in listening to Helen. After nine years, Helen was so very predictable. Near the front gate, the fog parted momentarily, drew back like a soft gray curtain, and there she was. She came walking up the road, hesitated as you discovered one another silently, and then... Hello. Well, hello. I'm, I'm sorry, but I've been walking forever, it seems. I wonder if you could direct me. I'm trying to find the Belden residence. Really? And now that you've found it... Have I? I'm Charles Belden. Oh, Mr. Belden. Of course you don't know me. But I came in response to the ad. Ad? In the London Courier. Perhaps Mrs. Belden placed it. Um, regarding a housekeeper. Oh, yes. Um, you didn't write her and talk to her on the telephone. Uh, no. Uh, No, I thought it best to meet her, talk to her in person. I understand you have a problem because of the distance. Quite a problem, yes. Matter of fact, we haven't been able to persuade anyone to stay very long. However, I think think it's best that I talk to Mrs. (laughs) Bell. Yes, that's it. More in her province, you know. Um, Come along, I believe she's back from her morning stroll. (laughs) Daily ritual with her, you know. Here, I'll take your cake. Oh, Oh, you're very kind, Mr. Belden. Not at all. It's strange, isn't it, Charles? The effect of that brief moment of silence when you first caught sight of her. And going toward the house, taking her to see your wife, Helen, there's a vague awakening, a stirring of something inside of you that suggests a beginning and the end of monotony. And a few minutes later, you find yourself oddly interested in the outcome of Helen's questioning. Sorry. The interview with... Laurie uh... Edgley, I read of your need in the courier. I'd rather you have written us, Laurie, or called. Does it matter, Helen? It was thoughtless of me, I know. And I should have thought of references, but if you've no one else in mind, I'd be very happy to, to work for we you. We haven't, have we, Helen? No. However, I- I'd appreciate a few days' trial, Mrs. Belden... And if you didn't think me efficient... What do you I... say, Helen? I think Laurie's trying to be fair. 
Of course, it's up to you. Yes. Very well, we'll try it for a week. Oh, thank you, ma'am. And you, Mr. Belden? Not at all. We've waited some time now. A week can't make much difference. Except that you might not like us. Oh, I don't think that's fair. We'll discuss it later, Laurie. Come along, I'll show you where you'll stay. Yes, ma'am. The way she looks at you. That's it, isn't it, child? Laurie's gentle, lovely look. It lingers in your mind, fading in and out of focus as you think about it. And consider its meaning. Somehow it's more than a grateful glance, child. You're certain of it. And it remains with you in the in the days that follow. In the long drive to London and the dull hours at the office. What have we decided on the shipment of Chloe's name, Mr. Belden? Being held at the Southampton warehouse, you know. Mr. Belden. Yes, Laurie. What's that, Mr. Belden? Oh. Sorry, Jameson. What was it now? It lies in air, that ship. No, yes. Why, I see no reason why we shouldn't accept it. Take care of it, will you, Jameson? I'm going home early today. Oh? Feeling badly, Mr. Belden? Not at all. I feel fine. What is it, Helen? Close the door. Charles, that young woman. We've got to get rid of her. Laurie, isn't she satisfactory? Oh, as a housekeeper, she's excellent. Well, then I don't understand. It happened early this afternoon. Oh, Charles, it upset me. So Mrs. Wilton drove up from the village. Oh, that busybody. She came to discuss the elections at the club. You know I'm running for the presidency, and I'm counting on her support to put me... All right, all right. What happened? Well, Laurie didn't answer the door. I finally had to do it myself. Is that all? Helen, the girl simply hasn't caught on to the routine of things. It isn't that I'm trying to tell you. I spoke to her when Mrs. Wilton had gone. Charles, she asked if... if she did everything else to our satisfaction. Would we mind if she didn't answer the door or take telephone calls? What? Exactly my reaction. Naturally, I demanded an explanation. Well, did she give one? It isn't satisfactory. Not to me, Charles. What did she tell you? A wild tale. Something about coming out here to get away from someone. Oh? A man. He's in love with her. She professes to be terrified of him. Says that he's threatened to kill her. And you don't believe her? Believe her? There's more to it than that. The girl's a fugitive, Charles. Something of the sort. I wonder. Wonder? Yes. She seems so... Oh, well, so gentle, Helen, so harmless and gentle, and we've had so much trouble getting anyone to stay. You mean you don't think we should do anything about it? Well, if you insist, I'll talk to her. But you're not at all alarmed about leaving me way out here alone with her. Charles, I'll never understand you. You're careless of me, thoughtless, disinterested in everything, even my father's company. Helen, please don't speak that. No, you're going to talk to that girl. Charles, dismiss her. Tonight, she just... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's I... all right, Laurie. Come in. I'm going to bed, Charles. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Belton. Um, Laurie. Yes, Mr. Belton. Laurie, we've just been talking, and um, yes, she, Mrs. Belton, told me how, how well you did your work today, and it's all right, Laurie. I'll get that. You don't have to answer the phones or the front door, ever. And you're going to be all right. Right here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Belden. Thank you very much. With the prologue of The Lovely Look, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You know, out here in Hollywood, where The Whistler is produced, an actor or actress often becomes famous for some one feature, such as the legs or the body or the voice, that folks often overlook the fact that they're also very great at acting. Well, it occurred to me that it's much the same with Signal Gasoline. Signal has become so famous as the go-farther gasoline, many folks forget what makes that good mileage possible. 
the quality in signal gasoline. You see, the best yardstick of gasoline quality is mileage. After all, the only way any gasoline can give you better mileage is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, smoother power, the kind of performance you expect from a quality gasoline. That's why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, just remember two things. One, in gasoline it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. You couldn't dismiss her, could you, child? Couldn't carry out Helen's demands, no. Because everything she'd said, all her complaints, demands, were swept away when Laurie looked at you. Her soft eyes wide and pleading, and somehow you found the strength to stand up for her, and later to stand up to Helen, as you knew you must. You said a week, Helen. Surely you can give the girl that much time. I can't understand why you're so interested in a servant, child. She's not exactly a servant. She needs help, I tell you. Something or someone to cling to. And since we need her, why not give her a chance? You managed to convince Helen, didn't you? Temporarily win her over to your way of thinking. And Laurie stays on. But week after week, the contest between you and Helen is renewed. And her patience is reaching the breaking point. But it doesn't seem to matter, does it? Because you know that Laurie understands. And all the time, the strange, unspoken bond between you has increased. As she attends to your every wish, hangs on every word you say, you wonder how long it will go on, where it will lead. Then the answer finally comes in a phone call to your office. Mrs. Belden calling, sir. Go ahead. Yes, Helen? Charles, I want you to drop around to the employment agency sometime today and see about another housekeeper. Another? Helen, what do you mean? What's the matter with Laurie? I, I can't that... stand it any longer. I won't have Laurie around another minute. I've... I've discharged her. What? I'm just not satisfied with this arrangement at all. But, Helen... You... Really, Charles, I don't care to discuss it any further, nor have I the time. I'm due at the club in half an hour. The election, you know. Helen, will you listen to me? It's I... no use, Charles. I've made up my mind. I've told Laurie she can stay just one more week, and that's all. For a moment, you sit there, stunned and then slowly replace the receiver. And as you sit back, trying to think it out, something Helen has said many times passes through your mind. I can't understand why you're so interested in a servant, Charles. Helen called her a servant. You know now, you've known for many, many weeks that she's far more than that, isn't she? She's everything to you, Charles. And just as she has tried to tell you, with every action, every look, you suddenly feel the urge to tell her. An hour later, you're racing across the English countryside. The rain driving against you as the car swerves perilously along the narrow cliff road. Finally, you swing into the driveway, hurry up the steps, into the house. Laurie! Laurie! Then you hear it. The movement in the kitchen. You hurry down the hall and catch sight of Laurie. The thunder drowns your voice. She doesn't hear. You move across the kitchen and touch her arm. Gently. Oh, Laurie, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to startle you. Mr. Belden. No. That's quite all right. The silly help me to... I always think it, it might be him. I know. What, whatever are you doing home at this hour, Mr. Belden? I didn't expect... Well, to... I, I left some important papers in my desk. I had to come back from the office. Oh, in this storm, too. What a shame. Oh, here, let me do that. You'll cut yourself. Uh, may I fix some tea for you, Mr. Belden, before I go? Go? You're going out in this weather. Oh, it'll be clearing soon. 
And this is my day off, you know. Oh, of course. I thought I'd go down to the village. I have some things to buy. Laurie, don't go. What? I mean, the village road. It's terribly slippery in the rain. On the way here, my car skidded, almost went over the cliffs. Oh, how awful. You could have been killed. Would you have cared, Laurie? Why, why, of course, Mr. Belden. You, you've been so kind to me. Laurie, listen to me. You can't go away. You mustn't. But Mrs. Belden said... Oh, she's quick-tempered. She says a lot of things she doesn't really mean. And besides, I can't let you go. Well, I suppose I could stay until you got someone else. That isn't what I mean, Laurie. It's... Well, I know I'm handling this rather badly. I, I don't quite know how to say it. You see, I've never really been in love before. In, in love? <sighs> don't you understand? Please. I want to marry you, Laurie. But... You are married. Laurie, I'll change all that, and when I'm free... Please, Mr. Belden, you mustn't talk that way. I had to let you know how I felt. And now that you do, well, I don't expect an answer right away. I hope you'll want to think about it a little. I think... I think I'd better go now, Mr. Belden. Yes, all right, Laurie. But you will think it over, won't you? You watch Laurie as she hurries out. Somehow you feel confident that she'll want you to find a way. A way to rid yourself of Helen. But that isn't going to be easy. Divorce is out of the question. Helen would certainly oppose it. And even if she didn't, a divorce would leave you penniless. The importing business, the house, everything belongs to Helen. Moments later in the library, you pour yourself a drink, pace the floor... Try to find the answer to your problem. You're so engrossed with your thoughts, you don't hear the car in the driveway, the sound of the front door, and you don't feel the eyes watching you from the hallway. And then... Charles. Yes. What? Oh, Helen, I... I know, I know. You didn't expect me so soon. Well, I thought this was going to be an all-day meeting. It was going to be, yes. I simply walked out on them and came home. Something happened at the club. After all I've done for. Imagine to elect a silly, illiterate creature like that, Mrs. Meglin. I simply don't... Uh, by the way, Charles, what are you doing home at this time of day? Well, I... I... <laughs> really, Charles, I could have saved you this early trip back from town. I should have told you that Laurie always goes to the village on her day off. Didn't you know? What do you mean? I know why you came here, darling. You thought I'd be gone all day. You came back to see Laurie, didn't you? Laurie? Why... That's ridiculous. I... <laughs> Is it? Helen, you can't be serious. Oh, stop I... it, Charles. You take me for a complete fool. I've noticed the way you watched her. That sick, stupid look on your face, mooning about like a schoolboy. Really? Helen, you're imagining Indeed, things. I never did so it. I you that... Charles. Do you think for one moment she'd be interested in you? Helen, that's enough. You're so terribly dull, darling. So unromantic. Helen! I feel sorry for you. But you'll get over it. Laurie will be gone soon, and you'll go back to your rose garden, your pipe collection, and you'll still have me. Won't you, darling? Charles, where are you going? Charles! As you hurry out of the house to your car, the rage within you gradually subsides. For an instant back there in the library... You thought you could have killed her, and you wonder why you didn't. That would have solved everything. Yes, with Helen dead, you'd be free to marry Laurie. Suddenly, as you drive toward the village, the answer to your problem becomes quite clear. And you find yourself thinking of murder, Helen's murder. And you're still thinking minutes later as you stop in the village and enter the tobacco shop. Morning, Mr. Belden. Good morning, Matthew. Seems like it's clearing up a bit, eh? Quite a storm we had last night. Yes, yes, it was. Um, what's going on over at the constable's office? I noticed quite a few people. Oh, that bit of excitement we had. Constable and some of the lads brought a man down from the cliffs. Oh, the cliffs? Tourist chap, staying over at the inn. Decided he'd take a bit of a stroll early this morning. Lost his footing. Good thing for him he wasn't killed. I see. Uh, what'll it be, Mr. Belden? Mm, same as usual, Matthew. Small tin. Right, Ah, uh, Lucky chap, that one. Dropped some 15, 20 feet down to a ledge he did. Only thing stopped him from going all the way. 
Boozed him off a bit, hurt his leg, about all. Yeah, he was lucky, all right. There you are, Mr. Belden. Thank you. It might be wise to caution Mrs. Belden about what happened this morning. She still goes for a walk along the cliffs every morning, doesn't she? Oh, yes. Yes, she does. Yeah, the cliffs are dangerous in this kind of weather. Well, you're quite right. Never can tell what might happen, you know. No, you never can tell. <laughs> That's it, isn't it, child? An accident on the cliffs, and you'll be free. The villagers all know of Helen's daily walks along the cliffs. Know how dangerous the cliffs can be during the rainy season. It's perfect, isn't it? Yes. And you have the rest of the day to think it over, to make your plan. Late that evening, when you return to the house, Helen is already retired. And you hurry to find Laurie. You've got to know what her answer is before you make your next move. You can't wait, can you? You want to get it over with as quickly as possible. As you step into the half-darkened library, you see Laurie standing by the window, staring out into the garden, her back toward you. You approach within a few feet of her. Laurie, don't turn round. Don't say anything. Just listen to me. I found a way. A way to be free of Helen. But first I've got to know how you feel. I've got to know if you want me to go ahead with it. Now, listen, Laurie. This is very important. You'll not be implicated. You don't have to answer me. You don't have to say a thing, Laurie, unless... Unless you want to stop me. Shall... Shall I go ahead with it? All right, darling. I'll do it. Oh, good morning, Charles. Good morning, my dear. My, you're up bright and early. Rather a surprise. We haven't had breakfast together in ages. Mm, yes, I, I wanted to catch you before you left the house. You are going for a walk this morning? Well, I thought I would. The rain has stopped. But, uh, why'd you ask? Helen, I... Well, it might sound odd to you. Helen, early in our marriage, we used to go for walks together. It, it seemed to me that we were able to talk out so many things. That's true, Charles, but... I was wondering, couldn't I walk along with you now, this morning? Why, why of course, Charles. But what about the office? Don't you have... Oh, to... it can wait, Helen. We're more important. Yes. Yes, we are. Charles, I'd enjoy having you go with me. We'll walk along the cliffs, like we did before. I'll get my coat. And, Charles... Yes? I'm glad you thought of this. Good. I think it'll settle a lot of things, Helen, for both of us. will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, since this coming Thursday is Thanksgiving Day, I want to say for Signal Oil Company and the almost 2,000 Signal dealers who serve the six Pacific Coast states from Canada to Mexico, we hope that your Thanksgiving will be filled to overflowing, not only with good food, but also with good health and good cheer. Certainly all of us can be thankful from the bottom of our hearts that we're living in America, the land of abundance and freedom for all. We of the Signal Oil Company like to feel that in our 17 years of serving the West, we have played a part in furthering the way of life that is America. Because Signal dealers are in business for themselves, they are carrying on the tradition of the independent businessman who has played such an important role in building America. And Signal Oil Company, by supplying its dealers with constantly finer products, is helping them keep ahead of that ever-present healthy competition, which is the key to America's continuing progress. Competition which helps all of us here in America enjoy the highest in the world standard of living. And now back to the whistler. It's all over now, isn't it, Charles? 
The walk you took along the cliffs with Helen was the last one you'll ever have to take with her. And as you turn away from the precipice, the fog moves in around you, and you hurry back along the path toward the house. You're anxious to see Laurie again, talk to her, gain the reassurance that sweeps over you every time she looks at you. There's magic in those moments, isn't there, Charles? An enchantment and beauty that cannot be denied. And after the weeks of waiting, you've settled it finally. And Laurie need never leave the house that will now be yours. Laurie! Laurie! Oh, there you are. Oh. Oh, is, is something wrong? No, Laurie. It's over. Exactly as I said. Over? It'll seem like an accident, Laurie. I'm sure of it. it. It's happened to someone from the hotel in the village. They'll think it was the same with Helen. Your, your wife? Don't you understand, Laurie? Helen's dead. What? If they come round, just tell them we missed her this morning. Thought she'd gone for a walk. Uh, you... You killed her. Laurie. No. No, no, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Laurie. She turns, hurries away. You take a few steps after then stop. It's the shock, isn't it, Charles? You can feel it yourself now. The realization of what you've done. But you'll be all right, and so will Laurie. You wonder if you should go on to the office, give her time to think. And then suddenly you hear the sound of Helen's car from the drive and rush to the window. Laurie, driving toward the village. Good Lord. <laughs> Racing after her in your own car, a dozen thoughts pound in your mind as you wonder what you've done wrong. Perhaps it was the way you told her, the suddenness of it, the cold shock. And then you see Helen's car parked at the curb. You stop, step out, and realize too late that you followed Laurie right to the constable's office, where he's talking to her. And then, as you turn to hurry away... Just a moment, Belden. Huh? I wouldn't try to get back in that car if I were you. What? What's the matter, Constable? I have a few questions to ask you. Laurie here tells me you've killed your wife. She told you? Yes, just now. But she was in on it herself. She knew I was going to do it. I, I told her and she didn't stop me. No. No, no, that's not true. But, Laurie, last night in the library, you were standing by the window, looking out into the garden. The I... library? Last night? Why, I... I didn't even see you. But you heard me, Laurie. You must have. Just a moment, Belden. If Laurie says she didn't see you, she couldn't have heard you. What? Don't you understand? That's why I couldn't answer the doorbell. The telephone. That's why I made up that story of the man who was supposed to be threatening me. Belden, haven't you ever noticed the way Laurie looks at you? Yes. A lovely look. She has a good reason for that look. You see, Laurie can't hear. When she looks at you like that, she's reading your lips. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were John Hoyt, Lorette Philbrandt, and Mary Lansing. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed tonight by Sterling Tracy, with story by Mary Ruth Funk and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Whistle is your 
your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Hired Alibi. The dry desert heat that enveloped the highway seemed to add to the pressure and anguish tormenting the lone man in the swiftly moving automobile. Paul Burns' hurried trip to Los Angeles had proved useless. There wasn't a chance of escape for him now. And he was forced to drive back and face his wife, Edith, tell her that he had failed. If only there was a way out, someone he could turn to, to talk it all over and perhaps somehow find a way. Hey, hey, I'm on the left. Huh? Oh. Thanks, friend. Almost didn't see you. Out here? I, uh, got things on my mind. That's probable. When you're driving with the sun in your face, it's sometimes hard to see anything but the white ribbon in the road. How far are you going? Flagstaff. Then 50 miles north I'll to... get out of Flagstaff. All right. A little warm for this time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, the weather's warm. As for what happened in the election, I'll agree with you. That's how I pay for my ride. Isn't it? I talking? No. It isn't necessary. I just... Go thought... on. Pick a subject. Only keep it down to my level. <laughs> Since you seem to limit yourself, perhaps you should decide. Okay. Women, sports, towns, automobiles. All right. Automobiles will do. Yes, Paul. It's good to have someone to talk to. Only your interest is not in the relative performance of various automobiles. But in this young man himself. He's rough and hard, but oddly handsome. And as you drive along, you begin to speculate about him. Wonder vaguely if you haven't seen him somewhere before. And suddenly it comes to you, Paul, and you tense with excitement. If it's true, it can change a lot of things, can't it? Yes, but you've got to be sure. I'm wrong. Uh, no, I just noticed I'm out of cigarettes. I thought I'd pull in at that cafe up ahead. Oh, sure. Uh, would you mind running in for me? Hey, look, you sure you're not just tired of my company, maybe? <laughs> of course not. Here, get a pack for yourself. Thanks. Thanks, I'll do that. You wait nervously, Paul until he disappears into the little roadside cafe. Then immediately you turn around and pick up the newspaper on the back seat. His picture stares up at you from a newspaper dated early in the week. Norbella. He's Joe Norbella. Yes, Paul. Your hitchhiking friend is Joe Norbella, a fugitive wanted by the Los Angeles police for killing a theater manager during a holdup. You hide the paper in the back and force yourself to relax as Joe comes back and Climbs into the car. There you are. Oh, thanks. Here's a change. Light. 
sure. Thanks. Okay. What do you do for a living, son? Odd jobs. I like to keep on the move. You said you were going east. Any particular spot? No particular spot. I bet you wouldn't like where I live. Okay, I'll play. Why? I'm Paul Burns, general manager of the Silver Canyon Mine. Am I supposed to be impressed? No, no. Just my way of explaining why we're tucked away up in the hills. You wouldn't like that, would you? Wouldn't I? <laughs> You're a young man. You'd probably find it very dull. Probably. Well, the population of the town nearby is about 600. Yeah. Called Silver, but we refer to it as Hermit's Heaven. That's nice. Well, we're so far off the main highway, we have hardly any contact with the outside world. I've heard of worse places. You, uh, wouldn't be interested in going to work for me. Pay's very good. Yeah. And I'll even throw in living quarters. You would, huh? Yeah. You'd be sort of an all-round handyman. It's difficult getting young fellas to work in an out-of-the-way place like a silver mine. Yeah, I guess it is. I don't blame them. Working up there is next to disappearing. But it's 75 a week to start with. 75, huh? What do you say? Uh, what is your name, by the way? Joe. Joe Webster. Well, Joe, how about it? All right. You got a deal, Mr. Burns. When do I start? As soon as we get there. And, Joe. Yeah? I think this is going to work out fine for both of us. Just fine. With the prologue of Hired Alibi, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you're one of those folks who like to carry a pocket calendar... You're probably wondering where you're going to get your new one for next year. Well, worry no more, because your signal dealer is now offering free the neatest little pocket calendar you've ever seen. These signal pocket calendars are just the right size to fit in a man's wallet or milady's handbag. They're made of moisture-proof plastic, so the numbers will stay legible, and the edges won't fray from wear. And they're printed in attractive colors, with all the holidays indicated in red. Of course, like all good things, they'll no doubt go in a hurry. So if you want one of these signal pocket calendars, I'd suggest that you stop in for yours soon. Remember, they're free. And remember where? At your nearest signal service station. And now back to the whistler. It was a strange meeting, wasn't it, Paul? Two men brought together on a lonely Arizona highway. You and Joe Norbella. Joe, a fugitive who tells you that his name is Joe Webster, and that he'll be happy to take a job at the mine you operate. It all fits together, doesn't it, Paul? Making a pattern of escape for you. A simple but clever one. And all you have to do is be careful. Not let Joe become suspicious. It's almost one o'clock in the morning when you turn off the highway. Wave to the guard as you drive through the gates of the mine property and up to the house. Joe seems more relaxed now, doesn't he? But you know that you must be patient, go easy. And you try to be casual as you lead him into the house and back through the hall to the guest room. I hope you'll find this comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, it looks fine. We'll talk about your job in the morning. It's late. I don't want to wake the family. Sure. Well, good night, Joe. Just make yourself at home. Edith. Edith, wake up. Mm, what? Oh. Oh, you're back, Paul. Yes. Did, did you get the money? No, John didn't have it. 
fine brother. He didn't have it, that's all. Don't worry. Don't worry. How can I help it? Went through the books again tonight. There isn't any way to cover the shortage. You've used $14,000 of the company's money. Maybe so, Edith, but we're not beaten yet. Is Ruthie home? Yeah, she's asleep. Nothing on her mind. And she's not going to have either. I won't have her involved in this. Let me handle it my way. Like the way you handled the 14000 making those surefire investments? Well, you thought it was a great idea while I was doing it. Go wake Ruth and tell her to come in. There's something I want to discuss with both of you. Something important. All right, Paul. I hope you know what you're doing. Oh, hello, Dad. What's on your mind? I'm sorry to wake you, Ruth. Uh, it's all right. Something happened? No, honey. Did you have a nice time while I was gone? Oh, nothing unusual. Went bowling with Eddie, so a couple of movies. <laughs> Same old thing, you know. Paul, what did you want to tell us? Oh, yes, yes. Well... I wanted you to know tonight so there wouldn't be a lot of questions in front of Joe when you meet him in the morning. Joe? Who's Joe? Joe Webster. A very nice young man, Edith. He's he's going to work for me in the office. Oh, I see. He's going to live with us here in the house. In fact, he's up in the guest room right now. But Paul, here in the house, why would you have it's a It's very simple, Edith. I need help in the office. And you know how difficult it is to get a good man to come all the way out here. Uh, yes, but don't you think All that... I ask of you is to make him feel at home. Be nice to him. And don't ask too many questions. Questions? What do you mean? Well, it's just that, well, there's been a little uh, unhappiness in Joe's life. I'm sure he'd rather forget about it. Oh, okay, Dad. Whatever you say, if he's that important to you. He is, Ruth. Very important. <laughs> For the first time in months, you sleep peacefully that night, knowing that everything is going to turn out all right after all. And the next morning at breakfast, you're completely satisfied with the warm, friendly welcome Edith and Ruth give Joe. That's important, isn't it, Paul? Yes. Joe Webster must be happy here. He mustn't become restless and want to leave. Not until you're ready to put your plan into operation. And then after breakfast, you lead Joe down the path to the office. You think you're going to like it here, Joe? Yeah, I like it. So far, no complaints. I, uh... Maybe I'm wrong, but I sort of got the idea I'm supposed to go on living with you at the house. Is that right? Of course. I want you to feel right at home, Joe. Oh, it won't be hard. You got a nice family. There's only one thing bothers me. Well, what's that? You. What? Now, look, you don't know me. You pick me up off the highway, you give me a job. Next thing, I move right in like I'm one of the family. Why? Well, I... Now, don't tell me that you've always wanted a son. I couldn't take that. No, I'm not going to tell you. It's just that it's hard to get a young man to stay in an out-of-the-way place like this. Yeah, but why put me up in your own home? Just one more inducement. Hard to find good boarding places around here. Besides, it's convenient for me. I won't have to go looking for you if I want you after hours. Now, here we are. What have you got to lose by staying here, Joe? Nothing, I guess. Nothing at all. Mm. Ah, that desk over there will be yours, Joe. You want me to sit behind a desk? What's wrong with that? Look, put me on an engine. Give me a pick and shovel. Oh, but, Joe, I need you here in the office. Work isn't hard. Typing records, time cards, payrolls. I'm a little better with a bulldozer than a Remington. You learn anybody can do this work. It won't be too difficult, believe me. I still don't get it. Don't them. back down on me now. I need you here in the office. To be perfectly frank, I've been counting on it. You have? Well, if that's the way you want it, okay, but you may be sorry. <laughs> I don't think so, Joe. I don't think so at all. <laughs> And so another step in your plan has been successfully completed, hasn't it, Paul? Joe Webster has been installed in the company office. And now it's only a matter of time, a matter of waiting, a month or so, until you're ready to make the final move. But as the days go by, you notice with dismay that Joe is becoming restless, impatient with his new job. And you wonder, perhaps, if you're not going to be forced to bring things to a head quicker than you'd anticipated. 
You go out of your way to make everything pleasant as possible for him. Urging Ruth and Edith on, insisting that they keep him entertained. And then one afternoon at the end of the second week, as you return from an inspection tour of the mine, you step into the office. Joe! Joe! Panic suddenly sweeps over you. As you hurry across the office to the storeroom, you're certain now that the one thing you feared most has happened. Joe! Joe! Man Gate, Frank Nelson speaking. Johnny, have you seen Joe Webster? Webster? Yeah, Mr. Burns. He came through here a couple hours ago. One of the boys gave him a ride into town. Into town? Well, what for, do you know? Well, it beats me, Mr. Burns. Oh, he did ask me about the bus schedule, the Flagstaff. Maybe, maybe... The bus? Uh, I see. All right, all right, thanks. Slowly you cross the room and slump down into your chair behind the desk. He's gone. Joe Webster is gone and he won't be back. You're certain of that, aren't you, Paul? He's walked out on you. And your plan has collapsed. You stare at the date on your calendar, a date circled in red, little less than a month away. Only a miracle can save you now. You lean back in your chair and stare out the window. Watch the distant hills turn from gold to purple. And then fade from sight as darkness sweeps in over the desert. Then, wearily, you walk back up the path to the house. I was just going to call you. Dinner will be ready in a... Oh, where's Joe? He's gone, Ruthie. Gone? This afternoon. Oh, but why did he say... He left without a word. Oh, I see. Well, that's that. Uh, dinner will be ready in a few minutes. All right, Ruthie. All right. Paul. Hmm? Why don't you eat your dinner? Oh, uh, I'm not hungry. Oh, nonsense. Now, you eat your dinner. Joe walked out on you, he walked out, that's all. Brooding about it won't bring him back. It's not that. I'm just not hungry. Uh, Dad? Yes? Did Joe mean so much to you that leaving upset you so that you can't even eat? Oh, no, no, of course not. I, I'm just tired, that's all. Really? Uh, Dad, I... Oh, what was that? The front door. Somebody just... Joe! Sorry to be late. Joe, I, I thought you'd left us. Well, things were kind of quiet around the office this afternoon. I didn't think you'd mind if I went into town. Had to buy a couple of things. Oh? Oh, of course. Yeah, I figured as long as I was going to be a white-collar worker, I ought to look the part. Joe, you haven't had your dinner? No, I haven't. I uh, expected to get back earlier, but I had a little trouble picking up a ride. Well, sit down, Joe. I'll, I'll get you a place. So you thought I'd walked out, huh? Oh, yes. Yeah. The guard at the main gate told me you'd asked about the bus schedules, and I thought you'd walked out on me. You want to know something? Huh? I was walking out on you, but I changed my mind before I got to the bus depot. I figured it'd be a lot smarter move for me if I stayed. Good, I... I'm glad you changed your mind. You have no idea how glad I really am, Joe. You're certain you know why Joe Webster changed his mind, aren't you, Paul? Because he realized he'd be better off here, hiding out at the Silver Canyon Mine, rather than risk capture on the open highway traveling from town to town. Yes, you're greatly relieved now that he's back. But you're not going to take any more chances. You're going to move swiftly before Joe has the opportunity to change his mind again. That night after dinner, as the four of you are drinking your coffee, you decide to waste no time in setting up your next move. But that means working with Edith alone, and somehow you've got to get rid of Joe and your daughter Ruth for a few hours. Look, uh, why don't you youngsters drive into town? See a show or something, huh? I'd love to, but... Well, maybe Joe doesn't feel no, like it. Oh, that sounds okay to me. I could stand a movie. How swell. You might show Joe around town, Ruthie. It's not much of a place, Joe, but, well... Not the place. 
it's who you're with. Ready, Ruth? Uh, I'll get my coat. Why don't you bring the car around? Uh, be careful driving, Joe. Ruth is my pride and joy. She's all we have. Okay. Uh, have a nice time. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. What are you up to, Paul? As soon as they've gone, I'll run down to the office and get the books, Edith. We've a lot of work to do. <sighs> Wish I knew what you had on your mind. You will, my dear. But the auditors will be here in a month. Less than that. I've tried not to worry. Listen to me, Edith. It's all going to work out. We'll be in the clear. All we have to do is fix the books. But how? We'll arrange the books so that the money that's missing will be listed as cash on hand. <sighs> what good will that do? When the auditors go to the safe, they won't find the money. Then what? Don't worry. I'll be able to account for it. Every penny of it. Two days later, you decide the moment has arrived at last. You can't delay another minute. Yes, everything is quite in order now, isn't it, Paul? Throughout the day, you fight to remain calm, unconcerned. And that evening, as you retire to your room upstairs, you don't sleep. You listen to the clock tick away the minutes. Your eyes are wide open. The hours drag on. And then shortly before two in the morning, you slip out of bed and dress quickly. Moments later, you hurry to Joe's room. Joe. Joe. Huh? 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 What, what do you want? Joe, keep your voice down. Listen to me. What's the matter? Shh. The sheriff was here looking for you. Sheriff, what did he say? Nothing much, except that your name wasn't really Joe Webster. Yeah, well, look, I... I, I wanna... No, no, I don't want to know any more about it. I don't care what you've done, Joe. Right now, you've got to get out of here. Yeah, yeah, sure. I told the sheriff you were probably hanging around town. Now, you have to hurry because he'll probably be coming back. I don't figure you at all. Don't try to. Here, the key to my car. You can park it at the water stop north of town. There'll be plenty of freight trains. Thanks. And take this, Joe. Two hundred dollars. You'll need every cent of it. I don't know why you're doing this, but thanks anyway. Just call it a bonus, Joe. I'll go back to the office now in case the sheriff comes back. No, wait a minute. How am I going to get past that guard at the gate in your car? He might have been tipped off. Don't worry, son. I'll take care of it. You'll get through. Now hurry. You leave him to finish dressing. Slip out of the house and hurry to the office. He fell for your act without any hesitation, didn't he, Paul? Exactly as you'd planned. And once he's out of the gate and on his way, your worries will be over. As you wait in the darkened office, you begin to wonder why Joe is taking so long. And then finally, you hear the car start up behind the house. A minute or so later, it races past the office. You wait another half minute and then pick up the phone and call the guard at the gate. Main gate, car speaking. Hello? Main gate. Hello? Quickly, you move across the office to the window. Hold your breath as you peer out into the darkness. Then you see them. The headlights on the highway. Your timing was perfect, wasn't it, Paul? Drawing the guard away from the gate to answer the phone made it possible for Joe to speed through without being stopped or questioned. Now there's only one thing left to do. You step to the telephone. Sheriff's office, Mikhail speaking. Sheriff, this is Paul Burns at the Silver Canyon Mine. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's up, Mr. Burns? There's been a robbery here. The safe's been cleaned out. Over $14,000. What? My car is gone, too. I guess that woke me up. I heard it start up. Well, any idea who Yes, was? yes. I'm afraid it's a young man I had working here in the office. Joe Webster. He's gone. All right, Mr. Burns. Uh, let me have the license number of your car. And don't worry. He won't get far. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word to you drivers. While watching some Christmas shoppers this morning, the thought occurred to me, if people would only choose their gasoline as carefully as they select Christmas gifts, a lot more drivers would be using Signal gasoline. And for good reasons. One, of course, is Signal's good mileage, which has made Signal gasoline known throughout the Pacific Coast states from Canada to Mexico 
as the go-farther gasoline. But equally important to you is the proud performance in today's signal gasoline, which naturally goes hand-in-hand with mileage. After all, the only way today's signal can give such good mileage is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you also enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother power, the things that make driving more pleasure. That's why Signal says to be sure of all the things you expect of a quality gasoline, you have just two things to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. Yes, Paul. You're quite pleased with yourself, aren't you? As you sit in the mine office waiting for the news of Joe Webster's capture. News that will spell out your final victory. Then you can wake Edith. Tell her the shortage in the books has been covered. And you're certain she won't blame you. For Joe Webster, alias Joe Norbella is wanted for murder anyway. And one more crime won't make much difference. It's true they'll never find the missing money. But as far as the company is concerned, it'll be accounted for. Then shortly before dawn, a car grinds to a stop in front of the office. And a moment later, the sheriff enters. Morning, Mr. Burns. Morning. Did you get him, Sheriff? Yep. Picked him up about an hour after you called. Oh, you have no idea what a shock this is to me. I never dreamed he'd do such a thing. Well, this may be another shock. Huh? He only had a couple of hundred dollars on him. A couple of hundred dollars? But... There's more than 14,000. Maybe he hid the rest somewhere. Don't worry. If he did, we'll find it. I hope so. Might interest you to know Joe Webster's wanted by the L.A. police on a murder charge. Murder? Mm-hmm. His real name's Norbella. Pretty smart operator, so they tell me. Yeah. He was a fool to try this, even with an accomplice. Accomplice? Yeah, we had to book both of them. But Joe didn't have any... Norbella claims he was framed. Says you gave him the 200. He's lying. Well, that's what I figured. Too bad, too, because if Norbella was framed, we might save his accomplice. Why? If they were together, they were guilty. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Too bad, though. What do you mean? Well, this is going to shock you, Mr. Burns. The accomplice I spoke of is your own daughter, Ruth. Says they were running away to be married. Ruth? Married? That's right. I know she's everything in the world to you, Oh, but... no, Sheriff. Not Ruthie. She's innocent. I framed Joe Norbella. I gave him the $200. Sit down. I'll tell you the whole story. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you that those Salvation Army kettles you'll be passing between now and Christmas will provide Yuletide cheer for over a million needy men, women, and children. Even a few pennies that you'll never miss will help to make this Christmas merrier for someone less fortunate. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Ed Begley. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Sterling Tracy. With story by Bernard Girard and music by Wilbur Hatch. And was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That Whistle.
is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Stormy Weather. As Kitty Gabron stood at the window of her husband's office, 19 floors above the street, she could have seen the black edge of cloud on the horizon. But Kitty wasn't looking for a storm. No, for at this moment she was as happy as she could ever be. Forgotten were the one-night stands, the dirty dressing rooms, the cheap hotels and long hours of rehearsals. All that remained of those seven years, she spent as an actress, with a grace, the poise that she'd learned so well. The ways of talking, looking, and walking that had first attracted Dr. Rim's cabin. Yes, something good had come out of those bitter years. A home, security, and love. But at this moment, Kitty had no way of knowing that, that all this, everything she'd worked for, would soon be threatened. And now, as the first distant rumble of thunder drifted in through the open window... Kitty's laughter covered up the sound. Oh, Rim. Rim, darling, please. What's this? Resist me, will you? Now, see here, young lady, you're the only wife I've ever had in only three months of that. And you'll have to expect to be kissed every time you come into my office. What will Miss Anderson say if she happens to open the door? What every good nurse should say when she catches the doctor kissing his wife. Nothing. You told me yourself, doctors have to be respectable to stay in business. Come here. Oh, Rim. Friends, darling, I do love you so very much. I don't think I ever really lived until I found you, Kitty. Such a charming liar. You never needed me at all, really. You've always had your work. Work? Hmm. My patients have been in jeopardy ever since I first met you. <laughs> Why, I... Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Mr. Gunther, please. Oh, fine. Uh, in a minute, Miss Anderson. No. Doctor will see Mr. Gunther right now. All right, all right. That's what I get for having an office in the Star Times building. Right across from the city editor, and he always has a headache. And you're the best brain surgeon in the world. You take good care of Mr. Gunther. Bye, darling. Bye. Hiya, Doc. Hey, I got that headache again, and... Oh, excuse me, I... Hello, Mrs. Gabbin. Didn't know you were here. I was just leaving, Mr. Gunther. Well, don't rush off on my account. I... Hello, Gunther. What are you doing here, Niles? Your secretary said you stepped across the hall, so I trailed over. Why don't you introduce me, Gunther? You used to introduce me to all your friends. Uh, this is Niles Keating, Dr. and Mrs. Gabbin. How do you do? I am particularly interested in meeting Mrs. Gabbin. What? Now, see here, Niles, this is downright impolite. Sure, but then I never made much copy as a gentleman. Dr. and Mrs. Gabbin, I must apologize. Niles is a former business acquaintance of mine, and I... And now he's a rum hound who can't get a job on any paper in the country. I beg your pardon, Doctor. Mrs. Gabbard, I was rude. Now that everyone's unbearably uncomfortable, I'll leave. I'll wait in your office, Constance. Don't bother. Suit yourself. I'm terribly sorry. Mrs. Gabbard, I have no idea. Oh, oh that's quite all right. Forget it, Gunther. I, um... Uh, I think I'll run along, Rims. I'll see you at dinner. All right, darling. Bye, Mrs. Gabbard. Oh, uh... Oh, Kitty. Yes? Be careful driving home. 
Looks like we're in for a bit of stormy weather. Yes. Yes, it does. Suddenly, there's a cloud over the sun, and the sky grows dark and ugly. But it isn't the storm that worries you, is it, Kitty? It's the tall, unshaven man named Niles Keating. There's something familiar about him. A grim, frightening shadow who somehow seems to belong to your past. As you step out of the elevator and hurry out into the street, a gust of cold wind envelops you and shudder. Then as you cross to the parking lot, you see Niles Keating lounging against the side of the building, watching you with that same odd, cold look. You're gonna need an umbrella. I... I have my car. A green one? Yes. I had one like that once. Now I walk. Can I drop you off anywhere, Mr. Keating? I remember when you didn't have a car. Oh? We've met before? Not exactly. We, uh, had a mutual friend. A guy you knew before you met the doc. Your name was Kitty James then, wasn't it? Before I was married, yes. Before you had a nice, shiny new car like this one. Yeah. It's real classy. Smooth lines. It's, uh, just the kind of a car for a doll like you, Kitty. You've been drinking, Mr. Keaton. Sure. Sure. I've been doing it for five years. What do you want of me? Maybe we could do a little talking. About what? Well, I could give you a thumbnail sketch of myself as a starter. Niles Keating. Used to be a pretty big name in the business. Good job, nice apartment, nice friends. You know where I live now? No, but I'm Room not... over a garage. I dug up the wrong story one day, five years ago. A reporter shouldn't do that. Wash me up fast. You know what I've been doing since? Really, Mr. Keaton? Working. I'm... Covering all kinds of stories. None of them ever written up, mind you, but I've been on the job every day. Every day looking for one story that put me back in the business. I'm sure you'll find it. I have, Kitty. I have found it. That's fine, but I'm not interested. It's about one of those successful people who used to come around to see me. A guy named Tim Brady. Tim Brady? Remember him? I... No. Oh, cut it out, sweetheart. Cut it out. Come on, let's ease into your little green wagon and go for a ride. Uh, maybe you'll buy me a drink, huh? You, you pick the place. Okay, I'll pick. <laughs> As you drive through the downpour with Niles Keating by your side, the fear within you grows steadily, like the fury of the storm outside. And the nightmare, the horror of that evening weeks ago, returns to you now. The night when Tim Brady died. Your car moves slowly along the rain-swept streets. And occasionally you glance at the figure of the man in the trench coat, slumped down in the seat beside you. There's the bare trace of a smile on his lips as he stares into the storm. And you wonder how much he knows what he'll say. You're afraid he knows all about you. Yet you wait in silence. Wait for him to make the first move. There's still a chance he's guessing, isn't there, Kitty? The minutes drag on. You sit behind the wheel, tense. Waiting. Waiting. And then as you leave the downtown traffic behind you... <laughs> <laughs> relax, baby. You're holding onto that wheel like you were afraid it's going to get away from you. Relax, relax. Here, uh, have a cigarette. Thank you, no. Okay. Now, uh, about that drink, I know a nice, cute I've little I've been waiting spot. for you to talk, Mr. Keating. What's on your mind? Tim Brady, a racketeer, but a pretty good guy in some ways. Too bad he got himself killed one night in his apartment. I read all about it in the papers. Gang killing, wasn't it? Well, the police figured a guy named Dutch Jensen had done it. He was seen in the neighborhood that night. He and Brady weren't very close pals. Dutch got his a week later, trying to get away from the cops. 
He died before they could get anything out of him about the Brady shooting. The police were convinced he'd done it. Sure, sure. So, after Brady's funeral, a kid sister of his back in Duluth asked me to go over to Tim's apartment and close it up. Send her Tim's stuff. So I did. I, uh, happened to find something in the apartment. Oh? You see, the apartment manager described a woman who'd been to see Tim the night he was killed. Her description fits yours to a T. Sure, the cops were certain Dutch was the killer, but the newspapers saw another angle. They figured this woman might have been a very close friend of Tim's. Maybe she... Yes, I, um, I read about that, too. The papers called her the mystery woman. It's corny, but good copy. Never did locate her, though. It would make a great story if somebody could tell them who she was. You, uh, look cold. The storm bother you? What do you know about the mystery woman? I can tell them exactly who she is. Who? You. That's stupid. Is it? Who would believe you? You said yourself you can't get a job on any newspaper because... That was then. This is now. You have proof, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. A woman's glove. I found it stuffed down between the sofa cushions. Took me quite a while to trace that glove, Kitty. Department stores, cleaning establishments, just like in the movies. That, I suppose, proves I was there that night. Well, I wasn't sure you were. Not until a few minutes ago. But I am now, Kitty. Uh, look, pull over the curb and let me off. I can use the drink even if you can. Listen to me. I hadn't seen Tim Brady in over three years. I only went there that night because I wanted to get some letters I'd written him before I met Rim. Foolish, girlish letters. There was no trouble. He gave them to me. Sure, sure, sure. Pull over, huh? I tell you, it's the truth. I don't care why you wanted to see him. The point is, you were there. Well, what do you expect to get out of this? A headline that's going to read, Mystery Woman Found, Doctor's Wife Implicated in Brady Case. Mr. Keating, perhaps we can make some arrangements. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Save it. I'm not a blackmailer, Kitty. I'm a newspaper man, and this story will put me back in the league. I've already left a message with Gunther's secretary telling him I have all the proof he needs. In another hour, I'll tell him who the mystery woman is. Please, please listen to him. You're wasting your time, sweetheart. Dig up some old files on me. You'll find I'm just as bad as you think I am. With the prologue of Stormy Weather, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. One evening recently, while doubling in the role of babysitter, I was telling our neighbor's little son about Santa Claus, how Santa comes all the way down from the North Pole nonstop. Gosh, Marvin, the little fellow exclaimed, Santa Claus must use that famous go farther gasoline you talk about on the radio. <laughs> Well, reluctantly, I had to admit that Santa uses a sleigh powered by reindeer. But if Santa did use gasoline, you can bet that he'd be interested in Signal's good mileage. And since Santa knows quality, he'd certainly appreciate Signal's quick cold weather starting, Signal's lively pickup, Signal's smoothest skating power. That's why you can put Marvin Miller on record as saying, if Santa ever trades Prancer and Dancer and Dunder and Blitzen for a car... I predict Mr. Claus will power it with Signal, the famous go farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. (laughs) 
And so, the one-time crack newspaper man, Niles Keating, has stepped into your life, Kitty. And suddenly, everything that was so sure, so certain, has vanished. He knows that you're the much-sought-after mystery woman in the Brady killing. And soon, the whole story will appear on the front pages of every newspaper in the country. As you watch him walk away from your car, half stumble along the rain-swept street. You know this means the end of everything you've wanted and worked for. But there's still a chance you can make him stop the story, plead with him. And then as you open your car door, you hear the screech of brakes. Look out! And look up in time to see a car bear down on him. I wasn't watching where he was going. Watching against the light. Who is he? I don't know. I think I've seen him get out of that green car over there. Anybody call an ambulance? Stand away, everybody. Huh? Let me look. Let me look. Hey, mister. Mister. Hey. This guy's hurt bad. Real bad. Yeah. He sure is. Look at him. He stepped right in front of my car. I tell you. We've seen it, Mac. Is he, uh, is he a friend of yours, lady? Hi. No. I never saw him before in my life. You step back into the crowd. Wait with him until the ambulance arrives. Watch as a white-coated young intern examines Keating's head injuries and then carefully assists in loading him into the ambulance. As they drive off with him, Kitty, you, you suddenly find yourself admitting that you're glad it happened. Gabron, thought you'd never get home. Goodness, I hope you didn't get soaked. I'm sorry I'm late, Hilda. I was too late. I was just getting ready to leave your note, ma'am. You may go now if you wish. Oh, thank you, Miss Gabron. Dinner's all cooked. All you have to do is warm up. Miss Gabron, you feel all right? Yes, yes, of course. You look so pale. I'm just tired, Hilda. Oh, can I fix you something before I go? A cup of hot tea. No, no, thanks. Sure. I'll, I'll be fine. I'll rest until the doctor comes home. You run along now. Mm-hmm. All right, Tim. See you in the morning, Miss Gavin. Goodbye, Hilda. Bye. Yes? Hello? Hello? Is this Dr. Gavin's residence? Yes. This is Mrs. Gavin speaking. Oh, oh, Mrs. Gavin, I didn't recognize your voice. Uh, this is Miss Anderson at the doctor's office. Yes? Could I speak to the doctor, please? Why, I thought he was at the office. He left more than two hours ago. Said he was going to make a hospital call and then go right home early. Well, I can have him call you. It's very urgent. I tried to locate Lucas and Desmond, but they're both out of town. The hospital's been calling every five minutes. What is it, Miss Anderson? An accident case at City Hospital. I'm afraid Dr. Gavin is the only man equipped to operate. I'll tell Rims as soon as he gets in. You better have him call the hospital direct. All right. And whom shall he ask for? Surgery. The patient is Mr. Niles Keating. Keating? Yes, Mr. Gunther's friend. He was hurt this afternoon. Oh. Oh, oh I forgot you met him. And Rim? Dr. Gabrin is the only one who can operate? Yes, if Dr. Gabrin gets to him in time. He has a chance. <laughs> It's almost more than you can bear, isn't it, Kitty? Too much for one day that began so perfectly, only to turn into a wild nightmare of confusion. Your mind spins. The room seems to go in and out of focus until everything goes black before your eyes. What happened? What happened, Kitty? What's the matter, darling? Rim. Oh, Rim, it is you. Yes, darling. What happened? I... I guess I found it. Oh, Rim. Oh, hold me, darling. Hold me tight. Of course, of course. Never let me go, never. Of course not. Oh, Rim. Oh, poor darling. I don't look after you. I should. I, I just hold me. I, I'm so frightened. Now, there's nothing to be frightened about, and there's no reason you should be trembling. I'm such a fool. 
it was so silly of me to faint. I came home and had a slight hit. I'll take care of that in a minute, darling. I'm always so busy taking care of other people, I forgot the most important one. Now on, darling, I'm spending a lot more time with you. Uh, here you are, Kitty. Grim's what? No, no, you just take this and help calm you. But I... Go on, doctor's orders. Oh, all right. Here, I'll take the glass. You just sit back and relax. Oh, I love you so much. I love you too, Kitty. I'm here, darling. You feeling better? Oh, I... I must have fallen asleep. Huh? That was a sedative I gave you. You dropped right off. Grim. Hey, what's the matter? How long have I been asleep? Oh, about two hours. Two hours? No, no, sit back. Rims, wait, I... I Don't I've say got anything to... now, honey. Just relax. Like the fire? Oh, uh, yes, yes, it's nice, but I've and got... And it's going out on us if I don't get some more wood. I'll have to go back to the shed. Be right back. Rims, wait. Uh, uh... Seems we have a caller. I'll answer it. No, don't trouble, Kitty. I don't want you to... No, know. I feel fine, Rims, really. You get the wood. I'll answer the door. Well, all right. You wait, Kitty, making sure that your husband is outside the house before you go to the door. But as you open it, the dark, heavy figure in the shiny raincoat glances at you accusingly. It's Gunther, the city editor, and you wonder how much he knows. Hello, Mrs. Gabbard. Hello. Sorry I didn't answer right away. I, I was sleeping. Oh, this has been quite a night for me. But running all over town looking for your husband. I phoned here several times, but I kept getting a busy signal. Oh? Is he here? No. Well, guess my trip was for nothing then. Is there anything I can do for you? It's about Keating. Hospital phone you, I guess. They tell me Dr. Gabbard's the only one that can do the job. Yes, that's, uh, that's what Miss Anderson said. Do you have any idea where he could be? No. That seems funny. Darn funny. You're very concerned for Mr. Keating? Well, he worked for me once. We never got along, but he's a good newspaper man. That's what he said. When? Oh, I mean, that's what I gathered. Huh. Well, Keating came to me a couple of days ago about a story. Said he found the mystery woman, the uh, Brady case, you know. I told him I'd have to have proof, and he said he'd get it. Apparently he did. Uh, then this accident happens. And you haven't got your story? Ah, uh, none of it. Well, if the doctor comes in, you'll let him know what's what. Naturally. Keating will die if he isn't operated on soon, Mrs. Gabrin. Well, goodbye. Yes, Kitty. Niles Keating will die if he isn't operated on soon. And if he is operated on, he'll tell the story that will identify you as the mystery woman in the Brady case. You stand by the door for a long moment after Gunther drives off in the rain. And then, when you turn around, you're looking into the quiet, questioning eyes of your husband. You can tell him the truth now, Kitty, or you can let Niles Keating die. And your secret will die with him. Who was that at the door, Kitty? It was just a man. He had the wrong address. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a reminder about a faithful friend who I'll bet you've left off your Christmas list, your car. Christmas, you know, is really a swell excuse to give the faithful chariot some of those things it's been needing. Things that pay you back later in extra driving pleasure. What more, your signal dealer has just what Santa ordered. For instance, rugged new tires by Lee of Conshohocken to replace your smooth, dangerous old tires. Powerful new Signal Deluxe batteries, guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. Or how about a set of new Champion Spark Plugs for quicker cold weather starting and more pep? These are just a few of the useful practical items for your car 
that you'll find at your signal dealer. You see, signal service stations are much more than just headquarters for the famous go-farther gasoline. In addition, each signal dealer carries a complete line of fine quality automotive accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now back to the Whistler. It's all over, isn't it, kid? And with the coming of the dawn, calm and clear, you sit alone quietly. You keep telling yourself that you've made the right decision. The hours drag on and you wait. Then a door opens quietly. Footsteps move past, white-clad figures. And suddenly Rims is standing by your side. Come on in, Kitty. He's out of it now. He's all right? Yes. Yes, he's fine. Oh, Rims. Steady, darling. Hello, Mrs. Cabra. Hey, they tell me your husband did quite a job on me. He saved your life. I suppose I should say thanks. I was glad to be of service, Keating. It's my job. Yeah, sure. We've all got our jobs to do. You can thank my wife, too. She told me about you. She drove me here in time to operate. I'm still a reporter, Doc. My job is to get news, not censor it. On the way over here, she also told me all about the Brady affair. The story you're going to print. Does that surprise you, Keating? Uh, let's say I didn't expect her to do it, Doc. I've always told Rims everything. Sorry I didn't tell him about Brady long ago. You were innocent, or why didn't you? Because I was afraid he might not believe me. I'm sure your readers wouldn't. Uh-huh. Tim had just given me the letters when the doorbell rang. He told me to wait in the kitchen while he answered. And then there was a shot. I got panicky and ran out the back way. And the next morning I read that Tim was dead. Naturally, you'd say something like that. I believe what she says, Keating. You see, I know Kitty, and I've read the letters. Hello, Doc. Say, I heard Keating's came around. Uh, yes, Gunther, but he can't be disturbed until tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I know, it. I know, but i got to get a story. Only take now, a minute. Now, wait a minute. You can't see him. Come on, Niles. The mystery woman, who is she? You know, Gunther, the Doc and I were just discussing that. What? It's a funny thing. When that car hit me, I... Got an awful wallop. I can't seem to remember a thing, Godfrey. Amnesia, I guess. Too bad, huh? Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you that those Salvation Army kettles you'll be passing between now and Christmas will provide Yuletide cheer for over a million needy men, women, and children. Even a few pennies that you'll never miss will help to make this Christmas merrier for someone less fortunate. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Lorette Philbrandt, William Conrad, and David Ellis. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by E. Jack Newman and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking... This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Hang... It was boredom that got Lee Ryan into it in the first place. His train out of Chicago for the West Coast was moving slow, with further delays expected because of the snowstorms ahead. Yes, he was bored and impatient. His last business venture in Chicago hadn't paid off too well, and he looked forward to his arrival in California and the prospects of a deal worthy of his talents. Lee decided that the club car might help pass the time. It did. The car was crowded, and he found himself sitting with a talkative man who seemed to know many things about many people, including a number of their fellow passengers. He was a reporter, a man whom Lee had known casually over a period of years, a reporter who apparently loved to report, and he talked to Lee confidentially as if to his city editor. Oh, you picked a great choo-choo, Lee. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm glad I'm getting off. You can carry on for me. How do you mean? Well, you can follow Lloyd, Jeff Larkin. There's no story there as far as my newspaper concerned. The city editor's washing it up. Larkin? That sounds familiar. Yeah, I bet he looks that way, too. Hey, uh, right over there with that girl. Oh, she's not bad. Huh? Oh, she's just like all the rest. Hanging around him thinking he's going to get that money. Money? Oh, you didn't recognize him, eh? An ex-con. But I knew him when he was a big, big man. And who's late? Anybody's. Time had happened, he was the brains. Yeah. Well, that's what they say. He'd planned the robberies, and his partner, Noisy Nevins, pulled them off. Oh, great team, great team. Oh, Noisy Nevins, huh? The nitroglycerin artist. Yes, sir. Oh, Noisy could blow a safe door off, clean as a housewife, and open a can of pee. Oh, sure, and I'm with you. They used to work together. But the last big job they pulled, a $100,000 bank job. Larkin got careless. <laughs> he also got five years. Who got the 100000 Oh, it disappeared, and so did Nevins. That's why I've been tagging Larkin around ever since he walked out of that pen six months ago. Your paper figured he'd meet Nevins, split the dough. <laughs> That's right. Only my paper was wrong. Larkin knows from nothing where that dough is. And noisy? Oh, he's quiet now as they get. And permanent, too. Oh. Yeah, I got that way about a month ago. I think it was an auto accident out in Frisco. Ah, it was too bad. Nevins was probably the only guy in the world who knew where that money was. You figure he stashed it away somewhere? Right. Absolutely right. A hundred thousand dollars, and it stays stashed. Mm. Well, that poor girl wasting her time with luck, and somebody should tell her. Yes, a hundred grand. Unmarked bills. Negotiable as a mud puddle on a pogo stick. Uh-huh. <laughs> Say, you know what's a funny thing? Why, when I was a kid, I could never manage one of those things. Oh, no? No. Well, I was pretty good. Oh, you kidding me? Yeah. Really? <laughs> well, I'll be seeing you, pal. Happy as scoops. Well, <laughs> don't worry about me. I'm getting off the next stop. My, uh, my best of luck, and if you should run into him... Yeah, I'll remember. And I just might run into him. Interesting, isn't it, Lee? A man with $100,000. Only he doesn't know where it is. It was hidden away by a partner who's dead now. All very interesting. Yes. 
And you think about it a lot after you leave your reporter friend in the club car. Wonder if he's right. If that girl really is going to be disappointed. It's hours later that you feel the train grind to a stop. Glance out of your compartment to see that you've pulled onto a siding at a small town station. A porter. What's wrong? Why are we stopping? Hey, it won't be for long, sir. It's, it's just the snow. Oh, yes. Now, there's time to get off for a while if you want to. Some of the passengers are. We'll be here about an hour. Oh, thank you. I don't think I'll bother. Instead of leaving the train, you walk back to the observation platform. Stand there, looking off toward the few lights of the small, slumbering town of Springdale. You find yourself wondering about Jeff Larkin again and the girl. And then as the train is ready to move on, you see her, approaching alone from the direction of town. It's a chance to speak to her, isn't it, Lee? On impulse, you decide to take it. You start for the boarding platform at the end of the car and reach it as she comes up the steps. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... It's all right. Oh, no, you've dropped your purse. Here. Please, never mind. I insist. You bend down quickly, begin to retrieve the articles that have spilled from her purse. One you can't help noticing. It's a picture postcard addressed to Mr. Jeff Larkin. General Delivery, Chicago. Give me that. Give it to me. Why, certainly, certainly. Here you are. Sorry, but I'm in a hurry. Thank you very much. Afraid your boyfriend might miss you? My... Boyfriend? I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, I just thought you were kind of chummy with a fellow in the club car. You're mistaken. Someone happened to sit with me because the car was crowded. Oh, sure, sure. That's happened to me, too. Forget it. There's nothing to forget. Good night. Night. She wasn't very cooperative, was she, Lee? And you wonder why. Wonder also about the card addressed to Larkin. Why she got so excited about it. The next morning, following the stop at Denver, you find out. Yes, conductor? I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Ryan, but we've been questioning all the passengers. Questioning them? About what? Oh, I- I'm sorry. This is Lieutenant Knowles, Denver Police. Lieutenant? To explain quickly, Mr. Ryan, a man a few compartments down from you has been murdered. On this train? No, happened at a place called Springdale. When we uh, pulled into a siding, Mr. Ryan. Oh, I remember. We, we stopped for about an hour. Yeah, that's the place. During that hour, the victim, a man named Jeff Larkin... Larkin? You know him? Oh, no, no. I, I've heard of him, that's all. Mm, I guess a lot of people have. Anyway, Larkin got off the train for some reason and never got back on. His body was found a short time later in an alley at the edge of town. He'd been shot. Poor devil. Uh, we've been trying to find someone who got off with him or talked to him just before. No luck so far. But now, the young lady in 29, Miss Clinton, says she spoke to Larkin earlier in the club car. But that's the last she saw of him. Oh, she, uh, she didn't get off at Springdale? No, no. She says she stayed in her compartment the whole time. I see. And you, Ryan? Well, I walked back to the observation car. I was there all... Twenty minutes or so. But you didn't observe anything. No, no, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I didn't observe a thing. And now back to the whistler. You don't have to wonder anymore about the girl you saw with Jeff Larkin. It all fits, doesn't it? Reporter's story about hundreds of people who a deserted alley back in Springdale. The girls claim that she didn't see Larkin leave the train. And that she herself didn't get off. You know different, don't you, Lee? And the knowledge gives you absolute confidence when you reach Los Angeles, check into the same hotel that she does, and then half an hour later call her room. Hello? Hello, Julie. Oh, a friend of yours, a good friend. We, uh, met on the train. The train? I didn't meet anyone who I... Well, you met Jeff Larkin, Julie. You got real chummy. Like I once said. Oh. Well, are you still there, Julie? Yes. Well, stay there, huh? I'm coming down to your room so we can talk. Now, wait a minute. Now, you wait a minute, Julie. That's all it'll take me. Well, the name is Lee Ryan, and Julie... 
Yes. I like my martinis very dry. Well, don't expect too much, Mr. Ryan. I haven't any ice. <laughs> no, give me that. So far, it's all you've had. Just, uh, use that cold shoulder of yours. Have it right down. I, uh, I don't do this for everybody, Mr. Ryan. I don't lie for everybody. Really, you're mistaken about that. Oh, is that so? Yeah, the drink looks good. I think yours looks better. Let's switch, shall we? Cagey. Hmm? Suits me. Oh, it's good. Now, to the business at hand, Julie. <sighs> Sounds terribly boring. Oh, I'm not nearly as bored as I was when I started this trip. Things are beginning to look up. That's why I didn't tell that police detective that you got off that train. They couldn't resist a certain possibility. Namely? That you know something. Look, I, uh... I don't care about Larkin. But what were you after? What's that, uh... What's that address unknown, Julie? That spot where... Nevin stashed that hundred grand. Uh, hey, hey, I got it. What have you got, Mr. Ryan? A postcard, that picture on it. Someplace up north. Mother Lode Country Silver City, wasn't it? You're talking thick, Mr. Ryan. Hey, what did you do? What did you put in this? In my drink? I'm getting dizzy, Joey. I had you figured perfectly smart, boy. You shouldn't have switched drinks with me. But you'll be all right. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan, are you all right? Should I get the doctor? No, no, no doctor. I'm okay. Where is she? The young lady who called about you? She's gone, checked out. Gone where? She was going to catch a train, I believe. I'm, I'm not sure. She was just leaving her room when she saw you out here in the hall. Well, give me a plane schedule. I want to go to Silver City. Silver City? I don't believe the plane's landing. All right, they'll get me close enough. I'll go if I have to crawl the rest of the way. Yes, sir. Anything you say. It's as far as the stage goes, mister. Silver City. Here's your drink, mister. Thanks. Like I was saying, Silver City's real quiet during the day, but it'll open up round sundown. That's when the boys start drifting in from hang trees. It, oh, say, you was asking me about the stage. There she is, just pulled up in front of the hotel. Uh, you wouldn't be waiting for that little lady with the suitcase just got off, would you? I sure would, Pop. Yeah, <laughs> classy. Oh, here's your change. I gave you some silver in case you want to play the slot machine. Oh, there's no need to. I just hit the jackpot. As you sit there at the bar, watch Julie enter the hotel across the street. You congratulate yourself, don't you, Lee? Your trip to Silver City paid off, with a bigger payoff yet to come. A quarter of an hour later, you see Julie leave the hotel. Watch her as she enters a cafe halfway down the block. Quickly, you leave the bar and hurry into the hotel. Say, clerk, I've been expecting someone, a young lady. She was supposed to arrive on the bus. Oh, Miss Clayton. Why, yes, yeah, she checked in a little while ago. A roommate. Oh, good. But she ain't in now. Oh. Oh, well, I'll see you later. Say, let me have your pass key, will you? I've left my key in my room. I'll bring it right back. Mm, well, okay. Just a sec. I'll get it for you. Moments later, you slip into Julie's room. Quickly, you go through her suitcase and pocket the gun. Then as you turn, your eye catches sight of something on the dresser. It's the postcard. The same one Julie dropped on the train. The card addressed to the late Jeff. It boasts a picture of historic Hang Tree Cemetery of Silver City. On the back, you can barely make out the handwriting. Dear Jeff, be sure to look me up when you're out this way. Hope to see you soon. Johnny Burgess. Johnny Burgess? I gotta know more about him. Bur 
religious. Yeah. Well, how do you like that? Your uh, friend was in here asking about him. My friend? Mm Mm-hmm. Lady got off the bus a little while ago. Uh Asked me if Johnny Burgess had been in lately. (laughs) You know something? Johnny Burgess died over 50 years ago. What? Mm, Yeah. Silver Johnny, they called him. Big man. Another big man? Mm, Yes, sir. Owned the mine. Town, too. Yes, sir. You uh, been out to the cemetery? The cemetery? Johnny's got the fanciest resting place of them all. Heard it cost over $10,000. Big granite crypt, got a life-size statue of Johnny on top, and... What's the matter, young fella? Oh, nothing, nothing. Uh, look, how do you get out there to the, the cemetery? Oh, easy. Just go right down the end of C Street here, then turn left by the Signal Oil Station, go up the road. You'll see a tree top of the hill. That's old hang tree. Right beyond it, other side of the hill, real handy likes the cemetery. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> You're out of breath when you finally reach the old cemetery. As you start down the hill, you notice a handful of people moving about the tombstones. Tourists, Lee. Yes, they're all about you, peering at the time-worn inscriptions on the tombstones, taking snapshots. Then you notice someone else. Yes, there she is, standing before a massive vault, staring at the statue on top of it. Quite a gent, wasn't he, Julie? What? Don't look so surprised, baby. Oh. What are you doing here? I'm writing a book on the Old West. Now, what are you doing here? You, uh... You won't believe this. I'll try. A book, too. About Johnny Burgess? That's right. Yeah, a remarkable character, Burgess. I understand that broken-down pile of rocks there, that crypt, cost ten grand. I must make a note of it. Doesn't look much like anything now, does it? Overrun with the weeds and all. That uh, lock on the door doesn't look very good to me, does it to you? I'm not an expert on locks. You know, from here it looks like it could be forced with a marshmallow. I wonder what's inside. That is, besides Johnny Burgess, I mean. I wouldn't have the faintest idea. Look, baby. Our tourist friends are going to be parked here all afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. So why don't we go back to town? Talk. About the romantic old West and all? No, no, about this. This postcard. And Johnny Burgess' crypt. Where'd you get that postcard? I happened to wander into your room. It was quite accidental, really. I was looking for the uh, elevator. May I have it, please? Well, sure, sure. Now, let's go back to town, find some place nice and private. Your room at the hotel will do. <laughs> You know, Lee, you're a pretty smart boy. Oh, thanks, honey. It was really very simple. Nevin sent the card to Larkin to let him know where the dough was stashed. Hang Tree Cemetery. The hundred grand's hidden in that vault. The final resting place of Silver Johnny Burgess. <laughs> Give me a cigarette, will you? Help you, sir. Thank you. You been to Frisco? Mm-hmm. It's a great town. We could have a wonderful time there, Julie. Could we? Yeah, besides, we'll be rolling in dough. Lee. Yeah? Just where do we stand? I mean about... We're partners, honey. We're partners. I see. You'll have to give me a little time to think it over. Oh, sure. You know, there's one little thing I've been wondering about you, Julie. How'd you break into this affair? You're not Larkin's girlfriend. You picked him up on the train, didn't you? That's unkind. Oh. So you and Noisy Nevins used to hold that. So we did. I met him in San Francisco while Larkin was in prison. You must have covered the boyfriend sent word and he got dope. But Nevins didn't tell you where it was. He was not very cooperative at times, Lee. Yeah. I bet you even suggested Nevins double-cross Larkin so that the two of you could have all the dough. Do you think? Yeah, I do. Well, Nevins wouldn't hear of it. He was one of those honest people, code of the underworld and all that. Funny... I thought he'd do anything I asked him. Except double-cross an old pal. Noisy seemed to think we could get along with half the money. Said he didn't deserve any more. Opening safe came so easy to him. Yeah, to him and his nitro. So when Evans was killed in that accident, you saw that half go out the window. You didn't know where it was hidden, but Larkin did. He'd get it all. So... Do we have to go into that part of it? No. No, I guess not. We'll forget about it. 
We'll forget about everything except that in another half hour it'll be dark. And then we have a date with Johnny Bridges. And a hundred thousand dollars. Now, we can be in Frisco by morning. What do you say? Oh, I don't know, Lee. I can talk you into it. Right now. Can you? Well, I... Keep talking, Lee. I may buy. half hour later as you step out into the street, you suddenly discover that Silver City has come alive. The main street is swarming with men from the mine. As you walk past the saloons, the cafes, and stores, you can hear the shouts, the laughter, jukeboxes, and player pianos. You walk to the edge of town, stop, and stare at the hill beyond, hang trees silhouetted against the sky. For a long while, you stand there, trying to make up your mind about Julie. After all, Lee, she killed once. At last you turn and hurry back along the crowded street. One of the saloons, you get the information that you want. What's that again, mister? The bus. What time? Oh, yeah. There's one due there in, uh, let me see, uh, about another half hour. Thanks. You can catch it over there. Yeah, I know. Not say, is there a phone in here? Yeah, right back there, uh, end of the bar. Thanks. You push your way through the crowd to the rear of the saloon, to the telephone booth, and place your call. Hello. It's all set, baby. Still want to go to Frisco? Of course I do. All right. Forget the stuff and leave tonight. Now, you wait for me. Stay right where you are. I'll pick you up in about ten minutes. I'll be waiting, Lee. Look, Sheriff, you can check on this later, but an ex-con named Larkin was murdered in Springdale five days ago. Wait a minute. Who is You'll it? find the murder gun at the Elmira Hotel in room eight. It's under a seat cushion, a chair by the window. You'll find the dame there who pulled the trigger. Now, hold on here. Who is this? Hello? Hello? Oh. <laughs> Bye-bye, baby. I'm going to miss you in Frisco. <laughs> After 12 hours and several long-distance calls, Sheriff McQuinn of Silver City was prepared to do some questioning. He talked to Lieutenant Knowles in Denver and to the San Francisco police. Now at last, he felt that the puzzle was beginning to fit together. All that remained was to walk through the quiet early morning gloom to the cell occupied by his angry, impatient prisoner. It's about time you're talking to me. What's it all about? You can't hold me here like this. Now, just take it easy, lady. I can, and I'm doing it. But I haven't... Sit down. I've been making some phone calls. Picked up lots of things about you. What of it? In San Francisco, they tell me you used to run around with noisy nevins. So? So, that's very interesting. Added to the gun you were carrying around, and it could spell a murder in Springdale. You'll have to prove that. Lieutenant Knowles thinks he can. The caliber of the gun, you know, ballistics, and then the motive, all that money. I don't know anything about it. Sure, sure, you don't know a thing. Why don't you ask Lee Ryan? We don't have to, lady. We're satisfied with what happened to him last night was Nevin's work. (laughs) Just like a hand from the grave, a double-crossing hand. What do you mean? Out at the cemetery... When your friend Ryan tried breaking into Silver Johnny's last resting place. (gasps) Yeah. Yeah, Noisy Nevins was an expert with TNT. He wasn't planning to share that dough with anybody. He set a booby trap to kill his old pal Larkin. But Ryan got it instead.
Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Telltale Brand. The small western community of Eagle's Nest once a gold rush boom town, still full of interesting landmarks, silent reminders of a hectic, glorious past, had turned into a quiet, peaceful center of small town trade and commerce. From the Gold Nugget Hotel at one end of its main street to the Silver Slipper Saloon at the other, a handful of men lolled in doorways, stood chatting quietly on street corners. A more careful observer, however, could discover activity, or at least some noise. And it was taking place in the front office of the town's newspaper in the middle of the block. Some of the leading citizens were there listening. And the noise was being made by a tall man named Mark Melville. Your town is dying on the vine. Now, you men run this place. You, Mr. Betterly, with one of the finest ranches in the West. Henry Malone here with his department store. Chambers and his newspaper. Mr. Conklin, your bar. Look, mister, we don't even know your name. You can't just walk in here. Oh, now, let me finish. And the name's Mark Melville. Let me tell you what happened to me. I have a good public relations business in San Francisco. Two weeks ago, I suddenly got fed up, wanted a rest, a change. I closed up the office, stepped onto a bus, ended up here. No particular reason, just stepped off the bus. <laughs> you know what happened to me when I walked down your main street? I didn't see a broken down has-been community, no sir. I saw a colorful saloon with swinging doors. I caught the excitement and gaiety that belongs with a place like this. I'd like to see it that way again, and one thing can do it. Publicity, gentlemen, publicity. Promotion. Publicity, promotion? Yes, put on a Frontier Week or an Old Timers Week. Anything we want to call it. Just something to bring people in from miles around. Now, there's 100,000 people within a radius of 75 miles. They'll come, believe me, they will. And they'll spend money, too. What? If necessary, I'd like to fly back to San Francisco and... Get my own capital to start things rolling. Oh, no, no, no. If we ever do go into a thing like this, we'll pay our own freight. Well, what sort of things would we do, uh, Mark? Why, the stunts are endless. We'd give it the works, western-wise. Put on a rodeo, a carnival. Have a stagecoach race ending up in the middle of town. We'll make a rule, maybe. Everybody wears a ten-gallon hat. <laughs> or we could even organize a vigilante committee. Anybody caught with his hat off gets his head dunked in the horse trough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that that is that is <laughs> I don't wear one. Hey, Melville, how much would you want for your services? Oh, if you insist on a business basis, well, you can give me a percentage of the overall take, say 10, 15 percent. Have it your way. Fifteen percent it is. Boys? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Right. When can you get started? Why, wait another minute. I'll go back to my hotel, start setting things up right now. Uh, just a minute, Mr. 
Mr. Melville? Where are you going? Why, up to my room. I wouldn't bother. It's locked. I got the key. I'm not sure that I understand. <laughs> I get it. I know just what you're thinking. I wouldn't be surprised. You're thinking when I stepped off that bus four days ago, I was broke. Exactly. I want you to do something, Mr. Davis. I want you to go to that telephone there. Pick it up. Call Chambers' paper. Mr. Betterly's there. I want you to ask for him. Betterly? You know Jim Betterly? <laughs> he came here to see him. And not five minutes ago, he talked me into a deal worth at least several thousand dollars. Go on, call him. Get him on the phone. I insist, Mr. Davis. Tell Betterly what you think of Mark Melville. Tell him you don't want me in your hotel. See what he has to say about it. And about me. Well? Uh, here's your key, Mr. Melville. Uh, Mr. Melville, I'll bring your bag up right away. I locked it in my office. When you bring it up, bring along a lunch menu... Going to be doing some work in my room. Yes, sir. It's amusing, isn't it, Mark, how people can be impressed. You've often thought that, given the means, you could change a universe. Only right now, and for several thousand badly needed dollars, you must concentrate on changing Eagle's Nest putting it on the map as you promised. The next day, you move your headquarters over to the newspaper office. It's while you're at the typewriter pounding out the first publicity release on the Eagle's Nest Frontier Week that you met someone else. Hello. Hello. Well? Hello? I'm Helen Rice. Helen, I'm Mark. I know. Mark Melville, publicity genius. Going to tell the world about Eagle's Nest. <laughs> Isn't it about time somebody did? Yeah. Uh, that is my typewriter you're using. Oh, well, I'll be through in a minute. Use it. As long as you like. Thanks. You, uh, work here on the paper, huh? Yeah. Thrilling career. Bitter? Bored. Uh huh? I know the feeling. What do you do about it? I generally start looking around for something new to take up my time. Interesting idea. It usually works. You like to discuss it sometime? Maybe. Live close by? No. I live out. About five miles. Doing anything tonight? Wasn't planning to. Why don't you meet me here in town? I'm engaged to Jim Betterly. Oh. Well, I guess that changes things. Yes. Yeah. I'd better meet you out of town. So now you have two things to amuse you, Mark. The Frontier Week plans and Helen. Soon you're seeing Helen every night late, always meeting her out of town so nobody will see the two of you together. But a week or so later, you begin to notice two things which disturb you. First, Helen is getting more serious. And second, her fiancé, Jim Betterly, is staring at you very curiously these days. And then, just before the Frontier Week opens, it all comes to a head. After the final committee meeting, Jim Betterly waits while the other members leave. And then he comes up to you. Alvo. Hmm? Oh, Betterly. I want to talk to you. Uh, yeah. I, um, I suppose you want to be sure you've got the plan straight. I got them straight, but that isn't what I want to talk about, Melville. No? No. I want to talk about Helen. Helen? Yeah, she's engaged to me. That means I'm in love with her and I want to marry her pretty soon. Wait, 
sure. I, I hope you do, but... Melville, all this stuff you've done for the town so far shows you've got a lot of brains. You're a pretty clever fellow. Just don't get too clever. Look, I, I don't know what this is all about, Betterly, but believe me, you've got nothing to worry about as far as Helen's concerned. I'm glad you said that, Melville. Just don't forget it. Jim Betterly walks out the door, and you sit there at your typewriter thinking. It doesn't take you long to make up your mind, does it, Mark? One look at Betterly's face a few minutes ago has told you what would happen if he ever found out about you and Helen. You're still sitting there at your typewriter, thinking about it when she walks into the newspaper office and comes over to you. And then suddenly she bends over you. Hello, darling, darling, darling. Helen, not here. Why not? Betterly just left. He might have seen you. Let him. What? I said let him see me. I'm tired of sneaking around, meeting you out of town late at night. I thought that was the way you wanted things. I did at first. I thought I wanted to hang on to Jim then. But now I know I don't. Now I only want you, Mark. Well, as a matter of fact, Helen, I want to talk to you about us. Yeah, I've been hoping you would, darling. I don't think you understand. Mark, you'll be leaving town after Frontier Week. Take me with you. I'm sick of this stupid little town. Take me to San Francisco, Mark. We can get married there. San Francisco? Yeah, that's where we belong. Together. I'm afraid not, Helen. What do you mean? Look, we've had a lot of fun together. But, well, things seem to have gotten a little beyond the fun stage. So I think it would be best for all concerned if we just called it a day. Called it a day? Now, let me get this real clear, Now, Mark. look, let's not... You want to brush me off? Helen! Well, there's something you ought to know, Mark. I don't brush. When there's something I want, I hang on to it. And if you think otherwise, you're in for a lot of trouble. Trouble? Look, Helen, I don't like threats. This isn't a threat, darling. It's a fact. Jim Betterly's got quite a temper. Ha! You're bluffing. He's the last guy in the world you'd tell. Is he? Well, I think I could explain things to him in a way that might Look, be very... Look, if you go to Betterly with a bunch of lies about us, Helen, I'll tell him the truth. Will you? And who do you think you'll believe? Me or you? I see. Yeah, so do I. And I know just what you're thinking, that you could leave town right now and be in the clear. Well, it wouldn't work. Because once I told Betterly about us, he'd follow you and he'd find you no matter where you went. So think it over, Mark. Better play it my way. It'd be much safer. Much. <laughs> With the prologue of Telltale Brand, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Now that the holiday season is over, most of us are settling down to some serious thinking about economy. An economy, that's one place where Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, shines. Of course, if you've lived out west any length of time, you already know that throughout the Pacific Coast states, from Canada to Mexico... Signal has an enviable reputation for mileage. But mileage, mind you, is only half of Signal's story. Just ask any driver who powers his car with Signal gasoline, and you'll find he's equally enthusiastic about Signal's performance, which is only natural, because good mileage and superior performance go hand in hand. Both are the result of the extra efficiency today's Signal gasoline coaxes from your motor. That's why if you want to measure gasoline quality, you'll find your best yardstick is your speedometer. It takes extra quality to go farther. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler.
It had been so simple at the start, hadn't it, Mark? So easy selling the citizens of Eagle Nest on the idea of a Frontier Week celebration. And you looked forward to the day when it would all be over. And you could ride out of Eagle Nest with three or four thousand dollars in your pocket for masterminding the affair. Yes, it was a perfect setup. Until you became involved with Helen, Jim Betterly's fiance. Now there's no telling how much trouble she'll make if she goes to Betterly with her version of what's happened. And yet you can't leave town. Not before you've collected the money that will be waiting for you at the end of the celebration. You think about it in the days that follow and struggle to reach a decision. Then Frontier Week opens, and you plunge into the thousand and one details of running the affair. You manage to avoid Helen as much as possible. And then on the night of the carnival, as you wander around the grounds, you notice Helen at a distance. She's with a stranger, a man you've never seen before. And then as you watch them... Now, well, what? Oh, better me. I... How's it going? How's what going? Why, the carnival? Pretty good. I want to talk to you a minute, Nova. Well, uh, I... won't take long. I want to get it off my chest. Why, how come you're not making the rounds of the sideshows tonight, Betterly? Because I've been looking for you. Say, I, uh, I see you've got a friend to show Helen around. A friend? Yeah, I saw her with someone a few minutes ago. He's no friend. I've never seen him before. Oh, Look, Melville. Hey, grab the tourist, boys. He hasn't got a hat on. Come on, <laughs> Your vigilantes are doing quite a job, Betterly. That horse trough's gotten a lot of business. Yeah. Melville, quit changing the subject. What I got to say isn't easy, and I want to get it over with. All right. What is it? Last week, you and I had a little talk. Remember? Yes, but... I told you then, Betterly. I thought you and Helen had been seeing each other. Look, Betterly. The last couple of days, I've hardly seen her. And now, tonight, she's with a stranger. You say you haven't seen her much lately? No. And, well, maybe I was wrong about you, Melville. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry for shooting my mouth off the other day. Why? Why, that's okay, Betterly. Sure, forget it. It's difficult to hide your surprise and relief, isn't it, Mark? And now it looks like Helen has found a new interest, the stranger. Yes. Suddenly it seems that all your troubles are over, doesn't it? It's almost two in the morning when you go back to your hotel room. But then as soon as you close the door, you see it. The note on your pillow... And as you read it, you realize your troubles aren't over after all. Mark, I must see you tonight. It doesn't matter how late. I'll be expecting you. You'd better not disappoint me, Helen. Well, it looks like this is the showdown, doesn't it, Mark? Ten minutes later, you arrive at her house. The shades are drawn, but there's a light inside. You open the door and go in. Your eyes flick past the empty bottle on the table to Helen's sullen face. She pokes silently at the coals in the fireplace with a poker and then straightens up and turns to you. Decided to quit trying to hide from me, huh? Look, I haven't been trying to hide. I just wanted to get things straightened out in my mind. Anyway, I'm sure your new boyfriend has kept you from getting too lonely. Boyfriend? What are you talking about? The guy you were with at the carnival. Ah, don't make me laugh. He was just in town for the celebration. I never saw him before tonight. You always have made friends easily, haven't you? Still, you pay for that crack. I gave you a few things to think about the other day, didn't I? Yeah. I've been thinking about them. I've reached a decision. What is it? Come into Frontier Week, I'm leaving town. Alone. I don't think you will. I don't think you'll do anything about it. Jim will kill you when I tell him. Look, A, I don't think you have enough nerve to tell him. B, even if you do, I don't think you'll believe me now, so just forget it. Forget it? (laughs) You're going to take me with you, understand? You're going to take me with... Take you with me to San Francisco? You must be out of your mind. You think you're too good for me, don't you? You think I'm just a small-town hick? Well, this is what I think of you... You shouldn't have done that, Helen. You've 
had something coming for a long time, and I'm going to You stay it. away from me, Mark. Put that poker down. It's red hot, Mark. <clears throat> oh, you burn me. You burn my chest with your little... Moments later, you're standing there in a daze, Mark, staring at Helen's lifeless body on the floor. Then at the angry X-shaped burn on your chest. Finally, your mind begins to clear. You look around the room. There's no sign you've been there. And luckily, you're almost certain nobody saw you leave your hotel. You slip out the front door and look around. There's no one in sight. So you hurry back to your hotel room, rip off your charred shirt, and hide it temporarily in your closet. Then you collapse on your bed. The burn on your chest is throbbing painfully now, but you have no bandages or salve to put on it. So you just lie there, staring into the darkness. And then finally, just before dawn, your eyes close from sheer fatigue. Sheriff. Can you come on over to my office right away? Why, uh, yes, of course. Uh, is anything wrong? Yeah, something's wrong. And you know what he means, don't you, Mark? Helen's murder. Probably this is just routine. But you've got to be on guard. You put on a clean shirt and wince as the cloth brushes against the burn. Ten minutes later, you walk into the sheriff's office. With him are a circle of grim-faced men. Among them, Chambers, Conklin, and Jim Batterly. The sheriff doesn't lose any time questioning you. Where were you last night, Melville? Last night? Why? The carnival? What time did you leave? Oh, must have been almost two. Everything was closing up. Why, Sheriff? Where'd you go after you left the carnival? To my hotel room. Did you leave your room at all after that? No. Look, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sometime between two and three this morning, Helen Wright was murdered. What? Oh, no. Yeah, and I think you might have had something to do with it, Mogul. Sheriff, I'm getting sick and tired of this guy throwing nasty accusations at me. Two weeks ago, he got the crazy idea I was seeing Helen secretly. He even threatened me about it. But you admitted to me yourself, Betterly, that you were wrong just last night. Yeah, that was before I talked to Joe Merrill. Joe Merrill? Who's he? He drives a truck between here and Little Creek every night. He says he's seen Helen riding on the highway more than once lately. And the man she was with looked like you. Like me? Why, why that's... No, no, betterly, Joe didn't make a positive identification. He said it was too dark. Sheriff, this whole thing is ridiculous. Anyone that says I was ever with Helen is lying. If I just had one little shred of proof, Melville, just one little shred... But you don't, betterly. There's no case against Melvin, and you know it. Oh, well, there's no use arguing among ourselves. If we could just locate that stranger and pick him up, I got a strong hunch he's our boy. Stranger? You mean the man Helen was with at the carnival last night? Yeah. You think he might have been the one who killed her? You didn't look that way. Yeah, Melville dropped out of sight during the night, apparently left town. No trace at all of him. I think maybe if we could only catch up to him, we'd find the brand Helen slapped on him. Brand? Yeah. We found a poker and some charred bits of cloth on the floor beside her body. Looks like she branded her killer. Oh, I see. Look, Sheriff, I don't care what Melville says. I still think he's lying. Now, listen, I think he was sneaking around trying to see Helen behind her back. Maybe that's how it was. Maybe she refused to see him, so he killed her. If I could just prove you'd been seeing her, Melville. Betterly, I... I'm afraid that wouldn't prove much. What do you mean, Ed? Well, I, I'm no particular friend of Melville's here, but all I say is if he was seeing Helen on the sly, he wasn't the first one or the only one. What are you trying to say, Ed? Well, I'm sorry, Betterly, but, well, Helen... Helen and I, we were kind of running around together for a while, too. That's a lie! No, I'm afraid it isn't, Betterly. You keep out of this, Carver. Oh, Helen and I had a few dates, too. Helen and you? And Ed? Yeah. I don't like to say this. Well, I guess it was the same with Ed as me. 
Just as much Helen's idea as was ours. That's why I think probably it was this stranger that killed her. Helen had sort of a... Way well, of... Uh, I, uh, I guess that's enough for now. I'm sorry, Betterly. Melville, I don't think I'll need you anymore. You can go now. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a brief weather forecast. Winter rains ahead. And every rain means more auto accidents. Consider, one out of every five deaths caused by autos occurs when roads are wet or slippery. Another one in five deaths occurs when driver's vision is obscured. Fortunately, there are two precautions you can take to avoid these hazards. One, if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, your signal dealer can install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. And two, if your tires are worn smooth, signal dealers can now equip your car with new eight-rib Lee Super Deluxe tires. The broader, flatter tread on these new Lee tires guarantees quicker stopping and greater non-skid protection. Well, there you have it. Two items that can play a big part in helping you prevent an auto accident. So have your signal dealer check your windshield wiper and your tire treads this week. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is equipped to take you safely through the rainy months ahead. And now back to the whistler. It was a stroke of luck you hadn't counted on, wasn't it, Mark? Just when things looked darkest for you, the unexpected... Uh... Character witness Ed Chambers and Bud Conklin took the pressure off you, didn't they? The surprising light they threw on Helen's activities makes the missing stranger a very promising suspect in her murder. So now you're as good as in the clear, and it's a very pleasant feeling, isn't it? Even the burn under your shirt, the killer's brand, doesn't seem to hurt as much anymore. You follow the men out of the sheriff's office. Betterly stands at the horse trough, staring emptily down at the water. And you go over to him. Betterly, I'm sorry about what happened, Betterly. Leave me alone now. Okay, Betterly. Hey, 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 what's that bunch of men heading this way for? Huh? Oh, that's the Frontier Week Vigilante Committee. Vigilante Committee? Well, haven't they heard about what's happened? I don't know, guess not. Uh, we better call the rest of this Frontier Week off, Melville. Yeah, guess you're right, man. Look, him for eating the big boss himself. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the joke's on you, Melville. Come on, take your medicine. Hey, what is this? Let go of me. Ah, this is Frontier Week, remember? And you don't have your hat on, so you get your head ducked. Yeah. What? Well, just a minute. I'll get my head. It's right inside. Oh, listen to him. Now, come on, get your shirt off. We're going to duck you. Yeah. Shirt? Yeah. Oh, no. No, no. Get your hands off. Yeah, what's the matter? Can't you take it when the joke's on you? I said, get your hands off. Okay, boys, get his shirt off. Let go of me. Okay, we'll take his shirt off the hard way. Here goes. The brand. That burn on his chest. Ed. You better call the sheriff. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Rye Billsbury, Mercedes McCambridge, and William Conrad. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Bob Reif and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now, The Whistler's strange story, All Damage Covered. As usual, the Swank Orchid Room was crowded. And the reason for the popularity of this small nightclub in downtown Los Angeles was obvious. At the moment, the tall, slender girl with the honey-colored hair stood before the microphone on the dance floor, swaying with the rhythm of her song. Just who can solve its mystery? Why should it make a fool of me? I saw Maxine had sung those words over and over, night after night. But suddenly she seemed to be singing them for the first time. Suddenly she was the woman the words were written for. The thought of killing him had occurred to her before. But never in the middle of a song had she known this cold-blooded, dispassionate desire to kill the man she'd married. What is... Later, in her dressing room, Maxine had changed into her street clothes when she heard a knock on the door. And she didn't have to guess who it was. This wasn't just her boss. This was Jim McCoy, a guy as real as his name. Hiya, Songbird. Hello, Jim. Oh, you were great tonight. Real great. Sounded like you meant every word of it, baby. Maybe I did. Well, keep it up. <laughs> I can always add a few more chairs for the customers. Well, I gotta get back to the lounge. What's your hurry? Hurry? And we usually say goodnight about this time? That's what I mean. Do we have to? Now, look, baby. We've been through all this before. Observation. The tone of your voice goes well with the cold of your shoulder. Maxine, things were different when you were a cute trick on the loose. You may be Miss Maxine to the customers, but to me, you're Mrs. Charlie Kendall. I know. But after all, what's in a name? Look, baby, maybe they don't show, but I still have a couple of old scruples lying around. Don't kid yourself. They show something awful. Charlie needs you now more than ever. It's no fun not being able to walk, cooped up day in and day out. You're all he's got. Yeah, I guess you're right, Jim. Forget it. Yeah, I think we'd better. Well, good night, Songbird. And so, Maxine, a half hour later, you're driving over the freeway, going home to Charlie, your husband. You can't help but admire Jim for turning you down, can you? Because of the way things stand. Because you're married to Charlie. You drive on through the night thinking about it. And by the time you reach the outskirts of Ellenville, you've decided that there must be a showdown with Charlie. As you start to plan the things you'll say... Sorry, lady, roadblock. Oh, but I live in Carpencita. I've got to get home. There's been a landslide. Won't be able to get through for a couple hours yet. Oh, oh, I see. Train coming through in about ten minutes from L.A., or if you'd rather, you can go back to the main road, take a ten-mile detour. No, thanks. I'll, I'll take the train. 
You turn your car around, and minutes later, park it on a quiet side street near the depot and hurry to catch the train. Shortly before four in the morning, you unlock the front door of your house in Carpencita. As you step into the living room, you see Charlie, stretched out on the couch, an empty bottle on the floor, the cane propped up against the end table, cigarette smoke curling up around the hand that dangles over the edge of the couch. It's a familiar sight to you, isn't it, Maxie? Charlie's been an invalid for two years now. His leg, injured again when he fell while getting off the suburban train a month ago, still hasn't mended. You hurry to Charlie's side. From his hand, you take the cigarette that's ready to fall to the floor. Charlie. Uh, come on, come on, sweetheart. Uh, come to the party. Uh, Charlie. Mm. Charlie, uh, wake up. Uh, uh, oh. Oh, Maxie. Hey, oh, baby. Yeah, baby's home. Uh, uh, must have dropped off. What time is it? Oh, a few minutes to four. Four? Whoa. What took you so long, Maxine? There was a roadblock at Ellenville. Oh. That's too bad. I had to leave the car there and take the train. Sure, sure. I had to wait ten minutes for the train. It took 15 minutes to get to Carpencita, 20 minutes to get a cab to take me here, and I... Okay, okay, honey. I believe you. I believe you. Well, why shouldn't you? It's the truth. Sure it is, baby. Sure. You don't believe a word of it. You never do. And do you want to know something? I don't care, Charlie. I don't care what you believe anymore. Don't you think I know that, Maxie? Honey, don't rub it in, huh? I know you go out on dates when you're finished at the club. I even know about the guy you work for. McCoy. I was not on a date tonight with Jim or anybody else. Mm, sure, baby, anything you say. I'll never ask any more questions. Just as long as you come home to me. Maybe I'm sick of coming home. Maybe I'll never come home again. Don't say that, Max. Why shouldn't I? I mean it. I've told you before. You'll never get rid of me. We're married and you can't change that. Don't tempt me, Charlie. You struggle to control the rage that's sweeping over you. Turn away from Charlie and hurry into the bedroom. You stand there in the darkness by the open window while the frost of night bites the anger in your cheeks. The train, Maxine. Yes. Why couldn't it have been late tonight? Ten minutes late. Ten minutes. The cigarette would have slipped out of Charlie's hand. The straw rug would have caught on fire. It would have solved all your problems. Suddenly an idea flickers through your mind. It could happen again. Charlie could fall asleep with a cigarette in his hand. There'd be a fire. But you'd be somewhere else when that happened, Maxine. An alibi. All you need is an alibi. And in an instant, it becomes crystal clear to you how you can get one. Maxie. Maxie. Huh? Oh, what is it, Charlie? Oh. All by yourself in the dark, baby? It's on your mind. The train, Charlie. I was just thinking about the train. And now, back to the whistler. You've reached a decision, haven't you, Maxine? You're going to rid yourself of your husband, Charlie, once and for all. And you know exactly how you're going to do it. You can see it all now, the way it's going to happen. The official version of the accident. Charlie asleep on the couch. The empty bottle of liquor on the floor. A lighted cigarette dropping from his hand to the straw rug and then the fire. And you weren't around to prevent it. It's late afternoon of the following day when you awaken. 
And as you recall your plan, your heart throbs with a sick, dizzy excitement. After a reassuring cup of coffee, you call the train depot. Check the schedule of the evening train to Los Angeles. Then you take your time dressing. Fight to remain calm. Shortly before 5.30. Maxie. Hey, Maxie, your cab's here. Coming. Well, well, what's in the suitcase, honey? Oh, it's just a dress I'll need at the club. Bye now. Bye. Hey, Maxie. Yes? Try to make it home early tonight, will you? It's kind of lonesome around here. Don't worry, Charlie. I'll... I'll be back before you know it. A quarter of an hour later, you reach the depot. Buy your ticket and start for the train. You're about to put your plan into operation, aren't you, Maxine? And you smile to yourself as you think of the first move. Charlie's accident on this very line put the idea into your head. As you reach the train, you start up the steps. One step and then another. And as you near the platform, you deliberately place your foot between the two steps and throw yourself forward. Oh! Miss! Uh, miss! Are, are you hurt? I... I don't know. Uh, here, wait, wait. Here, let me help you. Uh, uh, there. There. Hey, you better sit down there. The train's moving. Thank you. I'll be all right. It's terribly clumsy of me. Oh, well, accidents do happen. They seem to run in the family. A month ago, my husband had a similar fall. Uh, oh! Your ankle? Yes. Uh, oh, it'll be all right now, I'm sure. Uh, well, is there anything I can do, miss? No, no, thank you. Well, I... I'm sorry. I'll, I'll have to have your name, miss. My report, you know. It's just routine. Oh, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs. Charles Kendall. Uh, Mrs. Charles Kendall. Uh, address, please. 752 Mapleton Drive. You smile, lean forward, continue to rub your ankle as you watch the conductor fill in the report. Everything's there, isn't it, Maxine? Your name, the date, time of accident. Yes, everything working according to plan. You've established your presence on the train to Los Angeles. As soon as the conductor is out of sight, you pick up your suitcase, hurry into the ladies' room. A few minutes later, you emerge wearing a dull, faded coat, a drab hat pulled down over your eyes. All traces of your original makeup have been removed. And in your new makeup, you've suddenly become a different woman. A plain, older-looking, unattractive woman. Ellen Bell! Next stop, Ellen Bell! As the train stops, you get off without delay and hurry away from the depot. You find your car where you'd parked it the night before. On the quiet side street, and minutes later, you're racing a good 70 miles an hour along the road back to Carpencita. Luckily, your train is a slow train, because you must make up a good 35 minutes before it arrives in Los Angeles. It's dark now, and no one sees you as you arrive in Carpencita. You quietly park in an alley and then walk quickly to the rear entrance at your home and slip inside. And then you're standing in the living room, looking down on Charlie, sprawled out on the couch... The sleeping powder you slipped into his drink before you left has taken effect, hasn't it, Maxie? Charlie? Charlie? He doesn't stir. Quickly, you light a cigarette. Drop it on the straw rug. In a few seconds, it begins to smolder. In strange fascination, you watch the flames begin to creep along the floor. And then you turn and run from the house. It's over, isn't it, Maxine? The worst part of all. As you hurry back to the car, you know there's only one more thing that you have to do. You must overtake the train at one of the many stops it makes and somehow get back on board unnoticed. To be in the clear, perfectly safe, that conductor must see you get off at Union Station. Those are tense moments, aren't they, Maxine? Moments that seem like a lifetime. You take this short, straight highway into Los Angeles, hitting better than 70 miles an hour most of the way. Finally, you catch your train at one of its last stops and get back on just in time. Disappear quickly into the lounge room, where you can change back into your original outfit. Union Station! Union Station! Union... Oh... 
Oh, uh, Mrs. Kent. Uh, ankle better, Mrs. Kent? Yes. Yes, thank you, Conductor. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Union Station. Your plan has worked perfectly, hasn't it, Maxine? You keep telling yourself that over and over again. And then, as the train stops and you walk back to step off, you freeze suddenly and stare in terror at a man standing on the crowded station platform. Oh, no. You recognize him, don't you, Maxine? This man in the pinstriped suit. Instantly, your mind goes back to that night a few weeks ago when you came home late just as this same man was leaving and you heard him say to Charlie... Now, don't worry, Kendall. I'll take care of everything. It's all clear to you now, isn't it, Maxine? Now you know why this man in the pinstriped suit was talking to Charlie a couple of weeks ago. Charlie was hiring him to follow you. Perhaps he was following you tonight. You step back into the train, hurry through the cars and get off further down the platform. It isn't until you climb into a taxi and try to settle back that you realize you're trembling all over, shaking uncontrollably. Somehow you manage to compose yourself, regain your confidence by the time you reach the club and go inside to greet Jim at the bar. Hiya, Songbird. Hello, Jim. Say, your feathers look a little ruffled. You're limping. Oh, I, I fell and scraped my knee while I was getting on the train tonight. Train? How come you took the train? Oh, uh, I was too tired to drive all the way home last night, so I left the car in town. Well, you better take it easy. Sure you want to go tonight? Oh, don't worry. I'll make it. Okay. Uh, how's Charlie? Charlie? Hmm. Don't tell me you've forgotten our little conversation last night. Oh, no, Jim. I, I haven't forgotten. As a matter of fact, I'm very grateful to you. You made me see what my duty was. Yeah. Glad to hear it, baby. That night, you deliver the songs mechanically, don't you, Maxine? Because your mind is on something else. It's been four hours since the fire started, and you still haven't had any word. But as you approach your dressing room... Maxine! Oh, I, I didn't see you, Jim. There's a call for you, baby. You can take it in my office. Uh... Call? Mm hmm. Who is it? Long you know? distance, yeah. Cop and Cita. Probably Charlie. Your mind is blank for the next few moments until you find yourself alone in Jim's office, your fingers tightly gripping the telephone receiver as you slowly raise it to your lips. Uh, hello? Mrs. Kendall? Yes, this is Mrs. Kendall. This is Captain Craig, Carpentry to Fire Department. Oh? I'm uh, sorry, Mrs. Kendall. I have some bad news about your husband. It won't take long, Maxine. Coroner just wants to ask some questions. Uh, your husband was an invalid, was he not? That's right. Smoked quite a bit, is that correct? Yes, he... He smoked quite a bit. And uh, he was a heavy drinker as well. Oh, drinking helped relieve his pain. Oh, don't misunderstand me, Mrs. Kendall. Uh, I'm not trying to establish that your husband was a chronic alcoholic, just that he did drink at times to a point of... Yes, yes, he, he did. Oh, then I think the conclusion we drew from the evidence is correct. Your husband fell asleep with a lighted cigarette while in a state of intoxication. The cigarette fell and... That was it. I was afraid that would happen someday. I warned him so many times. Easy, Maxine. Uh, Mrs. Kendall, if you'll please sign this. What? Yes. Uh, honey, you're trembling. Here, I'll hold it. I... I... What is it, Mrs. Kendall? Oh, nothing. I, I'm just upset, that's all. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kendall. Uh, thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Finally, it's over, Maxine. Really over. Without even the necessity for the alibi which you went to so much trouble establishing. The man from the coroner's office is gone and you're alone with Jim. With no more barriers between you. It's all you can do to keep from blurting out how good you feel inside. How little you need the rest that Jim is trying to insist upon. I still think you should take it easy, honey. Stay in bed for a while. Oh, no, Jim. I'm not going to let myself brood about this. I want to work. It'll help, I know. Okay, Songbird, you win. Oh, thanks, Jim. I appreciate everything you've done, and I hope I sound sentimental. You do. 
I can take it. Uh, I'll see you later. What is this thing called love? This funny thing called love. Just who That night, your song is different. The nervousness is gone, isn't it, Maxine? Suddenly you're gripped with terror and the song dies in your throat. A fool of... Through the amber haze, sitting motionless at the bar, you see the man in the pinstripe suit. In that instant, you're certain he was hired by your husband to follow you. You don't know how long he's been following you, but in that moment of desperation, you suddenly turn, flee from your surprised audience toward the dressing rooms. Who is it? It's me. Now, look, Maxine, what's this all about? What did that man say to you, Jim? Oh, it's got you worried, hasn't it? No, no, I'm not worried. It, it's just a nervous reaction, Now, listen to me, all. baby. This isn't a relapse. This is something else. How about you kicking in with a few more details? I'm unstrung. Answer me all. one question. What question? What do you know about that fire? Nothing, Jim. How could I know? Answer me. There's nothing to answer, Jim. What's wrong? Why do you keep looking at me that way? Look, Maxine, I thought something was phony last night when you got that call from the fire department. When I told you I thought it was Charlie, you almost keeled over. And I think I know why, baby. You already knew about that fire. No, Jim, And if no. you knew about it, you started it. I swear, I swear I didn't. Oh, Jim, please don't tell that to him. He knows too much already, Jim. And I... I thought so. And to think I was in love with you. Oh, please, Jim. Please, you're all I've got. Take your hands off me. Jim. Go on and cry to that guy out front. He wants to see you. Oh, don't go, Jim. Don't leave me alone. Not now. you got to help me. you got to help me figure this out. Jim, you mustn't leave me. Not now. Jim! Frantically, you slip into your coat. Hurry out the side door after him. But Jim's nowhere in sight. And you leap into a waiting cab. Yeah, where to, lady? Would you mind cruising around a bit? I, I'm looking for someone. A man. Sure, lady. Uh, see me, lady? No, no, I don't. But let's not stop. Okay. Uh, you sure the guy you're looking for ain't looking for you? What? Uh, there's a black car been following us ever since we started. No. No, that's not the man I want. Driver, turn the corner. Do anything but lose that car. <laughs> As you speed along the street, it suddenly occurs to you exactly what's happening. Yes, you ran out to find Jim, and now you're trying to escape the man in the pinstripe suit. Fear sweeps over you and crowds Jim from your mind. And you know you've got to get away from this man. The black car is only a block behind you as your cab races into the dark, deserted manufacturing district. Screeches around one corner, then another, and another, turning, twisting, and then suddenly... Driver. Yeah? That station up ahead, is that the electric train? Yeah. Here, this will take care of the fare. Let me off, quickly. The black car is nowhere in sight as you leave the cab and hurry to the dimly lit, deserted station. You're praying wildly for a train when suddenly you're relieved to see the lights approaching in the distance. And then, then as you step out on the platform... Hey! Hey there! You see the man in the pinstripe suit hurrying towards you. Quickly, you run down the platform, dark behind a stack of packing cases. Mrs. Kendall, Mrs. Kendall, wait a minute! You hear his footsteps approaching along the platform. Your hands move up in front of you. You wait... Then as he steps into view, you lunge. I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to The Whistler. <laughs> small group of passengers had gathered on the station platform. Standing around in shocked silence, they'd waited until the ambulance arrived and the police. 
Okay, okay. Now, here, now, let's keep back a little here. Okay, here, get back. I saw the whole thing, officer. I was sitting up front by the window. I could see just the plane. And... All right, lady, all right. You'll get your turn. I want to know what the motorman has to say first. Well, I tell you... If you don't mind. Well, Sergeant... Uh, go ahead, you. Well, officer, when, when we got close to the station platform, I see this woman, and I... Uh, she tries to push this fella onto the tracks. Huh? And then the fella steps out of her way and she goes over herself. I, I couldn't stop in time to keep from hitting her. Oh, yes. Uh, well, now, here, now, here, where's the fella she was trying to push over? Where? Uh, right here, sir. Oh, will you come up here? Uh, what's your name? Uh, Henry Cooper. Did you know that woman? No, I never got a chance to meet her. I've just been trying to. Her name's Mrs. Kendall. Well, how come she tried to push you in front of a train? I don't know. You see, I work for the railroad claims investigator. Yeah. Well, a month ago, her husband was in an accident. Uh-huh. Funny thing, a couple of days ago, she was in a similar accident. I only wanted her to sign a voucher so I could give her a check to cover all damages. by Wilbur Hatch and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the signal oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Friends, here's some exciting news. The latest Hooper ratings show that in the last two months, the listening audience of The Whistler has increased by more than 50%. Yes, sir, 50%. And even before this increase, The Whistler was rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. What do we at Signal Oil think about this? Well, naturally, we think it's wonderful. And we want to say thanks to our regular audience and welcome to all you new listeners. And remember, friends, Signal Gasoline is tops, too. And now, The Whistler's strange story. Last Curtain. The company's engagement at the Opera House in Los Angeles had two weeks to run. But Oriane Donati, whose beautiful voice was largely responsible for the success of the tour, had other things on her mind. Oriane was no longer thrilled by the curtain going up. She was not new to the music world. And moreover, when she allowed herself... She could feel the years inside. She didn't allow this often, of course. And certainly it was not being displayed at the moment. With Charles beside her, quietly reassuring, Oriane found it a simple matter to face the anger of the impresario, Giulio Cassini. Have you lost your mind, Oriane? You cannot just tear up a contract. I'm protected by the law. Law, law. There is only one law I recognize. I do as I please. And I will not desert my Charles. Um. Why should you, my dear? Do marry, Charles. But remain with us for the season, at least. Please, Carabia. It is impossible. 
Charles will not hear of it. We are both desperately in love. Am I right, my darling? Yes, you're quite right, Oriana. Oriana, please, reconsider. Sorry, Julio, my mind is quite made up. Come, Charles. Let's go someplace where we can be alone. By all means. <laughs> all right, play your games, but if you want my advice... It was rather unpleasant, dear. Yeah? Julio, <laughs> he only thinks of the money he will lose. Enough of him, though. Do you really love me? Don't you know? Yes, I suppose I do. <laughs> that was nice, darling. Now I must go to my dressing room. Can you amuse yourself for a little while? Yes, but do hurry back. <laughs> Soriane, at this point in your career, in your life, the most important thing is Charles and your love for him. You're thinking about this, aren't you, as you sit down before the mirror in your dressing room? Mama. What? Mama. Oh, Felice. How often have I told you not to call me Mama? Oh, Mama. I, I what mean... am I going to do with you? Oh, tell me. How are you coming along with your voice? Mm-hmm. Very well. Professor Gresby is pleased with my progress. What are you up to now? I've just finished Faust. I'm to take up Martha next. Oh, Martha, lovely. You know, Mr. Cassini has a great hope for your future. Do you enjoy your work in the chorus, darling? Very much. But, Mama, how long must this pretense go on? Now, Felice, my baby, it will be over sooner than you think. I... I am going to be married. Married? Yes, cara mia, to a very fine, handsome, rich man. We shall all three of us be very happy. Oh, oh, Mama, when? Soon, Felice. Very soon. Now, child. Yes? A thousand pardons, my lady. But uh, if you have the time, I should like a word with you. I am very busy, Pepo. But, uh, well, young lady, you run along now. I hope the advice I have given you will help you to amount to something. Oh, it will, Madame Donati. And thank you. Well? What is it, Pepo? Please, Madonna. Is it true what they are all saying? That you are leaving us? Being married? Yes, it's true. Oh, no, my lady, no. You must remain. The opera needs you. The opera? <laughs> Go away, old man. Go to your world of props where you belong. You fatigue me. Oh, you grieve me, Madonna. True, I am without physical grace and beauty, but... Oh, please, in my heart. There is love. Love? <laughs> love indeed. Go away, buffo. Go down to your room where you belong and stay out of my life. Stay out of what does not concern you. Peppo doesn't really annoy you, does he, Oriana? He only amuses you. But you're genuinely disturbed about your daughter, Felice. Because you haven't mentioned her to Charles, have you? Somehow, the opportunity has never been right. But you know there'll be plenty of time for that after you're married. And his love for you will make him understand anything. The following morning, Julio sends for you. And he seems in a strangely happy mood when you enter his office. Uh, uh, Orian, come in, come in. Where are the papers? Canceling my contract? On the desk, my dear. There are six copies. The sooner you sign them, the sooner you can start preparing for the great day. You do not want me to perform tomorrow night? Oh, not necessary at all, cara mia. Now, if you just sign the paper... Julio. Yes? Uh, tell me, how is it that this morning you seem so agreeable? Only yesterday you were tearing out your hair, shouting you were ruined. I have had a change of heart. I know about love. I know it cannot wait. I thought it over. After all, who am I to oppose Cupid? Huh? Julio, you are lying. What has happened? All right, you ask. This morning, Madame Brock signed with us. Kitty Brock? You sign her before you cancel my contract? Uh, yes, and I hear the paper, six copies signed at the bottom. I Every... sign nothing. Good day, Julio. Wait, Orion, we must discuss this, please. There is nothing to discuss. The thought that Julio has taken you at your word about leaving the company infuriates you, doesn't it, Orion? that he would sign someone else before you've even given the final release on your contract. And of all people for him to choose, Kitty Brock, a woman you've never liked. 
Since you refused to cancel your contract, you continue to sing your roles. Then a few days later, you learn even more about Kitty. It's during a lull in the rehearsal while you're standing in the wings that Peppo, the property man of the company, whispers the unpleasant news in your ear. My lady. Huh? You? What are you doing sneaking about? I would like to tell you how pleased I am that you remain with the opera after all. Oh, go away, Peppo. No, it is a wise decision you make, Madonna. Uh, that porco is not worthy of you. Porco? How dare you speak of my beloved in that manner? Go about your business, wretch. I must sing in a moment. Yes, my lady, sing. Give your love to music. Do not waste it on him who deceives. Deceives? I speak the truth, my lady. It is him whom you would call husband that deceives you. He has been seeing her these past weeks. I know I followed them. Her? Who? Speak up. It is the other. The one with the voice of a god. Kitty? Oh, no. Peppo, if you speak falsely, I kill you. No, 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 no. I speak the truth. Please, please. Even now, this very moment. Look. The third box to the left. Eh? They're together. Oh. Do, do you see, Madonna? They are not looking down at the opera. <sighs> no, indeed. They look into each other's eyes. No. They are in love. Oh, is it her design to make me out a fool? To take all that is mine? No. Oh, no, I shall not let her do that. has happened, hasn't it, Orianne? Charles and Kitty. The shock of it keeps you confined to your hotel rooms all the next day. And the evening's performance goes badly. And the day after that brings angry words between you and Julio when he tells you that Kitty Brock is going to sing your role tonight, regardless of your contract. Later, the odd, strangely devoted little Peppo comes to your dressing room. My lady. Peppo, please, let me be. Madonna, I beg of you, listen to what I have to say. Oh. Look, after tonight, Madame Brock will bother you no longer. What are you saying, Peppo? In the room where I keep my props, there is a mirror. A mirror especially created for the use of Madame Cazzana. A mirror? Yes. But, ah, such a mirror. And so, so, so practical. You see, it was purchased for Madame Cazzana nearly 20 years ago by a man who was madly in love with her and very jealous. Oh, come now. You're speaking in riddles, old man. Explain yourself. Well, the mirror, the glass, was treated in such a way that a high-pitched trill or vibrato would instantly explode it in one's face. It's just reward for vanity, Madonna, would you not agree? Eh? Especially if one is accustomed to singing into one's mirror, like the good Faust Marguerite. Eh? How is that that you have come to possess this... this mirror? <laughs> Madame Gazzana was in love with another, so she gave the mirror to me. Ah, uh, you're dreaming, old man. If you were telling me the truth, you could not know of the mirror's treatment. Katsana herself did not know. But I do know. The jealous lover told me. When Katsana sang Margarita, and the mirror did not explode, the man came to see why. When I told him I had the mirror, he begged me to give it back for fear some innocent one would be hurt. But... But you kept the mirror? Yes. I was certain that someday it would serve its purpose. Oh, get out of here, people. Uh, this, then, is my reward for offering you happiness. I told you to leave, Peppo. Very well, my fine lady. But the next time, you will come to me. Really? You think no, Madonna, huh? I shall be waiting for you. Downstairs in my room, with my props, where I belong... Where all the ugly things are kept.
You know in your heart there is only hatred for Kitty Brock, don't you, Orion? And you wonder why you fail to take advantage of Peppo's offer. The more you think about it, the more you're certain Peppo told you the truth. The principle of shattering glass by, by vibration has been known for more than a century. And now you've sent him away, the only one who could help you. As you leave your dressing room and start down the circular stairway... Orion! Orion! Oh, Charles! Orion, where have you been? I've tried to reach you. I... Charles, you have to excuse me now. I must see Julio. Oh, wait, it's important. I... I have something to say to you. Well, all right, but do hurry. I... I hardly know how to begin. It's rather difficult to... Charles, what is it? Orion, I must ask you to release me from my promise. Release you? Orion, please don't hate me. I... So it's true. The Brock woman, is it? Yes. Yes, it happened all at once. It was sudden, overwhelming. We... Well, neither of us could help it. Oh, Charles, you fool! Wait! It's finally happened, hasn't it, Orianne? You've lost everything. Though you're still under contract, Julio has replaced you in the company. And now Charles has rejected you. You walk backstage, behind the lofty proscenium, as though lost in a dream. As the hours pass, you can concentrate on only one thing. One person. Kitty Brock. She's the cause of it all, isn't she? Then in the distance, you hear the chorus rehearsing for tonight's performance of Faust. Concealed behind a flat, you watch your daughter Felice as she sings. So young, so alive. Then another voice becomes audible. Kitty Brock rehearsing your role. The role of Margarita. Her voice taunts you, doesn't it, Oriane? You begin to tremble with rage. And then a thought flickers through your mind. Jewel song. Margarita gazes into a mirror. A mirror. The hatred you feel for Kitty Brock swells within you. You turn, rush downstairs to the property room. It's the first time you've been below the opera house. You find the air damp, faded. And as you walk along the dark corridor, you see a dim light at the far end, and you hear Peppo. Peppo! Peppo! Oh. It is the fine lady come to visit Peppo, huh? What an honor you accord me. Peppo, I... I am in need of your help. I have no time to lose. I must have the mirror. Peppo, please give it to me. A moment. For what reason do you want it? For what reason do you think? The Brock woman. She has robbed me of my fiancé, my position, everything. Everything, my lady? Or is it just that she has robbed you of your lover? Are you going to give me the mirror? Yes, I will give you the mirror. Take, take it. <sighs> Thank you. And then now, Peppo. Yes? You leave the building. And stay away until after the performance tonight. Oh, but Madonna, Mr. Cassini, what will he say when he asks me what shall I say? You were called away suddenly. Somebody in the family was ill. Anything, I don't care. It will be safer. If you are not here, they cannot blame you. An accident. Someone picks up the wrong mirror by mistake. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, I will go immediately. You watch Peppo back out of the room, twisting the tattered cap in his hand. The moment he's gone, you pick up the mirror. Quickly, you slip it under your wrap and hurry to your dressing room. You put in a call to Union Station, reserve a compartment on the late train to New York. Moments later, you're backstage, to the left wing, where the garden sequence paraphernalia is set and waiting. You hurry to the jewel box on the table. Quickly, you remove the mirror from the box. Replace it with a deadly one you got from Peppo. Yes, sorry, Anne. In a fraction of a second, the deed is accomplished. Back at your apartment, you spend the rest of the afternoon packing for your trip to New York. Then shortly before six that evening, you hurry from the building. Your train doesn't leave till 9.40. And you decide to have dinner at a quaint little Italian restaurant not far from Union Station. As you approach the waiting cab, the driver opens the door for you. Hurry on! Hurry on, wait! Wait! You turn and see Giulio Cassini hurrying down the street towards you. Hurry, driver. If you're the Italian restaurant, commercial street... 
You're relaxed, aren't you, Orient? Hours later, as the train pulls out of the station, you lean back in your chair, give yourself up to the slow, hypnotic rhythm of the wheels on the track. Wheels that every moment take you further away from the opera house, where the performance is now in progress. Suddenly, a picture flashes through your mind. The opera, Kitty Brock and the Jewel Song. You can see her now, can't you? Singing into the mirror. You can almost hear the high-pitched trill and then the glass shattering. It is too bad, Madame Brock, that your first performance with this company shall be your last. About ten o'clock, you step out of your compartment, start down the narrow corridor toward the club car, and then suddenly your ears become alert. Your brain starts spinning wildly as two voices emerge from a compartment up ahead. Oh, come along, darling. That's Kitty Brock's voice. What is she doing on this train? A moment later, you see her step into the corridor, followed by Charles. You stand there dumbfounded, unable to move, unable to think. Uh, Kitty, don't you think we ought to wire Julio? When we arrive in New York, we'll be soon enough. Do you think he'll be mad because we eloped? Missing the performance tonight, I mean. He'll be furious, of course. But who cares? <laughs> I doubt very much if Orion will ever sing for Cassini again. Yeah, that's true, I suppose. Well, it's Felice. She's quite good, you know. Felice? Who is... Orion's daughter. You didn't know. <laughs> Felice. Felice. Oh, no. Oh, but Felice will have to sing. She's the only one left who knows the rules. <laughs> Conductor! Conductor! Yes, ma'am? I must get off the train immediately. You must stop. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I've I... got to get back to Los Angeles. Well, we'll be in Pasadena in a few minutes. You can get off there, take a cab. What time is it now? Uh, ten minutes after ten, ma'am. All right, all right. I get off at Pasadena. <laughs> One, seven, nine, four. Biddy! Oh, no. It can't be. It can't. Try, try, operator. Oh. Oh. Who was keeping the operator? Operator. Operator. I'm trying to reach Creston 1794. But I keep getting busy signal. Will you check that for me, please? That is a toll call, madam. Oh, hurry, it's important. The number is Creston 1794. Yes. Yes, do hurry. One moment, please. Oh. Really? Who was taking her so long? Operator! Operator! I've got to reach Felice. Hello? Yes, operator. Creston, one seven nine four has been reported out of order. Out of order? I'm sorry if you'll place your call later. But it's important. I must get through somehow. Please, is there anything you can do? I'm sorry, the line is out of order. Oh! Foxy! Foxy! Yes, ma'am? The opera house in Los Angeles... Can you make it in 20 minutes? I've got to be backstage before 10.40. 20 minutes? That's pretty quick, lady. Make it quicker if you can. Don't worry about traffic fines. I pay for everything. Please hurry. It's a matter of life and death. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a brief weather forecast. (laughs) No, I'm not going to predict just how cold it's going to be or how often. But this much I do know. The kind of weather we're likely to have during the next couple of months is tough on car batteries. And you can never tell how suddenly you may need a new one. 
That's why it'll pay every driver to keep these facts in mind about the new Signal Deluxe battery. Unlike ordinary batteries, which may be guaranteed for 12 or 18 months, Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed for a full 30 months on a service basis. The secret of this extra-long life in Signal Deluxe batteries is their superior construction, which includes improved-type rubber separators and a new design all-rubber case, which requires water less often. As a result, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power for quick, dependable starting. So, before you buy any battery, stop by your Signal service station. Find out the liberal trade-in your Signal dealer will offer you on today's finer, longer-life battery. A new Signal Deluxe battery. And now, back to the Whistler. It's a race against time, isn't it, Orianne? The minutes tick away, precious minutes. And finally, your cab roars into downtown Los Angeles. You must reach the opera before the jewel song begins. Before your daughter Felice, as Margarita, sings into the deadly mirror you had hoped would shatter in Kitty Brock's face. Then as you're within half a block of the opera house. Driver, what's the matter? Why are you stopping? Sorry, lady, I can't run over the car in front of me. Can't you go around there? Sorry again, that's impossible. All right, here's your fare. Keep the change. I run the rest of the way. I must get backstage before 10.40. Well, lady, you can't get out here. Be careful. A small crowd had gathered near the opera house, stunned by the news of the tragedy. They saw Giulio Cassini slip out the side entrance with Felice Donati. They watched the sobbing girl, a handkerchief covering her face, being assisted toward the waiting ambulance. Now, now, my dear, everything will be all right. Please, please, let us through. Here, let me have the Please. Julia, oh, I... Take it easy, please. Now, we're all right. Hours later in the hospital waiting room, Giulio Cassini, hands clasped behind his back, stood by the window staring out into the night. The room was quiet except for the gentle sobbing of the woman who sat nearby. <laughs> Giulio turned, placed his hand on her shoulder, and then a door opened softly. A white-clad figure stepped out into the hall and approached them. Doctor? Oh. Uh, Doctor, how is she? Mr. Giulio Cassini. Yes, yes. Will she be all right? Well, she'll pull through okay. Oh. But her face was cut quite badly by the glass. Oh, may we see her now, Doctor? Oh, uh, uh, this is uh, Felice, Doctor, the injured lady's daughter. May we go in? For a moment, yes. Come along. Thank you. Come along. Uh, Mr. Cassini. Yes? Do you know how this accident happened? Oh, uh, according to the cab driver, Orion jumped from a taxi, started to run toward the opera house, saying she had to get there before 10.40. Uh, she did not see the car approaching. 10.40? Oh, yes. Uh, that is just the time when the jewel song starts. And that's when Beppo rushed onto the stage, stopped the show. He grabbed the mirror from me and broke it into a thousand pieces. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. I am 
the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Friends, here's some exciting news. The latest Hooper ratings show that in the last two months, the listening audience of The Whistler has increased by more than 50%. Yes, sir, 50%. And even before this increase, The Whistler was rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. What do we at Signal Oil think about this? Well, naturally, we think it's wonderful. And we want to say thanks to our regular audience and welcome to all you new listeners. And remember, friends, Signal Gasoline is tops, too. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Ticket to Paris. The young, attractive, dark-haired girl looked out through the dirty windowpane of the old bookshop. Watched the rain as it fell on Olive Street. Then, a few minutes after ten, she locked the shop door, turned out the light, and stood for a moment in the darkness. She rubbed her arms and shuddered and then hurried through the darkened bookstore. She would always live in terror of the dark, of even the next moment, so long as one man remained alive, the man who was living only to kill her. She'd been forced into the back streets of obscurity to escape him, and though she despised this grim little bookshop where she worked for the old woman named Hattie Simmons, the job paid for her keep, provided her with more safety than she could find anywhere else. As she reached the door to her room in the back of the shop, she stopped and listened. There was someone in the room, searching the darkness. She threw open the door and switched on the lights. Oh, hello, Madeline. Hattie, what, what are you doing here in my room? I, uh, I couldn't sleep. And this old rocker here is so comfortable, I thought I'd come in and sit a while. Oh, my, it's comfortable. Uh, you don't mind, do you, dearie? No, I don't mind. It's, uh, it's the storm, I suppose. Makes me so restless. Hattie. Yes, dearie? My trunk. I'm certain I had left it closed. Oh. Uh, oh, that. Well, you see... The wine bottle is in the cupboard. Help yourself. Well, now, I don't like to pick up the habit, mind you. But seeing that I can't sleep... Perhaps these would be better for you. Oh, the sleeping tablets. Yes, I was looking for them. The box was here on the table. <laughs> Dear me, my eyes, you know. Here you are. <laughs> Madeleine, it, um, it always struck me kind of queer. A young girl like yourself uh, taking so many of these pills. They're harmless. Yes, I suppose. Uh, but you always seem to have so much on your mind, dearie. Yes. I have many things on my mind, Hattie. <laughs> yes. Um, Madeleine? Yes? Uh, while I was looking for sleeping pills, I noticed your name on the trunk. Uh, didn't think portier was spelled that way. Portier. P-O-R-T-I-E-R. Oh. I couldn't help but notice something else, theory. Inside the trunk. A gun. Of course I have a gun. During the war, many French women had guns. We had to have them. Yes, I suppose. <sighs> I was just wondering. I was just wondering, uh, how come you've got a German gun? Hattie, why don't you take the pills and go back to your room? I'm very tired. All right, all right, Madeline. Uh, you close up the shop all right? Yes, it's locked. Never know when we might have thieves, you know. Uh, good night, dearie. Have a nice sleep. You watch Hattie waddle out the door. And when she's gone, you hurry to the bureau. From the top drawer, you take out a folded newspaper. And for the hundredth time, you stare at the photograph on the front page. The photograph of a man in a Nazi uniform. Over it is the name Einstadt and a question mark. Next to it is another photograph. A young, smiling American correspondent, Alan Tennyson, recently home from Europe. You slip the newspaper into the pocket of your raincoat and hurry out of your room into the shop. And then as you open the front door... Hiya, Frenchie. Oh, you frightened me. What, what are you doing here, George? Can a guy come around to see his old aunt once in a while? Huh? Patty has gone to bed. Fine. 
really didn't come around to see her anyway. I'm sorry. I'm going out. Hey. What's your hurry? George, please let me by. It's raining, I... baby. Terrible night to be out. Please. Much better to stay in. Curl up when I feel good. Or something. Madeline? I... Madeline, is that you out there? Yeah, I thought you said the old goat had gone to bed. Madeline? Madeline, what... Oh, it's you. What are you doing here, George? That seems to be the burning question of the week. Good evening, Aunt Hattie. Madeline, I thought you were going to bed. No, I... I decided to go for a walk. In this weather, dearie? Don't worry about me, Hattie. Good night. A quarter of an hour later, you step off the streetcar. Hurry toward the low red brick building in the middle of the block. At the entrance, the doorman greets you. Good evening, miss. This is the Sequoian Club? Yes, it is. Well, a newspaper man, a Mr. Tennyson, is giving a lecture here. Could I go... Oh, it's over, miss. Over? Ten minutes ago. Oh, but Mr. Tennyson, is he no, still... No, 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 he left. But I must see him. It is important. Well, I think you'll find him across the street at the bar. He was headed in that direction when I saw him last. The bar? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Drink? No. Well, if you won't have a drink, what's on your mind? Mr. Tennyson, there was a story in the paper yesterday about a man, a German named Heinstadt. Heinstadt. Yeah, that's one of my stories. What about it? This man they're holding in a palace prison. The French government is not certain he is really Heinstadt. No, they're not. Plastic surgery is a great thing. But certainly they're really... They know what they're doing. It'll take a little time. You, uh, sure you won't have a drink? No, no. Ah. Well, it's, uh, it's Heinstadt, all right. Look, uh, what makes you so interested in this? Oh, I am curious. Yeah, that's been established. I used to know him. I so? When? During the war in my country when the Nazis occupied Paris. You speak pretty good English for a man, sir. I was educated in England. I see. And just uh, how did you and this Heinstadt get along? Not very well, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. You... You have heard of the Chateau Polanyi? Well, I've been there. It used to be Heinstadt's headquarters in Paris. So? Well, before the war, I worked at the Chateau for a very fine family. Then Heinstadt took over. Only the servants remained. We were forced to work for Heinstadt. Not very pleasant, huh? Especially for a girl... Pretty one of that. It was unpleasant for several of us. So now you'd like to see Heinstadt get what's coming to him. But first they must be certain it is the right man. There must be no mistake. Oh, there won't be. But like I said before, it'll take time. It wouldn't take me to any time. I would know him instantly. Uh-huh. Why are you looking at me like that? You are pretty. Very pretty. Yeah. You look good on the front page. What? My picture? My syndicate could use a follow-up story on Heinstadt. French girl tells all. Sinister figure of Paris occupation. Oh, no, no, I... Think of the publicity, baby. Wouldn't do you a bit of harm. And with the movie studios only a stone's No, throw, I'm not interested. Well, that's a switch. I was sure that's what you were driving at. Excuse me, Mr. Tennyson. I must... Uh, just a minute. Please. What's really on your mind? Nothing. Nothing at all. Why? You interest me. There's something about you that's a little different, and I like people who are different. I like to know what makes them tick. In your case, I think I'm going to enjoy finding out. The thought of your picture in the newspaper, the publicity, frightens you, doesn't it? And that's why you ran away from the correspondent named Tennyson. The man you went to for information on the German who was now being held in a Paris prison. You hurry back to the little bookshop, spend a sleepless night wondering if the prisoner is Heinstadt. You wonder, too, about the newspaper man. If he really meant it when he said that he would find out more about you. The next day, find you in the bookshop as usual. And by afternoon, you're convinced you've seen the last of Tennyson when suddenly a voice behind you 
Uh, pardon me. I'm interested in a mystery called Why Doesn't Mademoiselle Want a Picture Taken? Mr. Tennyson. Hi. How did you find me? Uh, let's go next door. We'll talk about it over coffee. No, I'm alone in the shop. Besides, there's nothing to talk about. Yeah, you gave me quite a chase last night. Why are you afraid, Madeline? How did you know? The me? cop on the beach said it was Madeline. Madeline what? Simonou. Uh-uh. How about Portier? Mr. Tennyson, what do you want of me? I want to know why you're so interested in Heinstein. Or the guy they think is Heinstein. I told you. Yeah, but not all of it. So he was a big, nasty character. All right. The day of the liberation of Paris, Heinstein was prepared to abandon the chateau. I locked him in a room so the Americans would capture him. He pleaded with me, promised anything if I would let him go. When I refused, he swore he would kill me if he ever got away. Uh, so that's it. And he did break out of there before our boys reached the chateau. Yes. I knew that as long as he was at large, somewhere in Paris, I was not safe. I see. So you had to get out of Paris. Yes. Later, I, I came to America. Still don't feel too safe from Heinstadt, huh? Well, I've heard that a few Germans have been able to sneak into this country, and it's possible that... that... Heinstadt may be here now. Any publicity about you would lead him right to your doorstep. That's right. You see, Mr. Tennyson, why it's so important to me that I find out if that man in the Paris prison is really Heinstein. Sure, sure. Well, I'm not going to twist your arm. We'll, uh, we'll just forget the story. Mr. Tennyson, you have contact with these things. Perhaps you will let me know when word comes. When the man is identified? Yes, I'll do that. I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> The days pass slowly, don't they, Madeline? And Alan Tennyson doesn't call. You wonder what is causing the delay. Why the French authorities can't make up their minds about the man in prison. Perhaps you tell yourself the government has decided the man isn't Heinstein. And that the matter has been quietly shelved. Yes. And if that's the case, the man who has sworn to kill you is still at large. Perhaps right here in Los Angeles. You become increasingly nervous as the days go by. And then finally there's a telephone call from Tennyson. He sounds urgent. Asked you to meet him at the bar where you'd met before. Oh, Alan, over here. Oh, yes. Come on, time, Mr. Tennyson. Oh, you are, you are. Sit down here. Thank you. Oh, waiter, champagne, the ladies here. Champagne. Ah, it's an occasion, man. Wait, you have something to tell me. Please don't keep me in suspense. Listen, for you. April in Paris. Mr. Tennyson, no, wait, what? no, wait, wait, wait. There's still the champagne. Been in this bottle since 1922. Ah, there you are, sir. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tennyson, please tell we'll me. We'll drink to it, Madeline. Your glass. The, uh, the wire came this afternoon. That man in prison. It, he was, I thought. Yes, not a doubt in the world. Oh, they were going to force him to stand trial, but... He didn't escape again. No. He's dead. Swallowed poison. Oh, no. Oh? Delight or remorse? Well, in winning, we can afford some sympathy for the loser. Yeah. I guess it's only you. But, oh, I'm so happy now, Mr. Tennyson. Drink. Drink the champagne. To Paris. The Paris I love. To the Paris you love, man. <laughs> Yes, Madeline, you're eager to celebrate, aren't you? Because this news of Heinstadt's death clears the way for you. Yes. Not just to the Paris you love, but to the hidden wealth in the cellar of the Chateau Perlinese. Only you know about that, Madeline. Because it was you who hid it there. A fortune, Madeline. Yours now for the price of a ticket to Paris. That's all you need to do. Return and take what belongs to you through your own cleverness. Hurrying back to the bookshop after leaving Tennyson, you're thinking of only one thing. Where to get the money for your ticket. You're so deep in thought that you don't even notice Officer Davies outside the shop. He looks at you Good concerned. Back, Miss Madeline. What? Oh, oh, Officer Davies. Inside. Hattie and that nephew of hers. George? Uh-huh. They're having a little of a fight. I started to go in, but oh, I Oh, I'll take of... care of it, Officer Davies. It's nothing. But why not? Hattie, I'm not asking for the moon. You you see what I mean? Sometimes I can wring your neck. I think so. All right, I'm going. 
George. Let me buy. But, oh, well. He's out of temper, all right. And if looks could kill. Excuse me, Officer Davies. I've got to talk to Hatch. Yeah, sure. I'll be moving along there. George? No, Hattie. Oh, I thought it was that no-good nephew coming back. I was just hiding this strong box. Now, there. Another quarrel, Hattie? Yes, over the usual thing, money. Oh, Hattie. Yes? Hattie, I must return to Paris. I had a call. I have to return at once. Return? Oh, I'll hate to lose you, Madeleine. Come to count on you a lot. Thank you, but it is very necessary that I go. Soon? That depends. I haven't the money for a ticket. Oh. I was wondering, well, Hattie, could you lend me the money just for a little while? Lend you the... Dearie, you, you know I'm fond of you, but you also know I'm not young anymore. I need what little I have. You must be able to get it somewhere else. No, I'm not. I don't know anyone else. No one that I could even ask. You, you can't turn me down, Hattie. Please, Madeline. I've had all the squabbles about money that I can stand for one night. But, Hattie, I will... Madeline, to... I said no. Oh. Now, good night, dearie. <laughs> She's refused you, Madeline. When you counted on her so much. But it isn't over, is it? No, it can't be. You have to get to Paris, even if it means stealing the money. You'll be able to repay Hattie three times over. The following afternoon, the opportunity you've been waiting for presents itself. Hattie leaves the shop. You wait a half hour after she's gone to be sure she's not just on an errand to the corner store. Then you close the shop, hurry to Hattie's room... And go to the drawer where she's placed the strong box. It's still there. You pick it up, hurry back to your own room, and there you try to force the lock, and then... Well, sweetheart, <gasps> we seem to have the same ideas about things. George. Yeah, that's right, George. Boy with the key to the front door. <laughs> I'll take the strong box, baby. No. Oh, but yes. <laughs> Give it to me. Ah. And you can tell my dear aunt that she won't be seeing me for some time. No, George, you mustn't take that box. Get away from me. Give me... Tell me, George, I... Get away! He shoves you aside and you fall in a daze, your head striking lightly against a trunk. You look at it, Madeline. It's your trunk, your own. And suddenly you remember there's a gun inside. Madeline, put that down. Give me that box, George. Don't come any closer to me. George, I warn you. Madeline, you... You couldn't shoot me. Madeline. You've killed him, haven't you, Madeline? And in a flash, you realize that your plans are ruined. You'll never get away with the money now. George's body would be discovered before you can even get out of town. You stand there, bewildered, wondering what to do, and then... Yes? Madeline? Mr. Tennyson. I wonder if I can stop by. I want to talk to you. Say in about an hour or so. An hour? I don't... All right, Mr. Tennyson. Yes. Do come by. It's a way out, isn't it, Madeline? A sudden way out that's about to be given to you. A little later, you've unlocked the front door, put the strong box back in its place, and you've turned your room into a shambles. Upset the lamps, scuff the rugs, pull things from the dresser drawers. When Tennyson arrives and walks in, you're in the middle of it all, aren't you? Yes. Sprawled out, apparently in deep sleep, the gun clutched tightly in your hand. Madeline, Madeline, what is it? Wake up. Mr. Tennyson, no. Yeah. Is this your gun? My gun? Yes. Madeline, but... what have you done? What's happened here? Did you kill him? Kill him? That man behind the screen. His name was Hawley, George Hawley. I looked in his wallet. George? George Hawley? He's dead? You didn't know? What is it, Mr. Tennyson? What has happened here in the room? Look, do you remember me calling you a while ago? Yes. Yes, I remember. What happened since then? Come on, think hard. Right after your call? Yes. Hattie. She came in. Hattie? George's aunt. She owns the shop. Was he here when she came in? No. Just Hattie and me... She mentioned him, though. They quarreled again. Quarreled? Over money. They were always quarreling over money. Her money? But George thinks some of it belongs to him. It was left by a relative. All right, go on, go on. Then what happened? 
Nothing much. We had some wine together. And is that what put you to sleep? No, I felt sleepy. Like when I... When I take my sleeping pill. I see. Madeline, where's Huddy now? I... I don't know. Uh-huh. You, uh... You know something, Madeline? This is all too pat. What do you mean? Look at this room. The way things have been tossed around. I don't think there was a struggle here at all. You don't... This whole setup is a phony. The room was made to look like there'd been a struggle. This lamp on the floor, it didn't fall. It was placed there. The bookcase, it was pulled from the Mr. wall. Mr. Tenson, I... Look, Madeline, I've been suspicious of you right from the start. You and that Heinstead guy. But I explained... I like to do my own explaining, find my own answers. Last night I got to thinking you might have been Heinstead's girlfriend. His girlfriend? Yes, he had one, you know. A French girl named Diane Roger. Diane Roger, but she's dead. She threw herself into the Seine on the night of the occupation. Yeah, that's the answer your governor sent me this afternoon. Then... What you were thinking last night... Last night doesn't matter, or what I thought then. The important thing now is the dead man behind that screen. But you do believe me. Like I said, this whole thing is a little too pat. It's a frame. And Hattie could have framed it. Hattie? She would do this to me. Why, look, if you'd have planned to kill George, you wouldn't have tried to do it this way. I think you're a lot smarter than that. Oh, I'm glad you see it that way. Uh Uh-huh. I'd better call the police now. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Thank you very much. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. But now, a message for missing drivers. I mean drivers who are missing something. And that means you, if you're not powering your car with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. One thing you're missing is that good, good mileage, which has made Signal gasoline known throughout six western states, from Canada to Mexico, as the go-farther gasoline. But equally important, you're missing the superior performance in today's signal gasoline, which makes such mileage possible. You see, in order for today's signal to help you get the most from every drop of gasoline, it has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you also enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother power. So you see, in gasoline, mileage and performance do go hand in hand. And that's why signal says... To be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. You congratulate yourself, Maggie. Your plan seems successful. You're certain you've sold Alan Tennyson on the idea that you were the victim of a plot by Hattie. That she had killed her nephew and had fixed the blame on you. And now it looks like he's going to help you. Because he seems convinced of Hattie's guilt. You listen as he calls the police and tells them what's happened. Then he calls his newspaper. Minutes later, he's back in your room and you notice a strange expression on his face. Is something wrong? One of the boys just cabled a story from Paris. The French authorities found a fortune in jewels in the cellars of the Chateau Polonais. Oh, no. You seem disappointed. You know, that hunch I had last night, maybe I was right after all. Maybe Heinstadt's girlfriend, Diane Roger, didn't jump in the Seine the night of the occupation. Maybe it was the real Mademoiselle Portier who was pushed into the river. How about that, Dion? You will never be able to prove it, Mr. Tennant. No, I guess not. What about the dead man over there, George Hawley? Has he tried to frame me? Madeline? Madeline? Where are you, dearie? I... Oh, hello, Hattie. Officer Davis? How are you, miss? So, the police found you, Hattie. Found me? Well, what are you talking about, dearie? I've been with Officer Davis all afternoon. We went down to Long Beach. <laughs> Hattie wanted someone to go along with her. Protection, you know. And it was my afternoon off. Protection? So I... That's right, dearie. Forget what I said last night. I changed my mind. I decided to go down to the bank where my brother works to get the money you wanted for your ticket to Paris. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. 
brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Search for Maxine. For a long time, he'd been standing in the darkened doorway across the street from the Swank Bachelors Club. As Ted Pomeroy struggled to make up his mind, he stared up at the second-floor windows of the building and puffed nervously at a cigarette. It was the last thing he wanted to do, to go to Cousin Walter for a favor. But there was nothing else he could do. Ted was a good newspaper man who'd suffered one bad break after the other through no fault of his own. But he always felt that someday the big opportunity would present itself. Now that opportunity had arrived, but he needed capital. And Walter Pomeroy was the only man he knew who had the kind of money he needed. Suddenly, Ted flipped a cigarette into the streets and hurried into the bachelor's club. Unnoticed by the desk clerk, he strolled across the lobby, up the stairs to the second floor, and stopped before the door of apartment 206. Come in, come in. I, I. Hello, Walter. Well, well, well. Theodore. Cousin Theodore. <laughs> well, come in, come in. You're just in time for dinner. The boy will be up in a minute. Oh, no, I... thanks. I haven't much time. I only stopped in for a oh. minute. You mean you won't forget bygones to the extent of having dinner with me? Well, look, let's forget that stuff, shall we? We're grown up now, Walter. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, sit down. No, I I won't be too long. Okay, sit yourself. Um, uh, how are things on the West leading newspaper, huh? Fine. You're getting paid regularly? Sure. Well, then what's this visit for? Well, it's this way. A friend of mine, Dan Alby, he's down in Portstown now. Look. Here, here's a letter I got from him. He's buying a paper, their little country sheet, eight pages, twice a week. So? So he wants me to go in with him. It's just what I've been looking for. What are the places growing? We can double the circulation in six months, and with some of the ideas uh, I have... <laughs> What's the matter? What's so funny? <laughs> you? <laughs> How much, Ted? The price is 10000 I'll need half of it. 5000 bucks. <laughs> Walter, I'm asking you for a loan. You can have the whole plant for security. Ah, I'm not interested in newspapers. You mean you're not interested in me? Oh, I didn't say that. You're not interested in letting bygones be bygones. And I didn't say that either. I thought we agreed to forget... Oh, I didn't agree to anything. Okay, Walter, okay. That answers my question. (laughs) 
It's good for a laugh, though. <laughs> I thought you once said you'd never come to me, even if you were starving to death. <laughs> That's enough, Walter. If you haven't had a couple of drinks too many. Five thousand bucks, and you thought I just handed it. <laughs> Good enough, Walter. I'd like to... Hey, take your hands off me, or I'll... Okay, Walter, you asked for it. Go! I've owed you that for a long time, Walter. Sure, you're right. I was stupid. Get up, Walter. Walter! As you bend over him, you see the ugly gash on his right temple, where his head struck the edge of the fireplace. A cold wave of fear sweeps over you. You stare at him, unable to move, to think. And suddenly you remember the beachhead at Salerno where you saw dead men off him. You grasp Walter's pulse and feel nothing. I've killed him. The realization of what you've done overwhelms you, doesn't it? Slowly you turn, half stumble across the room to the door. Your only thought now is escape. Yes, escape. There's still a chance you can slip away unnoticed, isn't there, Ted? The desk clerk downstairs didn't see you come in. Now, if you can get out of the building without being seen, you'll be in the clear. You place your handkerchief over the knob door and turn it. Before you step out of the hall, you look back to give the room one last look. And then you see it. The telephone receiver is off the hook. Uh, hello? Walter? Yeah, this is Walter. <laughs> Look, when I want impersonations, I'll go see a floor show. Now, why don't you call your dear cousin Walter and tell him I'm getting tired of holding this telephone? Oh. Uh, who will I say is calling? He knows. I made that pretty clear before you barged into his apartment. Theodore. What what makes you think I barged in? From this end, the dialogue sounded more like a brawl than a tea party. Come on, friend, put him on. Well, he he's not here. He just stepped out. Then let me talk to Bill. Bill? Last name Putnam, Walter's business manager. You're supposed to have dinner there. Or is he now administering first aid? He hasn't arrived. Listen, why don't you give me your name and number? Walter and I'll already have... has it. I gave it to him a year ago at a moment of weakness. Good dinner, Mr. Pomeroy. <gasps> Hello? Hello? Are you still there? Listen, Walter won't be back. Call him later in the morning. Hey, what's going on? Mr. Pomeroy? You in there? Mr. Pomeroy? You tell yourself you haven't a chance. The bellboy out there pounding on the door... The girl on the phone who has heard everything, who can send you to the chair with a word. What's happened to Walter has changed your entire outlook, hasn't it, Ted? And suddenly the idea occurs to you. Walter must have her telephone number written down somewhere. You know you must get that girl to protect yourself. You search frantically for his telephone list. You find a gun in the top drawer of the desk and put it in your pocket. And then as you hear the bellboy rattling his keys outside... You find what you're looking for. A small brown leather book with some names and numbers in it. Just in time, you jump for the door and slide behind it as it opens. Mr. Pomeroy? Mr. Pomeroy, what's the matter? Holy cow! Larry! Hey, Larry! The moment he turns the corner, you race for the back stairs two steps at a time and rush out into the alley. The cold air feels good on your face, and you hurry away, still unseen and safe. Except for the girl. Yes. Yeah. The news will be out in a matter of hours, on the radio and the papers, and when the girl learns about it, the quarrel she overheard on the telephone will tip her off, and you know she'll go to the police. You can't have that, can you, Ted? I've got to find that girl. Find her. Stop her. the prologue of Search for Maxine, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Ponce de Leon spent his lifetime looking in vain for a spring whose waters would keep him young. Had he been looking for a prescription to keep cars young, I could have told him where to go, to a signal service station. 
Yes, signal dealers have just what the doctor ordered. Signal premium compounded motor oil for your engine. And signal double-check lubrication for your car's chassis. There are good reasons why signal premium compounded motor oil keeps that new car pep in your engine longer. Its 100% pure paraffin base is fortified with scientific new compounds that do so much more than just lubricate. As a result, Signal Premium cleanses your motor of carbon, gum, and varnish, protects bearings against corrosion, and does other important jobs that regular oil alone can't do. And when it comes to chassis care, Signal Double Check Lubrication is just as superior. Signal dealers use nine specialized lubricants to give each part on your car the exact type of protection it needs for long, trouble-free service. And they check each part not just once, but twice, to make sure not a single part is overlooked. So when it's time for an oil change or a lube job, remember the place that has what it takes to keep your car young. Your signal service station. She's the only thing standing between you and freedom, isn't she, Ted? The girl who overheard your quarrel with Walter Pomeroy. And when she finds out what's happened at Walter's apartment, you know that she'll notify the police. And you know, too, that you must prevent her from going to the police. You have only little time to find her and silence her. It's going to be difficult locating this girl, isn't it, Ted? You don't know who she is. All you have is a small brown leather book with some names and phone numbers in it. Walter's memo book. A dozen names in it belong to women, and you wonder which one is hers. As you step into a phone booth, you try to hold the sound of the girl's voice in your mind, hoping you'll know it when you hear it again. Hello? Annalene? Yes? Hey, this is, uh, Tom Sherman. Sherman? Hi. I'm sorry, I don't seem to remember... Catalina, we met there last summer. Oh, you must have the wrong Annalie, Mr. Sherman. I haven't been to Catalina in years. Are you sure that you... No dice. Hello? I'd like to speak with Louise. She I... ain't in. If you're the guy who's been bothering her, let me tell you... Hello? May I speak with Janice? Oh, sorry, she's not here. She's visiting in the east. Can I help No, you? thanks. I'm sorry, sir. Your party does not answer. You say you're making a survey? Well, my little hit isn't much good at Vegas, but I'll surely be glad if... Is this Maxine? That's right. Who's this? I was talking to you on the phone a little while ago. Oh, yes. Theodore. You're the fellow who hangs up in people's faces. Sorry. We, we were cut off, Angel. You were so coy about giving me your phone number, I couldn't call you back. Uh-huh. So you went out and bought yourself a crystal ball? No, no. I, I just called up every girl in Walter's little book. Ashby 86347 was yours. Why did you do that? Well, maybe I wanted to see if the girl is as nice as her voice. Uh, how does one blush over the telephone? Look, why uh, why don't you save us both a lot of trouble, honey? Why, why don't you just tell me where I can meet you? Uh-uh. And... I'd rather keep it this way. I can be pretty persistent. And I can be pretty stubborn. I'm sorry, Theodore. Oh, but... wait a minute. What's the music? Radio? No, it isn't the radio. Now, look, you're a nice boy, I suppose... But I'm really too busy to play games. Well, won't you at least give me your last name? Some other time. Bye. Well, Maxine, wait! A feeling of panic sweeps over you as you stand there in the telephone booth. And something inside tells you to run. To take the next plane for anywhere. But you struggle against the urge and fight it down. 
You've been a reporter a long time, haven't you, Ted? Certainly long enough to know what happens to a man who runs. What you must do is coldly clear. You've got to find that girl, Ted. It's the only way. Hey. Yeah? Through the phone? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. It to bother you, but I gotta get hold of the little woman. The more I explain to her now, the less I'll have to do when I get home. Boy, they're sure going all out in that parade, ain't they? Yeah, yeah. Parade? Excuse me. Sure, what's the matter? What was that you said about a, a parade? Well, like I said, a big parade coming up the street. Crosstown traffic's had up for two hours. Coming by here? Yeah, band's down the street now. Band. That's what I heard over the phone. What? Nothing. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yes, Ted, you notice them now. The crowds lining the curbs outside and down the street coming towards you is the brass band at the head of a parade. The same brass band that you heard over her telephone, passing so close by that it almost covered her voice. So you do know something about her, don't you, Ted? That she's someplace not far from the street, and the band had passed her at exactly one minute to nine. You remember looking at your watch. It's a chance, isn't it, Ted? A wild one, perhaps, but one that you must take. Excuse me, will you? Uh, mind letting me through? Oh, goodness. If you're going to walk along with a parade, young man, why don't you get out there? You weren't listening, were you, Ted? You were threading your way along that sidewalk through the crowds for a very definite purpose. And you kept it up for a full block and then looked at your watch again. It took the parade a minute and 20 seconds to cover one block. Figuring it back, that meant they'd covered 13 blocks since passing the girl's telephone. Alvarado Street, Ted, that's where she was. Probably in that big apartment house opposite the signal oil station on the corner. Apartment 20, Jones. 21, Leibs. Apartment 20... What are you looking for, young man? Why, uh... I, I was looking for Maxine. Maxine who? Why... Oh, I... There's no Maxine living here. I'd know. I'm the manager. Hey, it's, it's all right. Thanks. Oh, uh, there's a Maxine in the next apartment house. Oh? What number? Kind of funny the way you're snooping around here, trying to find names and apartment numbers. What's this all about? Well, you know how it is. We just met her. An awfully nice uh, kid, but I, I didn't get around to last names. Uh -huh. Girlfriend, huh? I'd like her to be. Uh-huh. In that case, I wouldn't waste my time next door. The Maxine I'm talking about is 72. Your heart sinks, Ted, and you walk away. And the nameplates in the apartments on the rest of the block reveal no more Maxine. You're left with only one more possibility. A residence hotel in the middle of the block. You enter the place and decide to try to call her again. Walk past the cigarette counter in the lobby toward a row of phone booths in the rear. Here, here, just a minute, mister. What's the matter? Where are you going? Just want to use the phone. Oh, oh well, go ahead, but make it fast. This here's woman's hotel, house rule against men in the building after 11 on weeknights. Oh, I, I'll hurry it up, thanks. The janitor doesn't notice, does he, Ted? But you're trembling as you fumble for a coin. Dial the girl's number again. Ashby, 86347. Hello, Maxine. Here we go again. What is it this time, Theodore? What? I'm still trying to wear you down. Because you like my voice? Right. And another thing. I think you'll live in the Grace and Arms. You're a remarkable detective. Give up? <laughs> Why should I? I don't live in the Grace and Arms. I live on the other side of town. Oh, wait, now. Be honest with me, Maxine. I wish I knew why you're going to all this trouble. I told you, I, I like your voice. Oh, sure. Uh, hold it a minute, will you? Yeah, yeah, I'll be here. Yes, Ted, you'll be there, anxiously waiting and wondering, too, won't you, Ted? Wondering if Maxine is lying, playing with you, knowing all the time what it was all about. Feeling of panic returns, doesn't it? You look out of the glass doors of the telephone booth across the marble floor to the cigarette stand by the entrance. Notice a man buying cigarettes from the girl at the counter. He leaves, and another man comes in, and you freeze, your heart standing still. It's the distributor with the early editions of the morning papers. 
You know what must be in those papers, but you can only stare as you wait for Maxine at the other end of the wire. Hello, Eddie. Hi. About ready to fold? Mm. See the papers on the counter. Nice. Nice. Your mind is paralyzed, isn't it? With nothing sinking in. Not even as you see the girl at the counter some 30 feet away across the lobby turn and pick up a telephone receiver. Now, let's see. Where were we, Theodore? You were stringing me along about living on the other side of town. Listen, Maxine, you've got to... Got to what? What's the matter, Theodore? You still there? Hello? Hello? Then it hits you, doesn't it? So hard that you almost shake. Your hand grabbing the phone, your head tight. The girl you're talking to over the phone is the girl at the cigarette counter across the lobby. Maxine. Hello? Hello, Ted. A trembling, surging relief sweeps over you, all through you. You've found her, haven't you, Ted? At last, you found Maxine. You slump back in the booth, watch Maxine across the lobby. She keeps trying to talk into the phone, rouse you. And then finally, she hangs up. You tell yourself that you'll wait there in the booth until she leaves and then follow her out. And then she reaches for something that makes you change your mind. You leave the booth and quickly cross the lobby. Wait, wait a minute. Yes? Uh, too late to sell me a pack of cigarettes? I'm afraid so, just locked up. Not even for an old friend? You're two laps ahead of me. I've been calling you all evening. No. Yeah. So your cousin Theodore. Disappointed? Crushed. I I thought you'd be more like Walton. Oh. Uh, that's a compliment. Sorry now, I was so stubborn. How'd you find me? Crystal ball. <laughs> you ought to get yourself a booth at the county fair. Do you really live across town? Mm-hmm. Worst looking house on the street. Good, then I I can walk you home. My car's outside. Oh. It'll hold, too. Let me get my hat and coat. Be back in a minute. Okay. As she moves off, your hand goes to the gun in your pocket. You take it out, check the clip. It's loaded, ready. The car is a real break, isn't it, Ted? It'll be much safer in the car. Hey. Yeah? Seen the girl who runs the cigarette counter here? Yeah, she's gone home. You sure? So I'll leave. How long ago? Five minutes, maybe. That's funny. Okay. Thanks. Sure. A plainclothes detective. He has that look, hasn't he, Ted? And you move after him. Quietly glance through the glass door to see him looking at a car parked out front and then... All set, Theodore. The car's right outside. Stay right there. What? What are you... That's right. It's a gun. Don't open your mouth or... Never mind that now. Closet. Get in there. And if I won't? I'll kill you. I wonder. He's coming back. You'll find out in two seconds. All right. All right, Ted. Hey, what do you mean she's left? I checked outside and... Where'd that guy go? Hey, anybody here? Yeah. What's the matter? Where's the girl who takes care of the cigarette counter? Oh, she's still around here somewhere. The guy just told me she went home. Oh. The car's still outside. Oh, she ain't gone home. Ain't given me the keys yet for the morning girl. Might take a look in the back room. Maybe she's getting her hat and coat. They're gone. Come on. That's Bill Putnam, Walter's business manager. I shot what a you... kill you right here. Now get going. Where? Across the street. We're going to take a walk. A nice, quiet walk in the park. We can be alone. No one will see what's going to happen. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Since Thursday will be St. Patrick's Day, you've no doubt been getting your share of Killarney on today's radio programs. I had thought of describing how your friends would turn green with envy when you power your car with signal gasoline. 
because today's signal drives the pings and sluggishness out of a motor like St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. Or, I thought of reminding you, that your wallet would feel lucky as a four-leaf clover because of signal's good mileage. But sure, in Degora, when you buy gasoline, there's really just one thing that matters. You want to be sure that you're getting the tops in quality, the gasoline that helps your motor operate at top efficiency. And that's something you can determine with your own speedometer. After all, when your motor runs more efficiently, you not only enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother, knock-free power, but also more mileage. Good reason why we're so proud of Signal's famous mileage. And why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. You tell yourself that this is the way it's got to be, don't you, Ted? Yes, from the moment you realize that Maxine could send you to the chair because of the quarrel she heard over the telephone. Your quarrel with Walter. You knew you had to find her and silence her. Now, as you follow her into the park, your hand grips the gun in your pocket. It'll be over quickly, won't it? Simply, coldly, and... You'll be away and free. As you reach the protective, shadowy darkness of the park, Maxine stops, turns calmly to face you. There's a look on her face, a look that could haunt you for the rest of your life. And then suddenly you know. You know that lover or hater, you simply cannot kill her. Get away, Maxine. I'm, I'm not going to do what I can. Go on, get away. Do what I said, get away now before I change my mind. No, Ted. Come on. Let's, let's sit down here. I think you'd better tell me everything. It's all over, isn't it, Ted? You know that whatever it is that's in a murderer isn't in you. And you can't bring yourself to kill Maxine. Now you sit with her on a park bench. You've told her the whole story. I didn't mean to do it, Maxine. I could never hate Walter that much or anyone. I know. Cigarette? Thanks. And now what, Ted? Oh. I'll have to take my medicine. Turn myself in. I'll just find an officer. And... You won't have to, Ted. Look, coming down the path. Bill Putnam. There's a policeman with him. Maxine! Maxine, where the devil have you been? The officer on the beach and I have been looking all over. Oh. Bill, this is Ted Pomeroy, Walter's cousin. Well, that's a break. I've been trying to locate you too, Ted. Oh, what about Walter? They've got him down at City Hospital. But... Hospital? Then he isn't... There's some lug busted into his apartment tonight and hit him over the head. Walter says he never saw the guy before. Funny thing, nothing stolen, no sign Maxine, of it. Maxine, Maxine, did you hear? Yes, Ted, I heard. Everything's all right now. Well, um, how about coming out of the hospital with me, Ted? Walter wants to see you. Keeps asking about you. Something about uh, investing in a newspaper. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. During the current Red Cross drive, Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you it's the little contributions each one of us make which enable the Red Cross to be of such big help in time of need. Featured in tonight's story were Rye Billsbury, Doris Singleton, and Joseph Kearns. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Harold Swanton and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking... 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Death of Mr. Penny. On the icy slope high above Clear Valley Ski Lodge, the two people, racing down together side by side, appeared like two moving specks of black against a sea of white. To the little man who had his field glasses carefully trained upon them, the picture was far more complete. He saw a very handsome couple, the woman fresh, radiant, and wholesome, the man tall, athletic. And as they swung to a stop at the end of the ski slope, their happiness with each other seemed very apparent. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Eklund seemed perfectly matched. The little man with the field glasses could not help but marvel at the strange course of true love. How it could so neatly bridge the gap between the fact of Mrs. Eklund's almost fabulous wealth and the modest means of Mr. Eklund, the mere ski instructor. And the little man had to admit that the two were getting along famously. <laughs> oh, darling, you're wonderful. Your favorite ski instructor? My favorite ski instructor. Yeah. Well, then you'll accept my criticisms a little more graciously, Mrs. E. <laughs> At last, Christy was bad. Fine way to turn an ankle. And be carried home by the tall, bronzed instructor. I think I'll do it. I think you won't. <laughs> we're heading back to the lodge right now. <laughs> All right, darling, whatever you say. Yeah. But, um, I've still got that headache. Barbara. Yeah. Something on your mind. You were so quiet up there on the slope just before we came down. Quiet? Just taking time to tell myself I'm not in a dream. That we're really together. Married. And so happy. Are you sure that's all? I'm sure that's all. And the headache can either be cured or made worse by a dry martini. Shall we go take the gamble? Oh, you don't have to suggest that twice. <laughs> I wonder if you'll always be such an agreeable man. Yeah, as long as I'm thirsty. Let's go. <laughs> An agreeable man. Yes, Fred, you've been that with Barbara, haven't you? That and more. And you know that she appreciates it. That you've made her very happy. But you also know that there is something disturbing her this afternoon. Something more than a simple headache. You worry about it yourself. Bring it up again as the two of you sit by the roaring fire of the lodge and look out at the landscape through a giant picture window. You, uh, still don't feel any better, dear? No. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go upstairs, nap for a couple of hours before dinner. Mind? You know I don't. What will you do to amuse yourself? Oh, look at the scenery. Well, that's not novel enough. You know it too well. <laughs> oh, no. I see something different every time I look out the window. Here. Here, I'll mm -hmm. prove it. Did you ever see anything like that? <laughs> I don't see what... Yeah. You mean that little man on the terrace? Uh-huh. The one with the field glasses. Looks like an African explorer. Now, you can't say I see anything like that every day. No, uh, 
But I, I didn't mean people. I... Frederick, I... If you don't mind, I'm going upstairs right now. Oh, but you haven't finished I'm your... sorry, darling. I don't want my drink. Oh. Well, I'll go up with you, dear. No, huh? please. I... Uh, Frederick, hmm? you could do something for me. That new book I want. The manager said they have it in the village now. Oh, I'll Wait. drive right down. I'll get it for you, dear. Glad to. But, uh, are you sure you're all right? Oh, I will be. Just give me an hour. I'll be bright as a new penny. Bright as a flower. Uh, by dinner time. Mm-hmm. Sounds worth waiting for. Go ahead, darling. Thanks, darling. <laughs> You watch Barbara turn away, go to the stairs. A moment later, you get up, start outside as if to get the car. But at the end of the terrace, you stop and wait a moment. He goes right inside, doesn't he, Fred? The funny little man that Barbara didn't want to look at. You walk back and see him hurry up the stairs after her. Ten minutes later, he's back down, heading toward the cocktail lounge. You walk in casually and slide into the booth beside him. Well, Mr. Penny, it's going very well. You got it? I did. 5,000 as usual. Mm. I was a little worried this afternoon. Thought Barbara might have guessed something. About you? Mm-hmm. But I was wrong. Of course. Oh, Barbara threatened me today. She said that this must be the last payment. She's convinced that you'd be quite understanding about those letters. Oh. I'll have to take a different tack. Yes, or spoil the act. Oh, they're really nothing, you know, the letters. She just feels that you'd be very hurt if you ever knew there'd been another man in her life once, a married man. <laughs> I hurt. <laughs> uh, you know, Freddy, you are the odd one. Long as I've known you, I always marvel. What is it that keeps you from simply presenting your case to these women, demanding all the money you want? Obviously, my dear Penny, you'll never know women. There are things that cannot be told. One of the things is that love alone is not sufficient to hold their man. Hey, you're right, I suppose. Well, I've always left that part of it to you. Yeah, let's keep it that way, huh? I'll take care of the romancing. You stick with the business end of the deal. Uh... If you don't mind, I'll take my half of the money now. To be sure, Freddy. To be sure. As you conclude your present business with Mr. Penny, he excuses himself and hurries away. A moment later, you're conscious of the voice. The song that comes from the large dining hall. One day, maybe Monday. Susan, a delightful girl, isn't she, Fred? Talented and beautiful. Sure yes, and since you met her a month ago, she's been quite overwhelmed by your charm. Maybe you stroll across the lobby and stand there at the entrance of the dining hall and watch her as she sings. He'll build a little home. She's beautiful, isn't she? Hmm? Oh, Penny, I thought you were leaving. I'm going in to have dinner. Now look, Penny, Barbara will be coming down soon. She isn't pleasant to be with when you're... Uh... Your wife is resting, Freddy. She won't be down for some time. But, shh, I want to listen. And so all else above, I'm waiting for the man I love. <clears throat> that was wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Susan sings beautifully, does she not, Freddie, my boy? Mm-hmm. She's um, quite a girl. Quite a girl. Yes. Another one of your many side interests. You've always had them, haven't you? <laughs> Thank you, my boy. Let's go out on the terrace for a moment. I want to talk to you. Come on. It's the idea we've already talked everything out. No, not quite, my boy. After you. All right, what's on your mind, Penny? Susan, I want to speak to you about Susan. Oh? You're quite interested in her, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. Just for laughs, maybe. Oh, I see. Then you won't mind if I ask you to stay away from her. To stay away? You're asking me... <laughs> Wait a minute, Betty. You don't mean that you... <laughs> you find it amusing, my boy. Why, well, she wouldn't even look at you. <laughs> oh, Betty, she has many times. So often that I don't want you to see her anymore. Oh, just like that, huh? <laughs> and just what will you do if I ignore your advice, lover boy? Oh, I can make things rather unpleasant for you. Really, I could. Really? Like what? Oh, tell your wife that you're my business partner. That we're blackmailing her together? You know what I'd do? No, what would you do, Freddy? Until you forced me into it a trick. I was only playing along with you until I saw my chance to turn you over to the police. Barbara's very much in love with me, Penny. She'd believe it. Yes, yes, I suppose she would. Well, in that case, I should have to tell her about the Carson widow. The incident at Sun Valley two years ago. What? 
that the police are interested in finding the man who went skiing with a Carson woman the morning she was killed. Accidentally. Now, wait a minute, Penny. I could tell your wife what really happened, Freddy. So be a good boy and stay away from Susan, eh? With the prologue of Death of Mr. Penny, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Here in Hollywood, where The Whistler is produced, this is the week when the movie folks decide who's going to win the coveted Oscars. <laughs> it's too bad there isn't an Oscar for gasoline, because I'm sure that Signal Gasoline would run away with the honors for outstanding performance. Just as some actors become typed in certain roles... You may have typed Signal Gasoline for economy because of its reputation as the go-farther gasoline. But economy, mind you, is only half of Signal's story. You see, the thing which makes Signal's good mileage possible, the extra efficiency today's Signal Gasoline coaxes from your motor, also makes Signal the logical choice for more dramatic performances, calling for instant starting, flashing pickup, or smooth, effortless power. So if you want your car to perform... As if it had just won an Oscar. Just you keep these two points in mind the next time you buy gasoline. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go farther gasoline. came as a shock, didn't it, Fred? Mr. Penny's warning. And you wonder if your odd little partner really means to carry out his threat, to make trouble for you if you continue to see Susan. He could make things quite difficult, reviving the Carson incident at this time. It would never do if your wife Barbara found out about that, would it? But in the days that follow, you decide to risk it, to test Mr. Penny's threat. And then one evening at the lodge, as you sit in the cocktail lounge with Barbara... Uh. Fred. Yes, dear? Uh, did you happen to run over to Shelville the night before last? Shelville? Why, no. Uh, Betty mentioned it this afternoon. Uh, she and Greg thought they saw you there. No, no, they were mistaken. Oh, I did go down to the village here. That's the night I ran into Higby, an old friend of mine. You remember, darling, I called you. Told you I'd be late getting back? Yes, I know. As a matter of fact, Higby and I spent most of the evening at the Buckhorn Cafe talking over old times. Uh, see here, Barbara, you don't think I'd... I'd lie. Well, of course not, darling. You know how Betty is, wrong as usual. Um, see if you can get the waiter, will you, dear? I think I'd like another brandy before turning in. Oh, Freddy, my boy. I could say that this is a pleasant surprise, but it isn't really. I've been expecting you. Can I come in? Well, I was about to retire, but thanks. I won't take up too much of your time. Oh, no hurry. Fix yourself a drink, my boy. Thanks again. Oh, none for me. I have my glass of milk, you see. <clears throat> well, here's to you, Penny. The winner. Oh? It's all yours. Susan, I mean. I'll stay away. Oh, good, good. You, uh, you told Barbara you saw me in Shellville the other night, didn't you? Did I? Yeah, it was just a warning, just in case I had any ideas about not playing ball, huh? Well, I could have told her you were with Susan, but, uh, I didn't. Thanks, thanks. It was bigger of you. I, I thought so. However, Freddy, my boy, if you insist... I know, I know. And I'll stay away from Susan. It's all settled. Uh, settled? No, no, not quite. I've been thinking, Freddy, my boy. What about? The money we collect from your wife. 5000 every three months. Well, it doesn't seem worthwhile. Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't push Barbara too hard. Well, 2000 more isn't such a push. Yeah, but there might be trouble. I wouldn't try. Let's leave it the way it is, huh? 5000 good enough. Well, perhaps, but uh, when one has to split it two ways... I said it's enough. For you, perhaps, but not for me. Yes, I've been thinking, Freddy. I've been thinking I should dissolve our little partnership. What? Yes. I think that from now on, I shall keep all the money. Wait a minute. I'm the one who gave you Barbara's letters in the first place. So what? You think I'll hold still for you cutting me out? But, my boy, there's nothing you can do about it. Because of Sun Valley, Mrs. Carson... Why, you... Oh, 
please don't get excited. I ought to wring your scrawny little neck. But you will not. You will do nothing. Now, please, go. I'm quite tired. Good night, Freddy. For a moment, you stand there, staring at the little man. You watch him as he calmly drops a sleeping capsule into the glass of milk. As he raises it to his lips, he smiles at you. And you know he has you at his mercy, don't you, Fred? You whirl and rush out into the corridor. And as you hurry back to your room, the rage within you mounts with each step. Yes, Mr. Penny has complete control of the situation for the present. But you're not going to let him get away with it, are you? No, the money he gets from your wife means too much to you. And you know that somehow you're going to get rid of Mr. Penny and the threat he holds over you. It isn't until the following afternoon that you know just how you're going to do it. On an errand for Barbara, you stop at the village drugstore, Pop Grandin's place. That be all, Freddy? Yeah, I guess so, Pop. Okay. Oh, say, uh, you going back up the lodge? Yeah, why? I wonder if you'd mind dropping off a prescription for me. Oh, of course not. You can just drop it off the desk. Come on back. I'll make it up right away, hmm? You walk with Pop Grand into the back of the shop. Watch him as he prepares the prescription. Then your eyes wander over the shelves lined with bottles. At the far end of the lower shelf, you see a bottle filled with tiny red capsules. Just like the one you saw Mr. Penny drop into the glass of milk last night. Oh, dreaded the telephone. Eh, excuse me, will you, Freddy? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure. I never saw it to feel. Every time I get back here, that dog goes... Couldn't have picked a better time. As you take the bottle down off the shelf, the idea hits you, doesn't it? Yes, this could be the way, couldn't it, Fred? Quickly, you unscrew the cap, drop a capsule into your pocket, and replace the bottle. Then your eyes skip along the shelf and finally stop on a small bottle filled with white powder marked poison. Deadly poison, Fred. Uh, sorry to be so long, Freddy. That was Mrs. Ferguson, and you know how she is. Talk, 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 talk. Yeah, where was I? The prescription. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that'll only be a minute, Freddy. Sure nice of you to do this little favor for me. Not at all, Pop, not at all. It's a pleasure. You're thankful that Barbara is out when you return to your room at the lodge. Quickly, you empty the contents of the red capsule into the wash basin. Then you fill the capsule with a white powder you took from the shelf at Grandin's drugstore. Moments later, you leave the room, the capsule containing the deadly poison, safely tucked away in your pocket. that evening, you pay another call on Mr. Penny. Oh, come in, Freddy, my boy. Come in. Thanks. I'm going out shortly. You don't mind if I finish shaving, do you? No, no. Go ahead. Make yourself at home, my boy. Fix yourself a drink. Thanks. I'll skip this one. As you wish. But tell me, to what do I owe the honor of this visit? Well, I, uh, I, I, I thought maybe you'd reconsider. <laughs> what? After the way you double-crossed me with Susan? Not a chance, my boy. Not a chance. I'd, uh, I'd take a smaller cut. And as a matter of fact, I've been seriously thinking of asking your wife for more money. I told you before, that would be a mistake. She won't pay it. We shall see. We shall see. What are you doing, Freddy? Hmm? Oh, just looking at this magazine on your nightstand. Holidays, huh? Planning a trip? Perhaps. Oh, look, Penny, I need the money. Why can't we make some sort of arrangement? You're wasting your time, my boy. This is too good a thing for me to share with anyone. I am rather surprised, and annoyed too, that I didn't think of handling the matter this way long ago. You, uh, you, you won't change your mind? No. After all, you still have Barbara. She's a wealthy woman. Do you begrudge me a few thousand dollars now and then? All right. That's the way you want it. Yes, that's the way I want it, my boy. Good night. Good night. Uh, no hard feelings, Freddy. No. See you in the morning, then. Yeah. Maybe you will, Penny. And then maybe not. It's done, isn't it, Fred? There were only four capsules in the box. You replaced one with a capsule containing the deadly poison. And now all you can do is wait. And you know it won't be long. 
for Mr. Penny takes a sleeping capsule every night. You're a little disappointed the following morning at breakfast when you see Mr. Penny sitting at his usual table. It was a little too much to hope for, wasn't it, Fred? That he'd take the poison capsule the first night. But then there are only three capsules in the box now. The next morning, you're in for another disappointment. For as you enter the dining hall, you see Mr. Penny again, sitting at the table near the window. He looks up as you and Barbara seat yourself only a few tables away. He smiles, nods, then returns to his morning paper. And then something that Barbara says startles you. Only two left, Frederick. What? Only two empty tables left. I'm glad we came down to breakfast when we did. I hate to wait. Oh. Oh, Oh, yes. Oh, goodness, darling. You jumped so. Something wrong? Uh, No. No, no, of course not. I I, I had my mind on something else. Yes. You were thinking of the capsules in the box, weren't you, Fred? There are only two left now, and it's an even money bet. However, the following morning when you arrive at the dining hall, Mr. Penny is absent. It's almost 11 o'clock when you and Barbara leave your table, and there's been no sign of him. You're sure he's dead, and you're free at last, aren't you, Fred? Yes. With Mr. Penny out of the way, the Sun Valley incident is closed. It'll be a simple matter with your connections to find someone more trustworthy than Penny to do your blackmailing. As Barbara hurries upstairs for her scarf, the desk clerk calls out to you. Oh, uh, Mr. Eklund. Yes? What is it? A message for you, sir, this envelope. Oh, thank you. For a moment, you're puzzled. Stare at the envelope. Then you rip it open. And suddenly an icy hand closes around your heart as a tiny red capsule tumbles out of the envelope into the palm of your hand. Penny has known all along, hasn't he, Frank? He must have watched you in the mirror when he was shaving, saw you place the poison capsule in the box. A cold wave of fear sweeps over you as you realize what he'll do now. Your first thought is for you and Barbara to get away. You hurry to your room upstairs, and as you're about to open the door, you hear Barbara's voice. Well, yes. Yes, whatever you say. What? No, not here. I'll meet you at the point. Inspiration point, tonight. Yes. Nine o'clock, Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny isn't wasting any time getting his revenge, is he, Fred? Your first thought is to get away, and then suddenly you realize it's useless to run. He'd find you and Barbara sooner or later. No, you've got to take care of him now, once and for all. And this time, you can't afford to miss. That night, you're standing in the shadows of the fir trees near the point. You see Barbara hurrying up the path. Mr. Penny is not far behind. Hello, Penny. What? Oh, oh, it's you, Freddy. What are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing, but I know what you're doing here. Too bad you'll never keep that appointment with my wife, Penny. What? Take a look down there. It's an awful drop, isn't it? What are you... What are you going to do? You're a smart little operator, Penny. You ought to be able to figure that out. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. When you passed a signal service station during the past few days, you may have noticed a picture of the happy bluebird on the sign outside. Well, Mr. Bluebird is there to remind you that if you want your motor to sing this spring, you'll be wise to make your next oil change a change to the improved type signal oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Naturally, Signal Premium has 100% pure paraffin base, the finest lubricant known. But in addition... Signal Premium contains scientific new compounds that protect your motor in ways no regular oil alone can do. For instance, one compound in Signal Premium compounded motor oil actually cleanses your motor of carbon, gum, and varnish. A second compound in Signal Premium protects costly bearings from corrosion. And still other compounds do other important jobs to keep your motor happy as a bluebird. 
Good reason, I'd say, to make your spring oil change a change to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Sold only at Signal Service Stations. It's all over, isn't it, Fred? Mr. Penny is out of the way at last. The threat he held over you is gone, and now you're free. Back at the village, the Buckhorn Cafe, you spend the next several hours chatting with old friends, and then shortly after midnight, you return to the lodge to your room. As you enter, you're surprised to see Barbara pacing up and down. Oh, Fred, where have you been? At the village, dear. I told you I Fred, had to... did you hear about it? The accident? Oh, the man who fell off the cliffs, yeah. They were talking about it in the lobby when I came in. Matter of fact, the sheriff is down there now talking to the manager. The man's name was Penny. You knew him? Yes. He was blackmailing. What? He, he came to me about a year ago with some letters I'd written. Foolish letters. He wanted $5,000 for each one. I, I laughed at him. They meant nothing to me, and I threatened to call the police. You, you threatened? Yes, I... I threatened to. But then Mr. Penny showed me some other letters. A woman's letters. Mrs. Carson. Mrs. Mrs. Carson? Her letters to you, Fred. When you're at Sun Valley. He said the police would be anxious to see them. I, I couldn't believe you'd done anything wrong. But then when he said... Send the letters to the Idaho police... <laughs> I was afraid. He's been blackmailing you all this time because of those letters to me? <laughs> yes. Barbara, listen to me. I've got... It's not true, is it, Fred? The skiing accident. You didn't kill it, did you? He told you that? This morning, yes. He called me on the phone, told me he could prove it, that you'd killed him. Made it look like an accident. That's not true. Oh. Oh. But he was lying. Oh, I knew it, darling. I knew it all along. But I agreed to meet him at the point tonight. He, he said he'd bring all the proof I needed. Letters, documents, all the evidence. He... He had all that with him tonight? Yes. But he never arrived. He fell off the cliff on the way. Yeah. Yeah, he fell off the cliffs. Oh, darling, darling. I'm so glad Mr. Penny was lying. If he'd had any evidence on him... The police certainly would have discovered it when they found his body, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, I guess they would. I'll, uh, I'll go, Barbara. I'm sure it's for me. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore, Dorothy Lovett, and Jeff Corey. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian John Doe, and music by Wilbur Hatch. All characters portrayed on the Whistler program are fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Network Re A Whistler. On the porch of the old gray house on the hill, Victoria Crane peered through the low morning haze that hovered over the lake, watched the boats move slowly back and forth across the water. Then her eyes swept past the tiny village of Twin Pines, nestled on the lakefront, came to rest on the figure of a man standing on the boat dock. For several minutes, she watched Sheriff Tilson, saw him as he tapped the ashes from his pipe and returned it to his mouth. Then, thrusting his hands into his pockets, he started up the path toward her. 
Somewhat nervously, Victoria's gaze shifted to the lake again, then back to the approaching figure. Presently, she heard the door behind her close, and her sister Meg came out onto the porch. Morning, Vic. Oh, Meg. Sleep well? Mm Mm-hmm. Like an infant. Oh, goodness, looks like we're going to have another nice day. Mm. Yes, it does. Vic? Mm Mm-hmm? What's going on at the lake? What are all those boats doing out there? They're dragging the lake, dear. Dragging the lake? What for? They think they'll find a body. What? A woman. She thinks she may have been murdered. Oh, how horrible. But what makes him think that? Well, night before last, several people heard shots from somewhere out on the lake. Then yesterday, a rowboat was found drifting along the north shore. Is that all they have to go on? No. This morning, some boys found a woman's scarf in the reeds near the boat dock. Vic, do they have any idea who the woman is? No. You had your breakfast, dear? Uh, yeah, yes, I've had breakfast. Meg, you know, I've been thinking about that dress material we saw yesterday. I do believe we could get much better if we went up to San Francisco this week and... Meg? Oh, what? Aren't you listening to me, Meg? Oh, I'm sorry, Vic, I was... Hello there. Uh... Oh, good morning, Cher. Good morning, Victoria. Meg? Good morning. Find the body yet, Cher? What? Well, you might know the news is all over the village. I heard about it two hours ago. Find out who the scarf belonged to? The scarf? Well, it belonged to a young woman who was staying at the lodge. You don't mean Margot Reed, do you? Uh-huh. Know her? I know of her. You know how people talk. We don't often have strangers here in Twin Pines, and when a glamour girl like Margot Reed shows up, well... I don't suppose you know why she came here, do you? No. No, I don't. Meg. Yes? Any idea where your fiancé is? Oh, no, not exactly. But what do you want with Ben? Ben Driscoll's newspaper office was closed when I went down there this morning. Oh, I, I think he drove up to San Francisco last night on business. I see. Why do you ask? Oh, figured he might be able to give me a line on things. The Reed girl stayed pretty much to herself all the time she was here, except... Except what, sir? Well, I understand she dropped around to see Ben at the newspaper office several times. Ben? She... She went to see Ben? Uh Uh-huh. That's what I want to talk to him about. Maybe he has some idea of what she wanted here in Twin Pines. I see. Well, I guess I better get back to the lake. Uh, mind if I go along with you, Sheriff? No, no, don't mind at all. I won't be long, Vic. But oh, oh, all right, Meg. See you later, Victoria. Margot went to see Ben. She went to. Oh, if I'd known! If I'd only known! It's something you hadn't counted on, isn't it, Victoria? A threat. It could ruin everything. That is, if you allowed it to. But you've faced worse situations before, bluffed them through with your cleverness. But even now, in spite of what's happened, you're confident that somehow you'll find a way out. You sit there, staring out over the lake, and wonder how much Margot told Ben Driscoll. And... If your sister's fiancé now knows the secret you once shared with Margot Reed, the secret you thought would be yours alone after her death. There's nothing you can do now but wait. Wait for Ben to return. And then finally, late that afternoon, you hear a car pull into the driveway. You hurry outside, see Ben get out of his car. He stands there for a moment, looking down at the lake. A puzzled frown on his face. Hello, Ben. Hmm? Oh, hello, Vic. So what's going on down there? They're dragging the lake. What? You mean they're looking for a... Yes, there's been a murder. So the sheriff says. Well, how do you like that? First time I leave Twin Pines in over a year and a murder takes place. 
Doctor, I better get down. Ben, there. wait. Hmm? They think it's Margot Reed. Margot Mar- Reed? The sheriff wants to talk to you, Ben. He thinks you might be able to tell him what she was doing here in Twin Pines. No one else seems to know. But, Vic, I... What's the matter, Ben? Nothing. I think I'd better go. Ben, wait. Do you know what Margot Reed was doing here? Did she tell you? Ben, Ben. Oh, hello, darling. You just get back? Yeah. You heard what's happened. Yeah, Vic was just telling me about it. <laughs> I was saying, fine newspaper man I am. Biggest story we've had around here in years, and I have to be out of town. You haven't seen the sheriff yet? No, no. I'm on my way now. Will you be back? Yeah, later. I have a number of things to do with the office. I'll call you, darling. Bye. Hello? Hello. Vic. Yes, Ben. Did Meg there? No, she went out right after supper. I don't expect her back for another hour or so. Can I come over right away? Well, of course. Did you talk to the sheriff? Yes, I... I'd like to see you about that, Vic. I'd like to talk to you. Alone. just as you feared it would, hasn't it, Victoria? You're certain Ben knows something. Perhaps that you're the reason why Margot Reed came to Twin Pines. Yes, somehow you can't believe she's told him everything, can you? That doesn't sound like Margot. You're sure that she wouldn't admit blackmail to a perfect stranger. And so you wait anxiously for Ben to arrive and stare out the window. Watch the small boats as they move back and forth across the water searching for the missing Margot Reed. A quarter of an hour later, you're sitting in the library facing Ben. I... I hardly know where to begin, Vic. You know why Margot Reed came here, don't you? Yeah, of course. But I I didn't tell the sheriff. Perhaps I should have. I don't know. They'll, They'll find out sooner or later. Will they? I'm telling you this, Vic, because I know I can trust you. You've got to talk to somebody about it. You see, Margot and I were married once. What? Yeah. We called it quits five years ago, divorce. Shortly after that, I came here to Twin Pines and bought the paper. I lost track of her completely until a month ago. I got a letter from Margot. Oh, Meg, don't look at me like that. I know I should have told Meg, but... So Margot Reed came here to see you. Yeah, she said the divorce was a mistake. She wanted us to... Well... Of course, I told her it was no use, but she stayed around the village anyway. And then, the day before yesterday, she came into the office. She was excited about something. Oh? Said she'd accidentally run into someone here. An old friend. Did she... Did she tell you who it was? No. No, I think she was about to, but Eddie walked into the office then. Eddie? Yeah, Eddie Farrell, my assistant at the paper. And that's something else, Vic. Eddie overheard Margot say she'd see me that night. I'm sure he did. Did you see her? No. No, I waited for her at my cottage, but she didn't show up. That must have been the night she... Oh, Vic, I pulled the stupid stunt. I should have told the sheriff the whole truth. Well, it's too late now, Ben. It, it would only make matters worse. If I were you, I'd leave things just as they are. There's a chance they'll never find out. Yeah, but suppose Eddie tells him I had a date to see Margot that night, and suppose the sheriff starts to investigate Margot's past. Ben, uh... Ben, listen to me. I don't know why everyone's getting so excited. What proof is there that the girl's actually dead? She could have suddenly decided to run up to the city for some reason or other. Well... Then I think it's best not to think about it anymore. Try to put it out of your mind. I, for one, will believe Margot Reed is dead when I see them drag her up from the lake. And I don't think they ever will, Ben. 
I don't think they ever will. That you, Meg? Yes. Did Ben call while I was out? He stopped in for a moment. Had to dash back to the paper. Said he'd call you in the morning. Oh, I see. Oh, by the way, Meg, I think I'll drive up to San Francisco in the morning. Want to come along? No, no, thanks. I'd rather not. Uh, you going to see about the dress material? Mm, yes. There's something else I have to take care of, too. Yes. And it's an important matter, isn't it, Victoria? The idea occurred to you while Ben was talking about his marriage to Margot Reed. You don't want to do this to Ben, your own sister's fiancé, do you? But you're sure Meg will eventually get over it. And it's the only way to protect yourself. The perfect opportunity to produce a suspect for Sheriff Tilson. Prevent him from digging too deeply into Margot's past. Her connection with you. The following morning, you drive up to San Francisco. Your first step is to inform one of the city's newspapers of a new development in the Twin Pines murder that a prominent citizen of Twin Pines is withholding information from the sheriff. City editor. I have some information for you about the murder of Twin Pines. Who is this? My name isn't important. Now listen. A girl named Margot Reed has been murdered. I know about that. Well, here's something you don't know. Neither does the sheriff of Twin Pines. Margot Reed was once married to Ben Driscoll. He's the editor of the local paper. That's so? Look, why Take you... it yourself. It should be a big story. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> You step out of the phone booth, a smile on your lips. It's done, isn't it, Victoria? You've made the first move, and now it's up to the newspaper, to some bright, eager reporter to follow through. Early that same evening, you return to Twin Pines to the house on the lake. As you step inside the door, Meg rushes out of the library into your arms. Oh, <laughs> oh now, here, here. Well, now, what's all this? Oh, it's Ben. The sheriff's holding him for questioning. He's in jail. What? They, they came for him this afternoon while I was with Ben at the paper. There was an, a man with the sheriff, a, a reporter from a San Francisco newspaper. I don't know how he found out, but... Oh, Vic, Margot was Ben's wife. Ben admitted it. He said he was glad the truth was out. Do... Do they think he killed her? Oh, the sheriff didn't say, but I'm sure that's what he thinks. That's what they all think. But he couldn't have killed her. You don't think he did, do you, Vic? Of course not. I'm sure he didn't kill her. You're pleased with the way things have turned out, aren't you, Victoria? Yes. And you'll find it difficult to hold back a smile, even as you try to comfort your sister, Meg. Your trip to the San Francisco newspaper paid off as you knew it would, and you congratulate yourself. But scarcely half an hour later, your joy turns to bitter disappointment and sudden fear. The doorbell rings, and as you answer it... Ben! Hello, Vic. But, Ben, I... I... I heard about what happened... It's all right, Vic. The sheriff let me go. Well, that's fine. I told him the whole story. I guess it sounded all right to him, so here I am. Where's Meg? In the library. Come on in, Ben. Yeah, I'd like to see her. I have a lot of explaining to do. You lead Ben into the library to Meg. Sit there as Ben tells her the whole story. His marriage to Margot, the divorce, everything. And then suddenly something he says causes you to stiffen in your chair. Meg looks up quickly. Ben, did you say Margot worked for a Dr. Kingston in Seattle? Yeah, that's right, darling. She's working as a nurse in Seattle at the time we broke up. Dr. Kingston? Vic, that was Uncle Frank's doctor. Who was it? Of course. Uh, Uncle Frank? Our father's brother. He, he'd been an invalid for a long time. Died five years ago in Seattle. He was the one who left us our money. Oh, all right. Uncle Frank had a private nurse, didn't he, Vic? And if Margot worked for Dr. Kingston... Vic, 
You were at Uncle Frank's when the accident occurred. You wouldn't know if you... Why, why, yes, but... The accident? Uncle Frank was killed accidentally, Ben. He, he fell down a flight of stairs. Vic, about his nurse... Wh- You're mistaken, Meg. I remember the nurse Dr. Kingston had for Uncle Frank. It was not Margot Lee. Are you certain? Quite certain. It's a terrifying moment, isn't it, Victoria? And more than ever, you're aware that there must not be a big involved investigation. They must never find out that Margot Reed was at your uncle's house the night he was killed uh, accidentally. That's when it all began, didn't it? The moment Margot suspected the truth, that you would push the old man down the stairs, murdered him for the money he would leave to you and your sister Meg. No. There must not be an investigation. Though your first attempt to involve Ben has failed, you're not through yet, are you? Quickly, your mind turns to Eddie, Ben's assistant at the newspaper, and the possibility of using him to frame Ben. On your way down to the village the following day, a plan forms in your mind. Then in front of the coroner's office, what the sheriff is telling the crowd gives you a further advantage. That's right, that's right. The body's been found. Yeah, what was it, Sheriff? Drowning? You read about it in the papers, Jed. Then it wasn't a drowning. You see, Emily, I... There were several bullet wounds. Margot Reed was murdered. Murdered? Did, did you find the gun? No, no, we haven't found the gun. Excuse me, Jed, Victoria. I've got to get along now. Now they know, don't they, Victoria? It's murder. And now you can get the gun and plant it in Ben's cottage when the right moment comes along. Yes. The gun must be there when you've finally given the sheriff enough clues to direct him to a murderer. But first, Victoria, you must begin to build a solid case against Ben through his assistant, Eddie Farrell. Morning, Miss Victoria. Hello, Eddie. You hear the news? A couple of the sheriff's boys just dropped in. Oh, goodness, did they question you two? Huh? Well, it's me? Oh, gosh, no. They only... Oh, t- yes. Yes, they told you she'd been shot. And... Yeah, yeah. I heard, too. I was down there. Oh, that poor girl. Well, I guess they know the kind of person to suspect. Uh, how do you mean? Well, you know. The sort of man who runs around a good deal... Unmarried. Always an eye out for a pretty girl. <laughs> sure, I guess there's a few in this town. But... Oh, Eddie. Goodness, you're taking what I have to say to heart. You don't think I'm talking about you? Oh, no. No, I didn't think that. Well, with all the dates you have, it's an advantage. Not something to put you under suspicion. What lucky girl were you out with on that particular night, Eddie? Why, uh... Had two dates, probably. Wait. I, I don't think I had any dates. What did you say, Eddie? Nothing. Uh, what was it you came in for, Miss Victoria? Let me see. What did I come in for? Oh, yes. Yes, I wondered if you had a copy of last week's paper, Eddie. There was a dress pattern in it I wanted. That all you wanted? Yes. Yes, that's all. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, Sheriff. I know how busy you are. If it's something to do with the case, Victoria, it doesn't interrupt. Well, it's about Eddie Farrell, Ben's assistant down at the paper. Oh, Sheriff, I really hate to suggest it, but... Go on, go on. It's just between the two of us. Well, he might have been with Margot that night, you know. Might is quite a word. I might have been with her myself. It was his attitude, Sheriff, when we were talking. The way he closed up. Oh, oh you're right. Probably nothing. Well, Eddie does have quite a reputation with the girls, and... Yes, yes, I, I know. I'll have a little talk with Eddie. Nothing can be lost by asking a few questions, huh? He's right, isn't he, Victoria? Nothing can be lost by asking a few questions. In fact, you have a lot to gain. 
Yes. And you've used Eddie Farrow well to point the finger of suspicion at Ben. The proof of that comes late that afternoon when you overhear yes. Meg on the telephone. Please listen to me. Don't come back now. You've got to stay where you are. Eddie Farrow has mixed you up in this. Yes, he, he told the sheriff that you had a date with Margot. Oh, I, I know, I know. What? No, please, darling, no. No, no, you mustn't come back here. Not right now. Yeah, all right, but please promise me you'll stay there. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'll call again. Goodbye, darling. Okay. Oh, oh, Vic. Was that Ben you were talking to? Yes, he's up in San Francisco. Oh, Vic, I'm worried. I'm worried sick. What happened? The sheriff is looking for him again. More questions. What brought this on? Eddie Farrow. The sheriff dropped around to see Eddie this afternoon and... and... Oh, Vic, what can I do? Oh, no, no, dear. <laughs> Meg. Yes. Meg, you love him very much, don't you? Yes. Very, very much. You must be absolutely sure of yourself. What are you... T- You're worried about what you'll have to say if they ever put you on the stand. Well, I couldn't lie. But I couldn't testify against Ben. I couldn't. Well, you wouldn't have to if you were his wife. His wife? The law doesn't expect a wife to testify against her husband. Oh, Vic. Aren't you sure, Meg? Of course I'm sure. But then go to him. You love him, Meg. Go to Reno. Marry him at once. Vic. There's a bus leaving at eight tonight. I'll start packing your things. You better call Ben. Tell him you're coming. <laughs> Sheriff, this is Victoria. Yes? Sheriff, I hate to tell you this because it involves my sister. But she must never know. What is it? Ben's hiding out somewhere in San Francisco. She's going to him. Left the house a few minutes ago. She's headed for the village, carrying an overnight bag. They're running off together? Well, something like that. You'll have to follow her. She'll take you to him. All right, Victoria, and thanks. <laughs> As you hurry from the house, you tell yourself it's perfect, isn't it, Victoria? Meg is gone now on her way to Ben. She'll talk him into running away, and that's all you need. You know Sheriff Tilson won't let them get very far. All that's necessary now is to take the gun from where you've hidden it and plant it in Ben's cottage. You're certain the murder weapon can't be traced back to you. That when it's found at the cottage, it will definitely implicate him in the murder of Margot Reed. You hurry along the lake shore, keeping well in the shadows, using the darkness to advantage. You have no trouble getting into Ben's cottage. And in the half-darkness of moonlight, you cross the living room, open a closet, and locate one of Ben's old hunting jackets. You're about to place the gun in the pocket when you hear footsteps in the next room. Suddenly, a door opens and the lights go on. Meg! Victoria! You shouldn't have come here, Meg. Why, I had to... When I called Ben, he asked me to bring some of his things. I, I've been packing them. But, Meg, you... Rick! What are you doing with that gun? What? I, I found it here, in, in Ben's jacket. Wait a minute, Victoria. You couldn't have. I searched this place completely just two hours ago. Sheriff Kilson, what are you doing here? Just what you asked me to, following your sister. She asked you to? Vic, what does this mean? I think it means Victoria outsmarted herself, Meg, trying to frame Ben. No, that's not true. We'll know more about that when we check this gun with the bullets that killed Margot Reed. I think it'll answer a lot of questions I've had on my mind all day. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
At this time last week, CBS was broadcasting reports of the Kathy Fiscus tragedy direct from San Marino. Because of improvised emergency conditions, communications between our master control room and the CBS newsman at the scene were severed at 8.30, and we were unable to immediately continue broadcasting from the scene. Because of these conditions, we decided to return to our normal broadcast schedule with the understanding that if an official announcement should be made during the ensuing program, it would be interrupted for the release of the announcement. We regret that we were unable to continue the San Marino broadcast at that moment. This was a decision of the Columbia Broadcasting System and not that of any sponsor. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Sleep, my pretty one. A few months before, Jean would have dismissed the whole idea of having her fortune told as ridiculous. But with marriage to a handsome young doctor just around the corner, things like tea room fortune tellers suddenly seemed important and exciting. So and rambled on, Jean found somehow she was taking it all seriously, a little too seriously. To see. You will be quiet, please. You will concentrate on the crystal with me. Max would be terribly shocked if he knew I was doing this. Shh, Jean. Please, signorina. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, it is coming. They pack now. The clouds pack. I, I see a number. The number 13. And now, the number 3. It is a date. The 13th day of the third month. March 13th. I gaze deeper. Again, the crystal clears, and I see the letter J, and now the letter V. Oh, your initials, Jean. J, V, well, how you did you I the... told you. Go on, Madame Dogger. I cannot go on. Oh, but there must be something. I have told you. The image page. The clouds close in. The reading is finished. Is, is something wrong? <laughs> Of course there is. There's me right of falling for this hocus-pocus. It is not hocus-pocus, signorina. If you must know, I will tell you. Hocus-pocus, signorina. If you must know, I will tell you. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of March. Why, that's this way. Never mind, Betty. Here you are, Madame Dorga. I better get back to the laboratory. It's late. And, um... Don't mention this to Max, will you, dear? If he ever caught me going to fortune tellers, he'd get himself a new lab assistant and a new fiancé. I'm sorry I'm late, darling. I had lunch with Betty. She insisted on a tea room across town. You know how that is. Mm, clear. <laughs> Miss me, doctor? That's a silly question. Of course I miss you, dear. Um, hand me that beaker, will you? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I've been up to my ears around here. Yeah. Mm. Excuse me. Yeah, you're so tight. Where'd you pick up the coal? Oh, I don't know. I have to do something for it. May I see you a minute, Mitch? Uh, oh, uh, yes, Dr. Olson. Uh, be with you in a minute, Dave. All right. Mitch, uh, Dr. Davies tells me you want to try your new drug, E-37, on one of his encephalitic patients. Yeah, that's right. The man's been in a coma for three weeks. I, I think E-37 can cure him. You think? As head of this institute, I'm afraid I'll have to refuse you my permission. The fact that you injected a bunch of rats with the virus of sleeping sickness... But you don't understand, that... Doctor. Those rats had sleeping sickness with all the symptoms. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. My drug E-37 cured every last one. That doesn't mean it's safe for a human being. I'd hoped you'd remember the last hopeless patient it was tried on. How long did he last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? But I told you I found what was wrong. I've eliminated the toxic factor. Oh, you've eliminated the toxic factor. This institute will not experiment with human lives. I absolutely forbid you giving Davies this drug, and that's final. couldn't help hearing it, Max. The transom was... Yeah. It seems, my love, that my work for the past year has been dedicated to a batch of white rats. There ought to be some way that you... There is. Just one. The drug has got to be proven on a human patient. Olsen knows that. For thousands of years, this disease has been killing human beings like dogs. And Olsen says we can't afford to take a chance. Well, darling, he's thinking of the institute. Well, I'm thinking of humanity. There's always a risk. That's how we learn. That's how we progress. That's science. Jean. Yes? Jean, will you help me? Why, of course, darling. I'm going to test my formula. I'm going to make the test and Olsen need never know about it. What kind of a test? On a human subject. But, but who can you... Darling, listen to me. You love me. Yes, Max. You, you trust me. Trust you? You've got to have faith in me, darling. It means everything now. Of course I have faith in you, Max. I have an aunt living outside Spokane. We can drive up there tonight. Well, I don't understand, Max. How can you make a test on a human subject? Who can you... Leave that to me, to... darling. I'm going to inject the subject with the virus. Then follow it at the peak of the attack with E-37. It's the only way I can show Olsen. But you haven't told me who you... You said you trusted me, Jean. Did you mean it? Yes, Max. Good. Come on now. Let's start packing the equipment. <laughs> Careful of that vial, Jean. It'll take us days to reproduce that drug. Mm, I'm wrapping it in cotton. Excuse me. Uh, uh, there you are, Max. Well, that ought to do it. And you can close up the bag. Now, hold still a moment, dear. Why? What are you... Oh! Just hold still. Ma Max, what, what is this? I'm giving you a shot for that cold of yours. What? Can't have you sick at a time like this. I feel a little faint. Yeah, I know. It always affects you this way. There. That's why I didn't warn you. I don't like injections, Max. Why did you... I told you, dear, it's for your cold. <laughs> You'd better have faith in the doctor, darling. Uh, yes, Max, of course. Good. Feel better now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Now, let's go, then. Five or six hour drive, and I... Well, Max, aren't you going to leave word where we're going? Of course not. I don't want anyone to know where we are or what we're doing until... until it's over. With the prologue of Sleep, My Pretty One, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. I don't have to tell you how automobiles have changed or how driving conditions have changed in recent years. But tonight I want to tell you about an amazing new change in gasoline. A gasoline scientifically engineered to help your car take fullest advantage of today's driving conditions. It's new Signal Ethyl, 
the new motor fuel that's so vastly improved, so superior in every way, you can actually feel the difference. Because today's traffic is heavier, new signal Ethel is engineered to let you inch along smoothly at a snail's pace without bucking. Because stop signs are everywhere today, new signal Ethel is engineered to give you eager, flashing pickup when you get the go signal. Because today's highways are broader, smoother, swifter, new signal Ethel has wonderful new power that makes the miles fairly fly by. And because many of today's motors have higher compression, new signal Ethel has higher anti-knock to make hill climbing a pleasure. To actually feel this difference in your own car, just try a tank full of new signal Ethel. See if you don't agree with the delighted drivers who are saying new signal Ethel is tops. The decision is made, isn't it, Jean? And you're on your way now to the little farmhouse near Spokane, where it will be decided, rules or no rules, whether the contents of the cotton-wrapped vial in Max's valise are a life-saving drug or a deadly poison. You want to help Max now when he needs you most. But as you guide the car north through the chill March night, you can't help feeling uneasy as if something is terribly wrong. And in spite of your belief in Max, you wonder how far he'd go to prove his cure. And you find yourself thinking about the shot for your cold that Max gave you. You glance sidewise at him at the solid set of his jaw. Wonder who the human subject is he's so vague about. His almost fanatic zeal for his work. His determination that science must come before all else. What's the matter, dear? You're... You're sure you're quite right in this? Huh? Well, I mean, if Dr. Olson were to find out, you'd lose your position. Well, if I succeed, Olson won't matter much. I'll have offers from every institute in the country. And if you fail... You matter less. Oh, look out! Matt, Good I, Lord, Jean, watch the road. I don't know, Matt. Well, what's the matter? But that car for a moment. Uh, I thought I saw two of them. Uh, careful now, the road's pretty narrow. I can see, thank you. Oh, there's the house up ahead. I'm glad the snow held off. In for a late blizzard. Well, there we are. There's the old pump house. The apple tree. Oh, oh watch it. There's an old stump on the right. If right. you don't mind, Max, I've just driven over 200 miles of slippery road safely. I think I can handle a country lane without advice. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Max. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, I just don't feel like myself. <laughs> This must be Jean. How do you do? Come in. I declare, Max, you got mighty good taste. Well, thank you. Now, don't bother. She can't hear you, Jean. What? She's stone deaf. Best just let her go on her way. She will anyway. Oh, I see. Come on to the kitchen. Gotta get this stuff on ice. I'm glad we're warm again. I said, Josie. Hey, you're just tired. I guess so. Oh, here we are. Same old icebox. Yeah, have to clear a place here at the back for the vials. You got them there? Right here. Max, uh, I don't like to keep asking this, but... Yeah? What is it? Where do you expect to find anyone with sleeping sickness around here? I don't. What? It's very simple. If there are no cases of encephalitis at my disposal, there's only one answer. To create one. Max. To inject the subject with the virus. Then after a good case is developed, use E-37. But we're, we're completely isolated here. Where can you find... I've already found the subject, Jean. Max. Jean, look what you've done. I had slipped. I'm sorry. I... Why did it have to be this one? E-37. 
Gina killer, my killer. Every bit of it was in that vial. Mike, listen to me. Maybe it's better this way. Maybe you better forget about E-37 and, and treat the patient in the ordinary way. It must be a hospital somewhere, Mike. Don't be ridiculous. My E-37 is our only chance. I injected 20,000 units of sleeping sickness virus. Fatal dose? Yes, a fatal dose. We've got to start working on another batch of E-37 right now. Come on. You follow Max down the dim old hallway in a daze like a figure in a nightmare. The kind where you run slowly as if through water trying to escape while nameless shapes come closer and closer. And though you still refuse to believe to recognize it, one of the shapes is fear. Eh, the fear that Max might be using you as the subject in this dangerous experiment. What? Here we are. Why, it's the laboratory. It used to be Aunt Agnes's pantry. It turned into a lab for me when I was a boy. But Max, it... This is nothing like your laboratory in town. How can you expect to synthesize? Sure, it's crude, but it's all we've got. Between what I brought and what's here, we can duplicate E-37. With a little luck. How tired are you, Jean? I'm all right. Once we start the process, we can't let up for a second. Come on. Let's get to work. And so it begins, Jean. It's midnight when the two of you have straightened out the dusty laboratory, cleaned the glassware, the retorts, and bunks and burners. Three in the morning when the first solution is ready to run. Once more, you're sure your fears are groundless. Max loves you. He wouldn't think of using you, risking your life for this experiment. Make a note of the time, will you, darling? Right. About 10, 5.20 a.m., first dilution completed, 100 C's. Max. What's the matter? My eyes, I can't seem to focus. I'm seeing double. Sit down. Rest a moment. You'll be all right. March 11th. 10, 15 a.m. Fourth district. Just coming off. It's March 12th, yeah? You've lost a day somewhere. Of course. I don't seem to be conscious of time anymore. <laughs> if I ever get through this, I'm going to build a monument to black coffee. Hasn't any effect on me anymore. And what time is it now? 4 p.m. Yeah, 26 hours since we ran that solution. Ought to be right by now. Got the beaker ready? Yes. Here, Max. It's sterilized. Steady. Hmm? Oh, your hand's shaking like a leaf. <laughs> can't see the control. Yes, because I'm pretty tense, too. Yeah, equipment's obsolete. It's a gamble any way you look at it. Well, we've got a good chance. You've never been afraid of taking chances, have you, Max? Why do you say that? Even if it meant gambling with our happiness, your work would come first. Science comes before everything, doesn't it, Max? Well, that's not a fair question. I think it's appropriate right now. What do you mean? Max, I love you. I'll always love you no matter what happens. I want you to know that. Jean, this is no time. There's still time to talk this crazy business. There's still time to get the patient one of the standard treatments. What are you Max? talking about? Max, let me call Dr. Olsen, please. Oh, I see. You're giving up. It's not that, Max. Well, I'm no, not giving I... up. We're going through with this. My experiment's successful. I want to know my cure alone is responsible. And if not... Go on, Max. What if it isn't? And I'll just have to face the music. I see. Where are you going? To get some more coffee. <laughs> You're glad the telephone's at the other end of the house. That you'll have a chance to get the call through to Dr. Olson before Max has a chance to stop you. You wait for the operator to answer. 
trying to fit the words together in a way that will tell Olsen the story without going too hard on Max. There's no other explanation, is there, Jean? The dull pain in the back of your head, the nervous disturbance, the deadly fatigue, the double vision can only mean one thing. There's little doubt in your mind now. Max's Aunt Agnes is obviously all right. So you're almost certain Max has used you as a human guinea pig. His belief in the effectiveness of his drug is won over his love for you. Why, Jean, good morning. Oh, you're not trying to make a phone call, are you? The line's been down for hours, down to the store. Oh, oh you look all worn out, child. No wonder the way you two have been working. Listen, you better get to the rest, I... child. I've never seen such dark circles under anybody's eyes. Miss Wilson! What's the matter, child? Why are you shaking me like that? I'll write a note taken in pencil by the telephone. Now watch. I just watch. Well, what you writing? Huh? Uh, oh. Max trying dangerous experiment. Stop him. Life and death are my life and death. Land. Do you I understand that? Life and death. I wouldn't dream of such a thing. Ain't ever interfered with his doings, not even half the time he and I blew upside the barn. Jeez, it means a life. Rest my life, life and death. Agnes... him for one thing or another, but not me. That's science, you know. Max says that's the way we learn. Jean, wait. Now that you feel sure Max is experimenting with you, you run blindly out of the house, down the snow-covered path to the shed where you left the car. There's only one way now, Jean. You've got to get to a hospital, a doctor. You've got to get away from Max once and for all. And as you fumble for the car keys, the nightmare you've lived through for the past few days comes back in a rush. I'll inject the subject with the virus, and after a good case is developed, use E-37. How long did the patient last, Mitchell? Was it ten seconds or twenty? Oh, Sylvia, I'm giving you a shot for that cold of yours. That car, I thought you of them. Double vision, sleepiness, fever. There is no future for J.B. after the 13th day of March. No future, no future. <laughs> What are you doing out here? Where do you think you're going? I thought if I could reach Dr. Olsen, I wanted to get someone, some help. There's no help outside. Only here. Where's the oxalate? Uh, on the top shelf of the cupboard. Yeah, I looked there. You'd better come and show me. All right, Max. I'll come. time is it, Jean? About nine. Is the hypodermic in the stylizer? No. Well, put it in. Put it in. We're almost ready. Now, where are the notes? Notes? Oh, oh, here. Now, let's see. Virus injected Monday, March 10th. Disease approaches critical state. Yeah, pretty close. Better make the final entry, Jean. Or next to final. While I finish here. All right. Ready now? Yes, Max. Preparing to administer anti-encephalitic bulk drug E-37 to subject. Work commenced on drug at 1 a.m. March 10th. Completed at 9 p.m. March 12th. Your hand trembles as you write. As you watch Max rise, walk slowly to the sterilizer, lift the lid and remove the hypodermic. There is no future for J.V. after the 13th day of March. You fight it out of your mind. Struggle against the fear that grips you as Max turns, hypodermic in hand. Everything begins to waver before your eyes. You drop the journal. It'll be over in a minute, Jean. You see, I... I simply put the needle in the solution. Release the plunger. No! No, Max! 
please. Jane. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. In spring, most folks think of house cleaning. But because one can't see the inside of his automobile engine, few drivers realize that they get dirty, too, and may need cleaning. In fact, that's one of the reasons Signal brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, the improved type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with scientific compounds. While you drive, one of the compounds in Signal Premium actually cleanses the inside of your motor of harmful carbon, gum, and varnish. Meantime, another compound in Signal Premium is on guard against destructive corrosion. And still other compounds are busy doing jobs which regular oil alone cannot do. That's why we call Signal Premium the motor oil that does so much more than just lubricate. And it's why drivers who want to keep their motors young are switching to Signal service stations. Switching to Signal Premium compounded motor oil. <laughs> It wasn't too much, was it, Gene? The sight of Max standing there before you. The hypodermic in his hand, ready to administer the anti-encephalitic drug to his subject. And as you collapse, as darkness closed in around you, you realize that what you'd suspected all along was true. That you were the subject in his experiment. That Max was gambling with your life. Gradually, as you regain consciousness, you become aware of the room you're in. A pretty bright room with organdy curtains. The sun is pouring in now, and suddenly you realize it's afternoon sun. I think she's coming around. You say something, Max? And never mind uh, that, Agnes. It... Uh, well, it's about time, young lady. Max. You slept the clock around, darling. It's after three. Max, it's all over? Yes, it's all over. You're all right. Oh, there's the doorbell, Aunt Agnes. What's that? Doorbell. Doorbell. Oh, doorbell. I expect it's the judge. I'll sit him down in the parlor. Good. I uh, told the judge to drop by on his way home from town, dear. Thought we might make an appointment. That is, if you don't mind changing your name on an unlucky day like the 13th. Change my name? My initials on... Unless you'd rather... No, it's... Perhaps you haven't told me what happened. What did you do? <laughs> If you hadn't fainted when you did, you'd have seen. Within an hour after I took that injection, I was feeling you. better. And eight hours later, there wasn't a trace of sleeping sickness in my blood. My next time. Uh, my next time. Well, that's science, darling. You risk a little to gain a lot. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Betty Lou Gerson and Willard Waterman. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with story by Ruth Bourne, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. A mask for Kinsella. Jim Kinsella couldn't seem to fix the beginning in his mind. If there was a beginning, it was all too confused. Like impressions out of a dream. Patches of thought and action bouncing back at him. The excitement, the shouted warning. And then the explosion that rocked the small chemical laboratory and sent the world crashing down on him. They were dim at first, the voices. Very faint. But growing stronger, growing stronger and coming closer all the time. Is he coming around, Doctor? Yes, he'll be all right. I still do not understand how the laboratory blew up that way. Gradually, through it all, something was coming back, clearing in his mind. It had to do with his friend Ted, Ted Brewster... The laboratory deep in the Mexican wilderness where the two of them worked. Yes, Jim Kinsella remembered now. How he'd gone back again into the lab after Ted, who shouldn't have been there at all that night. How he had risked the flames as Ted shouted hopelessly for help. This is Jim, Ted. Where are you? Easy, easy, my boy. Don't try to talk. Doctor, what's he trying to say? What, what happened? Oh, now, it's, it's all right. You're perfectly safe. Where am I? They brought you here to the hospital yesterday, after the accident out at your laboratory. Yesterday? Dr. Bowman, he's been doing everything for you. Dr. Bowman? That's right, my boy. Now try to get to sleep for a while. Quiet now. I I don't seem to remember exactly what happened. Of course. You had a bad shock. It'll be a while before you recover fully. Your memory will be hazy for some time. But these bandages, I, I can't see. Now, now, you had better get some sleep. Before too long, we'll remove these bandages. See what sort of a job I've done, eh? Job? On your face. It was a bit cut up, but don't worry. I've taken care of it. Just get some rest now. Yeah. Yeah, get some rest. <laughs> You can't sleep, can you, Jim? Thinking about Ted. Without asking, you know that Ted Brewster is dead. You remember now, finding him in the wreckage of the laboratory. It's all you can think about in the days that follow. That and how fortunate you are to be alive. Then the day finally comes when Dr. Bauman decides it's time to remove your bandages. All right, now. We shall see, eh? We will cut the bandages, miss. Yes, doctor. Here, help me unwind this. That's it. Gently. Gently. It's like coming up for air, Doctor. A new life. I'm certain you will be pleased with what we've done. Oh, I'm alive. That's enough for me. Good. That's the way to feel about it. Oh, let's nice. uh, just cut this adhesive here. Yes, sir. That's it. 
That's it. And look. Oh. <laughs> Don't I get a look, too? Uh, get me that mirror, nurse. Yes. Here you are. Thank you. Uh, that'll be all for now. You may go, nurse. Yes, sir. Well, Doctor. Well, there are some scars, but I'm sure we can take care of them later. Oh, just so I got a face, Doctor. Yeah, you have, and a very good one, my boy. Here. Mirror. See for yourself. Oh, thanks, I... No, no. Don't worry about those scars. I warned you about them, but they'll clear up. Oh, no. No, it isn't. Uh, what is it? What's the matter, Mr. Brewster? Mr. Brewster. He's calling you Mr. Brewster, isn't he, Jim? Yes. Because that's who he thinks you are. The realization races through your mind. He's made a mistake, Jim, a terrible mistake. And you're certain you know how it happened. In accomplishing his plastic surgery on your face, he must have worked from photographs of your friend, Ted Brewster, who was killed in the explosion. And the doctor's result is a well-fashioned replica of Ted's face. Mr. Brewster, have you forgotten what you look like? No. No, Dr. Baumer. Then what is wrong? He's asking you what's wrong, Jim. The man who's given you a new identity, a new face. And suddenly, something makes you decide that it isn't wrong after all. It might be the kind of thing you've been waiting for all your life. Yes, suddenly the thought hits you. With his explanation that there might be blank spots in your memory, your mind might fog out on occasion. It could make it simple, couldn't it? Simple to pass yourself off as the wealthy Ted Brewster. Mr. Brewster, you haven't answered me. You sit and remember what you look like, don't you? Is your mind blanking no, out? No, no, Doctor. I, I'm all right. You're satisfied then, Mr. Brewster? Yes. I think you've done a perfect job for me. Perfect. With the prologue of A Mask for Kinsella, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. It was just two weeks ago tonight that we first announced Signal's new super motor fuel, new Signal Ethel. But during these past two weeks, thousands of drivers throughout the West have discovered new driving pleasure that they hadn't dreamed was in their cars. For new Signal Ethel is so superior, so vastly improved, you can actually feel the difference. Yes, drivers are discovering that when it comes to pickup, new Signal Ethel puts new meaning into the word go. They're discovering that out on the highway, new signal Ethel puts a smoother, more effortless kind of power under your throttle. And when they soar up steep hills with the new signal Ethel, they've discovered that pings are a thing of the past. Does that sound like the kind of performance you'd enjoy from your car? Then here's a suggestion. Wait until your present gasoline runs fairly low. Then fill up with new signal Ethel. See if you don't feel a wonderful difference with signal's new super motor fuel. New Signal Ethel. It's perfect, isn't it, Jim? This thing that's happened to you. The mistake Dr. Bauman has made. He's created a mask for you. A mask for Kinsella. And you're sure you know just how it happened. In repairing the damage to your face, Dr. Bauman, working from photographs of Ted, fashioned an almost perfect replica of Ted Brewster. And in a moment of terrible decision, you decided to leave it that way. Ted was killed in the explosion. But he had money back in the States. And a wealthy aunt in San Diego who hasn't seen him for years. It's a gamble, isn't it, Jim? Posing as Ted Brewster. But knowing what you do of his past, what he's told you, you're certain there's a good chance you'll get by with it. The slow motor trip to the airport gives you time to think it through. Consider everything, including Mrs. Kinsella, your own wife in Mexico City. But your mind is made up. 
Somehow it was from the very first. And at the airport, you bid Dr. Bauman goodbye. Well, Dr. Bauman, it's the end of the line. I, I can't thank you enough. End of the line? Oh, don't say that, my boy. All this may be the beginning for you. Uh, yes, it may be at that, Doctor. Flight 24 for the West, El Paso, Amarillo, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Passengers will board the plane at gate number three, please. And yeah, that's me, well, Voice West. Paso, Goodbye, Doctor. Paso, Goodbye, Mr. Brewster. Ted? Something in his tone, Jim. The way he said the name makes you wonder, doesn't it? Wonder if Dr. Bauman realizes he's made a mistake. That you're not Ted Brewster after all. You dismiss the thought long before the flight ends. Because if he knew anything was wrong, he would surely have said something, at least to you. Yes, Jim, any fears or doubts you might have had are wiped away by the joyous greeting you receive at San Diego Airport from Ted Brewster's aging aunt. Oh, Ted. Ted, my boy, so many years and now to see you. You're not uh, disappointed, Aunt Louise? No, no, of course not. Am I... My face, it isn't too pretty. Oh, stop that talk right now, do you hear? It's you and you're alive and back. That's all that matters to us. Us? Oh, you've forgotten. Uh, Aunt Louise, the, the doctor, he said that I'd have trouble for a while, my, my memory. He said there'd be occasional lapses, blank spots. I understand. But I still have a surprise for you, even if you don't remember Judy Adams. Judy... Oh, yes. I uh, always thought a lot of her. Uh, Judy! Judy! Yes, Brewster? Over here, dear. Ted. Ted. Dear, Ted's just explained something you should know about. He's going to have... Uh, what is it, Ted? Blank spots? Uh, yeah, temporary amnesia, kind of. Hello, Judy. Ted. Oh, Ted. Do I look all right to you? You look wonderful. Blank spots and all? Oh, Ted, it's so good to have you back. Come on now, children. We're going home, the three of us, together. The worst is over, isn't it, Ted? You've been accepted. It's a lucky thing you said you remember Judy. And her attitude makes your position stronger than ever. Only you have to be careful. Always on guard. Like the afternoon when you're walking with her in the garden at Aunt Louise's home. Oh, it's pleasant here, isn't it, Judy? Yeah. I've always wanted a place like this. I mean, uh, I've always enjoyed this garden. Ted. Yes? You don't really remember this garden, do you? No, I... I guess not. Well, before you went away, we went walking here. But, well, that's close to ten years ago, isn't it? Yeah, I... I guess it is, Judy. <laughs> Gosh, Judy, this uh, this must be kind of rough on you. I, I mean, the way my mind does these flip-flops, remembering one day, forgetting the next. Oh, it's all right. Only... What? Nothing, Ted. Nothing at all. Her attitude worries you, doesn't it? You wonder if something you've done or said has made her suspicious. But a few evenings later, it seems to be all right. Well, Ted, how does it feel to be back in the nightclub again? Oh, okay. <laughs> Feels fine. I'd forgotten what it was like. You, uh, you don't remember this place, do you? Uh, vaguely. Uh, I'm afraid I've forgotten a lot of things, Judy. My, my mind's still pretty much of a blank. I know. The accident must have been a terrible shock. Yeah, you, you just have to bear with me, I'm afraid. Of course. I understand, Ted. Ted? Yeah? I thought you were taking me to Tony's for dinner. Oh, well, sure, I... <laughs> but you just drove right past it. Oh. I, I'm sorry, Judy. I, I just wasn't thinking. I'm in that fog again. It's all right, Ted. I know. It's been a convenient excuse, hasn't it, Jim? Those moments, all too many of them, when your mind becomes clouded. 
It helps you cover up when you make a mistake. And you're certain now that Judy isn't suspicious at all. Everything is going well, and you become more and more confident as days pass. Then, one afternoon, as you return to the house... Oh, Ted, uh, there was someone here to see you a little while ago. To, to see me, Aunt Louise? Who was it? Didn't leave his name. Emily told him you'd be back before evening. What did he want? Didn't mention. Emily said he was tall, heavy set man. Said he looked like a Seamus. What? Seamus. That's what Emily called him. A detective. Goodness, I don't know where Emily picks up these strange phrases. What's the matter, Ted? Uh, nothing, Aunt Louise. Nothing. The news is more than a little disturbing, isn't it, Ted? And you wonder if Emily, Aunt Louise's housekeeper, was right, thinking the man who called at the house was a detective. That evening at dinner, he's still on your mind, isn't he? You're hardly listening to Ted's aunt as she chatters on gaily. And then something she says penetrates your thoughts. Hmm? Uh, what did you say? I said, how long do you think you can go on trying to fool me? What? I, I don't understand. I knew from the moment you stepped off that plane. You did? You, you knew? Of course. Anybody can see you're still in love with Judy, aren't you? Judy? Oh. Of course you are. I knew somehow you'd never forget her. But there's something on your mind, isn't there, I've noticed? Well, yes, there are... Uh... There is something on my mind. You want to go back to Mexico, don't you? To build a new laboratory. But you don't think it'd be right to ask Judy to go with you? Yeah, I, it's something like that. Why don't you ask her, Ted? She's very much in love with you. Is she? Oh, my goodness, you men. Can't you see it? Does a building have to fall on you before you... Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, what is it, Emily? There's a phone call for Mr. Brewster. Probably Judy. Uh, no, ma'am, it's a gentleman. Didn't give his name. I'm thinking it's the same one who was here this afternoon. Uh, excuse me. Oh, don't be long, dear. Hello? Mr. Brewster? Ted Brewster? Yes, who's this? An old friend, Ted. I would like to see you. Oh? I'm at the Carlton Apartments, 607 Crescent Place. Let us say around 10 o'clock, Ted. Now, look, what's this all about? Who did... 607 Crescent Place, Apartment 3. It's very important, especially to you. Uh, hello. Hello. You stare at the telephone for a moment, then slowly replace the receiver, your hand trembling. There's something about the voice, a familiar ring to it, but you can't place it. As you walk back to the dining room, you search your mind for a clue that will reveal the owner of that voice. But it's no use. A couple of hours after dinner is over, you make excuses to Aunt Louise and hurry out of the house. Quarter of an hour later, you arrive at 607 Crescent Place. You're tense and nervous as you ring the bell at apartment three. Hello, Ted. Wow. Dr. Wow. Surprise, my boy? Come in, come in. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. I was about to fix myself a drink. Will you join me? Oh, I'll, I'll take a rain check. Anything you say. What's on your mind, Doctor? You, you said it was important. Well, you won't have a drink, my boy? No, no, thanks. Well, here's to success. Yours and mine, Jim. Jim, Jim I, I don't follow you. <laughs> oh, now, come, come, Mr. Kinsella. Let us not play games. Uh, you're a little confused, Doctor. Uh, no, I don't think so. After all, this was my idea, Jim. Your idea? It wasn't a mistake, my giving you that face. I see. It was an inspiration, a challenge. I decided to gamble. You see, several years ago, I lost my license due to an unfortunate mistake. That's why I was in Mexico. Go on. I knew quite a bit about you, Jim. You and Ted Brewster and quite a few other people. It's a little hobby of mine, let us say. So? So I was certain that uh, you would see the opportunity I placed before you. The advantages of a new face, a new life, money. And now you want in. A ride on the gravy train. Exactly. 
I expect to be paid for my services. Suppose I refuse. Oh, you would not be so stupid, my boy. I, I could make things so very difficult for you. I could inform Mr. Brewster's aunt. And let me see, there is a girl, too. Judy. And uh, Mrs. Kinsella, your wife, in Mexico. I think she would like to know. I could tell them all this was your idea. And it was, Doctor. This I could deny. I could be properly horrified by the ghastly mistake I had made. My reason for coming here to the States, you see. After making one mistake, I wanted to be certain. How much do you want? Half. Half of Brewster's money. Half? Oh, not, not all at once, of course. I can be quite reasonable, my boy, and patient. Let us say the first payment shall be $5,000. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Oh, wait a minute. I can't get it that quickly. I... Uh, you will try, my boy. You will try very hard. Listen, if, you, if you'll give me till the end of the week... That is out of the question. I have certain things to take care of. Expect it. I must have the money tomorrow night. Uh, let us stay around uh, this same time. All right. All right, Doctor. You'll get it. As you leave Barman's apartment, a plan begins to take shape in your mind. If you can stall him off for a few days, long enough for you to get a few thousand dollars, you can run away, can't you? Change your name. Bowman of the police will never find you. But you know, that would mean leaving Judy behind. And you don't want to do that. No, you really want to stay on here as Ted Brewster. You want to keep all the money for yourself. And you realize you're really in love with Judy. As you drive back to the house, you tell yourself there must be a way to prevent Bowman from ruining everything. You spend a sleepless night thinking about it. It stays with you the following day. And then that evening, as you sit in the car with Judy, looking out over the ocean. Oh, it's been a perfect evening, Judy. Did you really mean what you said about Mexico? Going back with me, I mean? You know I did, darling. Oh, you're wonderful, Judy. Uh, what time is it? Why, it's a few minutes to nine. Why? Do you mind if we go back now? There's something I have to do. Tonight? Yes. Might as well get it over as soon as possible. All right, John. Whatever you say. Now, I'll have to take care of this little matter before we can start making any plans, Judy. Uh, it's something I've got to do. A half hour after you've left Judy, you're entering the apartment building on Crescent Street. You hurry upstairs to Dr. Bauman's apartment. Bring the buzzer. And as you wait, the hand in your coat pocket closes tightly around the gun. Well, my boy, right on time, I see. Hello, Doctor. Come in. Uh, do you have something for me? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I have something for you, Dr. Baum. I don't think you're going to like it. Not one bit. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. You know, when Mother Nature created oil, she provided a mighty fine lubricant for automobile motors. But doesn't it stand to reason that in this modern day and age, a lubricant scientifically developed to protect motors should be even better? That's why more and more drivers are switching to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Naturally, this improved type Signal Oil starts off with nature's finest lubricant, 100% pure paraffin base. But in addition, Signal Premium Oil contains scientific new compounds that do specific jobs which oil alone cannot do. For instance, one compound in Signal Premium keeps your motor clean, free of carbon, gum, and varnish. Another compound in Signal Premium Oil prevents bearing corrosion. And still other compounds help in other ways to keep your motor young. No wonder Signal Premium Oil makes motors sing. So for the good of your car and your pocketbook, make your next oil change a change to the improved type Signal Oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. If 
over, isn't it, Jim? For what seems like hours, you stare at the lifeless body of Dr. Baum, dazed by what you've done. The one man who could strip the mask from your face, the only man who could reveal your true identity is dead. And so are you as Jim Kinsella. You've a new life before you now as Ted Brewster, with money, position, a wealthy aunt, and Judy, the girl who has promised to marry you. And now with one last look at Dr. Baum, confident you're in the clear, you turn and start for the door. And then as you open it... Hello. What is it? Homicide. We're looking for Dr. Bauman. Bauman? This is his apartment. Well, I, I'm sorry. He isn't in. Oh, isn't he? Well, that's too bad. We wanted to talk to him about an explosion. What? What? Yeah, at a chemical laboratory. I know the doctor quite well. Could could I help you? Can't you tell me what it's all about? The Mexican police ask us to check it for them. A few days back, a woman confessed that she persuaded Barman to do a nasty little job for her a couple of months ago. A woman? Mm-hmm. Barman's girlfriend. Seems she was tired of her husband, wanted him out of the way so she could marry Barman. And last week, Barman ran out on her. She got sore and... Tipped off the police. Tipped off the police? Yeah. To the explosion. And that Bauman was responsible for it. I guess she was just like a lot of other scorned women. Apparently, Mrs. Kinsella and the Mrs. doctor... Mrs. Kinsella? That's right. Bauman's girlfriend. Mrs. Jim Kinsella. Now, look, friend. We're coming in. No, I told you Bauman wasn't in. We know he is. We saw him come in. Now, come on, out of the way. We want a murderer and we're going to get him. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you are. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Jeff Chandler, Francis Robinson, and Paul McVeigh. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, based on a story by Richard Creedon, with music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday... Another Strange Tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Like anyone else, Van Barkley gave little thought to the precarious nature of everyday living. Had he had occasion to probe the fact, he might have acknowledged that danger is always present and that it can strike quite suddenly. Only Van Barkley wasn't thinking about such things. Perhaps he was too restless to care. A young engineer, unmarried, can get restless. Working in a new, strange city, he can get lonesome, too. Van Barkley was one or the other, or both of these things, on a Saturday night. But he came out of a movie and went for a stroll along the Santa Monica Palisade, in preference to going back to his hotel room. On a corner, he stopped to light a cigarette. That's when he first noticed it. The car was big, a Nash convertible. It cruised by him, came back around the block, moving slow. The third time around, he was standing on the curb, staring openly at the girl behind the wheel. She was very nice. Young, blonde, considerably more than attractive. And she was looking at him, just as obvious. Hello. Hello. You've opened a door before, no doubt. Hmm. In other words, isn't it a beautiful night for a drive? Well, isn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. You weren't going somewhere important. No, no, not at the moment. In fact, I was faced with a rather gloomy prospect of an evening at a hotel alone. And it is a beautiful night for a drive. Uh, I suppose it was on the golf course at Biarritz. What? Where we met. That's as good a place as any. Yes, only I've never been there. But I have a good imagination. And then, I remember so well those evenings at Monte Carlo... When you'd say to me, Van, you must sit beside me at the casino tonight. You bring me luck. You called me Van in those days, remember? Never Mr. Barclay. And I used to call you, uh... uh what was it I used to call you? It might have been Darling, mightn't it? Uh, yes, might have been at that. Or maybe the mystery woman, huh? Beautiful. Fascinating and unpredictable. Especially unpredictable. Oh, that's not very flattering, Mr. Barkley. You might have said, especially beautiful. Yeah, I might have. And meant it. Okay, you win. You're not only beautiful and fascinating and unpredictable, but you're too fast a worker for me. How come? How come what? All this. You're not happy about taking a drive with me, Mr. Barkley? I'm delirious. But why me? What I got? Well, you're not unattractive, you know. Yeah, but baby, you never saw me before. How do you know what I'm like? Perhaps I like to take chances. Didn't your mother ever warn you about picking up strange men on the street? My mother was rather unusual, Mr. Barkley. She taught me that when I wanted something, there was only one thing to do. Get out and find it. Uh -huh. Okay, who's kicking? You'll pardon me if I pinch myself. This is something I wouldn't have believed. Sort of like an angel from heaven dropping in your lap. Oh, oh I'm no angel, Mr. Barkley. Would you like a drink? You're driving. Then come on, we'll go in. Well, this is the swankiest roadhouse I ever saw. Oh, it's not a roadhouse. I live here. Come on. Uh, it's not a bad little place to hang your hat? <laughs> hang it, then. We like it here probably have two or three scattered around the country. Oh, no, no. Just a cabin at Lake Anderson. Mm -hmm. Well, I gather you're not worrying much about any wolves howling at your door. Not that kind, anyway. The guy that owns this place must be a movie producer. Your father? My father. And he's not a movie producer, just an art collector. Uh, perhaps you'd like to take a look around. We have some very nice paintings scattered all over the house. Think we can find our way without a guide? There's no one else here, if that's what you mean. We only have one servant now. This is her night off. It's cozy, isn't it? The whole place to ourselves, all 50 rooms. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. We'll take a look as soon as we have that drink, I promised you. You feel like pinching yourself, don't you, Ben? This is the kind of thing that just doesn't happen. But it's real. She's real. And she's even more attractive than she looked in the car. And it isn't the cocktails you've had. Finally, she leads you into the library. Like this room, Ben? Very much. Always wanted something like this. The right sort of library is good for a man. I designed this myself. Mm-hmm. Even no interior decorating, huh? You're, uh, pretty complete. <laughs> Thank you. Then, fix yourself another drink. The decanter is over there. I'll be right back. Take your time. This is all very pleasant. You fix another drink. Sink into a big leather chair and relax. When you open your eyes a few minutes later, she's back, smiling down at you. Hello. Hello again. Oh, I see your glass is empty. Well, that's easily remedied. I'll pour you another one. Well, this is nice work. If you can get it. <laughs> Here you are. Thank you. Nice perfume you're wearing. Like it? I like everything about you. Good. Then you won't mind doing something for me, will you? Anything, short of murder. Walk over here. To the closet? Yes. 
still. Now, open the door. There's something I want you to see. Okay. I'll play games with you. I... Hey, I thought you said we were alone. We are, Mr. Barkley. Because, you see, the gentleman in the closet is quite dead. It's a great deal more than you bargained for, isn't it, Ben? Yes. When you stepped into the car at the invitation of the beautiful blonde, you didn't realize what kind of a ride was ahead. It was like a dream, wasn't it? Going to her home, having cocktails and relaxing. And then in the library, you looked into the closet. Fantastic, Ben. Your mind spins, almost unable to cope with the situation, as you stare down at the quiet figure of a dead man on the floor of the closet. You scarcely hear the girl beside you. You'll help me, won't you? Hmm? What'd you say? All you have to do is help me hide him permanently. Now, wait a There's minute. There's a place out in the garden where some newly turned earth wouldn't be noticed, but I'm not much good at digging graves. Uh, uh baby. You can count me out. I don't know how this guy happens to have a hole in his head, and I'm not asking any questions, but just count me out on any part of his You field. said you'd do anything for me. Yeah, but I don't go off the deep end for anybody, especially for a girl who's in the habit of keeping dead bodies lying around. Uh-uh. No, lady. Pardon me. Well, I'll be seeing I think you'd better wait, Mr. Barkley. Oh. Yeah. I see what you mean. I see you're wearing a gun, too. Uh-huh. And I assure you I know how to use it. How can I doubt that, with the evidence staring me in the face? Good. That if you'll just pick up our late departed friend and come with me, I'll show you the place. You know that business about your being no angel? I'm just about convinced. You carry the body downstairs as she demands and go out into the garden. There's a shovel. Start digging. Like I said, dig it big. Sounds like a beach near here. The back of the yard drops off to the beach. But never mind, you've got other things to do. Dig deep and wide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, baby. A heavy shovel full of dirt in her face knocks her off her feet. At the same time, you're leaping clear, racing for the drop-off at the back of the property. It's a wild, frightening scramble down through the rock and brush until you hit the beach, running hard. There are no shots, no footsteps. You're away, Van. Free. Far down the beach, you work your way back up to the highway. Catch the bus for town and the safety of your hotel room. You're too upset to decide what to do that night. You want to call the police. But the memory of that blonde hair and those pale blue eyes stops you. You want to be sure before doing anything that will send her to the gas chamber. You turn in without deciding. Next morning, when you go downstairs, the desk clerk hands you something. Good morning, Mr. Barkley. Morning. What's this? A young lady left it late last night. But there's nothing written on the envelope. She just told me to put it in your box. Oh. Well, thanks. Hmm. That looks awful green. Yeah. A hundred dollar bill. And no note? No nothing? No. Nope. I wish I knew your secret, Mr. Barkley. You'd like to know that secret yourself, wouldn't you, Van? Now more than ever. One hundred dollars to pay for your silence. And probably a chance of more if you live up to the bargain. But there's also a chance to play it smart, isn't there? If you can find out more about this girl, her name, what's behind it all... You catch the bus again, and as you approach the big house, there seems to be quite a few people around. At the gas station on the corner, you find out why. All set, Mr. Armstrong. Anything else? That's all, Joe. Thanks. Hi there. What can I do for you, mister? Run out of gas or something? No. No, I was just walking, and I saw there was some kind of excitement around here. Yeah, more than we've had in a long time. They found a body down on the beach this morning. Oh, somebody drowned? Maybe so, but he got a bullet hole through his forehead first. Oh, murder, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Guy named Alfred Hamilton lived right up the street. Over in that house? Ridgely's? Oh, no. He used to be over there a lot, but he didn't live there. Well, I noticed that there was a police car out in front. No, that's part of the excitement. Not only is this friend of the Ridgely's bumped off, but Doris is missing. Doris? Yeah, Doris Ridgely, Mr. Ridgely's daughter. Oh, well, that's uh, Ridgely the art collector? Oh, sure, sure, you know. He's about the richest person in the neighborhood. Nice man, too. Mm -hmm. And Doris, his daughter. I remember, I've seen her. 
is a blonde, isn't she? Uh, good looking? Mm, that isn't the word for that girl. She's a peach. And she's beautiful. Yes, but uh, rather hard and spoiled. Doris? No. Why, there isn't a nicer girl in town. And I ought to know. I've been taking care of her car ever since she started to drive. I sure hate to see her mixed up in anything like this. And missing, too. Why, she might be in the ocean herself. Only her car is gone, too. Oh. They think she murdered this guy, Hamilton? I don't know. But if you ask me, she couldn't have. She's too regular. And if she did, she had a good reason. Hamilton was no good. I never could understand why Doris and old man Ridgely put up with him. There's just the two of them live there, huh? Yeah, Mrs. Ridgely died a while back. Gosh, I hope they find the girl okay. He'd just about kill the old man if anything happened to her. Yeah. When was this guy murdered? Last night. And I can tell you exactly when. Ten minutes to eight on the nose. Oh? How can you be sure? Because I heard the shot. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but I did notice what time it was, because I was just getting ready to close up. Did you tell the police that? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, where did the shot come from? How should I know? It was just a noise. Maybe from the house over there, maybe from the beach where they found him. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hey, you. Say, who are you, anyway? Nobody important. So long. As you walk away, you feel sure about one thing. That Doris didn't murder Hamilton at all. She was covering for somebody else, wasn't she, Dan? And you've got to find her and bring her back. But, but where is she? Suddenly it hits you. The cabin she mentioned. Yes, at Anderson Lake. You decide quickly, Van. Next stop, Anderson Lake. Uh, hello there, young fella. What can I do for you? Got everything here Bonnie needs? Groceries, notion, rugs, fishing, tackle? Oh, no, I was looking for somebody, Pop. Thought maybe you could give me directions. Well, I'm the person to come to. Can tell you about anybody in Anderson Lake. And who you're looking for? Doris Ridgely. She's got a cabin up here, hasn't she? Yep. Well, uh, how do I get there? And you don't. Huh? Why not? Wouldn't do you no good. Why not? Nobody there. But I'm sure Doris is up here, and I've got to find her. Well, if you got eyes in your head, you wouldn't have to go to no cabin. Huh? <laughs> if you look across the street over there, you'll see her car in front of Jake's Cafe. She's eating inside. Okay. Thanks, Pop. He's in Jake's Cafe. And you wait outside until she comes out. As she gets into the convertible, you slip around the other side and open the door. Oh, Hello, uh, baby. It's a nice day for a drive, isn't it? Mr. Barkley. Don't reach you... for your bag. I'll take it instead. I'll take a look inside, too. Yeah, just as I thought the gun. You still got it. Well, I'll just keep it this time, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Barkley... Now, just a minute. I'll do the talking this time. First, I'll give this back to you. Even if I had a price for this sort of thing, it wouldn't be $100. It's all I had last night. I said even if I had a price, I don't. I'll keep my mouth shut until I'm ready to talk. Or you are. But what makes you think I have anything to talk about? Now, look, I think I know a good kid when I see one. If you're really in trouble, I'm sorry. But I don't think you are. I don't think you killed this heel, Hamilton. I think you're covering up for somebody. No, no, I'm not. I killed him. He was threatening me. Threatening to, to tell something about me, and I killed him. I don't believe you. All you did was try to get me to help cover up somebody else's work. No, that's not true. Okay, so you're not ready to talk yet. Come on, let's go for a drive. Well... You know, I'm sorry I had to smother you with that shovel full of dirt last night. But I didn't like the prospect of sharing that hole in the ground with Hamilton. You mean you thought I'd... Oh, no, I never intended to do that. Well, how'd you think you'd get away with it then? Just let me walk away to tell oh, the cops? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, baby, keep your chin up. Of course you don't know. You were mixed up in something you knew nothing about. Now, you couldn't have killed this guy, Hamilton, any more than you could have killed me. So, come on. Come clean. I... No, I, I can't. Right, now, look, whoever this is you're covering up for, they'll be found out eventually. Probably they had a good reason for doing this, from what I hear about Hamilton. But now you've got to get yourself off the spot, and me, too. We're accessories to the murder. Yes, I know. I... Look, why are you doing this? Why did you come here? I'll show you why. Does that answer your question? I... I, I... No talking now. Come on, start driving. We've got to have a little talk with the police. Well, Van, you found her, and she's grateful. You can see that. The way she smiles at you weakly, wonderingly. And perhaps later, when it's all over, you can pick up the dream where it left off. You think about it, you drive back to the city with her. 
Then as she swings the big convertible into San Vicente Boulevard, she suddenly slams on the brakes beside a police squad car. Hey, what's the idea, baby? We don't want a squad car. We want to go to police Officer? headquarters. Officer, arrest this man. He's wanted for murder. And be careful. He's got a gun. You can't believe it's happening, can you, Ben? But it is. And later at police headquarters, your dream has turned into a nightmare. As Doris pours out a wild story to the chief of the Homicide Bureau. Yes, y- yes, they were, they were both at my house last night. They left together. Then I, I heard a shot. When I went out looking, I found Mr. Barkley standing over Hamilton's body down on the beach. He, he'd taken his wallet. What? You'll find it in his pocket right now. The officer here already has the murder gun. Are you kidding? Why, I haven't any wallet. I don't have a... Easy, easy now. Well, seems you do have a wallet, Mr. You Barkley. You see, Sergeant? Yeah, but... She put it there. She slipped it into my pocket while we were driving. This is Hamilton's wallet, and this is the same caliber gun that killed him, Barkley. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. It's all a lie. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Ridgely. Thanks for coming right over. The lad's right, Sergeant. He didn't kill him. Dad. It's no use, Doris. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you can't protect me. Dad, please don't say anything. I said it's no use, dear. You can release them, Sergeant. This young man and my daughter... I killed Hamilton. He was no good. I... I shot and killed him. The surprises are hitting you like punches from a fighter, aren't they, Van? The attempted frame against you by Doris. And now, out of the blue, her father facing the police, admitting that he killed Hamilton. You stare from one to the other, wondering and waiting. And then Doris breaks the silence. But, Dad, you couldn't have killed Hamilton. Why couldn't he? He just confessed. That's good enough for me. He confessed to protect me. Dad had no reason. He to... could have had the best reason in the world. Blackmail. That was Hamilton's racket. Blackmail? That's the answer, Doris. Hamilton had been bleeding me for a long time. But a few days ago, I got the evidence to clear myself and expose him. So you sent for him and told him. He got tough and... Uh... I shot him. I had to. In self-defense. Oh, look, officer, you found the gun in Hamilton's wallet on this man right here. What more do you want? I tell you, I never saw this girl in my life until last night. It's no use, Doris. It happened exactly as I said. No, Dad, I know you didn't do it. There's only one way you could know, Miss Ridgely. Yes, Sergeant. There's only one way I could know. I tell you, my daughter is lying. Mr. Ridgely is right, Sergeant. Uh, Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Find anything? Plenty. His daughter's lying to protect him. We know from the gas station attendant's testimony that the shot that killed Hamilton was fired last night at ten minutes to eight. We've checked every move of Miss Ridgely's, and at ten minutes of eight, she was seen buying a pack of cigarettes at the corner drugstore. And it was Mr. Ridgely. Uh Uh-uh. Mr. Ridgely left Hamilton in his living room last night somewhere around seven o'clock, probably after telling him he was going to expose him to the police. At ten minutes to eight, Mr. Ridgely was seen having a drink at the sea house. So, Barkley, you did take Hamilton's wallet. It was your gun. I tell you, I never even heard of any of these people. It I... wasn't young Romeo here either. I mean, who? Alfred Hamilton committed suicide. Suicide? That's right. There's no doubt about it. Powder burns on his face. He was left-handed. The angle of the bullet in the left temple shows the wound was self-inflicted. And tests prove beyond a doubt that Hamilton fired a shot a few seconds before his death. I guess when he realized Mr. Ridgely was going to expose him to the police, he just couldn't take it. Now, Mr. Ridgely, if you'll come into my office a minute, I'll show you the reports. Uh, Dad, we'll wait in the car. I'll be along in a minute, Doris. Well, baby, you gave me a nice ride. A very nice ride. Oh, honestly, Van, I'm terribly sorry, but I was worried crazy about Dad. Van, do you think we could have that drink again? Sometime, maybe? Now, look, you're a nice kid. You're beautiful, fascinating, all those things, especially beautiful. But, baby, if you ever see me walking down the street again, just go on by. Please. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Hazel Lytle and John Dunkel, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Signal Oil Program. 
Yes, the signal oil program, the Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal gasoline is tough, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Letter to Melanie. The tiny beanery on the main street was called the Heart of Gold. But the title bore little, if any, reference to the people who ate there. The miners, transients, local merchants, and people like Hal Benton. Perhaps the Heart of Gold held something more for Hal Benton. He was there regularly enough. Every time he came into town from the mine in the back country of Sonora. Hal's partner, Walter Reese, was interested only in the mail and supplies. But for Hal tall, young, and good-looking. There just might have been another attraction. Well, what'll it be for dessert, Hal, honey? Anything your little heart desires. Oh, you mean it, Terry? You know I do. Oh, fine. A piece of pie. Oh, the pie, he said. <laughs> I'll bet you baked it with your own two little hands. Oh, sometimes I don't think you'd notice if I had three. What about your partner? How about Walter? Walt! Uh-huh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, nothing for me, Terry. Okay, I'll get your pie, Hal. Oh, <laughs> another letter from Melody, huh? <laughs> I don't get you at all. Joining a pen club, writing to some dame you never met? I don't get it. No, I I guess you wouldn't, Hal. Now, you think a good-looking guy like me, I right? I know, I know. A good-looking guy like you. Have to beat them off of the club. Oh, I was just kidding, Walt. Here's your slab of blueberry, honey. Oh, thank you, gorgeous hunk of stuff. Oh, eat your pie, you two-timer. <laughs> uh, Hal, we should be getting back to camp soon. Oh, now, Walter, don't rush lover boy out of town. He wants to play post office. Yeah, sure. Relax, Walter, relax. What's your hurry? Well, it's just that I... Oh, you're anxious we... to get back to your typewriter, huh? Hey, why don't you take in a movie, Walter? Do you good? Well, I don't know. Uh, how much do I owe you, Terry? Uh, dollar three. Here. Here you are. Okay. Uh, look. What time do you get off tonight, Terry? Oh, a couple of hours. Oh? You know something? What? This pie is lousy. Oh. Well. Hey, you leaving too? Uh, yes, sir. I'm the impatient type, honey. Two hours is a long time. Walt is right. Got to get back to camp. Oh, fine. Go so I'll see you around, sugar. Come on, Walt. Come on. It's back to camp for you, isn't it, Hal? Yes, with all your other interests. The mine you and Walter are working in the back country is the most important thing in your life. It's most important to Walter, too. Although he makes you wonder sometimes, like right now, back at your camp in the hills, sitting across from you by the lantern, pecking away at the old battered typewriter. Another letter to Melanie. Melanie Lawton, Walter's Correspondence Club sweetheart. Walt, what's the good of all this letter writing to your bashful widow in Tacoma if you never plan to meet the dame? Well, perhaps I do intend to meet Melanie. <laughs> sure, sure. You don't believe me, Hal, do you? Just because it doesn't mean anything to you. You can have any woman you want, any time. Sure. You're handsome, Hal. Well, maybe you'll be surprised. Melanie's driving to San Francisco next week. No. <laughs> really? That's right. And she intends to stop by Sonora.
In the days that follow, you wonder about your partner. He's acting nervously, and you're certain it has to do with a visit from his pen partner, Melanie Lawson. And then one evening on your next trip into town, as you approach the hotel, Walter stops suddenly. Uh, what's the matter, Walt? Uh, Hal. Yeah? Uh, Hal, I'd... Uh, well, I'd like to go in alone. Could... Could you perhaps go on down and meet Terry, maybe? I'm a... Well, I'm a, I'm a little nervous. About what? About meeting her, Melanie. You really mean it? She's here? Inside, yes. That's her car up front. She wrote me about it. Well, well. <laughs> okay, Walter, sure. Go ahead, go meet your girlfriend. <laughs> hey, wait, uh, are you going to tell her you're really Walter Reese instead of using that phony pen name that you've been using, uh, William Blade? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I should, now. It surprises you, doesn't it, Hal? Even more as you walk past the huge convertible car parked in at the curb. And then a thought hits you very suddenly, doesn't it, Hal? The big car. What it must have cost. The money that Melanie Lawton must have to own it. And then another thought. Something Walter said. Something that suddenly has a new meaning. You can have any woman you want, anytime. Sure. You're a handsome Hal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe you're right, Walt. I wonder just how lonesome your rich girlfriend is. <laughs> I wonder. With the prologue of Letter to Melanie, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you'll be needing new tires soon, you're naturally interested in getting the biggest allowance for your old tires. And biggest allowance is just exactly what signal dealers are offering right now. Yes, that sign outside signal service stations means what it says. Biggest allowance for your old tires on new top quality Lee tires. Not cut rate secondary tires, mind you, but nationally advertised tires by Lee of Conshohocken. For 47 years, the finest of first line tires. Because of their exclusive double-life rayon cord construction, Lee tires have long been outstanding for mileage and safety. But today's Lees are so much finer, so vastly improved, they're actually giving 30 to 40% more miles. The secret? Lee uses long-wearing cold rubber and toughens it still more with patented high-abrasive Phil Black O. For trouble-free service and safety, you just can't buy a finer tire than the handsome new 8-rib Super Deluxe Lee tire. And for value, you can't beat that whopping trade-in allowance that signal stations are offering now. So before you buy any tires, be wise. Find out how much your old tires are worth now at your nearest signal service station. Your curiosity is aroused, isn't it, Hal? As it always is when there's money in sight. Any kind of money. And now you wonder if Walter hasn't found the real answer without knowing. Yes. His letters to a wealthy, lonely woman, Melanie Lawton, who drove all this way to see him. And you decide that the situation is worth looking into. Yes. And a few minutes after that decision, you enter the hotel cocktail bar, approach Walter and the woman who's sitting with him at the bar. Well, hello. What? Oh. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Walter, you old fox? Well, aren't you going to introduce me? Uh, well, of course. But this, this must be Mr. Benton. Uh, yes, Melanie. Uh, Miss Melanie Lawton, this is my partner, Hal Benton. How do you do? Hello. Walter was just telling me about you, Mr. Benton. Well, uh, that's just like him. What did he say? Oh, that's a secret. He... I promised him I wouldn't tell you. And you're not a gal to break a secret, huh? <laughs> well, here. Look, can I uh, borrow a stool here and buy a drink, huh? What well, no. Uh, Melanie, uh, Mrs. Lawton's had quite a drive, and she was just going to turn in, and I thought oh, that... Oh, it's quite all right, Walter, really. I don't mind. Well... Your uh, things out of the car, Mrs. Lawton? I know, they're... Well, bad service in a town like this, Mrs. Lawton. But I'll take care of it. 
that is, unless you'd rather, Walter. I don't want to interfere, you uh, know. No, no, of course I'll do it. I'll be right back, Melanie. You watch him go. Realize that he isn't angry, only embarrassed and confused. And you concentrate on talking pleasantly with Melanie Lawson. It's easy, isn't it, Hal? Easy and pleasant. And in the next few moments, you turn on the charm all the way. You know, Mrs. Lawton, uh, Melanie, I'm going to make a little threat right here and now. Oh? Yep. We're outspoken up here, straight from the shoulder. So I'm telling you, that partner of mine isn't going to have all your time to himself. Oh, well, really, Mr. Denton? Uh, how? All right. <laughs> You say you got to turn in, but I'm not going to let you get away with that. No, sir, not when there's a moon out and... Uh... Oh, now, don't be silly. Huh? Anyway, here comes Walter. I've got to say goodnight to you both right now. Okay. You can try, but I'm a stubborn man. Very stubborn. Yes? Oh. Oh, Mr. Denton. Uh, how? Oh, Mr. Benton, really? I know, I know, I know. You just said goodnight to me and to Walter. <laughs> he believes it, too. Went down to the depot, a red-hot game of checkers on tap. Oh, you, you don't believe it, that I meant it when I said goodnight? Not with that moon. Like I said... Oh, now, please. Oh, Melanie, I'm like a little boy at heart, really. I just have to drive that convertible around the block, at least. I'll give you the keys. You can... Oh, I'm not that much of a little boy. Oh, come on. Just around the block, Melanie. All right. Just around the block, Mr. Denton. How? Another block? Oh, no, Mr. Denton. Now, I don't think... Uh, that... uh, uh, how? All right. How? Another block. Like I said, Walter, I was on my way down here about a quarter of an hour ago, and I bumped into Melanie as she stepped out of the hotel. Uh, Hal, uh, don't you think it's strange? I, I mean, for her just to go to San Francisco without a word? Well, she told me to say goodbye to you. Oh, women are funny, Walter. Come on, come on, let's get back to camp. Yeah, yeah, let's do. Uh, Hal, I, I know this must seem silly to you, but Melanie's leaving like that without saying goodbye. Well, well, it's kind of knocked me out. Do. Well, do you think you could handle the mine alone for a couple of weeks? What? Why? What do you got in mind? Well, it's just like I said, this thing with Melanie ending like it did, it kind of knocked me out. And and if you don't mind, I'd like to run up to Sacramento and spend a couple of weeks with my sister and her husband. I'm, well, I'm just nuts about the kids. I think it's a good idea, Walter. A great idea. You didn't expect a lucky break like this, did you, Hal? The one thing that worried you, how to keep Walter in camp every evening while you gave your attention to the attractive and wealthy Melanie Lawton has been solved by Walter's decision to visit his sister in Sacramento. The next evening, dining with Melanie, you're very sure of yourself and your charm. Hal, how come Walter didn't come in with you tonight? Well, he's gone. Gone? But I don't understand. Neither do I. He just up and left for Sacramento. Told me to tell you goodbye for him. But he wrote so many nice letters to me. Look, uh, let's forget it, huh? They weren't wasted, the letters. After all, they brought us together. Yes. Yes, Al, they did do that, but... Oh, I still can't see why Walter left like that. It, it's all so strange and... And yet so nice, too. Sure it is, and it'll keep getting nicer if you decide to stick around. Look, you don't really have to go down to San Francisco now, do you? No. No, it isn't important, really. I've been thinking about it, Hal, thinking that oh, I'd sort of like to stay here in Sonora a while. Oh, it's such a lovely town. <laughs> and the people are so friendly, hmm? So very friendly. <laughs> There are other evenings with Melanie. Evenings when she picks you up at the bridge a quarter of a mile from your camp. 
and the two of you go for a long drive through the countryside. The mine has become unimportant to you now, hasn't it, Hal? Because you found another way, an easier way to make money. Yes, you've a definite plan in mind, haven't you? And one evening when you're out with Melanie... You're very quiet tonight, Hal. Huh? Oh, sorry, business on the brain. Oh, the mine? Yeah, yeah. And looks like Walter picked another lemon. I had a different spot all staked out. Mexico, but Walter couldn't see it. Even Muller couldn't talk him into it. Muller? Who's he? Oh, C.J. Muller. He's a friend of ours in San Francisco. Pretty shrewd speculator. Oh. Yeah, but Walter wouldn't budge. Says Muller's percentage of the take is too high. Maybe he's right. <laughs> Who'd be willing to take a chance on a couple of eggs like Walter and me? Oh, I see. Oh, look, look, it's too nice a night to talk about business. How about dri driving over to Jimtown? You ever been there? No. No, oh, it's well, you'll love it. You'll love it. Turn right at the next intersection. <laughs> It's done, isn't it, Hal? You've made the first move of the campaign. The subtle beginning of your plan to sell Melanie Lawson the idea of investing some capital in a Mexican gold hunt. And in the evenings that follow, you keep the subject alive, casually mentioning it from time to time, dropping a word now and then at just the right moment. Then you purposely avoid the subject for several days. And finally, at the end of the week, it's Melanie who brings it up again. It's just what you've been waiting for. You know, it's a funny thing, Melanie, you mentioning Muller. I got a letter from him this morning. Oh, still in Jackson? He's frothing at the mouth. Here, here, read it. Uh, my dear Mr. Benton, I see who could persuade your business partner, Mr. Reese, to accept my terms. I am certain that we... Oh, he is interested, isn't he? He wants to see you. <laughs> yeah, I talked to him on the phone this afternoon. I told him there's still no go. How... You're sold on this idea, aren't you? Going to Mexico. Oh, completely. And all you need is is $10,000. Mm-hmm. 5000 to start with, at least. What? What are you thinking about, baby? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, Hal. <laughs> Come on. Come on, help me squander some quarters in that slot machine, oh, huh? What, again? <laughs> hey, yes, sir. I have a hunch, Melanie. I'm going to hit the jackpot before long. You're fully confident now, aren't you, Hal? Your little scheme won't fail. The letter from Muller was all you needed. It's an old letter, and you changed the date on it. But Melanie doesn't know that, does she, Hal? The next evening, you're at the bridge waiting for Melanie as usual. An hour goes by. She's never been this late before, has she, Hal? And you're beginning to wonder if something has gone wrong when... I'm late. Well, you had me worried. Oh, oh, really? Oh, I just got back from San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco? Yeah, and you want to know why? Here's this envelope. Huh? Open it. Open it. Go on, go on. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What's this? Oh, it's $5,000, Al. And it's yours to get you started. I'm your new partner. Oh, now, now, look, baby, look. I can't take this. Oh, nonsense. It's a business deal. And I'm certainly old enough to know how to handle my money. And and besides, I... I want to do it, Hal. Well... <laughs> well, this calls for champagne, baby. A lot of it. <laughs> and a very big evening. You congratulate yourself, don't you, Hal? Everything has worked out as you knew it would. You could slip out of town in the morning, but you decide to wait a week or so for Melanie's other 5000 The future looks bright, doesn't it? And the next evening, after you close the mine shaft, you drive into town. Suddenly, you almost freeze with shock at the wheel. Your partner, Walter, is standing at the entrance to a drugstore talking excitedly to Melanie. You quickly turn a corner and stop the car where you can watch them unobserved. When Melanie leaves, Walter motions a nearby taxi, tosses in his traveling bag, and starts off in the direction of camp. You have to find out how much Walter and Melanie have told each other. You walk half a block and slip down the alley leading to the back door of Melanie's hotel. No one sees you as you hurry up the back stairs to room 204. Oh, 
Oh, Hal. Hello, Melanie. You lied to me about the mine, didn't you, Hal? I saw you talking to Walter. What did he tell you? He didn't have to tell me anything. I knew something was wrong by the way he acted. Where'd he go? Back to camp. Oh, listen, he's putting on an act, honey. He's sore. He's trying to make trouble between us because you and no, I... No, Hal. I phoned Mr. Miller in San Francisco. Oh, I see. He's been in Europe the past year. You... You were very clever, Hal. And... I was very foolish. Okay. Well, what now? You want the money back? What? I don't care about the money. What? That doesn't matter. Oh, well, look, baby, look. We can straighten this out. Oh, no, we can't. What are you doing? I'm going to see to it that you never get the chance to pull this cheap trick again on some... some other foolish woman. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can have the dough back. I'm calling the police, Hal. No, you're not. Give me that. Give me that phone. Call the police, will you? It happened suddenly, doesn't it, Hal? A moment of blind rage. Now as it leaves you, Melanie slips from your grasp, drops to the floor. It was an accident, wasn't it? You didn't really mean to kill her. Melanie. Melanie! You drop into the chair at the desk. The clever little plan that was to put you on easy street has now led you down the road to murder. And it's all Walter's fault, isn't it? If he hadn't talked with Melanie, this wouldn't have happened. Suddenly your eyes fall on a sheet of paper lying on the desk. A letter. A half-finished letter. Melanie. You pick it up. I find it difficult to write this, my dear Catherine. Difficult to admit I've been a fool. You were right all along, becoming involved in the pen club was a mistake. And that mistake has cost me $5,000. I was stupid enough to let a cheap swindler take it from me. I don't care about the money anymore. I just want to forget the William Blaze incident. There, the letter ends abruptly. You stare at the lifeless body on the floor. Then back at the letter. William Blaze. The name Walter used when he wrote to Melanie. There's no mention of you in the letter anywhere. Suddenly, the way out becomes clear to you. Minutes later, you hurry back out to the alley behind the hotel. Unseen, you reach your car and race back to camp. Walter isn't around anywhere. An hour goes by and still no sign of Walter. Then shortly after ten, a twig snaps behind you and Walter steps into the clearing. So you're back? Yes. I got in this afternoon. Where have you been? Out for a walk. How? I saw Melanie earlier this evening. You've got to give back that money. Never mind about me. You better start packing your leaving. Leaving? Unless you want to stick around to face a murder rap. Uh, what? It's Melanie. She's dead. Dead? You... Maybe you'd better sit down. I'll explain the whole setup to you, and I'll make it real, real clear. You tell Walter exactly what's happened, don't you, Hal? And you mention the letter Melanie was writing. The letter that will implicate William Blaze. That everything will point to him. That you'll have to tell the police about his connection with Melanie Lawton. Reveal him as William Blaze. Walter stares at you, an expression of horror on his face. Why? Why didn't you destroy the letter? They... they would never have known about William Blaze. I had to protect myself. I'm sorry at you, Walter, but I had to have a clay pigeon. You're it. You... you'd really do this to me? I have to. But I'll do the best I can to help you get away. Now go on, pack your stuff and beat it. When the police get here, I'll tell them you took the car and headed for San Francisco. You can go in the opposite direction and get the jump on them. Now here, here are the car keys. <laughs> Happy journey. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Where shall we eat? Where shall we spend the night? Those are two questions you'll be asking again and again if you do any traveling this summer. Well, to help you find happy answers to these questions, Signal Oil Dealers are offering free a 16-page booklet of selected eating and lodging places. 
called Lane's Guide. This handy booklet is packed with useful information. It tells, for instance, whether the lodging place is on a beach or has a swimming pool. In the case of motels, it states whether kitchens are available. And so that you can keep within your budget, it states whether the prices are low, medium, or high. Naturally, no pocket-sized publication could possibly contain every good eating and lodging place. But Lane's Guide, which is prepared by an independent travel organization, includes a representative selection in 243 cities and towns throughout seven western states. We hope you will enjoy this latest step in Signal Oil Company's continuing efforts to make your motoring miles more pleasant. Remember, a copy of Lane's Guide is yours free while the supply lasts at any Signal service station. It's over, isn't it, Hal? And you're in the clear. Melanie is dead. And the letter in her room implicating William Blades will lead the police to your partner, Walter Reese. He knows that too, doesn't he? And you're certain the panic that grips him at the moment will force him to run. That's just what you want him to do. It will help to convince the police that he's the man responsible for Melanie's death. And now as you stand facing him across the campfire... Oh, you thought you'd frame me, Hal. You'd better start rolling, chum. I know. Thanks for the car key. Thanks! What's the idea? Are you crazy throwing the keys away? Nah, nah, you won't be able to get away, Hal. <laughs> You're confused, Walter. I'm not running. You are. Oh, look, Hal. Down there on the road, a car coming this way. That red light must be the police. You must have made more noise in Melanie's room than you thought. And you fool, get out of here. The police can't prove I'm William Blades. I could tell them you're William Blades. I, I think I will, Hal. You're forgetting one little detail, Walter. You and Melanie exchanged photographs, remember? Yes. We exchanged photographs. And I wouldn't be surprised if she still has yours in that hotel room. That would cinch it. She had the photograph with her, yes. Carried it in her purse. But it's not going to work out the way you figured. Oh, no? No. You see, I... Well, I never thought I was much to look at. You've always said you could get any girl, any time. You're handsome Hal. You never let me forget it. So when Melanie wrote me as William Blades and asked me to send her a photograph, I made myself look good. I sent her one. I sent her yours. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Wally Mayer, Eddie Marr, and Sarah Selby. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program. Yes, the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program. The Whistler. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, 
hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independently operated Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Perfect alibi. Entering the Golden Sparrow, a cozy little cocktail lounge near the far end of Beverly Boulevard, private investigator Johnny Seltzer, 30, handsome, off-duty at the moment, found business at a standstill. He went straight to the bar and ordered a drink. Scotch and water. I'll mix it. Right. Old Masters, if you have it. Old Masters it is. Good. Johnny carried his drink to the nearest empty table and sat down to think. Self-centered, cynical, and in his own estimation, a smooth operator. Many things were on his mind. Especially Johnny Seltzer himself. Things hadn't been going too well for him. Tom Silver founder of the Silver Detective Agency, had threatened him with dismissal unless he changed his way, ceased gambling, and gave closer attention to his duties. Staring moodily at the voluptuous paintings lining the walls, Johnny suddenly pushed back his chair and walked over to the jukebox at the end of the bar and slid a nickel into the slot. Returning to his table, he sat back to finish his drink, listen to the music, and sympathize with himself. Ordinarily, Johnny would have welcomed the voice which abruptly shattered his mood. A low, sibilant voice that seemed to come from nowhere. I like music, too. Does that make us pals? <laughs> Don't seem very happy. I was. Uh, most men would be glad to see me. Yeah, well, I'm different. I'm sure you are. That's why I came over. That was my wife's favorite line. Maybe that's why it didn't register. It could be. You didn't like her much, huh? I didn't. Divorce? I didn't kill her. Say, what are you anyway, an investigator for the World Psychology Foundation? I'm surprised you haven't asked me why I got married in the first place. Oh, I figured that out already. Don't. And it shows on you, too. What? Your merger with the bankroll behind that mink and ice you're modeling. There. No merger. Present. From a relative. That's quite a coincidence, isn't it? What is? Two people who like money meeting up in a place like Hollywood. And now that we know all about each other, let's call it a day, huh? Why? Why not? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because it's still early. Maybe because it's raining outside. That's not good enough. I like to walk in the rain. Nice if you'd invite yourself over. Maybe I'll run into you again sometime. Wait a second. Yeah? Am I that hard to take? How would I know? You might find out. I'm not curious. Can I take your order? No, thanks. I'm taking a powder. Waiter, two scotches and water. We'll mix them. I said I was leaving. Don't be like that, Johnny. Hmm? Sit down. What was that name you called me? You're Johnny Self at Private Eye, aren't you? Okay. You know who I am. I figured that pickup pitch was a phony. Well, like you said, I'm Johnny Seltzer. And I'm Alice Collins. Who's she? She's the niece of Charles Collins. Charles Collins? Not the number one boy of lumber. <laughs> That's what it says in the papers. I never saw him until two years ago. He wrote and asked me how I'd like to live out here, and I said I'd like it. So here I am. Mm-hmm. Eastern talent? I was born and raised in Springfield. Springfield, Missouri. Who sent you to me? Nobody. I saw you out at Dilbo's one night last week. I asked a croupier who you were. I see. The lady gambles, loses. Now she wants me to get her money back, right? Wrong. No, I don't think so. What did you do? Follow me here from the office? Mm-hmm. Am I forward? I'll just say easy to approach, like a department store. Uh, pardon me. Okay, waiter. Let's have the check, huh? Just put it on my bill, will you please? Certainly, Miss Collins. Take it out of this. Keep the change. Thank you, sir. Well, that was nice of you, Johnny. Cigarette? Thanks. Hmm. 
Now, look, Springfield, you got an angle or you wouldn't be talking to me. What is it? You ought to get over that inferiority complex. There's no angle. I just thought you'd be a nice guy to know. Later on, after I know you better, I might be able to throw a little business your way. Detective business? Terrific detective business. Maybe as much as $50,000. Well, that's nice money. It's too bad I work on a straight salary. The Tom Silver Detective Agency makes the deal. Not this one. This would be a special deal, Johnny. $50,000. Just for you. Interesting? Uh Uh-uh. If it was legit, you wouldn't be putting out that kind of dough. You're jumping to conclusions, aren't you? Maybe. But if I'm wrong, you can always take it up with the agency. You know where the office is. Okay, Johnny. But if you ever change your mind and want to talk it over, call me up. I will. So long, Springfield. You can get me almost any afternoon at Melrose. Five, four, three, two, one. That's easy to remember, Johnny. All you have to do is count five. Backwards. When you leave the Golden Sparrow, you're sure you've seen the last of Alice Collins, aren't you, Johnny? Yet a few days later, you're not so sure. Your boss, Mr. Silver, has you on the carpet again, and you have an unpleasant feeling you'll soon be out of a job. $50,000 is a lot of money, and Alice herself is something to ponder over. She's really beautiful, isn't she, Johnny? You can't forget her lovely features, her low musical voice. The things she said keep repeating themselves. $50,000 just for you. It's easy to remember, Johnny. Melrose, five, four, three, two, one. All you have to do is count five. Backwards. A few afternoons later, you enter a drugstore, cross to the phone booth, lift the receiver, deposit a coin, and reach for the dial. You can get me at Melrose, five... Four, three, two, one. That's easy to remember, Johnny. All you have to do is count five. Backwards. With the prologue of Perfect Alibi, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story. By the Whistler. Have you been putting off buying new tires? You're going to be glad you waited. Because now you can save real money at Signal service stations. But hold on. Don't get the idea that Signal dealers are offering cut price merchandise. Signal dealers feature nationally advertised first line Lee tires. Built to top quality standards. In fact, for 47 years, Lee has built only one quality. The finest first line tires. And today's Lees wear much, much longer because Lee toughens cold rubber with patented high abrasive Phil Black O. That's why Lee can back every tire with a double guarantee. Well, since such quality obviously can't be sold at cut prices, how can signal dealers save you money? By giving you today's biggest allowance for your old tires. That's right. That sign outside signal stations means just what it says. Biggest allowance for your old tires on top quality Lee tires. I can't tell you exactly how much your old tires are worth, but they're worth plenty. And you can easily find out by driving into any signal station. So before you buy any tire, see a signal dealer. You'll be glad you did. A few days ago, when you left the Golden Sparrow after your uh, pickup tete a tete with Alice Collins, niece of the multi millionaire lumberman Charles Collins, you didn't expect to see her again, did you? You're a licensed private detective, and she sounds like trouble. But with things piling up on you as they have, you decide you were a little hasty. An hour after phoning her, you drive to a modest little apartment building on Fountain Avenue near Coenga. Curious, but still cautious, you knock lightly on the door. 
Hello, Springfield. Hello, Johnny. Come in. You still like music, don't you? Mm-hmm. I've got a good memory, too. You have at that. <laughs> Here, let me take your hat. Then we'll go in the sunroom. Okay. Sit here, Johnny, and help yourself. Cigarette, scotch, and ice water. Oh, this is cozy. Real cozy. <laughs> My uncle gives me a very nice allowance. I spend every weekend with him out at his home near the ocean. That's quite a home from what I hear. Swimming pool, badminton court. Mm-hmm. But I'm young and like to go places. Uncle Charles didn't want me to drive out there alone late at night all the time, and so he suggested I take an apartment in town. You see, I'm his only blood relative. You ought to have quite a future. Mm-hmm. If I'm not an old lady before... I... Before anything happens to him. I wouldn't dwell on it. Nobody lives forever. Uh, excuse me, Johnny. Sure. Oh, Frankie. Hello, beautiful. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, Orchid. They're lovely. <laughs> so are you. How about a drink? In the sunroom. You can mix me one while I put these in the icebox. I've been talking with the man for Uncle Chuck. Jo- oh, Johnny. Hello, is- Snoop. Well, you two know each other? For years. Hiya, Frankie. What are you doing here? I'm here a lot. How gorgeous. Uh, yes. Uh, you see, Johnny... What I, I can't figure out is what a snoop's doing here. Business. Strictly business, Frankie. You see, Uncle Charles has been sick, and, well, he, he heard rumors, things that the mill weren't on the up and up, and asked me to make some inquiries. Why didn't you ask me about it, baby? I'd have gotten you the best in the business. You don't think Johnny's good? Uh, he's all right. <laughs> oh, forget it, Snoop. I'm sorry I acted like I was sore. But when you're nuts about a dame... Bad, you know how it is. Sure, Frankie, that's okay. Cigarette? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll be back in a second. I want to put these on. All right, take your time. It's a nice cigarette. Class, too. F.B. Frankie Benson, monogrammed in Old English. Everything. You, uh, you really like it? Like I said, Frankie, class. Well, here, take a bunch. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. Go ahead, go on. I order them by the gross. Well, thanks. Uh, this job for old man Collins you're talking to the doll about. Oh, I don't know anything about it yet. I just got here two minutes before you did. No. How about a drink? Sounds fine. I think I'll skip it, baby. You gotta talk to Snoop here. I'll pick you up at dinner around seven, okay? Uh, Sounds fine. Good. Uh, drop around later on, Snoop. Say around, uh, five-thirty. I might have an idea for you. Five-thirty it is. So long, Frankie. Well, Johnny, your golden girl seems a little tarnished, doesn't she? Not that you're surprised, but you are disappointed. And a little nettled to realize that a girl with a background of Alice Collins would waste her time on a gambler, a glorified hoodlum like Frankie Benson, operator of the notorious Dill Bowles Gambling Club. After Frankie's departure, you make no attempt to hide your annoyance. Nice friends you got. Honestly, Johnny, it's not what you think. What do I think? You think I'm Frankie Benson's girl? Well, aren't you? No. He thinks so. I know he does. The way things are, I've had to let him think so. I owe him money, Johnny, a lot of money. Oh. So the lady did gamble and lose. Yes, she did. And if Uncle Charles found out, he'd cut off my allowance like that. Maybe send me back to Springfield, even. So you want me to get your money back? Uh Uh-uh, Springfield. This is where I came in. Frankie Benson plays too rough for me. Way too rough. Wrong again, Johnny. I don't want you to stick out your neck from... Do you want me to do? Just... That's all. Look, Springfield. That day I met you, you... You mentioned a piece of business you could throw my way. Fifty thousand dollars worth. I said we'd talk about that after I knew you better. Now, how long is that going to take? Not very long. I hope. As you drive out to Dilbo's at the uh, request of Frankie Benson, your imagination goes far beyond anything you've ever thought of. You decide to marry Alice Collins. She's beautiful, and someday she'll inherit the Collins lumber fortune, reported to amount to more than $2 million. But you're worried about her connection with Frankie Benson. Frankie usually gets what he wants in one way or another. And when he doesn't, well, accidents happen, don't they? 
But when you enter his office, he's more than friendly. Hello, Sherlock. Sit down. Thanks. Take a handful of cigarettes. He said you like them. Well, like I said, they're class. I haven't seen you around lately, Johnny. What's the matter? Don't you like to play here anymore? Oh, sure, Frankie, but... Well, I owe you nearly a G right now, and oh, I figured maybe I'd better pay up before I... Oh, your credit's always good here, Johnny. As long as we're friends. Well, that's nice to know. Well, what do you want to see me about? Oh, nothing in particular. Just curious about that snoop job for old man Collins. Is it all set? Uh... I don't know. Alice, or Miss Collins, is going to talk to her uncle about it. I'll know in a couple of days. Hmm. How come she picked you? Oh, she didn't. She called the office. The boss sent me out to talk to her. I'm glad you told me that, Johnny. I've always liked you. If there's anything I hate, it's being jealous of a guy I like. Well, like I told you, Miss Collins is called as a client, and the boss sent me out there. It's strictly business, Frankie. Now, I'm glad, Johnny. And I hope you keep it that way. Both of you. <laughs> Frankie Benson's cordial manner doesn't fool you for a minute, does it, Johnny? It only makes his thinly veiled threats more pointed. Frankie Benson is still a gangster of the old school. And you have no intention of giving up Alice Collins. But you decide you'd better be careful. And for the next few weeks, your meetings with Alice are at out-of-the-way places, usually some distance into the country. You're determined that nothing is going to prevent your marrying her. And uh, enjoying the fortune which will be hers after the death of her uncle. The idea of her uncle's uh, quick departure doesn't seem to shock you at all anymore, does it, Johnny? She says nothing further about the business deal she mentioned. Finally, as you decide it's time for a showdown, she phones you late one evening and asks you to drop by her apartment. She seems tense and excited. Frankie, Benson dropped in this afternoon, Johnny. He wasn't very pleasant. Now, look, you're playing with dynamite leading that guy on. He always takes care of Welchers, and when he goes nuts over a dame, he really goes nuts. The last dame that tried to fool him had a very peculiar accident. She fell on a letter opener and cut herself bad. I know. He told me about it today, while I was opening the afternoon mail. He gave me an ultimatum, Johnny. Marry him or pay up in two weeks. Well, can't you figure some way to get the money from your uncle? Thirty-three thousand? Not while he's alive. Of course, he could go any time. He's a restless sleeper. He's got asthma, high blood pressure, and a weak heart. He might even get tangled up in the bed bedclothes some night and smother. You think that might happen? It could. And if it did, there'd be 50000 in it for me, right? Yes, Johnny. 50000 just for you. Oh, it's too risky. I wouldn't be around long enough to spend There's it. There's no risk at all. I'll take you out to Uncle Charles a couple of times... By the time you make up your mind, you'll know every foot of the place. You'll have the key to the front door in your pocket. The servants would all be deaf, huh? On Thursday nights, they're out. Except Whitcomb, the butler. He's always there in case Uncle Charles needs him. Wait a minute. You'd expect me to... Whitcomb's no problem. No problem at all. He always reads in the library near the phone. You see, you'll open the front door at 11 o'clock. At two minutes before 11, I'll phone when he answers, I'll hold him for ten minutes at least. That'll give you all the time you need. Uncle Charles' death will be the most natural thing in the world. Doctor says it could happen any time. Mm-hmm. You really got it figured out, haven't you? A long time ago. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you picked the wrong guy. Too many chances for a slip-up. Things could go wrong. The doc might get suspicious, find it was murder. What if he does? You won't be connected with it. You'll have a perfect alibi. What? You'll be with me at my place all evening. There's no reason to think that I'd wish my uncle any harm. We'll have a few drinks. You can leave your fingerprints over everywhere. Forget your cigarette case, your top coat. It'll stand up. What about it, Johnny? Fifty thousand's not enough. After the will's settled, I'll double it. No, that's not enough either. I'm not interested in the money anymore. I want you, Springfield. I want to marry you. Oh, do you think I'd ever let you get away from me? Darling. Oh, I like that. So did I. What about next Thursday, Johnny? Maybe. I gotta figure out the other half of the problem first. The other half? Frankie Benson. As long as he's around, what happens to your uncle won't mean a thing.
And you do figure it out, don't you, Johnny? Frankie Benson's monogram cigarette. Instead of making it look like an accident, you'll make it look like murder. A murder that will send Frankie Benson to the gas chamber. The following Thursday evening, you go to Alice's apartment to double-check the details. Now, look, Springfield, about Frankie Benson. He called up a couple of minutes ago, Johnny. Wanted to drop over for a while. I told him I had a headache. What'd he say? Oh, he's beginning to scare me, Johnny. He told me I'd better take a nap. Said I might get dizzy and fall down and hurt myself. Said he'd call back in a couple of hours and see how I felt. Good. That's all I needed. Let's see. It takes about 40 minutes to drive from Dilbo's to here. All right. When he calls back, tell him to come over about 11.15. But I thought you were... I'm taking care of Frankie tonight, too. With one of these. Frankie's monogrammed cigarette. Yeah. I worked it all out, Springfield. All I needed was a break, like Frankie's phone call. Tonight's job's gonna be murder. A murder that'll send Frankie Benson to the gas chamber. Uh, No, Johnny, the other way's safer. Uh Uh-uh. We won't get another chance like this in a million years. Now, when I leave, I'll drop one of these monogrammed cigarettes by the front door. The rest is automatic. Oh, no, Johnny, it won't work. The cigarette will point to Frankie, sure, but it won't stand up when he tells the police he was framed. They'll believe him. Frankie hasn't any reason to kill Uncle Charles. I've taken care of that, too. I called the D.A. this afternoon. Said I was your uncle and told him to send a man out tomorrow morning. The newspaper boys will be there, too. They're expecting a big story about Frankie Benson. Oh, you're out of your mind, Johnny. Uncle Charles never gambled in his life. He never even heard of Frankie Benson. The D.A. heard different. He thinks your uncle found out about your gambling losses to Frankie. He sent out a private eye to Dilbo's. The guy picked up a couple of pairs of dice. Loaded. Cute, huh? Yes, it is. But what about Frankie's coming here tonight? Now, that's the clincher, baby. When he gets here, your headache will be so bad, you'll have to send him away. When the cops pick him up, if he tells him he was here, he's lying. That's my alibi. I was here all of the evening. Oh, it'll work, Johnny. Oh, you're wonderful. Well, that's it, baby. With you to back me, it can't miss. Wish me luck, Springfield. All the luck in the world, darling. Hurry back. Well, I'm not coming back tonight, baby. Our alibi is all set. The evidence will back us up. I think it's better if I just hold up at home for a day or so, huh? I guess you're right. Now, look, don't forget to phone the butler just before 11. I won't. Come here, Johnny. Huh? That's for luck, darling. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Since this is the season when so many of the most popular radio shows go off the air for the summer, I have tonight what I trust will be good news for you Whistler fans. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler, will continue to come to you throughout the summer without interruption. This makes the sixth consecutive year that Signal Oil Company has broadcast The Whistler for 52 weeks each year. What's more, if your vacation travel should take you into other Pacific Coast states, you can still enjoy your favorite mystery because Signal Oil Company broadcasts The Whistler on 16 CBS stations throughout five Pacific Coast states. For the nearest Columbia station to wherever you happen to be, just consult the handy radio log in the new Signal roadmaps, which are yours for the asking at all Signal stations. So this summer, when you want the tops in radio entertainment... We hope you'll continue to tune in The Whistler. And when you want the tops in gasoline quality, we hope you'll turn in to a signal service station and fill up with signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Taking care of Charles Collins was easy, wasn't it? Everything went exactly as you planned. And it came easy to you, didn't it, Johnny? You even slept soundly afterward. The following morning, lolling back in your one comfortable chair, you read the whole story in the papers. It's all over the front page. Lumber King murdered. Police solved case in record time. Killer apprehended. Everything worked out exactly as you planned, didn't it, Johnny? And in a few months, you'll marry Alice Collins and the Collins fortune. As the doorbell rings, you decide it must be another bill collector. That amuses you, doesn't it? You stroll leisurely to the door and turn the knob. Well, it's you, Lieutenant. Hello, Jennings. Come on in, boy. No, I haven't got time, Johnny. Besides, we can talk better downtown. Get your hat. Is that official? Very. 
Murder, Johnny. Collins killing last night. Oh, yeah. I was just reading about that when you came in. You've been seeing a lot of his niece lately, haven't you, Johnny? Yeah, sure. She's a client of mine. I was with her last night at her apartment, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. From nine until, well, nearly one this morning. Is that an official statement? Of course it is. Make a note of it, Johnny. Well, as a matter of fact, we know all about that, Johnny. You left your fingerprints all over the place. You must have been pretty high. Even forgot your overcoat and cigarette case. Uh, well, I'll admit we had a few drinks. But what's the idea, Lieutenant? The morning paper says you've already nabbed the guy that killed Collins. Yes, we have. Frankie Benson. He was a little noisy making his exit. Got panicky and dropped his card as he opened the front door. A half-smoked cigarette. Monogrammed. His own special brand. Benson admitted it? No. But his alibi was so phony, he's as good as convicted right now. Yeah, but what motive would Benson have? <laughs> Plenty. Old man Collins had him cold. Crooked game. Loaded dice. He was going to give the D.A. the whole story this morning. Well, you've got everything so sewed up. Why do you want to talk to me about the Charles Collins murder? We're taking you in for the murder of his niece, Alice Collins, Johnny. She got hers about 11 last night in her apartment. Stabbed with a letter opener, as if you didn't know. Pretty clumsy accident, Johnny. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb, Doris Singleton, and Eddie Marr. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Ed Bloodworth, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In The Whistler... Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now The Whistler's strange story, that physical fact. The captain on the bridge of the luxurious liner shaded his eyes from the white glare of the tropic sun. His gaze swept over the tiny deserted island, past the patch of white cloth flying from the top of a slender palm tree near the shore. Then he moved quickly to the quarterdeck, stood quietly by as the ship's doctor leaned over the half-unconscious person they'd just brought aboard. The details weren't available immediately, 
But when the story was pieced together, they discovered that it began some weeks before. Yes, it had all started weeks ago on an island several hundred miles away. On the docks beside the old freighter stood Professor Hillary Merrill, surrounded by a dozen huge packing cases. The successful result of more than two years of scientific research. It had been a large task indeed for such a small man. And the professor was a small man. People had never let him forget that physical fact. <laughs> the loud laughter of two seamen nearby interrupted his thoughts. Hey, ain't that just the way the little professor struts around, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like he owned the world. Yeah, he sure likes to give orders. <laughs> a little guy really gets a big charge out of pushing big guys around, showing them who's boss. What's he trying to prove? Ah, uh, what else? That it ain't the size of a man that counts. It's the brain. <laughs> Professor, glad to have you aboard. Thank you, Captain. Certainly been hearing things about you, Professor. Your research and all. I've tried to do my job. A yeah, big job, too. And for a man your size... If you don't mind, Captain, the physical fact has little to do with a man's brain. Uh, no offense, Professor, no offense. Uh, proud to have you aboard my ship. Yes. Well, thank you. I... Something wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. Just notice the young lady coming aboard... Hey, class. Nightclub entertainer or something? Uh, Lily, uh, Miss Lane is little more than just a nightclub entertainer, Captain. I believe I'll say hello. Well, well, Lily, so we meet again. Well, professor, Hello. I was wondering if I'd know anyone on board. You heading home? Yes, I am. I'm heading back. And you, Lily? What brings you aboard? Just that, Professor. I'm bored. <laughs> the islands, people, everything. Thought I'd give the states a break. <laughs> Wonderful. And our meeting like this should make the trip more pleasant for both of us. I don't see why not. Uh, we uh, picked quite a boat, you know. No, I didn't. How do you mean? The cargo. The usual. Along with a few passengers, I thought. That's all. Except for a very fancy shipment. <laughs> In the purse's safe. I didn't know anything about it. You do? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This ship is carrying quite a fortune. Well, what do you know? Now, why don't we go down to my cabin and buy ourselves the Bon Voyage string? An excellent idea. And you can tell me all about your... Research work, hmm? You enjoy the company of this young lady, don't you, Professor? And she seems properly impressed with all that you say and do. Then, the second afternoon out at sea, as you're taking a turn about the deck alone, you pass the lifeboat section. And hear voices, familiar voices. Lilies and someone else. Well, don't worry, don't worry, baby. I'd throttle him in a minute if he gave us any trouble. Casey, I tell you, he made a point of mentioning the money. It's just a coincidence. The guy was trying to impress you. Nothing's going to go wrong. Talk to Andy. He's still with us. He's in like a glove. He's tired of being third officer on this mud scow. He'll tip us when the time is right. I'll open that safe like a soup can. Oh, Casey, how are you going to do it? Like I've done it a hundred times with a blowtorch. At night, when they change the watch. Blowtorch? There's not even any smoking aboard. Isn't that dangerous for the cargo of gasoline? Not when you know what you're doing, sweetheart. Well, you'd better stay out of sight. The professor will remember you. That business with the heater, you won't forget. No, I won't forget either. I got a score to settle with a little man. If he gets in my way again, I'll kill him. I'll break him like a stick. Stick. <laughs> a stick, Casey. That's good. <laughs> Lily's laughter infuriates you, doesn't it, Professor? More than anything else. And you wonder what to do about what you've overheard. You keep close to your cabin for the rest of the day. And then one evening, you finally decide to drop in on the captain. 
as you start down the darkened deck and approach the bridge companionway. The ship trembles and rocks crazily. And then another sound comes drifting up, a terrifying cry, knifing through the darkness. Suddenly you seem to be in a hot, searing vacuum. The pressure becomes unbearable. You want to scream, but you can't. Then the vacuum breaks. You're spinning through the air, and then you hit the water. The rest is a blur, a horrible nightmare. You remember vaguely toppling over face down on the beach. You lie there till daybreak in a deep sleep. And in your dream there are voices and they come closer and closer. Hey, Professor, come on, snap out of it. Uh, What is it? Morning, Professor. Welcome to our little island. Casey? Yeah, Casey. Remember me? How you feeling, Professor? But all, all right, I guess. Who are you? Name's Andy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would you give me a hand, Andy? Never mind. I'll give you a hand, Professor. <laughs> Cut it out, Casey. Now, look. There are just four of us. We have to get along. You, you mean we're the only one? Great so. Me, Casey here, you and the girl. <laughs> the girl? Lily. Lying up there under the trees. The explosion shook her up pretty badly. I hope she'll come out of it okay. Oh, sure, sure she will. She'll be fine. But I don't know about you, Professor. I haven't uh, made up my mind. Leave him alone. Sure, sure for now. But I think this will be fun, don't you, Professor? Just the four of us alone on an island. Real cozy, huh, Professor? <laughs> Back to the whistler. It's frightening, isn't it, Professor? Like awakening from one terrible nightmare into another. Worse, more threatening. Casey, this big hulk of a man who resents the very air you breathe. And because of the explosion that wrecked your ship, you're thrown with him on this lonely Pacific Isle. Moments later, you discover why Andy, the third officer from the sunken ship, interfered in your behalf. It's Lily. She's injured, and perhaps badly, and they don't know what to do about it. They take you to her, and Casey starts giving orders again. Come on, come on, do something for a little man. Easy. Take it easy, Casey. Can you do anything for her, Professor? I can try. If you'll keep him away from me. Come on, Casey. Now, wait a minute. I'm not sure about... Come on. She's in his hands now. Okay. Okay, Professor, but treat her good. Very good. You'll be in my hands. The balance of power changes swiftly sometimes, doesn't it, Professor? Brains for brawn, and you've won the first round. You smile as you turn to examine Lily. Her injuries aren't serious, you're sure of that. But you have no intention of revealing it to Casey. You make her comfortable, talk quietly, reassuringly, and then you notice something else, a small black bag. Well, the money... They did get it, after all. Um, money. Oh, what does it matter? Who's going to use it now? Better that you rest, Lily. And don't worry too much. Everything's going to be all right. Professor, I... I'm sorry. I hope you don't hate me. Oh, no. No, indeed. I'm thankful for you, Lily. Yes, I'm thankful that you're here. Now, you just lie back. Get 
Later, you walk down to join Casey and Andy on the beach and see that they're swimming in the water, striking out for something with long, powerful strokes. You marvel at their strength as you see the object of their efforts, a wrecked lifeboat on the reefs. Minutes later, the two men have the gray hulk beached. It's almost a complete wreck, but lashed securely in the prow of the boat are two casks of water, a heavy axe, and in one remaining watertight compartment are several tins. Emergency rations of meat and biscuits. Hey, this is a break. Look at that, Casey. Food and water. Wonderful. Hey, give me that. I'm going to buy myself a drink. Casey, put that down. What? I said, put it down. Listen, you, since one of you... Hold it, Casey. Each drink you take puts us all that much closer to oblivion. We can stay here, oh, yes. Eating, drinking up our lives day by day. Oh, we can make an attempt to save ourselves. What do you mean? A raft. We can build a raft. Yeah, out of what? This shattered lifeboat, the canvas, the trees. Anything we can lay our hands upon. He's got something there, Casey. Sure. Suppose we do build a raft. We end up in the middle of nowhere. How do we know we got enough food and water? We don't. At best, it's a hit and miss proposition. We might hit. I'm game. Anything's better than sitting here letting that burning sun fry our heads off. Uh, what's the first move? I'll have to have time to figure out our chances. You must all give me your full confidence. I must also be given complete charge of the food and water. What? I've traveled these waters extensively. There were many other expeditions, you know. Concerning navigation, I know the stars like the palm of my hand. But most important of all, I know the approximate position of this island. Yeah? Uh, where uh, are we, Professor? <laughs> Uh, that knowledge, Mr. Casey, I will keep to myself. You see, that's my passport to safety. My insurance that all of us will uh, leave this island uh, together. You're one step ahead of Mr. Casey, aren't you, Professor? And that's where you're going to stay all the way. You turn your thoughts back to the details of your plan. Carefully consider the time, the distance, the food and water supply. The atolls and the radak chain are your best chance. Only two of you stand a chance of making it alive. But the others mustn't find that out. Not even Lily until you're ready. And then that evening. Okay, Einstein, what's the verdict? For now on, you will work at dusk and in the early morning. It's a known fact that overexertion and sun of this intensity could finish a man in a matter of hours. And of course, we're rationing food and water. How long do you think the food and water will last? Well, Lily, if we adhere strictly to the rules, we uh, have supplies for three weeks. How much time are we going to have to build a raft? Maximum of ten days. That means not quite two weeks on the water. How do you figure our speed? Uh, that, of course, is theoretical. Specific gravity of the raft, favorable winds, ocean currents... All have to be taken into account. I arrived at a rough average of uh, five knots a day. Professor, where are we? And where are we going? That, as I've already told Casey, will have to remain my secret. You'll all just have to trust me. In the week that follows, the work of building the raft progresses under Casey's supervision. You spend all your time weaving palm strands into a sail, taking care of Lily. And then early one morning, as you pause in your labors, you glance up. And a few feet away, resting on one elbow, Lily stares at you, a faint smile on her lips. Good morning, Lily. Have a good sleep? Uh-huh. Yeah. How do you feel? I'm still weak as a kitten, I'm afraid. I'll get you some biscuits and Not water. later. Right now, I'd rather talk. Now, you're pretty smart. <laughs> and what's the music? The way you handle those two big hawks, Casey and Andy, I find it very amusing. I kind of like it, Professor. Always like the man with brains. Then how is it that you and Casey... <laughs> well, I mean... Oh, he's all right. I figured he'd do till something better came along. I see. I guess I've always felt that someday I'd 
run across just the kind of a guy I want. Nice sort of guy and smart. And all the cases in the world could drop dead for my dough. And speaking of money... A little black bag here, Professor? What, what you thinking about? You're in. I've already talked with Andy. He's cut you in for a share. And Casey? What did he say? Casey's been outvoted. He's sore, but there's nothing you can do about it. So you're in. That's fine, Lily. That's fine. Professor. Yes? Um, don't get me wrong. I'm not fishing for information. I don't care where we are, where we're going. Just as long as I get there. What is it, Lily? Do you really think we have a chance? The four of us? We have a good chance. Yes. Yeah. Um, a couple of smart people would stand a better chance of making it, wouldn't they? I mean, food, water, and everything. Yes. Two smart people would have a better chance than four, would they? A much better chance. You watch Lily, the little smile playing on her lips as she leans back and closes her eyes. And you know what's on her mind, don't you? Yes, it's all very clear to you. That night, while the others sleep, you hurry to the food cache. Moments later, you're back. You carefully approach the sleeping Casey, place two whole biscuits under the palm branches that serve as his mattress. And then silently, you slip back to your own bed to wait for morning. And the opportunity to speak with Andy alone. How's the raft coming along, Andy? Say you ought to finish it up, Professor. How about the sail? All but completed. Great. Well, I'd better get down there and give Casey a hand. Uh, just a moment. Uh, I-, I must talk with you. What's up? Well, I suspected for the last few days that our supplies were being tempered with. What? Yes, last night I came sleep. I saw Casey leave his phone. Well, he wasn't gone for more than a minute. And when he came back, I saw him slip something under his mattress. Wait a minute. Oh. You think no, that no, he... no, 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 perhaps I was just dreaming, but, uh... Why don't we take a look? Just to be certain. <laughs> How do you like that? Two whole biscuits in his bunk. Just wait till I get my no, hands No, 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 Andy. No, wait, wait, wait. You must be very careful. Something must be done about it, yes. A man like Casey is dangerous in this situation. He threatens our own lives. Why don't I just go down to the beach oh, now no, and... no, 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 no. I have a better idea. Now, tonight, when everyone's asleep, you must go to the food cache and wait. And if I'm thinking correctly... Casey eats his stolen biscuits at night. And if that's the case, well, you'll get thirsty. Sure. Sure. And I'll give you odds. You'll have a uh, nocturnal visit. And if I have this visit? Well, I'd keep your knife in readiness if I were you, Andy. You know, we must be completely heartless in a situation like this. Yeah. If Casey walks to the food cache tonight, Professor, it'll be his last walk. Late that evening, the raft is completed. And now you're ready to make the next move in your plan to turn the two men against one another. It was easy to sell Andy the idea. He'd trust you. You could talk to him, give it to him straight. Because that's the kind of a person he is. But Casey isn't going to buy as easily. You've thought it over very carefully, haven't you, Professor? You know exactly how you're going to approach Casey. And with your help. Casey will sell himself on the idea. That night at the water's edge, you managed to get Casey alone. What do you mean we're going to have to cut down on rations? We're starving now. Well, it's just that the food isn't holding out as long as I thought it would. I I can't understand it. I must have miscalculated. You miscalculated, huh? What are you trying to pull? You don't think I've been stealing it? Why, Casey, I swear that I... You're not dipping into the grub, then who is? Now, come on, I want answers. 
Handling the food is your department. You're responsible. But I know, I know, but I can't stay awake 24 hours a day watching you and, and Andy. Emma. Andy? Well, well, listen, Casey, I, I don't know that this means anything, but several nights lately, I, I think I've seen Andy coming from the food tray. Andy, huh? Well, Professor, you can sleep tight tonight. I'm going to stay awake. But you don't sleep, do you, Professor? Instead, you lie awake, waiting and watching. Then you see Andy rise slowly from his bunk, slip away toward the food cache. Moments later, you watch Casey get to his feet, see him remove the knife from its sheath and hurry away into the blackness. You wait, trembling with excitement. And then you hear it, a low, muffled cry. You can hear the battle in the darkness. You glance over at Lily, she's still asleep. And then as suddenly as it began, all is quiet, except for the sound of the surf. It's all over, isn't it, Professor? Quickly, you get to your food and run toward the food catch. Moments later, you're back by Lily's side, shaking her gently. Lily? Lily? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's you... Hello, Professor. Lily, remember those two smart people you were talking about? Well, it's all set for them now. Well, what do you mean? There's been a fight down at the food cage. Casey and Andy. They're both dead. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. The sun reflected cruelly across the tropical sea as the last boat of the landing party left the tiny deserted island, returned to the liner lying offshore. The officer in charge moved quickly up the rope ladder to the ship and hurried along the deck. Finally, he turned into a cabin where the captain and the ship's doctor stood looking down on the small, still figure lying on the cot. How's the patient coming along, doctor? Uh, condition's very weak. There's little hope. Oh? Well, that's too bad. Any theory from what you found ashore, Jenkins? Well, captain, at one place on the beach, we found two men. Obviously, there'd been a fight. They killed each other with knives. I'm sure... Uh, just a moment. It's coming around again. Easy. Easy now. Uh, when time's right, we'll get away together, Andy. Just the two of us. Don't worry. I'll handle the professor. Professor? Uh, Say, I wonder if that could be the other man. He looked like he the might The other be... man? You mean the other... We found a raft further up the beach, stocked with provisions, ready to go. That's where we found the third party, a little guy. Could have been the professor the girl just mentioned. Any marks of identification? No, sir. Looks like he died of exhaustion trying to push the raft across the beach to the water. His fingernails had dug clear into the wood. Well, he had the right idea, all right, but not enough strength to back it up. That's the thing I can't quite figure. Yes? Why they built that raft way up on the beach instead of down at the water's edge. Why it would have taken two strong men to get that raft into the water. Whoever built it, well, I guess they just weren't very smart.
for The Whistler, composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. famous Go Farther Gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the whistler's strange story, Panic on Mulberry Street. Mulberry Street is in the heart of the city, yet it's very quiet there. Perhaps because it's only one block long with a small park at one end, the river at the other. Or perhaps the quiet is due to the nature of its small, unimposing array of shops and converted brownstone flats. Among the shops is the bookstore belonging to Henry Pettigrew. It's as quiet as Henry himself and equally middle-aged. Some of the books on the shelves reflect Henry's hobbies. Criminology, a most fascinating subject to Henry Pettigrew, and he spends many an evening discussing various cases with his good friend, Police Lieutenant Perez. It's on just such a night that Henry, rather embarrassed, calls attention to something which he's been anxious to show the officer. What is it, Henry? What have you got on your mind? All right. All right, I'll show you. <laughs> I've been afraid you'd laugh at me. Have I ever? Here. These newspaper clippings... Let me see what they are. I see. Well, yes, you have stories here on all the deaths in the city for weeks. For one month, to be exact, Lieutenant. But all of those deaths don't interest me. What? Just these six. See, they're rather unusual. Oh. See here now. To an unsolved murder on Ashton Street. An accidental death on Carl Street. Oh. Another on Elm. Suicide on Gordon. A disappearance on Iris. And a hit and run on Kirby. So what? Well, the streets in this area are in alphabetical order. Yeah, I know that. Now, these deaths occur on A, C, E, G streets, and, and so on. Now, if I'm correct in my conclusions, there's a pattern in progress. And the next street in order is M. M? Oh, Mulberry. Your own street. Oh, <laughs> Oh, so that's it. Well, I see why you're concerned, Henry. I knew you'd laugh. I didn't mean to. But, Henry, there have been many crimes in the city. In every city, these are only a few. With the sort of patience you've displayed, some sort of pattern or mathematical design could be applied to almost any group of them. True. It's true, Lieutenant. And yet... And yet, there it is, eh, Henry? Look, are you suggesting that this is the work of one man? Well, why not? Would it be the first time a killer moved in accordance with a pattern... Possibly an unconscious one. No, no, not at all. 
uh, police case files which suggest that they often do. But some of these cases you're talking about were accidents, Henry. Suicides. Oh, I wonder, Lieutenant. Oh. <laughs> Henry, you're always trying to worry me. Oh, no, no. But I refuse to be intimidated. Well, I have to be running along now. Have some things to do. All right, Lieutenant. I'll see you to the door. Okay. But remember, this is Mulberry Street, Henry. You'll be sure to bolt it after me, hmm? He's amused, isn't he, Henry? You expected him to be. But you're pleased. Proud of the little plan you've worked out. Your ceaseless reading and clipping until you found something on every street you wanted. And you're still thinking about it. Smiling because you know you've impressed Lieutenant Perez in spite of his amusement. Then the following morning, Arnold Fenway comes roaring into your shop in one of his unreasonable outbursts. Yes, I thought I told you to stay away from my sister. And I told you, Arnold, that if Mary Ellen doesn't object to my company, I shall most certainly... I'm warning you for the last time. Stay away. I'm not afraid of you, Arnold. I've asked Mary Ellen to marry me. Forget it. Mary Ellen's not marrying you. Or anyone else? What? That's it, isn't it, Arnold? Even though Mary Ellen is 43, you don't want her to marry anyone. You want to keep her an old maid. Keep talking, Pettigrew. Because her husband might have something to say about the way Mary Ellen should handle the estate left to her by her uncle. Why, you... <coughs> oh, you fell down. Here, I'll help you up. Take your hands off of me. Stay away from Mary Ellen Pettigrew. Or you won't be around to make any of those screwball predictions. No, won't I? What are you trying to pull with that hogwash anyway? Trying to scare people? I'm not trying to frighten anyone. How do you figure Mulberry Street was next for some kind of crime, huh? I don't have to explain that to you, Arnold. Okay. So you don't. <coughs> Remember what I said, Pettigrew. Stay away from Mary Ellen. Or I might make that prediction of yours about an accident on Mulberry Street come true. Oh, oh yes. Didn't see you at first, Mary Ellen. Well, it's it's the same Ben Henry. Sit down. Ah, this is nice. Don't know what I'd do without this little park. Been a good friend for years. And I don't know what I'd do without without you to talk to, Henry. How's it been? Still the same? Oh, worse. Arnold is more unmanageable than ever. He has no right to interfere with your life. You're scarcely a child, Mary Ellen. I, I know that, Henry. It's just that Arnold is so set against you, and he's terribly quick-tempered. I, I'm afraid of what he'd do to you. Well, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm not going to. His kind of people have to run their course. Run their course, I don't understand him. Uh, nothing, nothing, Marion. Uh, let's forget your brother for now. Henry. Yes? Henry, there's, there's something I meant to ask you. One of the neighbors mentioned it about this, this theory you have. Theory? The, the pattern you've worked out. Oh, yes. My pattern for death, as the lieutenant calls it. Yes. Isn't it kind of silly, Henry? I mean, the idea that, well, that the next time it'll be Mulberry Street. Oh, no, it isn't silly at all. That's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I, I mean to say, Mary Ellen, that, well, such things are quite possible. Mulberry Street may very well be marked for death. Tonight's limerick, inspired by the cartoon on Signal's new billboard, was sent in by Jim Fleming of Oakland, California. There once was a driver who plastered his car with every new gadget, including radar. The car was a riot. No one could deny it. But without Signal gas, he could never go far. Signal, signal, signal 
gasoline. Your car would go farther, go farther gasoline. Our gadget-minded friend in the limerick should have realized that the logical way to make a car go farther is with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. What's more, by filling his tank with Signal, he'd also have discovered how much fun driving can be. For the secret of Signal's good mileage, the more efficient performance that today's Signal gasoline coaxes from your motor, also helps you enjoy faster pickup and smoother, more responsive power. So if you want your gasoline dollars to go farther, just heed the advice on those signal billboards you pass. Next time, fill up with Signal, the famous go farther gas. Quiet of Mulberry Street is interrupted now, isn't it, Henry? Not violently. But the street has begun to stir. Conversations at first, that's all. A little questioning here and there as your theory spreads. Then a definite feeling of tension in the air. As your idea that something's going to happen takes hold. It's working perfectly, isn't it? Exactly as you knew it would from that day weeks ago when you thought of the pattern for murder and figured out your plan for a perfect cover-up. The morning following your rendezvous with Mary Ellen at the park, you're not surprised to see her come rushing to your bookstore. You know that somehow she's found out about Arnold's last visit, which you didn't mention to her when you talked with her in the park. Henry... Why didn't you tell me last night? I, I didn't want to worry you, Mary Ellen. When I heard that Arnold had hit you, I, I could have killed him. Please, let's forget it. Uh, no. No, Henry, not this time. I, I'm going to have it out with him once and for all. Mary Ellen, you'll only excite him. Arnold can't go on ruining our lives. I, I'll find some way to stop him. No. I don't want anything to happen to you. But Henry, nothing will. Uh, meet me tonight in the usual place. We'll discuss it. I... I can't tonight at the club meeting over at Mrs. Lang's. Oh, that's right. Wednesday. I forgot. Well, tomorrow night, then. And meanwhile, don't say anything. And uh, don't worry about your brother. She'll be free of him soon, won't she, Henry? And so will you. Free to enjoy the happiness that is rightfully yours. And you won't have to live in constant fear of what he might do to her. You know that Arnold drinks heavily at times. He's a man of violent temper. And in a moment of blind rage, he could easily kill her or you. Tonight, with Mary Ellen away at her club meeting, Arnold will be alone in the house. Yes, Henry, the time is right for your pattern of death. You reach the old brownstone house shortly before nine. You glance around, turn into a tiny delivery alley running between the houses. Inside, near the library window, is Arnold. He's sitting with his back directly to him. Perfect. His back couldn't be better. Then Arnold rises suddenly. You duck out of sight as he comes to the window. Then you hear him again, sitting down as before. Now is the time, isn't it, Henry? The gun is pointed. But your arm suddenly becomes paralyzed and your knees begin to tremble. I, I just can't. I can't do it. Oh. Good morning, Lieutenant. Henry, I, uh... I guess I came to apologize. Apologize? Mm-hmm. For laughing at your idea, that pattern stuff. You heard what happened? Happened? No. Arnold Fenway disappeared from his home last night under mysterious circumstances. Uh, disappeared? Uh-huh. Maybe you hit something with that crazy idea of yours, Henry. You stand in shocked silence, staring at the lieutenant, your mind spinning crazily. 
It's fantastic, isn't it, Henry? But it's happened. The theory. The plan you worked out to cover up Arnold's murder. It really exists. Yes. You've accidentally stumbled onto a killer's pattern for death. I, I just can't believe it, Lieutenant. This theory, it looked good on paper, but I never really thought... Look, Henry, just how much do the people here on Mulberry Street know about this? Well, none of the details, really. Not any more than what I told Frank Ferris. Oh. How much did you tell him, Henry? Just that I'd figured something out. That there might be a crime on Mulberry Street before long. Well, I'm not saying there is anything to this theory of yours, Henry, but if there is a killer at large, we don't want him to know we're aware of this pattern, this blueprint. So keep it quiet. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, that's all I had in my mind. I'll be getting back over to the Fenway house. Hey, Lieutenant. Huh? Mind if I come along? No, not at all. Come on. It was around 11 o'clock when I came home, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. I, I assumed Arnold was still working. The lights in the library were on. I, I didn't want to disturb him, so I went directly to my room. You didn't look in at all? No, no, I didn't. Miss Fenway, from the appearance of this room, there must have been a struggle here. Are you certain you didn't hear anything at all during the night? No, not a thing. Uh, Lieutenant, isn't it possible the struggle took place before Mary Ellen came home? She said she didn't look into the library on her return. Yes, that's possible, Henry. It, it wasn't until this morning when I I came down here that I, I, I knew something had happened. So I ran into Arnold's room and... The bed hadn't been slept in. That's when I called the police. Uh-huh. You said you came home around 11 last night, Miss Fenway. Now, what time did you leave the house earlier? Uh, ten minutes to eight. It's only a few blocks away to Mrs. Lang's. We we meet at her house every Wednesday. Well, you went to a club meeting then? Uh, yes. I see. Now, Miss Fenway, about your brother... Excuse me, Lieutenant. There's a Mr. Cosgrove out here. He uh -huh. says he's Arnold Fenway's boss. Oh, that's right, Lieutenant. I, I telephoned him a little while ago. I, I thought perhaps he might know something. Oh, I uh... see. Okay, Radek, send him in. Uh, this way, sir. Well, thank you, officer. Good morning, Miss Fenway. Mr. Cosgrove, this is Lieutenant Perez and Mr. Pettigrew. How do you Gentlemen. Do? How do you do? Oh, uh, I hope I'm not intruding, Miss Fenway. Naturally, I'm greatly concerned over all this... Arnold is a fine man, a loyal employee, and more than that, a friend. I think the world of Arnold. Oh, I know, Mr. Cosgrove. What sort of work does he do for you, Mr. Cosgrove? Arnold is our chief accountant, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. I'm with the firm of Cosgrove and Grant. You've heard of us, I suppose. The brokers, stock and bond. That's right. If there's anything I can do. Sure. Uh, the books here on the desk... They're ours, Lieutenant. Arnold's been working on them. Just a routine check. Let's see. Likes to have everything in top order, you know. A good man. Uh, Mary Ellen, shall I get it? Oh, would you, Henry? Now, Miss Fenway, do you know of anyone who would want to harm your brother? Hello? That you, Arnold? Uh oh, this is Henry Pettigrew. Oh, Henry, this is Mrs. Lang. Is Mary Ellen there? Uh, yes, but she's rather busy at the moment. Well, don't bother. It's not important. I just called to see if she was ill or something. She isn't, is she? Why, why, no. Well, the reason I asked, she never misses a Wednesday night meeting, and when she didn't come last night, I just wondered. Well, you tell her I called, Henry. Henry? Oh, oh uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll tell her, Mrs. Lang. You can hardly believe it, can you, Henry? Mary Ellen deliberately lied to the lieutenant told him she'd been to a meeting at Mrs. Lang's house last night, knowing the police could check her every movement and probably would. You must have had a powerful reason to take a chance like that, and you're pretty sure you know what that reason is. The strange disappearance of her brother, Arnold. Suddenly, something catches your eye, something in the rose bed just below the window. You slip out of the house, hurry into the garden, and pick up the bright, shiny object, a cufflink. You've seen it before, haven't you, Henry? It's one of Arnold's cufflinks. You stare at it for a moment, and then your gaze wanders to the rose bed again, to the freshly turned earth. You grow weak as Mary Ellen's words come back to you. Arnold can't go on ruining our lives, Henry. I'll find some way to stop him. Find something, Mr. Pettigrew? Uh, oh, oh, Mr. Cosgrove, uh, 
No, no, I was just looking around. Well, I do hope we learn what's happened to Arnold. This has been a terrible thing, Mr. Pettigrew. A terrible thing. <laughs> Is that you, Henry? Yes, Mary Ellen. Oh. Henry, who was that on the phone before? This is Lang. Oh. What oh. what did she want? I told her you were busy. Said for you to call her when you can. All right. Mary Ellen. Yes, Henry. Uh, why, Mary Ellen? Why did you lie to the lieutenant? Tell him you went to Mrs. Lang's. Well, I... I, I, I don't know, Henry. Well, where... Where did you go? Oh, Arnold and I, we... Well, we had a, a quarrel last night, and he became very angry. He, he struck me. Mary Ellen... Oh, Henry. Henry. Oh, now, now, my dear. He's never hit me before, and I... I, I was so confused, so angry, I... I don't remember what happened. I, I was suddenly walking along the river. It was, it was like a nightmare. And then suddenly I, I, I was back at the house. Mary and Ellen, I... Mary Oh. No one answered my ring, so I came around back. Thought there might be someone in the garden. Mr. Cosgrove. Good evening, Miss Fenway, Mr. Pettigrew. I, uh, happened to be in the neighborhood. Just wondered if there'd been any word about Arnold. No, no, there's been no word at all. I see. These things do take time, I suppose. Police doing all they can, of course. Well... We... We we were just going in, Mr. Cosgrove. You'll have a cup of coffee with us? Why, I think that would be fun. Oh, Father, Mary Ellen, you've had a very trying day. Now, you need your rest. Mr. Cosgrove and I will just run along. Oh, yes, of course. Mr. Pettigrew is right. Well, it's no trouble. See you tomorrow, Mary Ellen. Uh, Coming, Mr. Cosgrove? As you walk along the quiet street with Mr. Crosgrove by your side, listening to his small talk, you're certain there's something more important on his mind, aren't you, Henry? You're sure he overheard your conversation with Mary Ellen in the garden. He knows she quarreled with Arnold the night he disappeared, that Arnold had struck her. Yes, Cosgrove is sure she's involved in Arnold's disappearance, isn't he? And so are you. And then as you reach your shop door... Uh, Mr. Pettigrew... Yes? About Arnold. The two of you never hit it off very well, did you? Oh, I don't know. He's told me quite a bit about you, his objections and all. Arnold didn't get along with his sister either. What are you driving at, Mr. Cosgrove? Arnold Fenway is a friend of mine, a trusted employee and good friend. I'll do anything in my power to find out what's happened to him. I understand that. If but... you know anything about his disappearance... Even if you think Miss Fenway, his sister, does. Are you insinuating that she... I believe she knows more about this than she cares to tell. So do you. And if you're shielding her... Why, that's ridiculous. Is it? Perhaps the police won't think so. Good night, Mr. Pettigrew. The clock on the church tower is striking eleven as you finally return to Mary Ellen's house. You wonder if Mr. Cosgrove has been to the police. You ring the bell and wait. You ring again. There's no answer. And then a voice from the house next door. Mary Ellen ain't home, Henry. Oh, Mr. Griffin. She left a few minutes ago, Henry. The police came for us. The police? Oh, I see. I see. There's a 16-page booklet which signal service stations are offering free. It can make tomorrow's 4th of July outing and all your other summer trips a lot more pleasant. It's called Lane's Guide, and in it you'll find answers to the questions travelers ask most often. What's a good place to eat? Where's a good place to stay? In addition, this handy pocket-sized booklet, which was prepared by an independent travel organization, contains much other useful information, such as whether prices are low, medium, or high, whether the lodging place is on a beach or has a swimming pool, and in the case of motels, whether kitchens are available. 
since Lane's Guide includes 243 cities and towns throughout seven western states. You'll want a copy in your car for all your summer travels. So I'd suggest that you stop at the very next signal station you see to get your copy of Lane's Guide while the supply lasts. You'll find that this is just one of many friendly services that independent signal dealers offer to put more pleasure into your driving while you go farther with signal. It's all over, isn't it, Henry? You're certain Mr. Cosgrove has told the police what he suspected, that Mary Ellen is involved in her brother Arnold's disappearance. And now they've come for her, taken her away for questioning. You walk over to your bookstore and sit there in the back room for a long time. There's no doubt in your own mind either. You're sure that Mary Ellen is involved. And you wonder what she did with Arnold and what will happen to her. Then suddenly you're aware of a faint sound. Someone tapping the glass on your front door. May I come in, Henry? Oh, of course, Lieutenant. Come in. Well, that alphabetical design of yours worked out fine, Henry. We found Arnold about an hour ago. He was dead? No, on the contrary. He was very much alive. But he wouldn't have been for long if it hadn't been for your alphabetical street idea. My idea? That's right. He used that idea for his own ends, Henry. When you insisted Mulberry Street was scheduled for the next crime, he decided to be it. Then his disappearance... Was strictly phony. He messed up his library to make it look good. He was trying to get away. But why? The night Arnold disappeared, he dug up some of the firm's money he'd hidden in the rose bed. The cufflinks. Yeah, the cufflinks. That's what made you think Mary Ellen had had something to do with it. That's how Cosgrove knew Arnold was planning a getaway. Cosgrove just told us the whole story. Well, I still don't see how my idea... Funny, funny the way things work out, Henry. You see, that alphabetical street theory of yours never did make sense to us. But we got to wondering about you and Mary Ellen and decided to cover the next street on your list, just in case. Next street? Yeah. Mulberry Norton. Well, that would be Olive Street. Olive. We had it covered from one end to the other. Oh. Two hours ago at the Olive Street bus terminal, we picked up Arnold with $20,000 on him. He and Cosgrove were working together. Arnold was trying to double-cross him and skip town. But he'd have never made it. Cosgrove was just 20 feet behind him with a loaded thirty-eight in his pocket. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Wilms Herbert, Sarah Selby, and Hal March. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Steve Hampton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday... Another Strange Tale by The Whistler.
Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the whistler's strange story, The Hermit. The storm made it all seem ghostly somehow, unreal. Ben's face at the window, the worried, frightened look in his eyes. For a moment, Harvey Wilson considered giving it all up and heading back to town in the railroad station. But the storm decided this, too. It was getting worse, and with his clothes already half-soaked, Harvey Wilson was in no mood to give up. He called out again insistently... Come on, Ben, open up. It's your old friend Harvey, Harvey Wilson. Go away. I don't want to see anyone. Ben, for goodness sake, I'm just stopping through. You're going to make me go clear back to the station. Ben! Oh, that's better. I thought you weren't going to let me in. Well, what do you want? You've no reason to call on me, Wilson. Reasons, reasons. That's the trouble with the world. Always have to find reasons to call, excuses to visit. The old milk of human kindness is almost dry. I was just passing through, Ben. Yeah. You gonna let me stand out here till I'm drenched? All right. Come in. Well, nice fire going. Let me move there quick. Ah, better. Much better. Harvey Wilson. All right, now really, why did you come here? Just let me get this wet coat off. Well, like I said, it's passing through, Ben, heading up north. Still a salesman, still on the road, are you? That's right, Ben. Same old line. Yeah, I remember. You think what all the rest of them do, don't you, Harvey? What? How about the money? All that money I'm supposed to have embezzled. You'd know plenty about it, Harvey. You talked to people from the company. Heard how they fired me. Ben, Ben, that was years ago. It's not too many years ago. I know what you're thinking. That I'm, I've been afraid to spend it, and I still haven't. I think no such thing. Uh, you always were a sly one, Harvey. <laughs> Just passing through. <laughs> Just took you this long to find me, that's all. Ben, let's get one thing straight right away. I don't think you had anything to do with, with taking that money. Yeah. You don't believe me, do you? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to think somebody believed. But you don't. Go ahead, say you don't. I can see, Ben. I know you. Mm, maybe you do, Harvey. I think I know you. Always did. You haven't changed much. Certainly not around the eyes. Still eager, aren't you? Oh, now, let's be friends. It's only for a few hours. Till morning, huh? You want to stay overnight? If you really don't mind. I do, but it's all right. I'll put you up, Harvey. Just this once. Now, there's a good friend. (laughs) You're all right, Ben. I always knew it. And you won't be sorry. (laughs) No, sir. Well, Harvey, you found him. Your old friend, Ben. He's living like a hermit here, isn't he? Afraid to spend the money he embezzled. 
But you're sure he has it, aren't you? And that it must be hidden somewhere in this old house. You wait a couple of hours after he shows you upstairs to a room. Then, when you're sure he's asleep, you let yourself out. Slip quietly down the hall to the stairs. The fire is still throwing a good light. And you move around the room, searching systematically. Checking the floorboards, the walls, when suddenly... Ben. Yes, Harvey. Your friend, Ben. <laughs> you believe me. You're like all of my relatives, the people who worked with Stay me. Stay away from me, Ben. Oh, no, you're getting out of here. I'm putting you out. Ben, I warn Put you. Put it down, Harvey. That's my collection, my Just collection. Just a bookend, Ben. One that I'll use on you if... Put it down, I say. I'll put it down, all right. Harvey, no! You put the heavy bookend on the table. Stare down at the floor where Ben fell. And you realize he's dead. That you've killed him. It's a terrible feeling at first, isn't it? And then you begin to wonder if you didn't expect something like this from the first. You want that money, don't you, Harvey? And you came here to get it. You can stay as long as you wish now without worry of interruption. With an effort, you drag Ben's body behind a heavy sofa in a far corner of the room, then go over to the fire again. You're standing there alone when you suddenly hear footsteps. Who is it? Who's there? Hello. Huh? Who's... I, I'm sorry. The front door wasn't locked. I... Well, you... You just walked in? I didn't mean to startle you, but the rain was... Uncle Ben! Uncle Ben, I'm not your... Oh, of course you don't remember me. I wouldn't remember you. I was a child when... you Joan Benton, your niece. Uncle Ben. Yes? Didn't you get my telegram? Telegram? Yes, I sent it yesterday, Uncle Ben. I... I've come to spend the week with you. As Jimmy Durante would say, everybody wants to get into the act. At least judging by the number of limericks you Whistler fans have been sending in since I started reading them a few weeks ago, a lot of you are certainly getting a kick out of the idea. So to make it even more fun, we're going to send a signal coupon book good for $20 worth of signal gasoline to every Whistler fan who sends in a limerick that I read on this program. I understand this is not a contest. That $20 signal coupon book is merely a token of our appreciation of your interest. But your real fun comes later, after your friends hear your limerick read on the Whistler. If you'd like to try it, just write a five-line limerick about Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. Such as this. There once was a driver named Archibald Fry, who bought the wrong gas, and of course he ran dry said he in disgust as he missed the last bus. Next time, it's signal go farther, I'll buy. On your limerick, be sure to print clearly your name and address, and then mail it to this address. The Whistler Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with go farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. It's a shock, isn't it, Harvey? The suddenness of it all. Joan's arrival moments after you killed her uncle, Ben Masters. And now Joan thinks that you're her uncle, Ben. And she's come to spend the week here at the house. You could send Joan away, but you decide to let her stay. At least until you've been able to think it all out and find the money you're sure that Ben stole. Carefully, you get her out of the living room and show her upstairs to a room. Now, Harvey, you've got to move Ben's body. You decide on the cellar as the safest place. It's a struggle moving him that distance, but you manage it. Carry him into a small furnace room down there. Then you close the door of that furnace room, step back carefully, avoiding some freshly dug holes for new water pipes, and then... 
Huh? Who is it? It's me, Uncle Ben. Joan, I, I thought I said... I'm sorry. I, I can't sleep, Uncle Ben. Please. Oh, don't, don't come down here. I'll be up. Fine thing, bursting into my house, wandering around. Just trouble, that's all. Relatives, just trouble. Uncle Ben, please. Can't we go in, fix the fire, and talk a while? I'm just dying to talk to you, Uncle Ben. Please? All right. For a while, Joan. We'll talk. You didn't count on this, did you, Harvey? And your nerves can't take it much longer. The girl wants to talk, and not just for a while, like she said. Only fortunately, she does nearly all the talking. And it fills you in on Ben's family, his brother, Joan's father. Still, it's hours almost dawn before Joan finally decides to go to bed. Then you continue the search, and you wonder about Joan. Why she came here after not seeing Ben since early childhood. Wonder if her parents know she's here. She seems a nice girl, doesn't she, Harvey? Young, exciting. You almost wish you could talk to her, see how she would react to the truth. And you're still wondering about it as you hear the clock striking in the front hall. 6 a.m. And you've found nothing. Wonderful breakfast, my dear. You're an excellent cook. Thank you, Uncle Ben. <laughs> I did have a little trouble getting everything together. You know, finding things. I didn't want to disturb you. Uncle. Very good jam, miss, don't you think? Mm-hmm. You must be terribly fond of jam, Uncle Ben. Goodness, I never saw so many jars in anyone's cellar. Cellar? Why, why, yes. That's where I got this jar. Shouldn't I? Oh, it, it's quite all right. I couldn't find any jam in the cupboards here, so... Uh, may I have the sugar, my dear? Here you are. Uncle Ben. Yes? What's going on in the cellar? What? The floor. All that digging. Those holes. Oh, that. I, uh, well, I've been having some trouble with the water pipes, you see. And... Oh, I thought it was something like that. Uh, m more toast, Uncle Ben? <laughs> It was close, wasn't it, Harvey? And later you have cause for more concern. Writing a letter, my dear? Just a note to Mother. You know how she worries. Promised I'd write as soon as I arrived here. Telling her all about your trip, eh? That and about you. Oh? Uh, Joan, my dear. Yes? I, I wonder if I might add a postscript to your mother. Oh, would you, Uncle Ben? Just a few lines at the bottom of the letter. If you don't mind. Of course I don't mind. Here. You have no intention of adding just a few lines. No. It's just a precautionary measure, isn't it, Harvey? You read the letter quickly to make certain that she hasn't written anything to give you away. But you're quite safe, aren't you? It's just the type of letter you'd expect a girl like Joan to write. The, uh, having a fine time variety. And she's quite lavish in her praise of charming Uncle Ben. Very good. Here you are, my dear. But aren't you going to write anything? After such a beautiful letter, what could I say? Why don't you just add, Uncle Ben says hello, hmm? Well, all right. <laughs> That evening, the opportunity to continue your search of the house presents itself. It's difficult to do much during the day, isn't it, Harvey? With a girl, Joan, always around you, you have so little time alone. You leave Joan at her bedroom door, say goodnight, and then hurry down the hall to your own room. Sitting in the darkness, you wait till finally the hall clock strikes eleven. You tiptoe down the corridor, past Joan's room, hurry down to the library... As you're about to open the door, you hear someone moving about inside. And looking for something, my dear? Oh. oh, oh, Uncle Ben, you frightened me. May I help you? I, I hope you don't mind my going through your desk like this. I was just looking for some writing paper. 
I seem to have used all mine. I see. Have you found any? Yes. Here. It, it's all right if I take it, isn't it? Of course, Joan. Of course. Thanks. Well, good night again, Uncle Ben. Good night. As you watch the girl hurry from the room, the thought suddenly occurs to you. It's possible she's playing the same game you are, Harvey. Yes, it's possible she isn't really Ben Masters' niece at all. That she knows about the money, too, and is here to get it. You wait patiently until you're certain that she's sound asleep. Slip quietly into her room. Locate her suitcase and take it out into the hall. Inside, you find a letter. A letter addressed to... Mrs. Paul Gates. Yes, Harvey. Mrs. Paul Gates. Not Joan Benton, the name she told you. Another name. The following morning, after another night of fruitless searching for the money, you're starting down to breakfast when you overhear Joan talking softly to someone on the telephone. Yes, it's all You right. hurry forward, quietly straining to, to listen. It'll work out perfectly. What? No, he doesn't suspect a thing. I've got to ring off now. He may hear me. Yes, I'll be careful. Bye. Oh! Oh, you startled me, Uncle Ben. Oh, sorry. Have a nice sleep? Not too nice, no. Oh? Nightmares is something? As a matter of fact, it was a nightmare, Joan. I uh, dreamt you turned out to be someone else. Not really my niece at all. Oh, really? Fantastic thing. You were here to steal my money. I became so angry when I found out I wanted to kill you. Uncle Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm frightening you. Mmm, that bacon smells good. Would you like scrambled eggs this morning? Fine, Joan. Fine. You watch her closely during breakfast, but she betrays no sign of fear. Breakfast over, you leave her in the kitchen, hurry down to the cellar, and continue your search for the money. But the money isn't to be found. Then upstairs, as you walk along the front hall, you hear sounds from the den and decide to go down. What? What are you doing, Joan? Oh, just tidying up. Dusting. You... Shouldn't be moving that heavy furniture, child. Oh, it's nothing, really. You don't mind, do you, Uncle Ben? My sort of taking over, doing things. I'm afraid you're not a very good housekeeper. No, I don't suppose I am, Joan. It's a smart move on her part, isn't it, Harvey? If she's really looking for the money... Cleaning house gives her the perfect opportunity to search each room carefully, inspect every piece of furniture. After she's gone, you begin to move the pieces of furniture back into place. And then it happens. Suddenly, quite by accident, as you slide a small bookcase into place, one of its edges strikes the wall sharply. A section of the paneling gives away and swings back on rusty hinges. Quickly, you slide the bookcase out of the way, and then you see it, the small wall safe. Unlocked and empty. Joan got here before you, didn't she, Harvey? You whirl around, hurry from the den, and as you step out into the hall... Oh, Uncle Ben! You stop suddenly. Joan is standing by the front door, and there's someone with her. Uncle Ben, this gentleman's car ran out of gas. He, he wonders if he might use the phone. I uh, want to call the signal station down the road. Why, of course, my dear... Right ahead, young man. Well, lucky thing for me, I stalled practically outside your door. Sorry to disturb you. It's quite all right. You turn, walk back into the den and close the door, trying to act unconcerned. Then you hurry to the den window, see the young man's car parked off the road behind a tree. You slip into a raincoat, hurry outside. At the car, you find the key still in the ignition. You turn it on. The gas gauge shows that the tank is half full. And then something else. The registration on the steering post. Paul D. Gates. 
I knew it. Yes, you're certain, aren't you, Harvey? Paul D. Gates, the girl's husband. Her partner in a clever ruse to take Uncle Ben's stolen money. You consider taking the car and running, but the thought of the money holds you. You came here for it, didn't you? You're going to get it at any cost. Oh, Uncle Ben, come in. Uh, the man at the station is sending someone out right away. You don't mind if he waits here a while, do you, Uncle Ben? No, 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 of course not, my dear. I, I'm sure they'll be along soon. <laughs> in no hurry anyway, I, I'm rather enjoying the conversation with your niece. Well, get on with it then. You don't mind if I sort of horn in, do you? Why, no. Uh, no, of course not, Uncle Ben. You sit back in the easy chair, watch them closely, listen to them make idle chatter. They're clever, aren't they, Harvey? Cool and clever. But they're not clever enough to fool you. You're certain that Joan has the money. You're just waiting for the opportunity to slip away. But they're not going to, are they? And as the minutes tick by, a plan begins to take shape in your mind. Finally, you decide to put your plan into operation. Uh, Joan, my dear, perhaps the gentleman would enjoy a cup of tea. I'm sure I would. Oh, don't go to any trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. I'll just be a few minutes. Smoke? Why, yes, thank you. Good cigars, these. You'll like them. Have them made special. Uh, light? Thank you. Say, this is a good cigar. I'm glad you like it. Say, are uh, you by any chance interested in Chinese art? Well, <laughs> never thought much about it one way or the other. But I must say, you do have some beautiful things here, sir. I think so. Now... Take this pair of bookends, for example. Ever see anything like one of these? Oh, they're beautiful. They're heavy, too. Yes. Quite heavy. A friend of mine sent them to me from... Oh, isn't that the service truck from the gas station? What? Out front. You can see it there from that window. Where? I don't... <laughs> You stoop quickly to drag the unconscious Mr. Gates out of the way, and then freeze, fascinated as you stare down at the floor. The bookend, Harvey, from old Ben's collection. It smashed as you dropped it after striking Gates a glancing blow. And you see that it's filled with currency and large bills. So you found old Ben's hiding place. He did take the money and hide it. And now you have it. Uncle Ben. Huh? Oh, Joan. It's all right. You can drop the act now. What have you done to him? Your friend is out for a while, my dear. The money. You have it? Yes, most of it. I imagine there's a good deal more in that other bookend. No wonder they were made so large. I, I don't understand why you hit him. Oh, you're a very clever young lady, Joan. Or rather, Mrs. Paul Gates. Yes, clever. But you don't fool me one bit. What? You and your Mr. Gates. I suspect it from the start. You better sit down, my dear, while I decide what to do with you and your husband. This money is mine, and I'm keeping it. Now, a word to gamblers. I mean those of you who are gambling with your own life and the lives of your passengers by trying to squeeze that last thousand or so miles of wear out of smooth old tires. You know, of course, that smooth tires are unsafe. They don't stop as quickly. They skid. And they puncture or blow out more easily. In fact, records show that in one year, almost 6,000 vehicles involved in fatal and non-fatal accidents had either punctures or blowouts. There's so much for what you stand to lose. The next question is, what do you save by gambling on old tires? Well, right now, the answer is nothing. In fact, it's actually costing you money. Because now, signal dealers are giving today's biggest trade-in allowance for old tires. What's more, the Lee tires your signal dealer is now selling are made of cold rubber, toughened still further with patented Phil Black O, 
and actually give 30 to 40 percent more wear than ever before. So it's just penny-wise and pound-foolish to keep driving on smooth old tires. It's time to find out how little it will cost to trade your unsafe old tires for safe new Lee tires at signal stations now. It's time for the showdown, isn't it, Harvey? And you congratulate yourself. You were smart enough to see through her plan, weren't you? You're certain she was after the money. That she planned to get help in taking it from you. Sent for her husband and partner, Paul Gates. But he can't help her now, can he? You've taken care of him. He's unconscious. And now you're going to take care of Joan. You watch her as she stares at you, puzzled. So, you did take the money. You had it all the time. Not all the time, my dear. Yes, you did. I believed you. Told everybody at home that you were too nice to have stolen anything ever. What are you talking about? Paul is my husband, like you discovered. We were passing through town, and I decided to look you up. Now, don't give me that. You came for the money. Here, what are you doing? I can make him more comfortable while we talk. Poor Paul. You might have killed him in your anger. All this mistrust in the world. I thought Mother and Dad and Uncle Frank were all wrong about you. Just stubborn, like when they disapproved of my marriage to Paul. I thought we were two misunderstood people. That's why I looked you up. Will you stop this crazy act? It isn't an act. Not with me, only with you. You're a thief, just like I thought. I'm sorry I phoned them now. What will they think? Phoned them? You... You've asked someone else to come here? Yes, the whole family. Mother, Dad, my brothers. I thought we'd have a reunion. All try to understand one another. That's why Paul was stalling you, waiting for them to get here. Hello? Joan? Joan, dear, we're all here. Just a minute. Don't come in. Yes, all of you. Come in. Mother? Dad? Well, hello. What's all this? What happened to Paul? Uncle Ben did it, Dad. Uncle Uncle Ben? Ben? He hit him. Knocked him out. He thought we were after his stolen money. But where is he, Joan? Where is Uncle Ben? What did you say? Your mother said, where is Uncle Ben? If this man isn't Uncle Ben, I... I can't tell you. You'll have to ask this imposter. Or maybe... In that case, we better call the police. Let them ask him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Ed Begley and Betty Moran. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Ben S. Hunter, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Announcer has been Marvin Miller. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time 
than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the whistler's strange story, Brotherly Hate. Visiting hours were over. The Jeffrey Long Museum in San Francisco was quiet. And in the private office of the owner, Jeffrey sat at his desk, staring at the note in his hands. A note that was damp, almost wet with his own perspiration. The hands trembled and there was a tight, nervous feeling in the pit of his stomach. Symptoms of terror. It had all started three months ago when Jeffrey Long had received the first envelope while in Cairo. Then followed days and weeks of mounting fear. Because each Saturday thereafter, like a gentle stabbing before the final thrust, came an identical note, and the message was always the same. If you killed Estelle, you will die on the anniversary of her death. And now it's Saturday again. The feeling of terror grows stronger, doesn't it, Jeffrey? The beads of perspiration on your forehead colder. Yes. Because it's Saturday, and tomorrow, Sunday the 17th, is the anniversary of Estelle's death. Yes? Mr. Burton is here, sir. Uh, thank you, Miss Grant. Send him in. Come in, Burton. Come in. What's on your mind, Long? You know why I called you. Sit down. <laughs> Want me to discover the lamp used by Ramesses the Fourth? <laughs> oh, what I do for money. You're a private detective, aren't you? What about Estelle Blair's brother? Look, if you didn't kill the girl, why worry? This this brother, the one who's been sending me these letters, he's obviously a crackpot. He might do anything. Call the police. They'll give you protection. I tell you, he's got to be found. You've got to find him. I can't go around afraid of everyone I meet. Everyone from cab drivers to the, the caretakers here in my own building. Listen... When I walked in here nearly a year ago with a hunk of papyrus and an alabaster cup that belonged to King Tut, you hired me like that. Yes, sir. Since then, I've been doing your dirty work. I've even swiped scarabs and jewel boxes for you all over the world. But murder's another thing, even for me. I want to know what I'm getting into, that's all. If you kill Estelle Blair, then I want to know about that. That clear? I've... I've told you. Her death was an accident. And I'm telling you the result of my investigation... As far as I'm concerned, Estelle Blair never had a brother. Any time you decide to give out with what really has got you scared, just dial my number. You can't walk out of me now, Burton. You can get another private eye. No, no, there isn't time. Like I said, when you're ready to tell me why you're so scared, just dial my number. But don't wait too long. <laughs> It's turned out as you feared it would, hasn't it, Jeffrey? Yes. Burton, the private detective, hasn't been able to find Estelle Blair's brother. And now there's only one thing to do. You know there's too much to lose if you are murdered. The resultant investigation would certainly reveal the ugly facts surrounding your former assistant's death. You have immortality to lose, Jeffrey. Your name is the greatest private collector of Egyptology in the world. 
The proud name that shines brightly from the brass plaque on your great museum. The museum you intend to will to the city on your death. Quickly, you get to your feet. Hurry to the small cabinet and take down a bottle marked poison. There is a way out, isn't there? A way you can preserve the honored name of Jeffrey Long. Excuse me, Mr. Long. Yes? Oh. Oh, uh, what is it, Miss Grant? You won't be needing me anymore this evening, sir. I thought I'd run along. No, no, I won't be needing you, Miss Grant. You could... No. On second thought, perhaps you'd better stay a few minutes. There is something you can do. Yes, sir? I'll call you. As you walk back to your desk, you unscrew the cap on the bottle of poison. A Herculean force drags at your arm as you try to lift the bottle to your lips. Finally, you succeed. Your throat is numb as you take one swallow, then another, and another. Then a sudden stiffness seizes your hand. The bottle slips through your fingers. Slowly, you walk around the desk, slump into the chair. You wait a minute or so, and then press the buzzer. Come. Come in, Miss Grant. Mr. Long, is something the matter? Yes, I made a terrible mistake. In the cabinet there. Two bottles almost identical. One contains cough medicine. The other, deadly poison. Mr. Long, you you didn't really take... Listen to me carefully, Bernice. It was a mistake, do you understand? Be sure they know. They mustn't think otherwise. It wasn't suicide. Remember that. It wasn't suicide. You're... not going to die. Uh, What? I... I was afraid you'd do something like this. I poured the poison down the sink yesterday afternoon. What you drank was just colored water. Ed Stevens of Long Beach, California is the Whistler fan who receives a $20 signal gasoline book this week as a token of our appreciation for sending in this limerick. There once was a driver named Abbott, whose car took off like a rabbit. Signal Ethel, said he, is the fuel for me. From now on, I'll make it a habit. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with go farther gasoline. If, like our friend Abbott, you like pickup that's quick as a rabbit then Signal Ethel is a gasoline for you. But flashing pickup, mind you, is only one of the improvements you'll discover when you power your car with this super fuel. In addition, you'll enjoy Signal Ethel's extra power that makes cars fairly fly up hills and makes passing safer. And you'll be amazed at your engine's contented ping-free purr. For Signal Ethel is scientifically engineered to bring out the very peak of performance your car is capable of, regardless of age. So why not discover how much fun driving can be? Next time, treat your car to a tank full of the gasoline that's packed with more gold. Next time, fill up with Signal Ethel. When you raised a bottle of poison to your lips, you thought it was the only way out, didn't you, Jeffrey? You would cheat Estelle Blair's brother, the man who had sworn to kill you, if you took your own life and make it appear as an accident, and you would preserve the honored name of Jeffrey Long. Then as you sat at your desk waiting for death, your secretary, Bernice Grant, informed you that you wouldn't die because she'd poured the poison out of the bottle the day before, replaced the deadly contents, with harmless colored water. I was afraid you'd try to kill yourself. You see, I've known about the letters. You you knew all along? Yes. I've seen the fear, the worry in your eyes, the torture. 
But I couldn't let you do it. I'll do it again. You or no one else can stop me. No, no, you mustn't. Please. I can help you. Please leave me alone, Bernice. Promise me you won't try. Leave me alone, Bernice, please. I can help you. I want to help you. I said... What'll I do, Bernice? What'll I do? We must find Estelle Blair's brother. You could talk to him. Tell him it was an accident. Yes. Yes, I... I could tell him how she slipped... Fell off the boat. I, I could show him I wasn't to blame. I, I'm sure I could find him. I know if you'll trust me. No, I... no, no. It's impossible. What if I told you I'd already located Estelle Blair's father? You, you what? Yes. I learned about him the other day. He's living in the old men's home in Santa Peralta. I know if I can talk to him. I... Oh, please let me try. Well, uh, You promise not to try again to take your life. Are you sure you're not making all this up just... I tell you, I know I can find Estelle's brother. Now, promise me. All right. All right. Then go to the King Tut room in the basement. There's a telephone there and a couch. Stay there until I call you. I'll bring you some food later. Will you go? Yes, Bernice. If you say so. And please... No matter what happens, trust me. You must trust me. You see, I love you, Jeffrey. Still numb with shock, you find your way down to the King Tut Room, the large storage room filled with relics from the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Without even taking off your tie, you lie down on the couch and drop into a deep sleep. You awake much later, and when you look at your watch, you see that it's Sunday morning. The morning of the day you expect to be killed. Your thoughts fasten on the tiny bit of hope Bernice gave you yesterday. You quickly reach for the phone. Good morning. Messiah Apartments. Uh, Miss Grant, please. Thank you. Hello? Bernice, this is Jeffrey. Have you found anything more about Estelle's brother? Not yet, but... Jeffrey, I've made progress. I definitely know she had a brother. He's somewhere in San Francisco. But today is the anniversary of Estelle's death. The day is going to happen. I can't just wait. You've got to wait. You must be patient, Jeffrey. At any moment, I may have some news. What about the father in Santa Peralta? You must trust me, Jeffrey. I know, but what did he say? What's the brother's name? I don't know yet. But the father, didn't he tell you? I'm working as fast as I can, Jeffrey. You must believe that. I'll call you later, this afternoon. Maybe I'll have some very good news. Just wait and be patient, will you? Don't go out. Oh. All right, Bernice. And remember, Jeffrey. I love you. I will, Bernice. I guess I should have known it long ago. She convinces you to wait, doesn't she, Jeffrey? And you sit there quietly in the near darkness, trying to fight down your desire to run away and leave town. You're debating this when you hear footsteps from the direction of the stairs outside. You tense, nervously, staring at the door. Someone is coming, Jeffrey, into this room. Someone who moves quietly and has a key. You want to run, but the door is the only way, and then... Good morning, Mr. Long. Carruthers, what are you doing here? Why, Grady, the regular caretaker, is on his vacation, sir. I'm relieving him this week. But this is Sunday. You're not supposed to be here on Sunday. Miss Grant instructed me that you were here, sir, doing some special work. She asked me to bring this breakfast tray. Oh. Oh, yes, of course, I didn't see it. Sorry, Carruthers. It's all right, sir. Uh, anything else? No. No, nothing else. Thanks. You watch him leave, stare at the food, 
suddenly realize you're unable to eat it or to even think of hunger. Your nerves are getting the best of you, aren't they, Jeffrey? And you decide to take a chance and drive to Santa Peralta yourself at once. Talk to Estelle's father. You're sure you can make it and be back before Bernice calls you. You're on the highway in five minutes headed south. An odd feeling tells you that a car somewhere behind you has been making the very same turns and that it picked you up near the museum. But you try to put it out of your mind when no attempt is made to catch up with you. Hours later, you pull up before an ancient stucco building bearing the sign, Santa Peralta Home for the Aged. Well... Visitor so early. Welcome. Oh, thank Welcome. you. Welcome. I'm looking for a man by the name of Blair. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Uh, Long. Uh, Jeffrey Long. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Long. Uh, no one here by that name. Well, maybe he's here under another name. He uh, he had a daughter named Estelle. Mm, no one here with a daughter named Estelle. She's a pretty girl. Blonde. She was tragically killed about two years ago at sea, the Mediterranean. She fell overboard. Oh. Pity. Yes. Uh, but I'm afraid you have the wrong place. Uh, we have only ten gentlemen here, and uh, I know their records very well. Uh, we've never had your Mr. Blair here in San Peralta. You're sure? Absolutely, Mr. Long. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it, Jeffrey? Bernice told you Estelle's father was in the old men's home at Santa Peralta. But apparently she was lying. Suddenly you look around you, find that you're driving through the marina district, not far from the little cottage Estelle used to share with her mother in the days when Estelle was your assistant at the museum. You turn left, then right, and you see the house. Hardly recognize it after all these years. You stop and get out of the car and walk toward a tall woman who is watering the lawn next door. Hello. It's a lovely day, isn't it? If you like them hot, this is going to be a scorcher. You, uh, you live here long? Nine to fifteen years. You're not a collector, are you? Oh, no. No, I'm neither a bill collector nor a process server. A- an old friend of mine used to live next door. Andrews, maybe? Uh, no, no, the, uh, the name was Blair. Oh, them. Mother, big woman. Arms like the posts on that porch. Yeah, well, the girl, Estelle, was my friend. Sweet little thing, blonde as corn silk. Uh, She was killed, you know. Fell off a boat somewhere near Europe or Asia or somewhere like that. Worked for a museum. Well, I... I, I've been trying to locate her brother. Brother? Hmm. I don't seem to remember any man in the Blair family. Seems like there was just Estelle and her mother. Oh, I I see. Well, i got to be going. There was a girl, though, used to live with the Blairs. A friend of Estelle's. Dark girl, slim, about uh, five two, trim little thing, wore hair in a bun. You know, I used to say to my husband, Mac, that dark girl looks more like Mrs. Blair than Estelle does. I bet you they're sisters. I used to say to my husband, Wait a minute. Mac, be quiet. What? That car. He went past, and now it's turning around on the street. Well, now, Logan. Well, what is it? What's the matter? In your car, driving fast, you begin to pull away from the car in back of you. Soon lose sight of it altogether. Slowing down, your mind stops racing, too. And then it hits you, Jeffrey. Something that woman back there said. Dark girl, slim, about 5'2". Trim little thing, wore hair in a bun. You know, I used to say to my husband, Mac, that dark girl looks more like Mrs. Blair than Estelle does. I bet you they're sisters. That's it. Sisters. Of course. Yes, Jeffrey, that's it. An exact description of Bernice, your own secretary. Suddenly it all becomes very clear to you, doesn't it? You noticed it the first day she came to work for you. There was something familiar about her. She reminded you of someone, but you were never able to figure out who she resembled. And now you know. You've been a fool, haven't you, Jeffrey? The way you've played into her hands. You're certain Bernice is Estelle's sister. And all the while, she's the one who's been sending the notes intending to avenge her sister, Estelle. (laughs) 
back at the museum, you see no sign of the other car. But you're no longer worried about it, are you, Jeffrey? You're certain now that Bernice is your would-be assassin. You hurry inside and wait for her call. The hours drag by, and then... Hello? Jeffrey, darling. I'm calling from a pay phone in a drugstore on Broadway. Someone is watching me, so don't ask any questions. Just do as I say. All right, Bernice. Jeffrey, I found the brother. He's going to try to kill you tonight. But he doesn't know where you are. But you... Be sure you keep all the lights out there in the basement. Oh, yes, yes, of course. And don't call anyone. Don't tell anyone where you are. No, of course not. I'll meet you there in half an hour. Don't call anyone. You understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. Goodbye, Jeffrey. Darling. She is clever, isn't she, Jeffrey? She's maneuvered you on the very anniversary of Estelle's death. Into the basement of the museum where no one can hear a sound through the thick walls. But it's over for her now, isn't it? All over. Burton, Detective Agency, Burton speaking. This is Jeffrey Long, Burton. Oh? What now? I know. I know who's been sending me those notes. Yes? From my secretary all along. Bernice Grant. What? Yes. She's Estelle's sister. Now, you've got to help me. Uh, look here, Long. I've told you where I stand. Before I do anything, I have to know. Are you... Are you prepared to go along with me? The whole way, if I tell you? What do you mean by that? I mean... Even to doing away with someone? You mean Bernice? Yes. If it's necessary. Anything for money. You know that. All right. Yes, I I killed Estelle. I pushed her overboard. But she had it coming. I'll tell you about it later. Are you with me now? Of course. I'll be right over. You better bring along a man you can trust. Bernice is coming here to the King Tut room in the basement in half an hour. She'll probably have a gun. Can I depend on you? Don't worry about a thing. We'll meet you there. It seems ages as you sit there in the dark waiting. Then when the illuminated hands on your watch point to 8.30, you hear Bernice coming. Jeffrey. Jeffrey, what are you? I'm here. Oh, I've been so worried. Here, let's turn on the light. Oh, I'm so tired, darling. I've been so worried. Isn't this carrying things a little too far, Bernice? Jeffrey, what do you mean? How stupid do you think I am? Jeffrey, what's this all about? Still playing the game. Didn't you think I'd see through it all? You know, Bernice, I visited San Peralta. And as you know, Estelle's father has never been there. I had to tell you something to keep you from doing away with yourself. It was all I could think of. Jeffrey, I've been working every minute, working for you. I asked you to trust me. Trust you? <laughs> You've had me so worked up, I suspected everybody I ran into. Even thought it might be Carruthers, the caretaker. And in the car, I imagined someone was following me. You didn't imagine it. You were being followed. What? I was afraid you might go out. I called in the police, begged them to put a man on you. Do you expect me to believe that? <laughs> Here, give me that purse. Jeffrey! So, you're carrying a gun. For what, Bernice? Jeffrey, it's for your protection. I was afraid he might find you here. I... Why are you pointing that gun at me, Jeffrey? You see, Bernice, I know all about you. Found out from a woman next door to your old house in the Marina District. I know you were the one who wrote me those notes. No! I know Estelle never had a brother. I've discovered something even more interesting. But it... I've discovered that you, Bernice, the sweet secretary who said she loved me... You're the one who intends to kill me. Because you're Estelle's sister. And that's why I'm going to kill you. There are two ways to buy new tires. One way is to keep driving on smooth, unsafe treads until one day you're sailing down the highway, probably miles from nowhere... 
when all of a sudden, broom, 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 you've got a flat. Your old tire is probably ruined before you can stop, so it's now worth nothing. All you can do is take whatever make of tire the nearest station carries at whatever price they're charging. <laughs> well, there must be a better way to get new tires. And there is. That way is to trade in those remaining unsafe miles to your signal dealer now while he's giving today's biggest allowance. What's more, the new tires on which signal dealers are giving this generous trade-in allowance are first-line Lee tires, famous over 47 years for long mileage. And today's Lees, made of cold rubber, toughened still further with patented Phil Black O, actually wear 30 to 40 percent longer than ever before. So from a dollars and cents standpoint, you just can't afford to keep on driving on treadbare old tires. Not now, while signal service stations will trade them for new Lee tires at such surprisingly small cost. Stop in at your nearest signal dealers tomorrow. Get his generous trade-in offer, and you'll know what I mean. You watch Bernice standing against the wall, weeping. Everything is under control now, isn't it, Jeffrey? You're certain that you've outsmarted the girl you think is Estelle's sister. The girl you think wanted to kill you in vengeance for her sister's death. Now there's only one thing on your mind. To get out of the museum with Bernice and do away with her. You're tense, listening for the approaching footsteps which you know will be Burton's. Oh, thank heavens, Jeffrey. He's coming. The detective I've had following you. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bernice, you're wrong. That's someone I sent for. But I told you not to call anyone. I know you did. You wanted me all to yourself, didn't you? You're out of your mind. Hello, you in there? Yes, in here, Burton. Burton? Dick Burton? Yes. Come on out, Long. Shall I bring Bernice? No, leave her there a while. Come on out alone. Oh, don't go, Jeffrey. I found out for sure it's this no morning. It's no use, Bernice. I fell for your lies for a long time. Wait, please. Jeffrey, don't go. The police will be here soon. Dick Burton is Estelle's brother. Her brother. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Remember, friends, if you'd like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours read on The Whistler, the address to which to send it is Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. Your limerick must be your own composition. It will be judged on the basis of originality, humor, and suitability. And the decision of the judges is final. All entries become the property of the Signal Oil Company. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Willard Waterman, Virginia Gregg, and Wilms Herbert. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Harrison Negley, music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time, next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Your announcer has been Marvin Miller. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Uh, G-M-A-L. Signal, 
Signal gasoline. Signal the famous go farther gasoline. Invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by the Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, the Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story, Trigger Man. Martin Lang was young, brilliant, and confident. He had everything it took to make him one of Seattle's most successful lawyers. But law school graduates were a dime a dozen, regardless of how confident and brilliant they were. And Stella and the baby had to eat. So that was why Martin Lang took his first case from Branch Malone, a notorious gambler, and got an acquittal for him. The first of a long line of acquittals. Yes. And Martin Lang's classmates threw up their hands, said he was betraying his profession. But Martin needed money, and he kept telling himself he had to get a start somewhere. So he kept right on getting acquittals for Branch Malone, and the money kept rolling in. But it had to end sometime. There had to be a payoff eventually. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. How do you find? We find the defendant not guilty. Very well. The clerk will record the verdict of the jury. Defendant is discharged from custody. Jury is dismissed. Court stands adjourned. (laughs) Oh, uh, Mr. Lang. You wanted to see me, Your Honor? Yes, Mr. Lang. I suppose I should compliment you on the way you handled the case for Mr. Malone. Well, I did my best, Your Honor. It was more than enough. Is that all, sir? Mr. Lang, I don't like to see a clean-cut young fellow like you get mixed up with an out-and-out criminal like Branch Malone. I thought the jury found him innocent. They found insufficient evidence to convict him, Mr. Lang. That does not necessarily imply his innocence. You pleaded his case well. Doubtless you'll be able to do the same for him again. If you're willing to pay the price. The price? The price is your conscience. Your peace of mind. Well, I... I appreciate your interest in me, Your Honor. But I'm afraid that I... uh... Not impressed. That it? Will that be all, Your Honor? Yes, Lang, that's all. Very well. Good day, sir. Good day. Hello, Lang. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. You know, sometimes I'm sorry I'm on the force, fussing around with small stuff like murders, and I could be doing a great work like you are, upholding the rights and defending poor, innocent little guys like Branch Malone. Well, this seems to be lecture day. You'll excuse me, Radigan. I have an appointment. Yeah, 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 sure. I saw him. Malone the Mighty. He's waiting outside. With your payoff. Now, look, Radigan, I, I got don't... a tip for you, Counselor. It's about cops. Don't give us the brush off. Because one of these days, you're going to need us. Guys who play bang-bang with the big racket boys usually do. You know, I like you. You're a good kid. You got a nice family. Haven't you got any worries of your own, Radigan? Okay, Martin. Sorry. (laughs) 
You're on your way, aren't you, Martin? Another acquittal. Another $500 in your pocket. It doesn't matter where it comes from, does it? Malone's money is as good as anybody's. And you keep telling yourself there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. That night, as you sit in your living room reading the paper, you try to reason it through, file it away. But it keeps coming back. <clears throat> uh, Stella. Yes, Martin? Is anything wrong? Wrong? No. I thought something might be bothering you. No. There's nothing, Martin. I thought you'd be happy about the case and everything. We can buy that dining room set now. Yes. Yes, we can. Well, the case was a cinch. $500 for an afternoon's work. That's not bad. No. Not bad. There's nothing to it. State's evidence was insufficient. One of their witnesses didn't show up. Same as the time before. Uh, yeah. And they found the witness at the bottom of the river three days later. Well, I, I didn't have anything to do with that. No. no, of course you didn't. Well, Stella, you're not suggesting I drop Malone, are you? I mean, I know he's no angel, but if I wasn't getting his business, some other attorney would. A lawyer isn't a criminal just because he defends one, is he? You're defending yourself now, aren't you? Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm not going through that again. I've told you a hundred times, Stella. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, yes, Branch. What? Oh. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it right away. What does he want now? He wants me to meet a friend of his and rush him home. His boy was just run over. How terrible. Branch isn't good at this sort of thing. He wants me to tell a fellow and then take him home. Of course, Martin. Just a little favor for Branch Malone, Martin. It's the least you can do, isn't it? The tavern is only a few blocks away. And when you arrive, you find Mr. Williams in a back booth, just where Malone said he'd be. Are you Fred Williams? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you want? I'm afraid I have some bad news. Bad news? It's about your son. Lenny? Yeah, he's had an accident. An accident? Lenny? He was run over. No. No, where is he? I gotta go to him. He's home. Come on, my car's okay. outside. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Let's go. My car's right here. How did it happen? Tell me. This is it. If you'll tell me where you live, yeah, I... I'll... Hello, Counselor. Branch. What are you doing here? Little business deal, Martin. All right, Williams, get in. No. No, Branch, please. I said get in. Branch, I, I won't talk. I won't say a thing. I'll leave town and square it. Put the gun away, Branch. Sorry, Williams. <laughs> All right, Martin. Get in. Let's get out of here. Branch, you shot him. I said get in, Martin. Kind of quiet for a lawyer, Martin. I... I lured him to his death. <laughs> hey, you, you didn't expect me to go into that crowded bar, did you? Be seen with Williams? That story about his son being run over, it wasn't true. Ah, come on, forget it, Martin. You did a good job. You got nothing to worry about. So long as we're friends. Williams. Who was he, Branch? Oh, I thought I told you, Martin. He's the state's witness who didn't show up this afternoon. Audrey Newcomer of Los Angeles is the Whistler fan to whom we are sending a $20 signal gasoline book this week as a token of our appreciation for writing this limerick. There once was a horse from Bombay who preferred signal Ethel to hay. He was easy to ride. You just cling to his hide and step on the gas all the way. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, but go by the gasoline. A smart horse, that one from Bombay. 
For it's no secret that Signal Ethel is packed with horsepower that puts new zing into older cars and gets the most brilliant performance from new cars. Do you like flashing pickup that makes other drivers sit up and take notice? Try Signal Ethel. Do you like smooth, responsive power that lets you streak down the straightaway or float effortlessly over the highest hills with nary a complaining ping? Then it's Signal Ethel for you. When you step on the gas, you'll know you're enjoying the most thrilling performance your car is capable of delivering. If you fill your gas tank next time with Signal Ethel. You've discovered something, haven't you? The judge in Radigan. Even your wife, Stella, tried to tell you, but you couldn't understand until now. It happened so suddenly that it stunned you. The witness, Williams, is dead, and you unknowingly lured him to his death, right to Branch Malone, and stood by like one of his gunmen while Branch pulled the trigger. You're trapped, aren't you, Martin? Because you're the only witness living who could put a rope around his neck. And you know exactly how Branch Malone feels about that kind of a witness. There's nothing to do but keep your mouth shut and hope for the best. The next morning, you arrive late at your office and find your secretary waiting. I've been trying to get you, Mr. Lang. I'm sorry. I wasn't feeling well. I went for a walk. Something's come up that I... Well, they can wait till tomorrow. I'm going home. I'm afraid they can't wait. Mr. Jarrett called about the walk. That can wait. Then there was a call for Mr. Malone. Uh, What? When? About an hour ago. He wants to see you. Oh. All right. Um, is he at his club? At the city jail. He was booked this morning on suspicion of murder. Hey, I'm Mr. Lang. Hello, Counselor. Come on in. Make yourself cozy. Ten minutes. What's happened, Branch? I thought you might know, Counselor. Cops were tipped off to that Williams killing last night. What? Yeah. But, now, wait a minute. Don't look at me. You don't think I... I didn't say nothing. Well, listen, I'd be crazy to do anything like that, Branch. Sure. Sure you would. That's what I told Spike Robertson. Spike Robertson? Who's he? He's the man the newspapers refer to as my trigger man, Martin. Don't believe you ever met him. Nice guy to have on your side when you're in a spot. We have... Well, we've been trying to figure out if any witnesses might have been around last night. That is, any beside you, I mean. Oh, Branch, believe me, I didn't talk, and I'm not going to. That's what I told Spike. Spike said, don't worry, boss, if they pick you up. When there's no witness, there's no case. You can figure that one out for yourself, can't you, Counselor? Well, sure, Branch. There won't be any prosecution witnesses, Martin, because you're the only one, and you ain't going to be on the witness stand. You're going to defend me. You know, just like before, only this time Spike's going to be real interested in how you're doing. You get it? Lang. Uh, oh. Oh, it's you, Lieutenant Radigan. A little jumpy, aren't you? What do you want? Got it all settled with Branch Malone? Heard you just had a chat with him down in cell block nine. I'm sorry, Radigan. I haven't got time to stand I around and listen. Oh, I know. You're a very busy man. But you're playing with dynamite this time, Sonny. Your uh, friend knows that all these blue chips are on the table. Because whoever put the finger on Williams in that bar is the guy who's going to hang him. And this time, so help me, the witness isn't going to disappear. What are you getting at, Radigan? you got to take your choice this time, Martin. Oh, I still think you're a good guy. I still think you're on the right side. Maybe you don't know it yet, but you are. And I think you know enough about this case to hang Malone. And I think you'll come through for us. But when you do, it's going to be dangerous. Why are you telling me all this? I wanted you to know why I'm putting a tail on you. What? Mm Mm-hmm. He's going to watch over you day and night. And if you know what's good for you, you won't try to give him the slip. Is this for my protection? Or is it... Like uh... I said, Martin. This time the guy we think is an eyewitness isn't going to disappear. That puts it up to you, doesn't it, Martin? 
You can take your choice. Go along with Branch Malone and toss the rest of your life into the ash can. Or tell what you know and face Spike Robertson, Branch Malone's so-called trigger man. And you won't have a chance because you don't know what Spike looks like. You've never seen him. All you know is that he's never missed yet. That when Branch gives him the order, the witness uh, disappears. You can't eat, you can't sleep, and worst of all, you can't explain to Stella. Martin. Yeah? What are you going to do? Oh, will you forget it, Stella? Branch Malone is my client. I've got to defend him. Do you? Of course I do. Why, Martin? You know he's guilty. Why must you involve yourself in it any further? You've got a right to turn him down. He doesn't own Stella, you. please. If you defend him, you're as guilty as he is. Where are you going? Out. Come on, friend. We may as well be sociable. Sorry, Mr. Rido. Oh, I know you're the tail Lieutenant Radigan put on me. He told me himself. <laughs> Radigan told you then? Hmm. Wonder why he doesn't tell me these things. Did he tell you my name, too? No. Well, you know everything else. You might as well know that. It's Ed Morris. Okay, Ed. I saw you following me all afternoon. I thought you did. Thought I'd walk around the block, if you don't mind. Why not? Radigan would get a bang out of this, I suppose. Walking around together this way. The boss just said to keep an eye on you. He didn't care how. Is that all he said? That's all. Uh, say, there's a bar down the street here. I don't want to go on any bars. Maybe it's just this bar. Huh? Maybe because it's the one where Williams was. I said I, I don't want to go on any bars. All right, Martin. Anything you say. Just as long as you're a good boy. I've changed my mind about taking a walk, Ed. I think I'll go home. Yes, Martin, you're on a one-way street, a blind alley. There's no way to turn now, and there's a blank wall at the end. You've got to take the case. It's more than a matter of right and wrong. Yes, Martin, at this point, it's life or death. So you go to work on it. Visit Branch Malone every day in his cell. Spend nights at the office preparing the case, plugging loopholes, anticipating points the prosecution is sure to bring out, making it another sure thing for Branch. You have two weeks until the arraignment, and Branch Malone wants bail. Two weeks without sleep, forgetting to eat, until you're almost ready to crack. And worst of all, you can't tell Stella. There's no way to make her understand... And then suddenly, on the night before the arraignment, you can't hold out on her any longer. Martin. Martin, darling, you're worried sick. Why don't you tell me about it? You can't go on this way. Oh, please, Stella, there's nothing. Are you afraid to tell me? No, no, I... I... Why did you lie to me, Martin? Why did you tell me you had nothing to do with the murder? Williams was the man you met that night, wasn't he? Listen, Stella, you've got to forget it. Please, don't even think... What are you afraid of? I... All right, I'll tell you. I'm the witness. I'm the only one who can hang Branch. Lieutenant Radigan knows that they all do, but they have no proof. Well, that's why that guy's always waiting for me across the street, Stella. He's a plain clothes man, one of High Radigan's boys, protecting me. Protecting you? Yeah, his name's Ed Morris. Radigan knows if I open my mouth, I'm dead. But if that's all there was to it, I wouldn't worry. It's you, too, and Susan, don't you see? Malone won't stop at anything. His gunman, Spike Robertson's waiting for me somewhere. Waiting for me to open my mouth. And if I do, the guard won't make any difference. Spike won't stop until he gets us all. Martin, I... Well, now you know it. You were right, all of you. But it's too late now. So you're going to defend him? And let it happen again and again? Yes. Martin, I want you to stand up at the arraignment tomorrow and tell them everything. Oh, don't be ridiculous. We'll take our chances, Martin. Susan and you and I. It has to be that way, dear. If we don't, there's nothing left, don't you see? No, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, please, Martin. You just don't know, Stella. You have no idea. I do. I'd rather be dead. Don't even say it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> now, you better go on to bed, dear. I've got to do some thinking. What do 
are you pacing the floor for, Martin? I'm the one who ought to be worrying. What time is it, Branch? Uh, it's 12.30. Raymond's set for one, ain't it? Yeah. And have a smoke. Got a half hour. No, oh, thanks. You're still sure of yourself, ain't you? I'll get bail for you. That's a good thing to know. You and me are going to do big things together, Martin. You're a smart boy. Branch. Yeah? Branch, what if I told you this was going to be the last time? Huh? That if I get you out of this one, we're all washed up. What do you mean, if, Martin? All right, when I get you out of this one. How long have you been thinking this over? I don't know. I just I don't... don't like it, Martin. You just don't run out on this kind of a partnership, not when a guy knows as much as you do. Oh, I'm not going to talk if that's what's worrying you. You're wrong, Martin. I'm not worried. Okay, it's the last time if you want it that way. Of course, you won't be taking cases from anyone else either. But if you say it's the last time, there's nothing I can... What do you mean, Branch? Well, I'm not in charge of ending partnerships, Martin. I leave that to my partnership ender, Spike Robertson. So you go into the courtroom, Martin, and half listen to the statement of evidence from the prosecution as you think about the one-way street with Spike waiting at the end. Stella is there watching you, her face white and tense. Branch, confident, half-smiling, wondering what you'll say when the time comes. And then finally it comes, and you find yourself on your feet and going into I your act. remind the court that the so-called evidence presented by the prosecution is neither circumstantial evidence nor is it direct evidence. It's nothing, gentlemen. Nothing but suspicion based simply on the fact that it is alleged that uh, my client had ample and uh, sufficient motive uh, to... Uh, to... Stella is not looking at you now, Martin. She's bent over, her face in her hands. Radigan is turning away. The judge is looking down at the bench. Uh, William's connection has yet to be demonstrated to the satisfaction of either the state or... Uh, or... I can't go on, Your Honor. I ask that the court disqualify me as counsel for the defense... And, and I offer myself as principal witness for the prosecution. It's a new world, isn't it, Martin? There's a different feel to the sidewalk under your feet as you start home late that night after filing your sworn statement of the killing with the district attorney's office. The streets are bare and deserted. Just you and Ed Morris, the guard Lieutenant Radigan appointed to protect you. Oh, I missed you when I left the courthouse, Ed. I was there. Don't worry. Looks like you've got a job on your hands now. I'm ready. That was quite a thing you pulled. I thought Malone was going to pass out in his chair. You know, it's funny, Ed. Now that it's over, I'm not scared at all. They sent two men along with your wife. Stake out at your house, you know. Yeah. Oh, this is the car. Yeah. Hop in. Oh... Uh Spike. That's right. Spike. Something new has been added this week to signal service stations. That sign out front showing a little wooden soldier standing crisply erect under the broiling summer sun has been put there to remind you that Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil stands up under heat. That's especially important at this time of year because high temperatures tend to break down many motor oils and cause harmful carbon, gum, and varnish. But no matter how hot it gets, Signal Premium can take it. That's because its 100% pure paraffin base is fortified with scientific compounds that do important things for your motor, which oil alone cannot do. 
One of these compounds, for instance, specifically prevents the formation of gum and varnish. Another compound actually removes carbon. And still another compound in Signal Premium Motor Oil protects costly bearings from corrosion. So if you want your valuable motor to have the hot weather protection it needs to keep performance up and wear down, now's the time to change to this improved type Signal Oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Drive into a Signal service station and change to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. Well, Martin, it seems Branch Malone didn't waste any time, does it? Two shots and Ed Morris, the guard, lies dead at your feet. You look at the killer standing in front of you and the gun still smoking in his hand. There's nothing you can do, no way to turn. Ten, perhaps fifteen minutes left to live. Long enough for him to take you to a lonely spot on the highway and make another witness disappear. And then, strangely, you find yourself thinking of the sworn statement safe in the district attorney's office. And stranger still, you discover you still aren't afraid. There's no use checking him, he's dead. Yeah. I don't miss very often. Well, what do we do now? Well, maybe we better call the coroner. What are you talking about? That's what we usually do with stiff slang. I don't get it, Spike. Spike? You're Branch Malone's man, aren't you? <laughs> You're a little confused, brother. That's Spike Robertson on the ground there. He's been telling you since the Williams killing but he didn't know Lieutenant Radigan had me telling him. My name's Stanley, DA's office. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Remember, if you would like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours on The Whistler, the address to which to send it is Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. All limericks become the property of Signal Oil Company. Those selected for use on the Whistler will be chosen by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, they must be your own composition. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Edwards, Jr., Monty Margetts, and Charles McGraw. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Robert and Beatrice Gruskin, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. S-I-G-N-A-L Signal Signal Gasoline Your announcer has been Marvin Miller. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. 
I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, The Whistler's strange story. Confession. Only a week before, Marty Heath had thought to himself how wonderful it was to be a part of New York in the spring, with the grass turning green in Central Park and the crocuses blooming in the flower beds. Just a week ago. Now it was different. It was a cold city, a city without a heart. Yes, something had happened to Marty Heath that had taken the heart out of everything. Life had lost its purpose. Nothing had meaning anymore. He smiled bitterly to himself and crossed his fingers as he walked through the revolving door into the main office of the Ajax Life Insurance Company and across the cold marble floor to the application counter. The clerk was efficient and artificially friendly, just like all the rest of them. My name is Martin Heath. I was here yesterday afternoon. Martin Heath? Oh, yes, I have your application. Let's see... Mm-hmm. Married, wife, Clara Heath, living at 28 East 64th Street. No other defendants. That's right. Mm-hmm. The application was for a $20,000 policy, wasn't it? That's right. Payable to my wife. Yes. Take effect tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, will you excuse me a moment, Mr. Heath? Of course. I'll have to look up your file. Uh, pardon me. You got a match? Uh, yeah. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Cigarette? No, no, thanks. Getting yourself a little policy, huh? I hope so. Well, you won't have any trouble. You know the old saying, there's no one with endurance yeah. like... It. What's the matter? Huh? Was something wrong? Look, suppose we talk about you, huh? Oh, sorry. I just happened to see you were getting yourself a policy. Sure. Here. Skip it. By the way, my name is Blaine. See you later, huh? Okay. Huh? See me later? Here we are, Mr. Heath. I have your file. I'm awfully sorry, but our medical department has a report from a Dr. Chandler that Yeah, he... I know. It's all right. Skip it. Thanks for your trouble. Yes, Marty. They have the report from Dr. Chandler, too. They're awfully sorry, but they can't accept your application. Today, it's the Ajax Insurance Company. Yesterday, it was the National, and the day before, the Atlantic. Yes, Marty, it's a cold city, full of cold people. And you can't even confide in the one person who means everything, do you? Please, Clara, I don't want to say any more. Marty, you've worried me to death all week. I called the office, and they had no idea where you'd gone. I told you I was out to lunch with a customer. You're not telling me the truth, Marty. Don't you see, darling? I, I know there's something terribly wrong, and I want to help there's you. There's nothing wrong. Can you understand that? There's nothing wrong. Marty. Oh, I'm sorry, Clara. I, I don't know what's the matter with me. I, look, darling, let's forget about it. Let's go out and put away a swell dinner and take in a show. I think I can get us a couple of seats down at the Barrymore, and, and what about it, huh? All right, dear. Let's forget about it. But, Clara, your wife doesn't forget about it, and neither do you. The whole evening is unreal, both of you trying to ignore the strange coolness that has come between you, trying to smile, making jokes that fall flat, trying not to notice the awkward silences that come so often. You promised yourself you'd never tell her, Marty. It's best that way, isn't it? It's after midnight when you get home, and you're both tired, but you can't sleep. You're still wide awake, staring up at the ceiling when you hear the clock downstairs strike three. Ma, 
party? Yeah. I thought you were awake. That seemed to relax. Neither can I. Marty? Yeah. Marty, will you do me a favor? Sure. If... If it's somebody else, will you tell me? Somebody else? Another girl. Oh, Clara, Clara, darling. <laughs> I'm so worried, Mom. There'll never be anyone else, Clara. Believe that, will you? Oh, Marty, I love you so. Don't make it hard for me, dear, please. <laughs> what is it, Marty? What is it? It's... I can't tell you, Clara. I can't. No, Marty, you can't tell her. And you made Dr. Chandler promise he wouldn't tell her either. You leave the next morning before she awakens to wander the streets again, wondering what to do. For want of a better place to go, you end up in a bar on 3rd Avenue. Yes, sir. Well, a bit. Double scotch, plain water. Double scotch, plain water. Hello? What? Oh, it's you. Hey, mind if I join you? Go ahead. Thanks. You remember me? Saw you at the insurance office yesterday. Name's Blaine. Yeah. Uh, what's yours? Is it important? Might be. Heath, Marty Heath. Yeah. Hey, uh, double scotch and water. I'll be in five. Oh, here, let me get this. Uh... Uh, keep the change, bartender. Thank you. This a hobby of yours, buying drinks for strangers? <laughs> yeah, I got a special on. Maybe we'd better find us a booth somewhere, Marty. I want to talk to you. Okay. Here you are. Sit down. Thanks. Yeah. Now. Now I suppose you want me to tell you all about myself. No, no. No, I know everything about you I want to know. For instance? For instance, I know you're going to die in less than three months. Who told you that? I was waiting to see Dr. Chandler the other day when he gave you the bad news. Standing right outside the door. What were you doing up there? He's my doctor, too. I was sort of interested in your position, Mr. Heath. That's why I followed you. Watched you make a fast pitch to those life insurance companies. What business is this of yours? I'm coming to that. You're worried about your wife, aren't you? Wonder who's going to take care of her, what's going to happen when you're gone. I don't blame you. I'd worry, too, if I was in your shoes. Go on. I'll give you a policy, Mr. Heath. Ten thousand bucks cash on a barrel head, no questions asked. That ought to take care of her for a little while. Where do I come in? It's very simple. Guy's lying on the floor in an apartment on the other side of town. His head is bashed in with a beer bottle. What? what do you mean? What do you want? I told you it was simple. You only got three months to go anyway, Marty. What can you lose? Yeah, but what's it all about? Who... Wait a minute. I'll show you something. There you are. Count it. Ten thousand bucks cash. That ought to take care of your wife for a while. Where do I come in? It's all yours, Marty. All you gotta do is confess to that murder. With the prologue of Confession, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. When you were out driving over the 4th, was part of your fun spoiled by the way other cars left you behind on the getaway or climbed ahead of you on hills? Well, don't give up. Cheer up. There's probably lots of pep and performance left in your motor that you're not getting out of it. That's why tonight, for the benefit of you drivers who may not yet have tried Signal's great new gasoline, I want to pass along the good news about this new super fuel that's engineered especially to put the fun back into driving. You see, science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing new power into new signal gasoline. Power you'll actually feel as your motor springs to life the instant you touch the starter. Power you'll see as your car steps ahead in traffic 
with pickup that makes you proud. Power you'll hear in the knock-free purr of your motor as you breeze up those steep hills and high. Ah, but even that's not all. There's an extra bonus of extra miles. You see, because Signal's increased power helps you get maximum efficiency from your motor, well, naturally, it also helps you get maximum miles per gallon. And that's why those new Signal billboards, the ones identified by Signal's big circle sign in yellow and black, now say, you go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Marty, it's quite a proposition. $10,000 cash on the line. And all Mr. Blaine expects to get for his money is the rest of your life. And he's pretty sure of himself, isn't he? You can see it in his eyes as he sits opposite you, watching you carefully. He knows everything. He knows you're going to die. That there was no arguing with the laboratory test Dr. Chandler showed you. That in three months or less, you'd be gone and Clara would have to face it alone, without money. And he knows, too, that Clara is everything. Well, what about it, Marty? I I don't know. What's it all about? The guy's name is Stanley Roble. I killed him. Does that answer your question? But why? Poker game. Last night in his apartment. I was the last to leave. I had a lucky night, and he decided he didn't want me leaving with his money. Came at me with a beer bottle. Well, then you can get off. It was self-defense. Anyone else could, but not me. You see, Marty... I'm an ex-con. Oh. You need the dough and you're going to die anyway. You'd be doing me quite a favor, Marty. Yeah, I know. Listen, I... I got to think this over. I just can't... Okay. I'm going to trust you, Marty. I'll be waiting for you in this booth at five o'clock. Will you know by then? Yeah, I'll, I'll know by then. You leave him there, walk out of the bar and into the crowded avenue and just keep walking. All you can think of is Dr. Chandler and the cold, accurate laboratory reports of Clara, alone in a matter of days, of Blaine and his $10,000. And you know it's wrong, don't you, Marty? But if you turn him down, what's going to happen to Clara? Yes, Marty, what's going to happen to Clara? Hello, Clara. Marty, darling, what are you doing home? It's only... I know, I, I, I don't feel so hot. I thought I'd take the afternoon off. Oh. Well? Well, what? You usually start asking questions about now. Go ahead. I'm not asking any more questions, Marty. I see. Aren't you going to take off your hat? Oh. Oh, yeah. Come here, Clara. I, I want to talk to you for a minute here in the chair by the window. All right, Marty. That's it. I remember we used to sit this way a lot. Watching the people down there in the street. Feeling sorry for them because they'd never have what we had. Yes, I remember. Clara, you just said you weren't going to ask any more questions. Will you make that a promise? All right, Marty. I'm going to do something pretty soon, Clara. Something terribly strange. Something you probably won't understand for a long time. Maybe you'll never understand it. Marty, what are you talking about? You're asking questions. I'm sorry. It's going to make you wonder about me. It might even make you lose faith in me. I don't know. I want you to promise you'll remember one thing. Yes, Marty. That I love you. That you're the only thing in the world that matters to me. Oh, Marty. Marty, I've got to know. You've got to tell me. Oh, please, darling. Please try to understand. I don't. I don't understand. I'm your wife, Marty. Don't you see? I'm your wife. I've got to know. Oh, please, Marty. Please. I better go. <laughs> no. Don't go, darling. Don't leave me here. Tell me, tell me whatever it is. I can take it, Marty. I'll help you. I'll, I'll do anything. Clara. I can't go on like this. I can't live without you. Goodbye, darling. Hello, Blaine. Sit down. 
Have you thought it over? Yeah, I thought it over. Well, put the money on the table, huh? Sure. You can count it if you want. No, that's okay. What do I do now? You're a good kid, Marty. All right. Number one, you go to this address at 8 o'clock tonight. Yeah. You'll find Robo on the floor with a bottle right next to him. I want your fingerprints in that bottle, clear? Okay. Number two, you write a confession letter to the police. Oh, what'll I tell him? I have no motive. I don't even know the guy. Uh, you can tell him when you found out you were going to die, you decided you had to have the money for Clara. You found out about the poker game. Knew Robo was drunk and his apartment with a lot of dough lying around. Yeah, but all figured out, haven't you? I think so. So, you, you got the dough. But you had to kill Robo to get it. That's what changed everything, you see. You didn't figure on murder. So you had to get it all off your chest. That's why you wrote the letter. That's it, Marty. That's all I want for my ten grand. You'll get it. So that's all he wants for his money, Marty. And you're going to give it to him. Once more, you walk out of the bar and into the streets. The money feels good in your inside breast pocket, snug against your chest. You try and forget about Clara now and concentrate on the shops on Fifth Avenue, St. Patrick's Cathedral, Rockefeller Center. You see something new in all of it, something haunting and precious, now that you're about to leave it for the last time. Finally, you look at your watch. Ten minutes to eight. Yes, sir, taxi. 128 West 86th. Right. You arrive at 8 o'clock sharp. Take the automatic elevator to the fifth floor. Walk down the hall to Robles' apartment and let yourself in with the key Blaine gave you. And there he is, sprawled on the floor with an ugly wound in his head. The bottle lying next to him. On a desk in the corner of the room with some stationery and a pen. It won't take you long, Marty. Maybe five minutes. It's over now. You've left your fingerprints everywhere, and you're careful to leave a first-class impression on the doorknob as you carefully lock it behind you. Walk over to the mail chute and drop in the letter you just wrote. Addressed to the New York police. And then, just as you start for the elevator... Marty! Marty! Clara! Oh, Marty. Oh, you... I've been all over the floor. I didn't know which apartment... You're gonna get out of here. I saw you in the bar with that man. Hurry up. The elevator. You've got to tell me, Marty. All right. I'm going in there... I'm going to find Stay out... Get out of there. Let go of me. Listen. Listen, darling. There's a dead man in there. Marty, you... I can't explain now. Come on, into the elevator. Marty, you killed him. That's no, why you I didn't... No, I didn't kill him. Listen, baby, you got to believe me now. you got to have faith in me. Oh, where are you going now? I'm going to get a taxi and take you home. I don't want you mixed up in this. Marty, Marty. Please, Clara. Please. <laughs> Won't you tell me? All right. All right, Clara. I'll tell you. So you tell her, Marty, because there's nothing else to do. You can't hold it back any longer. And you discover suddenly that you never really knew her. She was right when she said she could take it. It's nearly ten when you arrive back at your apartment. You don't turn on the lights. Somehow it's better with the two of you sitting there in the quiet darkness. Well, darling. Huh? What now? They'll get the letter in the morning. Are we going to wait for it? It's the sensible thing, I guess. With three months left, should we be sensible? I don't know, Clara. I don't... Someone at the door. No. Let me go. Yes? Sorry to bother you so late. My name's Moeller. I'm looking for a Martin Heath. Oh. I've been told he lives here. Well, as a matter of fact, it is his apartment. But you see, Mr. Heath is subletting it to me. My name is Thomas. Uh-huh. You happen to have his address? Yes. 25 Wellfield Way, New Rochelle. Oh, thank you. I'll check it. Good night. Good night. Marty! Why did you lie to him, Clara? I told you there's no use. Marty! I couldn't let him take you. I couldn't. They're right on the job. I'm sure they haven't even got the letter yet. The neighbors must have heard us back there in the hall. 
broken into the apartment. Darling, you can't throw it away. It's it's our three months, not theirs. The whole state will be looking for me in the morning. We haven't got a chance. We can try. At least we can try. Where can we go, Clara? Anywhere. Let's just take a plane. Well, why kid ourselves? They'd find... Three months, Marty. Our last three months. Okay. Let's go. Yes, you know it's crazy, Marty. But you're going to try it anyway. There was nothing in the bargain about running away. At midnight, you arrive at the airport. There you are, sir. Two tickets to New Orleans. Better hurry. Plane leaves in five minutes. And at eight o'clock the next morning, you're signing the register of a New Orleans hotel. George, Ellingson, and wife... Pittsburgh. There you are. Thank you, sir. Boy, will take your bags right up. Travel agent will be in around nine if you want to check on that passage to Havana. I'm afraid, though, you'll have to wait till the end of the week. They're booked up pretty solid. And he's right. You managed to book passage on the boat leaving Saturday for Havana and settle down to wait for three days. Knowing that by now the papers in New York are out with a story and the search is on. You never leave the hotel room. Clara does whatever errands are necessary and arranges for your meals to be sent up, telling them you're ill. Then finally on Saturday morning... It's the boy with breakfast. I'll go. Hello, Mrs. Thomas. What are you doing here? You remember me, of course. The name is Muller. You led me quite a chase. Wait a minute. You have no right to come... All right, Myrna. What do you want? You should have known you couldn't get away with it, Heath. Let's forget it, huh? Chalk it up to experience. Maybe I better get my coat. Why? You're not going anywhere. At the moment, at least. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, whenever the New York cops get here. Incidentally, I sent them a wire this morning. They're on their way. What are you talking about? Aren't you... I'm a private detective, Mrs. Heath, employed by the Zenith Laboratories. It seems that they made a pretty bad mistake a while back. Might have involved them in a damage well, suit. What do you mean, a mistake? Well, three weeks ago, Dr. Chandler made a test on you and sent it to the laboratory for analysis. A red and white differential. Don't ask me what it was. Mistake? Yes, they got your test mixed up with somebody else's. What? There's nothing wrong with you, Heath. You're as healthy as I am. Too bad you went and bought yourself a seat in the electric chair, isn't it? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But right now, I've got some eye-opening facts for you drivers who wonder whether the kind of oil you use in your motor really makes any difference in the way your motor runs. Unfortunately, you can't see inside your motor. But I did see inside two test motors this week, and what I saw just downright amazed me. The motors were identical. They had both been run for 6,600 miles at 62 miles per hour. The only difference was that one motor used today's finest straight motor oil while the other use Signal's new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific compounds, Signal Premium Motor Oil. But get this, after the test, there was only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear in the motor that used Signal Premium Oil. Yes, those five scientific compounds in new Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs. Good reason why wise drivers are switching fast from old-fashioned straight motor oil. Good reason for you to make your next oil change a change to the new type Signal Lubricant that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Marty, it was all a mistake. This story of your having three months to live was an error. But there is still your confession of murder. You know it's useless to run away, that the only thing to do is face the music. Even though you know you haven't a chance. That they'll probably laugh their heads off when you try and tell them the story of Mr. Blaine and the $10,000 he paid you to confess to his crime. 
You don't even wait for the police to arrive in New Orleans in response to Muller's wire. You take the next plane north, and late in the afternoon, you and Clara walk into the office of the Inspector of Homicide in New York City. Sit down, please. We'd rather stand. I think you'd better sit down. Both of you. So you're the guy who confesses to a murder and leads us on a merry chase halfway across the country. I'd hardly call it a merry chase, Inspector. I agree with you. You should have known you couldn't get away with it. Until yesterday afternoon, it was pretty serious. What do you mean, until yesterday afternoon? The killing of Stanley Rover was pretty ordinary, you know. Routine stuff. Except for one very unusual thing. There were two confessions. What? Yeah. Yours and another one. Tell me, Heath, why do you think Eddie Blaine was in Dr. Chandler's office on the day the doc told you you were going to die? Well, I don't know. He was one of Chandler's patients. That's right. But Blaine was a pretty good guy after all. Wanted to do the right thing, I guess. Told us the whole story. What are you talking about? Blaine was a poor guy whose laboratory test got mixed up with yours, Heath. He died yesterday afternoon. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Elliot Lewis and Adrian Marden. This program, produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Fred Hegeland and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the whistler's strange story, The Eager Pigeon. (laughs) 
It was neither the best side of town nor the best cocktail bar. But Danny Thorpe's pocketbook wasn't in a very choosy mood or condition. Danny's clothes suggested better things. And, as on other occasions, he was counting on them to make things pick up. That was when he first saw her, or rather her reflection in the big mirror across the back of the bar. She was sitting alone, looking thoughtful and beautiful. She also looked out of place in these surroundings. Danny was curious and never wanted to stand on ceremony. He picked up his drink and went over. Excuse me. This seat taken? What? Oh. There seems to be plenty of room at the bar. Oh, sure. But why trade reflections when the real thing's only a few feet away, hmm? Well, we can confine the conversation to the weather. Warm night, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. It might even rain. It might. But that's not what you're worried about. Worried? Oh, it shows. Does it? Really? Well, it's my brother. Do you come in here often? Yeah, I come in here often. Maybe... Maybe you've seen my brother. He drinks too much. That's bad. Very bad. He was wearing a check coat. Tall, wavy hair. The coat? <laughs> my brother. <laughs> well... That's something. What's that? First time I've laughed in a week. Well, things are bad all over. I... I wonder if... No. No, I guess not. Try me. No. You certainly aren't in need of money. A man who dresses... Now, easy, lady. Don't mention that stuff and then run away. Money, you said? Yes. Oh, I'm always interested. Uh, your brother really isn't it, is it? No. It's nothing very much. I just need help, that's all. There's $50 for the right party. Have tucks, we'll travel. Outline the job, sweetheart. Are you serious? If you are. All right. But first, I'll have to make a phone call. Excuse me a moment. As she moves away, you look after her, telling yourself that it's the fastest deal you've ever managed. But suddenly you begin to wonder, don't you, Danny? Consider. And you ask yourself if it might not be too easy. A moment later, you slip out from the booth you're sitting in, make your way quietly to a booth further back, and just outside the little hallway where she went to make a phone call. You sit down, lean back, and find that you can even hear the sound of the dialing. A pause, and then she gets her party. You crane your head to listen carefully. Hello, Otto? Monica. It's all set, Otto. I found someone. Yes, in the bar. You'd better get ready. I'm bringing home a very eager pigeon. You get up quickly, walk back to where she left, and sit down to wait. The picture has changed fast, hasn't it, Danny? And you had good reason to wonder about this girl. To use her words, she's bringing home an eager pigeon. You deliberate for a moment, almost decide to walk out, but you don't. You never do. Instead, you finish your drink, sit back and wait, but not for long, Danny. Sorry to keep you waiting. You said 50 bucks, didn't you? 50. Oh, I don't mind waiting. You'll be pleased then. It's all set. It's all right. What's all set? All right. Well, I... I'd rather not talk here. We can go to my apartment. Now don't tell me it's right around the corner, not in this neighborhood. Hardly. I have my car. I have my hat. Let's go. You walk out with her, help her into a convertible car that matches the clothes. She smiles again and swings the car out into the traffic stream. You study her face as she watches ahead. A strange setup, isn't it, Dan? Interesting. And with what you already know about her, there might be considerably more than $50 in this evening for you. Yes, if you're careful, watchful, you might turn her plan, whatever it is, into something for yourself. You've handled fast deals before, haven't you? Yes, and you've always come out ahead. Twenty minutes later, she turns into the garage of a smart apartment building. Together, you ride up in an automatic elevator. You decide that it's time to switch the balance of power. 
What apartment? 502. You, uh, haven't told me your name, either. Oh, sorry, it's... Monica. Yeah, I heard. You... Uh, uh, no, you don't. Give me that purse. Let alone. Keep your hand... Well, well, fancy finding a gun in your purse. Is there anything wrong with a girl carrying something to defend herself? No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with a boy doing the same thing. Especially when it's your gun and I'm the boy who's got it. It's a big, bad, wicked city, sweetheart. Boys and girls can get hurt. I don't know what you're talking about. Here we are, fifth floor. After you, Monica. I'm interested in what you got in apartment 502. Very interested. Mrs. Otta Buell of Oregon City is the Whistler fan to whom we are sending a $20 signal gasoline book this week as a token of our appreciation for writing this limerick. Our car was anemic and slow till we gave it the gas with more go. On signal ethyl diet, when we park it, we tie it. It doesn't run fast, it flies low. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, we go gasoline. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Buell's limerick certainly hit the nail on the head in describing the extra driving pleasure you enjoy with Signal Ethyl Gasoline. And speaking of pleasure, if you'd like the fun of having a limerick of yours read on the Whistler, the address to which to send it is Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. You'll receive a $20 Signal Gasoline book if your limerick is read on the Whistler. And all limericks become the property of Signal Oil Company. Selection is made by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, your limerick must be your own composition. Remember, the address to which to send your limerick is Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. You've walked into something, haven't you? From the cocktail bar to this fancy apartment. And as you follow Monica down the hall toward apartment 502, you keep watching her, waiting for her to break, to stop and tell you what it's all about. Why she picked you up and lied to you about some sort of innocent job she wanted done. Finally, when you're only a few feet away from the door of the apartment, you decide it's time to stop her. You touch her gently between the shoulder blades with a little revolver you took from her purse. Well, hold it right here, baby. Conference time. Now, I want you to tell me who you talked to on the phone. Who's Otto? Otto? That's what you tagged him. I also heard you say you'd bring the pigeon right up. I don't know what you're talking about. Is Otto the boyfriend? The jealous husband? What is this, a shakedown? No. No, nothing like that. Don't let the clothes fool you. Look, lady, you could turn me upside down and not shake out a nickel. Please get out of here. Let me alone. Come on, move, honey. I'll follow. I'm just busting to meet Otto. I may even bust Otto. All right, open up. But... Go on inside and then call him. No warning, understand? After you, sweetheart. Come on, call the guy. Otto! Otto! Oh, we're right there. I'm wondering what you've been doing. What's this? It's a gun, Otto, and it wants some fast answers. Well, who is he, Monica? I'm the pigeon, Otto, but squab's out of season for you. Uh, look, you better get out of here. This is all a mistake. No, we... It's a mistake, all right, but I like mistakes when other people make them. Now, come on, move up over the wall. I want to have a look in that room. What? Move, Otto. Come on, move. <laughs> Well, how do you like that? No body. Body? Oh, yeah. This is a real switch. Figured to be a body in there. Okay, you'll have to brief me. What's it all about? All right. So I got all evening. I'll wait. It presents an almost humorous picture, doesn't it, Dan? The two of them standing there. Otto's eyes blinking, Monica's snapping angrily. And then you notice something else, Otto. 
He's looking at his watch. Otto is nervous. For some reason, which you're certain he's about to tell you, Otto doesn't want to wait much longer. All right. All right, he might as well know, Monica. That's better. I'll fix myself a drink, fat boy. You just talk, huh? Wait, we're expecting someone. Well, it's fine. We can play canasta. I'll tell him, Otto. Uh, a woman wants something from us. Some letters. She's going to pay... I know it. That green stuff, huh? Where was the pigeon supposed to figure? Oh, I shouldn't have called you that. You really weren't going to have to do much. Oh, tell him, Monica. Tell him. He seems like a nice guy. He might still help us. We just don't want our caller to get a look at us. That's all. Oh, that's all. You want me to meet your caller, hand over the letter, take the money? Yes, yes, that's it. Will you do it? We'll make it a hundred dollars since we've upset you so. Oh, you haven't upset me, Otto. Not a bit, boy. Nice liquor, nice company. The Monica here, I mean. Uh, then you'll do it, Mr... Thorpe. Danny Thorpe. I like that. It's cute. Well, so are you. So is he. Now, Otto, you can't be that worried over my indecision. It must be something else. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. You're both afraid that this dame might pull something. And she'll show up with a forty-five, pay for her letters with bullets instead of do... Uh, well, now, who do you suppose that is? Your caller, maybe? Well, answer it, Otto. Don't be nervous. No, 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 please. You don't think I'm going? Or this lovely little girl who worked so hard getting me up here? Monica, please tell him to forget it. Will I you... said answer it. Now go on, move. No, no, please, please. I... Out of the way, Monica. Out of sight. Go on, fat boy. Look, Danny, why... I don't... said open the door. Oh, what rough games Otto plays. What excitable playmates. Stop it. Can't you see he's... He's dead. Yes, Otto is dead. You can see that at a glance, can't you, Danny? Quickly, you step over him. Look down the hall. It's deserted. Whoever shot Otto made a clean getaway. Then you turn, drag the dead man into the room, and close the door. Monica, a few feet away, stands motionless, staring at you. Dan... Wait. I... I didn't know this would happen. Didn't you, sweetheart? Please. You've got to believe me. That could be me, baby, sprawled out there looking up at the ceiling. I ought to slam you all around this room. Dan, don't I... Mr. Felby. we got to get Mr. out of here. Felby. The whole apartment house Mr. will be on our necks. Come on, sister, snap out of it. What? I said let's go. There's a back way out of here, isn't there? Uh, yes. You better call the police. Come on, baby. Out, out. <laughs> Very quiet, sweetheart. Otto still on your mind? I'm not in the mood for conversation, sorry. Okay. Where can I drop you off? Oh, the night's young. Look, I'm not going to drive you around all night. Oh, relax, relax. Don't let this thing get you. It's just that I'm old-fashioned. I always get nervous when I'm mixed up in a murder. Anybody know you were with Otto tonight? No. About you and Otto. It was just a business deal, that's all. Sure. Anything else? Should have picked a smarter boy. It was pretty stupid of Otto to set up that kind of a payoff. We won't make the same mistake, will we? We? We just formed a new partnership, didn't you know? Dan, listen. I don't think I want to go on with this. Oh, sure you do. You'll feel better after you have a drink. There's a place up ahead. I'll buy. I thought you were broke. Oh, no, not anymore, sweetheart. You owe me 50 bucks, remember? in the mood for conversation now, Monica? <laughs> yes. I guess so, Danny. About this dame you had in the pressure cooker, who is she? Uh, Mrs. Granger. Stanley Granger. Of the Knob Hill Grangers? Yes. Uh, husband Stanley is pretty well healed, isn't he? That's why she married him, for his money. He knew that, but Granger was crazy about her and he didn't care. What do you have on Miss Granger? Nothing. Oh, come on, come on. It's the truth. We don't have a thing. You mean all this was just a bluff? What made you think you could get by with it? Before she was married, Mrs. Granger was a nightclub singer. She had a lot of friends. Otto knew that some of them were mixed up in the racket. So you took a shot in the dark, figuring she might have something to hide, huh? That's right. Hmm. She did have something to hide, didn't she? It's too bad Otto had to find it out the hard way. 
Yes, it's too bad. Now what do we do? We go right on with it. Only this time we're going to shake Miss Granger down for murder. Either she did it, her husband did it, or they hired someone to do it. We in business? We're in business. It's almost two in the morning when Monica drops you off at a fashionable hotel downtown with a promise to call you later in the morning. The future looks bright, doesn't it, Danny? Yes. And for the first time in weeks, you enjoy a comfortable night's rest. It's almost noon of the following day when you wake up, have breakfast sent up to your room and the morning paper. It's all there, isn't it? On the front page. The killing at apartment 502. You're not going to make the mistake Otto made, are you? No. You have it all planned, don't you? Know exactly what you're going to do. But first, you've got to be sure of Mrs. Granger, that you're dealing with the right person. That afternoon, you leave the hotel and slip into a phone booth. The Granger residence? Mrs. Granger, please. Whom shall I say is calling? Just tell her it's about apartment 502. She'll talk to me. Uh, apartment 502, sir? Yeah. Go on, Junior. Hello. Mrs. Granger? Yes. Listen careful, sweetheart. I have some information to sell. It's about auto feeling and why it was knocked off. You can buy it for 10 grand or I'll hand it over to the DA for free. You follow me? Yes. Well, that's fine. I'll be out at the Blue Pelican Bar tonight. It's usually pretty crowded, so don't get any ideas. Be there at 9 o'clock. Have the dough in a white envelope and carry it in your right hand. It's done, isn't it, Danny? And you feel confident Mrs. Granger will keep her appointment with you. Now there are other arrangements to be made. And you stroll casually down to the produce district near the waterfront. Step into the large warehouse of Gus Dorelli and Company. Hey, Gus. Huh? Get these oh, Danny, hiya. Hi, what's the Maggio batting these days? 335, not bad for an old man, huh? Hey, Gus, can you do me a favor? Uh, look, if it's a dog... No, no, no. You got a truck pulling out of here tonight? Sure, and he's taking a ten-wheeler out. How about a ride? He's going north. Where you going? By a stranger coincidence, north. Okay, he's going out for a load of cabbage, Danny. What? Cabbage, and he's going out for a load of cabbage. <laughs> That's funny, Gus. I'll be carrying mine with me. I don't get it. This a joke? Could develop along those lines. Gus stands there, shaking his head as you walk away. Everything is falling neatly into place, isn't it, Danny? The appointment with Mrs. Granger. And now your quiet exit out of town has been arranged. Yes, you're confident everything is going well. That is, until you return to your hotel. You're a little surprised when the clerk tells you there haven't been any phone calls for you. You look at your watch after five. Quickly, you cross the lobby, step into a phone booth, and call Monica's hotel. I'm sorry, sir. There's no one registered here by that name. Scott. Monica Scott. I'm sorry, sir. All right, never mind. Something's wrong, Danny. Monica lied to you, didn't she? And you wonder what she's up to. Then, as you're about to step out of the booth, something you see in the hotel entrance causes you to jump back. Two uniformed policemen walk briskly across the lobby, stop for a moment at the desk, and then disappear into the elevator. Hey, boy. Yes, sir? What's all the law for, do you know? Oh, that? Yeah, the, the guy in 801 had too much to drink. The house stick couldn't handle him. Oh. Yeah, now he's going to have to tell it to the cops. Drinking can become a horrible thing, son. Let that be a lesson to you. Yeah. Huh? You breathe a sigh of relief and smile as you step out into the street. You dismiss the incident and turn your thoughts back to Monica. You're puzzled why she lied to you. And then as you're about to cross the street, a car slides in along the curb. Hello, Dan. Well, I was beginning to think a lot of nasty things about you. Get in. Yeah. I called your hotel. They never heard of you. No, of course not. I have an apartment on Jackson Street. It's just a little hideaway. My very own. Oh, that's fine. Dan... I'm sorry. It's just that last night... Well, I wasn't sure I wanted to go on with this. Now you are? Yes. 
But I'm curious about our business deal, our partnership. Oh, we got plenty of time to talk about that. How about some dinner? Let's have it at my place. Oh, well, that's what I had in mind. All right. Uh, but I ought to warn you, I'm not much of a cook. Neither was Cleopatra. Well, here you are, Monica. We're out of soda. Plain water okay? Fine, just fine, Danny. Sit down. Yeah. You know, it's pretty good stuff. Nothing's too good for little Monica. And from now on, it'll be champagne. Hmm? Sure. Uh, I hate to bring up business again, Danny. What's on your mind? What? I said, what's on your mind? Uh, oh, I, I was thinking about Mrs. Granger. You figured out a way? You said you would. No, not yet, baby. You have it? It takes time. I want to case this set up pretty well before I make a move. Hmm. I'm beginning to understand you, Danny. That's good. You know something? I'm getting awfully sleepy. Have a hard day at the mangle? Oh, maybe I need something to eat. Come on, help me fix dinner. Oh, look, let's hold it off for a while yet, huh? I have to run out to meet a guy. I'm late now. Oh, Danny. Oh, I'll be back, sweetheart. This is very important. Well, you hurry. Sure. You'll stay right here and wait for Danny, huh? I won't budge an inch. Twelve precincts, Sergeant Regal. Sergeant, write this down. Huh? 1331B Jackson Street, apartment 411. The dame who was with Otto Felding when he was knocked off last night is there now. Her name is Scott. Monica Scott. Hey, wait a minute. Who is this? You might have a little trouble waking her up, Sergeant. Some louse gave her a sleeping tablet. It just goes to show, pal. You can't trust anybody these days. Next weekend, when you start off on your Labor Day trip, wouldn't it add a lot to your peace of mind to know that no matter how high the thermometer may soar, the expensive parts inside your engine are safe, protected by an oil that stands up under heat? Then this week, be sure to have a signal dealer drain out your tired old motor oil and refill with fresh, clean, signal premium compounded motor oil. Because scientific compounds have been combined with Signal Premium's 100% pure paraffin base, this improved type signal lubricant does things for your motor which oil alone cannot do. One of Signal Premium's compounds was especially developed to prevent the formation of motor clogging gum and varnish. Another compound in Signal Premium guards against destructive corrosion. And if there's any carbon already in your engine, there's even a special compound to wash that out. So you see, Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil does a lot more than just lubricate. Obviously, this means longer life for your motor. And, of course, more enjoyable performance for you. Two good reasons to change oil before your Labor Day trip. And change to Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. You congratulate yourself, don't you, Danny? As you sit in the Blue Pelican Bar waiting for Mrs. Granger. Yes, you've handled the whole affair with your usual finesse. Monica Scott is in the hands of the police now, and you're not sorry. You owed her that, didn't you, from the beginning? From the night she picked you up and took you to Otto Felding's apartment. You were going to be the fall guy, the pigeon. But it didn't turn out that way. Instead, you took over their blackmail scheme. Otto was then eliminated by Mrs. Granger or someone she'd hired. And now you're sure you've got Monica out of the way, too. And the blackmail money will be all yours. You're not worried in the least as you look up at the clock behind the bar. Note that Mrs. Granger is already half an hour late. Then a few minutes before ten, as you finish your third drink, someone sits down beside you. Hello, Danny. You know mine. What's yours? Allow me. Police department. So? Waiting for Mrs. Granger? Never heard of her. And let me tell you about her. Mrs. Granger was being blackmailed. She had no money of her own, so her husband had to pay off a guy called Otto Felding. And he did, but with bullets. So? So you picked it up from there. Tried to go on shaking down Mrs. Granger. Where'd you get that idea? Too bad you didn't know that Mrs. Granger was a party to the blackmail setup. 
She and friend Otto thought it up to get some extra dough out of her husband. What? A girlfriend of yours told us the whole thing. Monica Scott. She also told us you'd be here, waiting for a payoff. That's crazy. How would she... How would she know? Simple. You told her when you made that appointment over the phone to Mrs. Granger. Get it? Mrs. Granger. Monica Scott. Same person. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Because next weekend is Labor Day weekend, Signal has asked me to remind you. On America's last three-day weekend, the 4th of July, 296 people were killed in traffic accidents. So that some avoidable accident doesn't mar your Labor Day pleasure, it will be all the more important for you next weekend to drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Kay Brinker. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Sterling Tracy, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian John Doe. Music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional. All characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time, next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. <laughs> 